Yeah, hello. Hello and welcome to the second Azure Stack HCI, this time days. We have two days. My name is Carsten Rachval and I'm joined by Manfred Helber, uh, yes. who is so nice to uh, share his nice studio with me so that we can uh, do the next uh, two days uh, Azure Stack HCI days here together. So Manfred, some words about you? Yeah, um, welcome also from my side. I'm very happy that Carsten is here for the second time for the uh, Azure Stack HCI days. Last year it was the Azure Stack HCI day. And before we had the Azure Stack HCI day, we met several times on your cloud and data center conference. Uh, what was a, yeah, a, let's say in person event, a real life event. And because of the situation we all know, we uh, Carsten had to switch to a virtual event and I had already this video studio here Carsten mentioned and so I'm very happy that we are using this for Carsten's Azure Stack HCI days and also for several events I'm doing all over the year and I'm really looking forward to the many interesting tracks you have on your agenda so yes, I've seen yes. this in the last days yeah we will talk about all the tracks and the speakers and of course the sponsors very soon but first I want to say some words about the cloud and data center management conference um, unfortunately, we couldn't do it because of the pan, uh, pandemic um, last year in 2020. This year also not possible. And I'm, to be honest, next year there will also be no uh, cloud and data center management conference. We are planning now for 2023. So we hope that then um, coronavirus is something uh, we get used to every everybody or nearly everybody is vaccinated or, or had the virus uh, and is immune. So um, next year, not a cloud and data center management conference, but I hope in 2023 and uh, I hope we will do another Azure Stack HCI day in 2022, Manfred. Uh, I hope so at least. And you start with a new show on the 1st yes. of October. I think you will mention it in uh, in your presentation. Yeah, if that's do fine we, for you. Yes, I yeah, will. Yeah, we talk about it yeah. now uh, because you do a new thing. Yeah, there will be an Azure Stack HCI show. This show is presented by Sven Langenfeld, who is a Microsoft employee and my person. And we have great guests there in the Azure Stack HCI show. For example, Karsten in the first show. <laughs> yes. And maybe some of you know Eric Burke. He is also a Microsoft MVP. Um, he will be also in the first show in the third show i think so we will have cosmos darwin uh, will present there so the show as the name says is all about azure stack hci and if you are interested and you want to watch it you can find it on youtube when you search on youtube for manfred helber so my name then you will find my youtube channel and there you will find the show um it will be online it will be on the first of october from 12 to uh, 12 o'clock to 1 p.m and the youtube link will avail be available on monday so it will be listed there on monday but my channel is there already for and, sure. and we also do a little thing together yeah. the on-prem show the on-prem show there was a large summer um how you call it pause uh, that's mainly my fault because i i was a little bit in a corona down and uh, didn't do webinars and uh, other stuff a lot so we will start again i think also in october right? in october yeah i think in the middle of october yeah, we there, have our next uh, on prem there is a date yeah and it's uh, also streamed on youtube okay so let's uh, let's switch to the slides yes. and uh, do some some logistics um, so um, for your information we will talk about the sessions very soon but first the sessions always start at the full hour so the first uh, technical presentation after we talk a bit about the Azure Stack HCI day here uh, Manfred and I the first session will start at uh, 1 p.m or in in German it's it's 13 hour and the session will last up to 55 minutes. I talk to the speakers, so they have they, they are free how, how much time they use. They sh the session should be at least 45 minutes. And then we have some room for Q&A. So if you have questions, you are live in the event, please ask your questions in the chat. And uh, Manfred and I uh, will answer them. And we have some other uh, helping hands here. And uh, if 
questions are still open, we will ask them directly to the speakers so yeah. they can answer them. Yeah, so we have two small issues. We are using Teams live event. You are successfully logged in, so it works, but we have a delay in this live event. So we are talking here and you will see the content about 30 seconds later. So if you write down a question, maybe it will take um, about one or one and a half uh, minute till we see your question in the Q&A area. We already have a question from Jan. He's asking if there's an interactive chat. Yes, you have found it, Jan. And he asks if yes, where it's here. Um, and what's not really there is the interactivity because we always have to publish a question. Um, we can publish it or we can answer it. And this is the reason why you create a question, you send it, we will see it. And it takes a while if you get an answer directly because we take the question here to the speakers or we answer it here, Carsten and myself, or uh, we will write down an answer if we are not speaking actually and we find time to, to go into a question. Okay. So it should be interactively, absolutely. Yes. Um, but um, please keep in mind that there's a small delay. Yeah, and we will have some questions for the presenter anyway, because yes. uh, Manfred and I, we have also questions. <laughs> yeah. So we will see. Um, then all sessions are recorded. Um, they will be available later, of course. I will inform you. Uh, I hope most of you have ticked uh, when you um, when you registered for the event that you get onto the newsletter. And if you're on the newsletter, I can send you a mail when the sessions are available and they will also be available on my YouTube channel. I'm not quite clear now if we do the whole event or if I cut them up in uh, in smaller pieces, hourly sessions. And uh, uh, press your thumbs. Uh, this is a very long uh, Teams live event. We start now and it, it takes up to up to midnight, so that's 11 and a half hours. Never done such a long uh, live event, right? Me neither. <laughs> so no. I hope we will have no problems with, uh, with, with some technical issues. You never know, we are dependent on the internet. And um, in, my, in my area today, the internet is very scare, scarce because today is a, is a day of where the provider is doing some work. Okay. Um, then uh, at the last session, the closing that we do uh, tomorrow evening, uh, I will have a raffle and um, we will raffle. Uh, I asked the sponsors about uh, about prizes, but then I, I thought, how do we get the prizes to the spon uh, to the um, winners? Mm -hmm. And if you win from outside of Germany, maybe in the US or wherever you are, uh, it, it, could, it could be very hard to send uh, them over. Um, to your place. So I decided let's do Amazon gift cards and uh, we do Amazon gift cards. Uh, when you win the raffle, of course, I get your mail and then I send you a gift card and you can you can use it for whatever you want. And um, we will have another prize. I do also an Azure Stack HCI course, a five day course. I have also a storage basis direct course and a Hyper-V course, but we have the Azure Stack HCI day. So I will give away a free participation in my course. And if you if you are only an English speaker, not a German one, we will find a solution for that. Usually I do my courses in German, but uh, maybe we, we find some more people who are interested and then I will do a five day English course. Uh, and you can uh, participate in the course over Teams or live in the nice town I live in Hallenberg. And Manfred was, yeah, also there. It's a nice town. It's a small town, but it is nice. Yeah. OK, let's switch over to our speakers. And if you have questions for this, uh, we will also answer the questions. So we have an amazing lineup, a lineup uh, of speakers. I think I have four slides of speakers. There are 30s, 30 speakers, different speakers. Uh, actually, there are now 29 because one of our speakers got ill. He informed me on uh, I think on Monday and I had to shift the uh, the uh, agenda a little bit. So um, I'm the next speaker today. Usually it would be Jan Torre uh, from Norway, but he, he, he is not up to presenting because he is a little bit ill. So let's talk about the different speakers you see here. Uh, Fabian uh, Boske is um, from the company Fujitsu. I hope that's 
correct for you, so Manfred? Is that correctly pronounced? I hope so. Yes, I would and think. He will present today um, about the great solutions Fujitsu has for Azure Stack HCI, and they are especially talking about stretched cluster scenarios. Um, the title of his presentation is, I have it here, a Deep Dive Building Stretched Clusters with Prime Prex for a Microsoft Azure Stack HCI. Then we have two presenters from Dell, another sponsor, Michael Wells and uh, Lisa Clark, and both of them are also Microsoft Azure MVPs. So uh, as Manfred and I, we are also MVPs and um, their session will be uh, turning hybrid cloud dreams into rea reality with their technical technologies. And I like uh, I like uh, turning hybrid cloud dreams. So I like the ti title very much. I'm looking forward to that session. Then we have Rob Hindman. Rob is from uh, Redmond. Uh, and uh, I know Rob and Manfred also for uh, quite some years. Uh, he is also responsible for the Cloud and Data Center Management MVP uh, program where, uh, where I and uh, Manfred is in and uh, Rob is our MVP contact. Yes, let's say, and he is presenting. Uh, I have. Let's have a look. I think tomorrow. Tomorrow, yes. Tomorrow, um, the the last one. Uh, reboot in seconds with current soft reboot. Yes, uh, uh, with Christina Collette. We have uh, we have her later. Oh, she is she is here on the slide. Christina Collette. She's also a program manager uh, from Redmond. Um, uh, they will uh, talk about uh, rebooting in or reboot in seconds with a kernel soft reboot. I'm looking yeah. forward to that because it uh, it will shorten the reboot time of an Azure Stack HCI cluster a lot, right? Absolutely. Sorry for interrupting you, Karsten. We have one uh, message in the chat uh, if there is already audio or not. Um, I think uh, because of the answer of Jan, uh, we can be very sure that there is audio because he heard our message that there is a chat, but we have to publish the questions and so on. And he replied to this uh, yeah, information we gave via audio, but maybe you can send some um, yeah, Q and A um, messages to us if audio is okay for you if you can hear everything if you can if you can see everything um, because if there are any issues we can use this first minutes to optimize it till the first session starts mm -hmm. um, but um, I think this uh, it was an anonymous so I don't know who is behind this message uh, who has issues with the audio um, I assume this is an individual problem on this specific machine but it would be perfect if some of you could give us feedback yeah. so we can ensure that there's everything. Yeah, and uh, Jan also asked uh, or, or said it would be perfect if the attendees could chat to each other. Yeah. That's unfortunately not possible with uh, Microsoft Teams team live events. That's only only with Teams, right? Yes, so, yes, yes, yes. And but then we, we wouldn't see all the questions because uh, usually in the chat is so much going on. You don't see the questions anymore, right? Yeah. OK, then uh, Andrew Hansen has a session uh, with uh, Tina Wu. She is on, a, on another slide. Uh, he's also um, a program manager in Redmond and for um, yeah, storage and files is a storage and file system team, and we will hear, hear in that session about ReFS and um, the SYN provisioning for storage basis direct. Then we have Roy Sasabi. I think Roy is, where's Roy? He's, a, he's one of the presenters about secure core servers, and uh, David Schott, both also live from Redmond, is presenting about um, yeah, SDN, um, software defined storage. Let's go through a bit quicker because we have only uh, uh, 15 minutes to the first session. So then we have Alvin Morales, uh, Alvin, George, Prasit, and uh, Zakib, and Payman are also, um, and uh, Trung and Mike are also live presenting from Redmond or from the Microsoft product uh, groups. Uh, Alvin is uh, doing uh, uh, with other presenters GPUs for high available uh, availability or available VMs. I'm looking forward to that session a lot. George is George is 
I think uh, doing an SDN session. Uh, Prasit is doing is in in two sessions. One about GPUs and uh, about secure core servers. Uh, Zakib is um, also in the secure uh, core session. Payman is in the GPU session. Jan Torre, unfortunately, I. I didn't want to remove him from the speaker list because he was speaker until Monday. He got ill. Uh, so uh, I hope you get better soon, Jan Torre. We miss you here. Uh, Trung is um, doing a session. Um, let, let's have a look. He's, he's co-presenter with Trung. Where's Trung? I, I. Trung is Network ATC. Network ATC. Oh, he's, he's doing with, with Dan uh, on yeah. the next. So uh, uh, we, we will see how you can automatically configure your network in Azure Stack HCI. Tina, we already mentioned, she is doing uh, the session uh, about thin provisioning in storage basis direct with uh, Andrew Hansen. Thomas Maurer, uh, he is an Former MVP, we know him very well. He's from Switzerland, so he is, I think, the only Microsoft presenter uh, who is not from Redmond. And Thomas is talking about Arc, um, uh, the the new thing for Azure, where you can manage everything, right? Um, Jaromir Kasper, Jaromir is uh, an ex uh, Microsoft uh, employee. He is very well known uh, for. WS Lab uh, and now it's called MS Lab uh, and we will show us how to deploy Azure Stack HCI on hardware, I think with uh, MS Lab. Dave is an, an MVP fellow from uh, Canada and he will uh, talk about uh, Defender uh, in Azure Stack HCI. Didier, another MVP uh, friend of us uh, from Belgium. He will uh, talk about SMB and Quick, uh, a new technology where we don't use TCP IP uh, for SMB and other uh, protocols, but the new Quick standard. And it's now new in Windows Server 2022, the Azure edition, right? Yeah, it's in the Azure edition, yeah. Let's see. Manfred, you already See in the picture, Manfred, uh, also MVP in the Cloud and Data Center Management Group. Manfred will talk about um, how you deploy uh, Azure Stack HCI with Windows Admin Center, and his session is after mine at uh, two o'clock. Yes. Yeah, I'm presenting about uh, Stretch Cluster right at one o'clock, um, where uh, Jan, uh, Jan Torres' session was. And then we have Helmut, another MVP from Austria, and he will also ta talk about uh, from SMB to data center, the scalability of Azure Stack HCI. Uh, and now we are on the, on the, I think the fourth speaker slide, and we have Udo Walberer. Udo uh, is also known to you if you were a participant in the last Azure Stack Air HCI day in November. Udo is from Lenovo and he will do the Lenovo session. Let me see, making Azure Stack HCI solutions easy. Lenovo think Agile MX. And then we have Cosmos, Cosmos Darwin, of course. Cosmos uh, will present uh, about the Azure Stack HCI roadmap today at five. And I'm really looking forward to that session. What Cosmos will tell us about the, the future features or the future roadmap uh, of the product uh, we are talking about all two days. And Jason, Jason, also program manager from uh, Redmond, he will talk about the new VM fleet. I am a huge VM fleet fan and uh, I do all my installations or, or also Petra, another employee in my company. We do all our uh, um, Azure Stack HCI and storage basis direct installation. We test with VM fleet and there is a new VM fleet coming. Um, um, very interesting, and he will show us uh, um, all about it. And then we have Dan Cuomo. Dan is uh, uh, from the network team uh, in Redmond, and he will present with Trung, Trung, uh, Trung about uh, Azure ATC, so automa uh, automatically deploying your network. And then we have Matt McSpirit. Um, he will uh, tell us a lot about um, uh, Azure Kubernetes services uh, with a colleague of, of uh, a colleague of him has another uh, session. Mike, uh, we had him on the first slide. Mike Kostonitz. He will uh, tell us about 
um, um, the arch architecture of Azure Kubernetes service. And then we have Jeff Woolsey, last but not least, and uh, Jeff is also well known as a speaker in the community and he will um, talk about the new things in Windows Server 2022. And that was the speaker list. It's it's quite a long list. Yeah. So uh, we have <laughs> 10 minutes left. Um, here you see the agenda. It's live on the Azure Stack HCI day site. So you see here we are now in the first session. It's not really a session. It's a welcome to all of you. And uh, we will start at uh, one with my stretch cluster session, then Manfred, then Didier. Um, because uh, then we have our uh, Dell session, our sponsor session, and then it's eight in the morning in Redmond and uh, the Redmond speakers will uh, join us. So starting with um, Cosmos um, about the roadmap and uh, then we have Dave from Canada, uh, um, Windows Defender Advanced Red Protection. Then we have the networking session today. Uh, we have uh, the sponsor session from Fujitsu where we learn a lot about the uh, Prime Flex servers. I hope we will also learn a bit about the new server generations that are coming um, also at uh, the Dell session. And then we have SIM provisioning for storage spaces direct and ReFS improvements. Um, and then something I, I think many of you are looking forward to, uh, to GPUs for high available VMs. Um, they will talk about uh, what's coming for GPU support in uh, Azure Stack HCI 21H2 and uh, 22H2. And then we close the day with a secure core server session. And then it's nearly midnight. We will close up and uh, tomorrow we will start at one o'clock with Jaromir. He will show us uh, how to deploy uh, Azure Stack HCI 21H2 with MS Lab. And then we have Helmut, uh, which is from SMB to data center session. Then uh, we learn about Azure Arc and what we can do on premises, I hope, uh, from Thomas Maurer. Then we have uh, Udo uh, with the Lenovo session, make Azure Stack HCI solution easy. Uh, and then we have a round table and uh, I'm looking really forward to the, to the round table um, where uh, of course, Manfred and I, uh, Didier, uh, Jeff Woolsey, Helmut Otto, Jaromir Kasper, and Matt McSpirit are here to answer your questions. And I hope we get a lot of questions. You can ask anything, uh, Azure Stack HCI related, and of course, Server 2022 uh, about all the things. And uh, I hope that we will have a very live discussion about uh, these things. And then we have, after that, we have Jeff Woolsey with uh, the session about Windows Server 2022. And then two sessions about uh, Azure Kubernetes services. Uh, uh, something I really look forward to because I'm, I'm to be honest, I, I'm i playing around with Azure Kubernetes services on premises, but there's still something missing in my head. So I hope I learn a lot here. And then we have a uh, what's new in software defined networking session, then uh, the VM uh, fleet uh, session with Jason, and then the soft kernel reboot, uh, reboot in seconds, not in minutes, in seconds. <laughs> yeah. And then we have the closing uh, with the raffle, uh, and then everybody can sleep. And I think we both are very done then, right? I assume so. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this reboot uh, session because the reboot will faster than the duration of the delay we have here. But yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I hope. And do you think it's under 30 seconds? I, I don't think so. I, I assume yeah. with VMs, yes, but yeah. not with hardware. We will see. We will see. Yes. <laughs> okay. And then, uh, of course, I have to thank our sponsors because without the sponsors, you know, um, these free events are not really possible. So a big thank, uh, thanks to Dell Technology, who is supporting the Azure Stack HCI days, Fujitsu uh, and Lenovo. And um, 
of course, a big thank you to Manfred that we can do that here with his nice equipment. And I think so far is everything OK, or, or do you have? Yes, in we the had chat? a lot of feedback that audio and video is fine. So many wrote uh, that this is fine. And so uh, my my information is always that then maybe it's an individual issue of the audio settings at the endpoint because Teams works in the cloud. And so if one person uh, can receive our audio and video, then everybody should. Um, we have uh, a few uh, questions already in the chat, and one of these questions is very strategic, so I'm not sure if it was desired for us to answer it, if or if somebody wanted to ask the audience. Yeah. Maybe this anonymous can add this information, because the question is, do you see Azure Stack HCI as a virtualization platform, a cloud platform, ignoring Azure Arc, or both? So if the intention was to ask the audience, please um, resend this question with the information, then we can publish it and we can try to get some information from the audience. If this question was for us, I think it's perfect to discuss it tomorrow in the round table. So we yes. can take this uh, uh, one because now we have only a few minutes left, so we should take it till tomorrow. And then we, I have seen a question already about uh, GPU support and my recommendation would be we have later a session so we can put this GPU question to the session where we talk Talk about GPU later, and we have um, one question about uh, where can I watch uh, sessions I miss? Uh, and they mentioned Carson. Everything is recorded, and it will be published in the next days. So you cannot watch it immediately, but someone later. I think next week. Yeah, I hope to to get it up next week. Uh, and uh, the session could only uh, can only be record are only recorded. Uh, we do it with uh, Teams live event, so we will get a recording uh, um, when Teams has not not a problem. So if there are sessions that are very important to you, watch them live if it's possible for you. I know the time the time span is very large from uh, midday in Europe to midnight. Uh, but uh, if it's important to you and you want to uh, get your live question questions in, watch them live. Usually there are no problems with uh, the recording with team live events, uh, but uh, if there are uh, and we wouldn't have a recording, that would be terrible. So live is better, of course, than watching the recordings. And this is the reason why we only have one track. Uh, so we have two days with one track instead of one day with two tracks. Uh, um, so uh, you can really watch every session and maybe there's something not for you. So you have to 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 eat something and so on. So uh, remember the sessions start at. Always the full hour. Yeah? And if there should be any technical issues, if something doesn't work or the screen freezes or something like this, then stay on the call. We will come back. We have a lot of backup equipment here, so um, stay on the session. Um, we will do the best mm. that you can receive the information. Yeah. OK, I hope Carsten. Uh, you can also uh, uh, ask questions in German. Yes. Manfred and I, we are we are capable of German very well. Yes. I hope our English is OK. I will not talk German here because if I switch to German in my head, uh, I have problems yes. to do English again. Uh, yeah. And we can translate these uh, questions. I did this with some of the audio questions before. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So we have two minutes to go. Then I will start my uh, stat cluster notes from the field session. Uh, and if you have questions for that, very welcome. Uh, for me, it's a little bit small to read. <laughs> yeah, I will. So read. you have you have you have I, to I ask. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to ask the questions. Uh, to me. So I think this, the start went well. So we have nearly done the first half hour. So only 11 hours to go today. Huh? <laughs> yeah, and uh, it seems for the attendees everything is fine. And uh, again, to mention this, if you want to have something discussed uh, in the um, in the audience, then we can publish the question. I didn't publish any of the questions now because this was feedback about audio and questions we will take for the later sessions. But uh, if you want to discuss this in the audience, add the information that it would be great if we can publish it. Maybe we cannot publish every question, but we will do our best. And as soon as I publish the question, everybody sees it and then you can interact with each other. So Manfred, I have a technical question. Do yes. I switch? No, I use this microphone, right? 
Yes, you use this microphone because you are on my camera here. So um, yeah, you you only uh, you only lean back and start with stretch cluster notes from the field. Yeah. So I have a question for the audience. Uh, do you like to have the speaker uh, at the side of the slides, or do you want to have the full view of the presentation? Uh, because I have to start my presentation now. So question is, uh, if we do demos, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will switch to the full screen. And if the feedback is that full screen of the slides and presentation is always better, then I will stay on the uh, on the full screen layout of the presentation. So we can I will take this feedback and um, um, yeah, react based on the feedback. Yeah. OK, so it's uh, 1 p.m. in Germany, so I will start with my session. Um, good morning to everyone out there. Uh, first, uh, something about me. Um, you are in the session stretch cluster notes from the field. My name is Carsten Rachfall. I'm one of the cloud and data center management MVPs. In fact, for 11 years now, I got my 11th award uh, some days ago and I had I hadn't even the time to tweet and uh, blog about it. And I'm also an Azure MVP now in the third year. Um, I, I like to, to be in both categories. I always say uh, cloud and data center management is the old on-premise world and Azure is the new Microsoft world. And uh, I'm between that a bit more on-premise still than in Azure, but uh, both. And then I'm also a Veeam, Veeam OneGuard. So why I'm doing this session, um, in the Azure Stack HCI implementations, I'm doing uh, the stretch cluster is really the feature that most of the customers want. Uh, and if they don't don't do storage spaces direct, they uh, and do Azure Stack HCI. It's mainly because of the stretch cluster feature, because in Germany and I think it's the same for. Um, for Austria and Switzerland, we use a lot of stretch clusters. Uh, maybe um, if you look at the uh, amount of people who live there, most stretch clusters uh, in how you call that uh, per head of people are maybe in in Germany. So why use a stretch cluster? Uh, what are the reasons for a stretch cluster? Because it's more complex, of course, than a, a normal cluster or even standalone nodes. So um, the data in the VMs is today very valuable and you can't lose hours of work or even minutes of work in some environments and there are a lot of those. So um, we have companies today who uh, have, um, yeah, have a 24 by 7, so they work the whole 24 hours seven days so including saturday and sunday and even some of them 365 days a year i have i'm actually actually at a customer who has this requirement uh who, where the it has really to work 365 days uh, and you need really full av availability and a stretch cluster or um yeah a stretch cluster can help with that yeah. So we want to protect, uh, protect ourselves uh, against local disasters. So a stretch cluster could be uh, if we uh, think about, uh, uh, let's say, a, a natural catastrophe like, uh, like a volcano uh, breaks out like we have now in Las Palmas or you have a, a thunderstorm or a hurricane, you have earthquakes and so on. So you have maybe a stretch cluster that is uh, where, the, where the two sites are, are large, there is a large distance between both. But a stretch cluster is also if you have two rooms uh, with one wall and one of the room, uh, you want to prepare that this room has no power or can burn or whatever. So a stretch cluster, the distance can be very small, two rooms, uh, directly connected the rooms or on the same campus, maybe 100 meter, 500 meter, but it can also be a very long distance. Um, and you want to uh, you want to protect yourself uh, against the the total um, not availability of one of these sites. So if if one site is hit, we am starts on the other side. That's very important. It's not something where you have constantly replication of the VMs and the memory of the VMs. It's a replication of the data. So if a VM runs in site A, 
the data is also replicated to site B. Um, and if you have a disaster in site, site A, the VMs can be started in site B. So you have a slight outage uh, of your application, but it, it will be there maybe after some minutes um, and that on the other side. So there are some requirements for a stretched cluster. We have to have at a minimum four nodes two on each side. So the, the smallest Microsoft Azure Stack HCI stretch cluster has to have four nodes, not two, four nodes, two on each side. We have to have a network between the sites that can constantly replicate the change, the churn. So if we have a long distance stretch cluster, uh, we will see on the next slide an example from Microsoft where they have one site in London and one site in Paris. That's very far away. Uh, then you have to have a connection between the two where you can uh, constantly um, replicate your churn. And if, if you have VMs on one side that uh, do a lot of writes, you, you have to get them to the other side. So with a 100, a megabit internet connection, I think you that will not help you. You have to have gigabit or even 10 gigabit. And that's that's um, something that is not so easy, especially in long distance stretch clusters. On a campus shouldn't be a problem to have 10 gigabit between the two sites. Then what's very important uh, is the witness placement. Uh, we have to have a third site or Azure. I will talk about the witness place, placement a little bit later because this is really important. Um, we have four nodes and four nodes uh, are an equal number of nodes. So the cluster must have a witness and the witness can't be in the first site or in the second site. Uh, this is very important and many stretch cluster projects um, don't have the third site or don't have the right connection to Azure. Azure is also an option you can choose. And then uh, Azure Stack HCI is an Azure product, uh, but you have to have it. Uh, every host has to be integrated in an Active Directory. And I'm not talking about Azure Active Directory. I'm talking about the old Active Directory that can be on premise on premises. Of course, it can be hosted in VMs in the cloud, but you uh, the, the nodes have to be in an Active Directory. Uh, for example, today for the live migration, moving one VM from one node to another, you need um, you need tickets from the Active Directory and that 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 is a must today. Otherwise, you can't live migrate. So here is an example of Microsoft. Microsoft always thinks big because the Azure data centers. So when you when you have your redundancy, they are I think at least 300 miles apart. So the London Paris example is uh, is something Microsoft thinks of. Uh, the cluster is stretched over a large distance, but that 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 is not the requirement. You can also have one room. London could be. Uh, and the name of one of your sites, so the room is called London and the other room on the same campus can also be called Paris, but we can also uh, have a cluster stretch over both cities, both European cities. Yeah? So um, when we have this cluster, we have VMs running in the London part and uh, these two nodes, we have a, a storage pool where these VMs live. So their data is spread over these two nodes. Yeah, and then when we create a replication, a replicated volume, every every data that one of those VMs is written to the CSV, so the cluster shared volume, is replicated synchronously or with such a distance asynchronously to the other side, and then we write it here in a volume that is um, it's offline, it's not accessible, so it's. Uh, but when a disaster hits, this volume will be brought online. So if we have an outage here in London, for example, fire or um, power loss, um, these two nodes here, because this is one cluster, so we have one cluster stretched over two sides, these two nodes will notice that the other nodes are not available over the heartbeat, um, and then they will bring up the CSV where the data is and start the VMs that are in these CSV. Yeah, This looks a bit like an active passive design. That's one of the possibilities, but more often we have an active active design. So we have other 
uh, VMs running on this side in another volume. This volume can also be uh, stretched to this side. And then if this side fails, the VMs that were running here will be started here. So it can be an active active or an active passive construct. So um, normally I will have I would have here an eight minute um, um, demo how to install an Azure Stack HCI stretch cluster. Uh, in the next session, uh, Manfred will show that in detail. I will only show, show you the important part, what's different with a stretch cluster to a normal cluster that will Manfred show. So um, we what you see is Windows Admin Center on, and in Windows Admin Center, this is the the actual one, the 2103.2, uh, um, we can add here under add, I will do that very soon, we can add a cluster. And I do that now, add, and then we have create new server cluster. There are other possibilities we have. And then we have the possibility to install a Windows cluster or an Azure Stack HCI. And here you see we have all servers are in one side or servers in two sides. And that's the difference we have uh, when you see Manfred's demo soon. Um, let's stop here. Um, there he will not choose two sides. He will uh, install the two nodes in one side. So and then everything is the same until minute six here after the cluster creation. Yeah. And then here in minute six, when we when we continue here after the cluster creation, because we choose we chose two sites at the beginning, we have to assign after the cluster creation two names for the sites. Here I choose east and west that are the two sites. And when then we have to assign the nodes to the individual sites. So two nodes are added to east and two nodes are added to west. And then uh, in the storage part that you that you will see in in, uh, in uh, uh, Manfred's section, um, it will create a storage pool inside A and a storage pool inside B, and that's the only time, as far as I know, where we can have more than one storage pool in a Azure Stack HCI cluster. And Storage Basis Direct does not support uh, two pools. So I go back to my presentation. And continue with um, the possible designs we talked a little bit about already. So uh, we have two possible designs. We have an active passive design. Um, so we have a stretch cluster over two sides. We have side one and side two, and two servers minimum in side one, two servers in side two, and we have all our active volumes, our stretched volumes inside one, and they are replicated with storage replication to site two, but here they are offline and we have only VMs running inside one. So these blue and red, uh, it's not really blue, it's purple also, they are running inside one and site two is passive. So it's, it's just waiting that site one fails and then it will bring up the volumes automatically and also start the VMs. But most of the time, to be honest, I have never installed at a customer site an active passive design. They always, so far, so far, uh, they always have active active designs. So in an active active design, we have one um, stretched volume here that is replicated to from side one to side two, and we have one active volume here from side two replicating to side one. And of course, in one volumes are actively VMs running, and on the other hosts are also actively VMs running. And uh, now each side is. Uh, watching over the other side, if there uh, is a failure, then um, the volume uh, from the side that fails will be brought uh, online on the other side and the VMs are started. And of course, you can have multiple volumes. So don't have, have to have one volume on one side and one volume on the other side. There can be multiple stretched volumes on each side. 
and we can have also the possibility in an in an stretched uh, Azure Stack HCI cluster. You will see that in the demo later to create a volume that is only presented on one side. It 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 must not uh, it it must not be stretched. You can also have volumes that are only presented on one side. For example, if you have applications that have um, redundancy built in the application, like uh, an Exchange DAG, um, so in a DAG or uh, and, and SQL act um, SQL how it's called always on cluster. They have already redundancy in the application. So you you put the the VMs in a volume that is only represented on one side and another VM in a volume that is only represented on that side. And then you use the in application replication. So um, stretched. Azure Stack HCI possible nodes in two sides. We already learned we can have four nodes, so two nodes in each side. Here in this picture, we have um, a site in Frankfurt and a site in Hanau that are two German cities that are not so far away, let's say maybe 20 kilometers or 15 kilometers, so uh, we can do that. And of course, you can have a six node cluster, three nodes in each side, and you can have an eight node cluster, four node in each side. And you can have 10 node, 12 node, 14 node, 16 node, and then five node, six node, seven node, eight node, eight node in each side. What you can't do is a two node cluster stretch or a three node cluster stretch or having an odd number of nodes. So you can't do a seven node cluster, three in one side and four in the other side. They are always the same number of nodes in both sides. And if you look at this, we have also always an, e an even number, so we have to have a witness because we need a tiebreaker um, for our cluster design. And for that, that's our next topic, the witness design. So we have again our picture from before. We have an active active cluster. We have two nodes here and two nodes here, and we need a tiebreaker. So now let's have a witness, the green one here, in side one. If we place our witness in side one, we have now five, um, five votes. Five, yeah, and if now something happens to our side two, we have now uh, three votes from five votes. So uh, in total it would be five, but two are gone. So we have three from five. That is more than half of the votes are available. So what will happen? The VMs, uh, the volume will be brought up, the, the replicated volume will be brought up inside one, the volume from side two, and the VMs are started here. Everything is fine. So let's do the other side. Um, side one fails, and of course then our witness is also gone. So we have two nodes running inside two. They are perfectly fine, but they have only two votes now from five. So they are below half the votes. So and they are in the minority. They are not at the majority. They are in the minority. So what do they do? They shut down the workloads they have. And we have no VMs running. But you, you build a stretch cluster to have all the VMs running in a disaster, not none running because the cluster is in the minority. It will shut down the workloads. So how do we do that correctly? We have to place our witness in a third side. So and what's very important, each side can communicate with the witness without the other side. So we have to have a direct connection from side two to the witness and also from side one to the witness, not going through side one to the witness. Uh, so if side two can only reach the witness to, through side one because all the internet connections are inside one. That's not a not a design. You can't build a stretch cluster because if side one goes down, remember the, the slide before, your witness is also not reachable. It's running in your third site or in Azure, but you can't communicate with it and that's like down, so the cluster will go down. So we have to have the witness in a separate site and each site can communicate with it. Now site two fails, and what will happen, the cluster will bring online the VMs inside one, and the other way around, it's the same. We have three from five 
uh, votes, so still the majority, and our VMs will be brought up on the other side. So what witness options do we have uh, with an stretched Azure Stack HCI cluster or even with an Azure Stack HCI cluster? We have the same witness options with, uh, as we had in Storage Spaces Direct. We can, we can choose a file share witness where we have a share somewhere. Uh, I think at least an SMB2 share, not SMB1, SMB2 share. Or we can have the cloud witness um, we have another picture. Cloud Witness is an offering in Azure. You have a blob uh, that is uh, your Cloud Witness is very cheap. And um, um, I, I heard from a lot of customers in the past that, that, that have done or that are doing storage spaces direct. No, no Cloud Witness. We don't want to be connected to the cloud. With Azure Stack HCI, you have to have, you have to be connected to the cloud because Azure Stack HCI has at least um, inform Azure every 30 days how much cores are running because Azure Stack HCI is built through Azure. So you have to have a connection to the cloud and then you can also use a cloud witness if you don't have um, um, a third site handy with a file share witness. Of course, you can use a cloud witness and it usually it's much cheaper than to build a third site just for the witness. And what's not supported in Azure Stack HCI and Storage Spaces Direct, even if they are not stretched, is a disk witness. So in Azure Stack HCI, stretched or not stretched, and Storage Spaces Direct, only the file share witness and the cloud witness are supported, not a disk witness. So let's do a small demo how we uh, install the cloud witness. Where is my, there it is. So I go to an, another node. Oh no, I do it here. The other already have a witness. So if we go to settings here, I'm now in uh, an Azure Stack HCI cluster. It's installed. Um, yes, we talk questions at the end. That's a, uh, very good. We, we talk about your questions at the end. So um, uh, I have already installed it. It's registered in Azure. And now I go to the settings and Manfred will show you how you register your Azure Stack HCI in the cloud, right? OK, so uh, if we go here in the settings of the Azure Stack HCI cluster and we go to witness. You have the possibilities. We have no witness or we could choose a cloud witness or a file share witness. I will add a file share witness and then we have to give it a share. Yeah, and here. I have a share. We see there are already two clusters registers un under this uh, directory, under this share. Um, and I will do now the third. So I go back here and post, paste it in and click on save. And now we have our witness set. And the witness, of course, has to be on a place, third site or in the cloud. So now our cluster has a witness. So if something fails, it has the possibility to have a, a quorum. We call it a quorum. A cluster has a quorum. He has uh, more votes than the other side. And here you see it's all all so registered in Azure. And Manfred will show that in the next session. So let's go back to my slides. There's, this was a very small demo. So um, for the replication for the stretched volumes. Microsoft use a feature that is available in Windows with Windows Server 2016. It's called Storage Replica. So you you can use Storage Replica if you have a data center. Um, um, Windows Server 2016, 2019, 2022, but it's included, of course, in Azure Stack HCI, the new operating system, and it's a feature for disaster recovery, so prevent you from disasters. So here we see where the storage replication is embedded in the I.O. stream to the disk or the I.O. pass from an application to a disk device. And it's agnostic to, to file system filters, to the file system we use, to uh, snapshots, bit locker, everything. In fact, it's between a vol the volume manager and the partition manager. So uh, in fact, we replicate partitions, not volumes. And here, every IO to the disk is replicated to the destination site 
and then also written to a disk. So it's very easy. It's block based. Everything that is written to the volume, it's then transmitted over SMB3 to the other side. There are three scenarios we can do with storage replica. There is a server to server scenario. So if you have an Hyper-V server with a local volume, you can replicate it to another Hyper-V server. The volume would be offline. So if the, a disaster strikes here, you have to bring manually this volume online and register all the VMs that are in the volume because this is not a cluster. Server 2 doesn't know about your VMs in that volume. He doesn't even know the volume. So this is a manual task. We have another scenario where we have two clusters using storage replica and it's the same. We have one cluster here, one cluster here. If this volume fails, you have manually to bring up the volume and register the VMs in this cluster because this is the second cluster and this is the first. This cluster doesn't know the roles. Only this scenario, and by the way, this you can do with storage bases direct with two um, separate storage bases direct clusters. But what we want is a stretch cluster where we have one cluster um, uh, including both sides and we have our volumes that are replicated. So if this site fails, the cluster already knows this volume and knows that he can bring it up and he will bring it up automatically. And he also, also knows all the virtual machines because they are. this is the same cluster. He knows every node, knows every role and the status of every role. So he brings up the volume and he starts the roles automatically. So how does it work? The synchronous replication, we have two types of replication. We have the synchronous replication. We have an application, for example, our VM, that is writing a block to our source node. And in Azure Stack HCI, we have a source node and a destination node that is replicating the volume. So it, the application, the VM, writes a, a block to the source node, and the source node is writing the block into a separate lock volume, a C, also a CSV, and uh, in the same time transporting the data to the destination node over SMB3. So SMB3 is used as a transport and then it writes on the destination side also in a lock volume and then it acknowledged the write, the, uh, the successful write of the data in an in a non-volatile volume. So the lock volume is also on on flash and uh, if you write it to the log volume, it's uh, even if, if you have a power out of the server, the data is there, then it, the data is acknowledged and then the application gets acknowledgement. So now um, the data is written. And of course, how long it takes from the write uh, until the acknowledgement depends on how far away are your both the both servers. If they are next room, it's very fast. If there are 300 kilometers between the sites, you have maybe 20, 30 milliseconds of delay from your acknowledgement, and that's too much for a lot of applications. After the acknowledgement is done, the data is uh, copied to the original destination. So as you see here, we have four volumes for a stretched Date a volume. So four volumes instead of one for a stretched value. And we have some requirements. The latency between the sites should be below five milliseconds, and the log volumes have to be on flash storage. If we don't, um, if if we can't uh, promise these requirements, if the delay is longer than five milliseconds, or um, you uh, have also the possibility uh, to use asynchronous replication. How does that work? We have our application. It writes a block. The block is written to the lock and the, the write is acknowledged. And then the data is transferred to the destination node, written to the lock, acknowledged, and then it is written to the data. But we don't wait on the other side. So the uh, asynchronous replication is immediately, you don't have the delay, but you have also your data on the other side. It's not there immediately, but it's maybe a delay of two seconds or 30 seconds or whatever. So it's a continuous replication, but you don't have the guarantee that every write is on the other side. But it's also not bad because if you have a disaster on the source side, you maybe are missing 
let's say 30 seconds of your data. That's much better than restoring a backup from the night that uh, that includes maybe uh, does not include six, eight hours of data you have done. Uh, you have already changed in the VM. OK. So let's create a stretched volume. Do a demo where we create a stretched volume. So we go to. Uh, Oh, we can do it here. We can go to volume in uh, the uh, Windows Admin Center, and you see we have already four total, uh, four volumes, and these volumes are the very important cluster performance history. So if you create a stretched cluster, where is my mouse here? Yeah, it's very small. Uh, so if you create if you create an Azure Stack HCI cluster, a stretched one, you get your cluster performance history already stretched because it's important and we don't want to miss all our data from all VMs, from all data, uh, from all uh, disks, from all volumes. So Microsoft creates a stretched volume. And here you see the four, uh, four um, CSVs we get with that. So now we create a new stretched volume. So I click on create. And here we. It will gather some information and we have now the possibility to create a volume in a single site for my exchange DAG or my um, SQL always on cluster. No, we want to create a replicate replicated volume across two sites and then we can specify where where is it online in west or east so if it's in west uh, it will create it will be created in west and replicated to east uh, or the other way around so maybe if you create multiple volumes you spread them over the sites for an active active design uh, we just do it from east to west because east is first here and then we can choose which replication uh, mode do we want an asynchronous or asynchronous? And of course, you can change that uh, later. So you can change from synchronous to asynchronous or from asynchronous to synchronous after the fact. So it's not, it's, uh, you can do that later. So I will call it stretched volume. And now we can choose the resiliency. And this is a four node cluster. So we have only the possibility to do a two way mirror in each side. If you want to, to, to do something like a nested mirror or a, a nested uh, nested resiliency, we, we have to do it in PowerShell. Um, but for the demo here, we do a two-way mirror. And I say it's a 400, not terabyte, it's a 400 giga, a gigabyte volume. So then we have some advanced options here. And you see, our volume is called stretch volume, so it will create replication groups from the name with group and replication group and a log volume size. And best practice, it turned out at least to 100 gig or better 200 gig for your real world uh, um, stretched volume. So the the proposed 40 gigabits is much too less. So do 200 or even 500 gigabit if you have a 10 terabyte volume. And then we can do some other things here, but we can't do BitLocker and so on. And now I, I go to create. So I press create. What will the uh, Windows Admin Center do now? It will first create the stretched volume in site east. Then it will create the stretched volume lock in site east. Then it will create the stretched volume in site west. And this is offline. And it will create a stretched volume. Um, no, it will create a stretched volume replica in West and it will create a stretched volume replica lock in West. And that will take a bit and it will also um, install a running storage replica. So we will come back to this one uh, and I will show you that uh, in a demo or I go to another, another cluster that is prepared for that. And if we look here, and look on the volumes and the volumes we have eight. Here you see. We have our cluster performance history, our stretched volume, stretched volume log and stretched volume replica and stretched volume replica log. And if we click on storage replica, 
we can look at the replication status of the storage replica partnership and there should be one partnership for the cluster performance history and one partnership for our stretched volume and it is continuous replicating we can uh, look into some details here we see it's uh, synchronous here it is synchronous and we can if we want to can go to settings and here we can modify the partner settings so we could switch it to asynchronous or from asynchronous to synchronous. We can increase the log size. It's a 200 vo uh, uh, gigabyte volume, so I would advise to do more here. Is it? No, it's. I think here it's only only a 100 gig. Okay, but I think you got the impression how it works. So let's go back to the presentation. I have still 10 minutes. Maybe I need a little bit more. So there are some PowerShell commandlets to help us with uh, the replication. And to be honest, in the moment with Windows Admin Center, you can't delete a replicated volume, or at least you can't delete it fully. So you need some PowerShell commandlets, for example, to delete uh, the partnership. Yeah? Uh, and uh, I hope it will be added in the Windows Admin Center module, but in the moment you need some PowerShell. And there are plenty of PowerShell uh, commandlets we have for example for the storage replica we have a test sr topology where we can first test if a replication would work especially in a stretch cluster that is uh, is a far distance stretch cluster we can look at the replica status there are replication groups uh, uh, you can with get storage replica groups you can look at the status and see them and there are the partnerships so you can also get get as our partnership and there is a set and the new and the remove of course then if your synchronization stops for what reason ever for example your internet went down for two days uh, then of course your uh, synchronization stop because the logs are full and you maybe want to manually resync it there is a powershell commandlet for that then a very important thing you have to specify which um, network cards are used for the replications. Microsoft has some very strict strict requirements for the storage replication networks and you have to, uh, for your storage replication groups, you have to specify which networks are used. Um, very important. Then we can delegate uh, admin rights. Uh, so you don't have to be domain administrator if you want to care about the storage uh, replication. There are possibilities to grant rights and revoke rights. And we can limit the bandwidth, how many bandwidth the storage replication can use bytes in bytes per second. Um, Usually we have to have a very fast replication network where you where you that you don't share with other stuff. So you don't have to limit the replication bandwidth. You have to guarantee that your replication can always happen. Otherwise, you have some problems. So let's uh, let's move a VM and the volume to show you. That was a question when I first introduced. Uh, st uh, st um, stretch cluster before it was available. We, we we knew last year that the stretch cluster scenario will be available and people asked me in, in webinars, um, can you move a VM around without a, a fail? Yes, you can do that and I want to show you that. So I go back to the demo. Here in this cluster, we have a running replication and I have deployed one small benchmark VM into, um, into this stretched volume. So if we look in the Hyper-V settings here, and you see we have it in stretched in the stretched volume. There are our disks yeah, in C cluster storage, stretched volume, small benchmark. And now I saw I, I missed something. I didn't include the VM in the cluster. I will add that. Uh, so I have to connect to the cluster. I'm on two. It's the cluster is called AZHCI2 cluster. So this is live. And I open the cluster. 
the good thing is all the old tooling is, is still working. And if I go to roles, there is nothing. And I will configure a role. Just a virtual machine. The cluster will look on the hypervisors, which roles are not included in the cluster yet. So I add the small benchmark VM and then we have it in the cluster. So here we are. It's running on the second on the first node. You see that here and our stretch cluster going to Windows Admin Center to show you. Clicked wrong to show you the servers and under servers we should see under inventory where each node is. So we have an east and the west side. No, we can't see that here, right? Uh, so we go to Windows Admin Center under nodes. Here are the sides. So the first node and the second node are in east and the third and the fourth node are in west. So our, our VM is running on node one in east in the volume called stretched volume. And stretched volume is also the owner is uh, the node one where also the VM is running. So now I want to move the VM to the other side. So let's do a live migration here. Move, live migrate and select. So if I choose best possible node, it will move it automatically to node two because it's in the same site. And if I then again uh, live migrate and uh, let him choose where to move, it will move it back to one. So the VM will stay in the same site where the storage is. And if you if you let a VM move it to the other side, that's now uh, the case I have now running the VM on uh, in the other side. Um, it will the cluster will move it back to the site where the storage is. So the VM is following the storage. After a while, it will move it back automatically. So now we have the VM running in site west, and uh, the storage is in site east. And we can see that if we look at storage replica here. It's much easier in. I, I like the Windows Admin Center uh, and I always use Windows Admin Center unless I don't have the feature I need, like moving a VM on purpose. You can't do that in Windows Admin Center in a cluster in the moment. So here you see we have our replication from node one to node three. And now I click here. Let's see what what happened with the VM. It's now running on the other side and I will I say here switch directions switch directions and maybe he asked me for something. So here we see the VM. It's switching directions and we will see two things. The IO will halt in, on a hardware cluster. This is a virtual machine cluster on a hardware cluster to for five to six seconds. Then we ha will have IO again. Here it maybe takes longer because this is a nested virtualization cluster. Then the IO will, uh, will be there again and then it will halt for another five to six seconds. Here, unfortunately, it takes longer, uh, but in real world, I've done this multiple times. Uh, um, so you will have an I.O. hold for five to six seconds and another one, but your VM is running here. You see the another one, um, but after, let's say, 30 seconds, your VM, the, the storage is on the other side. We have you have two small five to six seven I.O. pauses and then the VM is running on the other side and now it will rebuild the replication. Yeah. So uh, replicating some blocks back to the other side. OK, let's go on. I, I'm nearly done. So um, with the time at least. So now some important network requirements. And Microsoft was a little bit late to um, uh, to document the network requirements for a stretch cluster. So in in the site, so here we see an eight node stretch cluster, four nodes in site A, four nodes in site B. In the sites, you can do SMB3 over SMB direct, so with RDMA for the storage replication between, not storage replications, uh, excuse me, for the software, software 
bus layer, so the storage bus, when, when you have your extends, your VM writes into extend and you have a three way uh, mirror, the, the data must be uh, written also to other nodes. For, for that, we use SMB direct preferably. Um, switchless is also supported in the site, so you can connect the four nodes with a lot of cables uh, without switches. So for the replication network between the sites, we need a fast low latency network. That's important. Low latency because if you do synchronous replication and you have a high latency network, it adds to your I.O. because it adds the milliseconds to the I.O. Microsoft does not support RDMA for the replication traffic. Indeed, Microsoft wants to have separate adapters for the replication traffic with no other traffic on them. Yeah, I have some support cases where, where that is clarified, no other traffic than the replication traffic on those adapters. And only SMB over TCP IP. And we have to have layer three routing. Microsoft does not support a layer two IP network between the sites, even if there is only one small wall between the two sites and you can perfectly have a layer two uh, network. Microsoft requires a routing instance, so you have to have routing in your switches or in your firewall for the replication traffic. It's not supported to have a layer two network. No layer two network is supported. I'm I'm talking to Microsoft because in a small stretch cluster with, with small distances, it would be much easier to have a layer two IP network instead of doing routing in switches and so on. And we have to add our constrained network. Uh, so the storage replica constrained network uh, for the replication uh, group. Otherwise, the network is going over another net and it, it does not prefer the routed networks. Uh, usually it uses the management network or so. You want to have your replication traffic on the separate networks. That's very important. I will maybe do another webinar about that because I'm doing in the moment, uh, I've done the last months some stretch clusters. What about dot 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 in stretch cluster? Azure Kubernetes services. In the moment, Azure Kubernetes services are not supported in a stretch cluster scenario. And that's a huge miss in the moment because um, if we do Azure Kubernetes services on Azure Stack HCI, people want to stretch them. They want to have high availability or even disaster recovery possibilities for the uh, containers. Software defined networking doesn't work, it's not supported in a stretch cluster scenario. It's only supported in a non-stretched cluster scenario. BitLocker, it works. So I have a customer where I implemented BitLocker on the on the stretched uh, volumes, but you have to do it by hand. So with PowerShell and some commands you have to do on the host. Uh, in, in a remote desktop session on the host, it, it is not working um, remotely where you use invoke command or something. Integrity checksums. I don't know, actually. I have some questions for the product group. Integrity checks them. You can't configure them for the data part of your of your stretch volume. So there's no um, in admin center. There's no possibility for that. Uh, uh, um, Manfred will show you that you can do that very nicely. BitLocker and integrity checksums if you create a volume in a not stretched scenario. Deduplication, same. I don't know if it's supported. At least you can't configure it with Windows Admin Center. But in the moment, I would. I would say don't use the duplication. So now um, disaster demo we skip. Uh, uh, I will because we have only some minutes left. And are there questions? A lot of questions. OK, then we go to the a lot of questions. Uh, Helmut did a great job. He already answered a lot of them, but uh, maybe it's interesting to take them or some of them on audio. Yeah, so ask, ask away. Oh, okay. I have, we have. Let's say six, seven minutes, and then 
Okay, so let's see which questions we have here where we will start. So uh, there are some questions about Windows Admin Center. I will take them in the next session. Yes. I think this is a good idea so we don't forget them. There are comments about Windows Admin Center. We will take them uh, later so you can show we have them here. Um, so there was a question when you were presenting, Carsten, can we change the resiliency from two-way to three-way mirror? That's a great one and uh, thank you for that question. And uh, it's um, so the, the technical answer or the, the marketing answer would be yes, you can not change, but you can go from a two way mirror to a three way mirror. Um, but if you want a technical answer, not really. So how do you change? from a two-way to a three-way mirror, there is no built-in possibility to do that with Windows Admin Center or even with PowerShell. But you can, of course, create a new three-way mirror stretched volume, or even uh, if you don't have a stretch scenario, it's also not possible, but you can create, if you have space, a new three-way uh, stretched or not stretched volume. Then you move with storage migration, your workload from the two-way mirror to the three-way mirror, and then you can delete your two-way mirror. So that's a workaround that can help you, but Microsoft has no possibility yet. And maybe it's a, it's a feature that will come in the future, but in the moment you can't do an, 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 an upgrade of a two-way mirror to a three-way mirror. So if you, if you add nodes and you have a four node cluster and you have a two-way mirror, uh, the volumes, if you extend them and even extending a volume I, I haven't managed to extend a stretched volume so far, even not with PowerShell. I, it I was not able. So, but if you would could do that, it would still be a two-way mirror. So you had you have three nodes with two-way mirror, and you have to create new ones. So, unfortunately, no. Okay. Long answer for no. Yes. <laughs> the next one locks on flash. Is that a dedicated drives, or can the cache drives be used? Um. No, you can't use the cache drives. Uh, if you look at Azure Stack HCR, there are different possibilities. So if you have more than two tiers, so for example, uh, SSDs and NVMEs or HDDs and SSDs, the SSDs can't be used for, for the flash. You have to have separate um, yeah, flash drives. So you can't use HDDs for your storage replica or you can use them because the cache is used in front of it and you have a fast write. You, so, so I would say, yes, you can use them, but Microsoft is not clear about that. Um, the requirements for storage replica are old. They are from 2016 and I haven't haven't seen, seen Microsoft change them. So yes, you can use HDDs with caching devices and every write is going to the cache device. So it's fast, uh, so you can use them, yes. Yes. OK, so then I, I didn't uh, catch this in your presentation. Here's a question for node switch list. Carsten mentioned four node switch list, but um, aren't only three nodes supported? No, you can also build four nodes. Yeah, list. Microsoft uh, at Ignite 2019, my, there was no talk about Azure Stack HCI so fast. It was still all about storage basis direct Microsoft. On Ignite 2019 said in a session, we also support not only two node, that's, that was supported forever. We support three node, we support four node, and we support five node switchless. You have a humongous amount of cables behind your servers if you want to do it redundant. Um, and I assume that it's also supported for Azure Stack HCI, but uh, but in the in the docs, it's there there is switchless stated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but we have really to ask Microsoft about a support statement for a stretch last cluster, but it works technology and uh, te technology wise it works, um, but we don't have a support statement, I think. I, is, I says Dell supports four node switchless. Yeah, but if Microsoft is not supported for four nodes, uh, Jaromir, um, you are not allowed to use more than two RDMA cards or two cards in in a cluster, so you it would be only one port to the nodes, right? I want to have two ports between the nodes. So if you have four nodes switchless, you have to have six ports in every server for uh, the switchless, and then add another, more cards. But this is a complete different topic. <laughs> um, 
Maybe we can talk it later on the Q&A, maybe. Uh, or not the Q&A, uh, the roundtable. The roundtable. Yeah, we can take this one to the roundtable. Yeah. This is a good topic because Do we have yeah, more. We have more. Um, we have um, one. What's the I think the question is not uh, correct here. The, the question is, what is the minimum number of nodes failure we can tolerate in 60 node cluster? Uh, it I think it must yeah. be what is the maximum number of nodes? Yeah, we, uh, so in yeah. a 16 node cluster, if it's not stretched, yes. two nodes can fail, not three. Uh, to be honest, you can have failures in two fault domains, not in three. So even three disks in different nodes is a disaster. There are things to mitigate that fast uh, parallel rebuild and so on. But uh, in a non stretch cluster 60 nodes, only two nodes, two fault domains can have failures. If you have a stretch cluster, two 60 nodes stretched, you have eight nodes on each side. Two nodes can si two nodes can uh, have failures in one side. So you have eight nodes in one side. Two of them can have failures. If three fault domains have failures, um, you switch over to your other side. Yeah. So in, in a stretch cluster, you can have more, more failure than in a non-stretch cluster. But in essence, I would not build a 60 node cluster, period. Period. Perfect. So one uh, is here. Layer two for stretched VMs is supported? Question uh, mark. What do you mean with layer two for stretched VMs? Uh, VMs for the replication traffic. No layer two is supported. Only routing layer three. Huh? Uh, stretched VMs. Uh, you have to clarify what you mean. But Azure Stack HCI is always a cluster with VMs. There's no other supported scenario like file server or so, like converged. It's always a cluster with VMs. Huh? So yeah. layer two for uh, the replication traffic is not supported. You can yeah. have layer two for your VM communication, of course, but not for the replication traffic. Yeah. I think you had the information in your uh, presentation. TCPA IP generates a lot of CPO overhead on Hyper-V hosts, on fast networks, 100 gigabit and above. So is there RDMA support for replication traffic no. on the roadmap? No. Oh, the question is on the roadmap. So actually no. it's not there? Um, no, I, I, so let me, let me uh, phrase it differently. Um, so far, I had talks with Microsoft, ex uh, especially about the replication traffic, because uh, of course, in the first projects I've done, I'd used RDMA in a, in a cluster scenario on, 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 on a campus where the clusters are only 100 meters apart or so. We used RDMA for that. It's not supported. Microsoft's statement in the moment is, RDMA is only supported in one rack. If you leave the rack, it's not supported. Yeah, so I don't think that we will ever get RDMA supported for the replication traffic. And to be honest, usually you don't have the churn uh, of where you need 100 gigabit in a cluster. Yeah, it's a lot of data that has to be written. So the block is only transferred one, not three times. Yeah? So Unfortunately, no RMA support so far for uh, replication traffic, and I don't see Microsoft change that in the near future, at least. Okay. Do we have time for some additional questions? Yes. Should we? You start. You have the next session, so if you yeah. want to, we can still do three minutes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, Helmut, I mentioned this already. Answered some questions in the chat. We will also answer additional questions after this Q and A. There's a Q and A after each session, and if you cannot take all the questions here via audio, we will try to do it in the chat. Uh, we have one here in a scalable architecture. Can we upgrade from two nodes cluster to three nodes without rebuilding the cluster? I think it's not related to, to stretched. It's uh, yeah. related to it. So let's, let's say that you can add nodes to an Azure Stack HCI cluster from two to three, from three to four, and so on. If you have a stretch cluster, you have at least four nodes, so two at each side. You can also add one node on each side. Uh, you can do that. You don't have to rebuild the cluster. Um, your data is still there. It will be spread over all nodes. That's perfect, but it will not change the resiliency of your volume. So there was a question before that. If you want to do that, you have to create a new volume and move your data. Yes, okay. 
I think this were most of the questions. Did he had a comment about this RDMA topic, but I think we should discuss this later and uh, maybe take it to the round table also. OK, yeah. Yeah, thanks so far for watching. Um, so um, at least let me do one uh, small addition before you start. Um, uh, my company, the Rachval IT solution, is uh, implementing and tr doing trainings about Azure Stack HCI, but also storage bases direct in Hyper-V. So if you need maybe help with an implementation, um, you find my uh, you find us under rachval.de. So Rachval is my last name. But now I would say Helmut, not Helmut. I'm a little bit done. Manfred takes the stage and uh, present about Azure Stack HCI uh, with Windows Admin Center. OK, I will try so because I have now to do the, the video switching stuff and the presentation and the live demo. And so maybe sometimes I need your support, Carson, and maybe Carson, you can have a, a look with one eye on the chat on your Teams client because uh, this one will be maybe hidden or something yeah, and you I have it do. also here for the questions and the, oh, you can check if I um, yeah took the questions all accordingly or if you want to change something here. OK, so let's see. I want to share my screen also and I have a lot of screens here and I want to share this one here. I would say so. Maybe this works. Mm -hmm. No, this actually is the wrong one. I have to scroll down so many. It's the screen two. Now we have the right one. OK, so let's share my screen. So also welcome to Azure Stack HCI days from um, yeah, uh, organized by Carsten here. And my name is Manfred. Carsten already introduced me and I would talk about configuring Azure Stack HCI with Windows Admin Center. Let's say more the basic things. Um, so Carsten already showed you Windows Admin Center and the stretch cluster um, yeah, specific topics. And I want to show you how to configure Azure Stack HCI with Windows Admin Center. And we had some comments and uh, questions about Windows Admin Center in the chat already, in the Q&A already. And I will try to take them also. And I added some slides about Windows Admin Center itself because there were also some strategic questions I initially didn't plan to talk about. So when we go to the Windows Admin Center basic things, when we talk about what is Windows Admin Center, uh, what it is for, what uh, do we do with Windows Admin Center, then we can say Windows Admin Center is a small installation. It's a web-based application um, we use to manage our Windows-based IT in our network. It's, let's say from, from my point of view, it's focused on Windows Server, but we can also manage Windows Client with it. Um, it's a very small installer. It's only 60 megabytes of size, actually. We don't need Internet Information Server. We don't need a SQL Server or things like this. Um, we only use a small installer that brings everything um, in the installation package. And we are very flexible regarding the connectivity. So we can use a modern browser like Microsoft Edge or Google Chrome uh, to connect here. And we do not need any Azure or um, internet connectivity to work with Windows Admin Center. For sure, we need to download it, but um, we we don't need a connectivity after downloading, installing the Windows Admin Center, except when we want to update the Windows Admin Center, then we have advantages when we have an internet connection, uh, but it would also be offline, impossible to bring uh, packages, extension packages and so on offline to the Windows Admin Center. Um, the management is done on the target host without installation of any agents. So you don't need any agent installation there. This is a great thing. This is uh, very helpful to use it in an existing environment where you don't want to choose uh, to change anything. And the whole uh, management activities are sent via PowerShell remote and uh, WinRM remote to the managed hosts. And there are different ways how to implement Windows Admin Center. Um, my preferred option is to have an 
management server, dedicated VM or physical host you use for management. You will need a server for backup and things like this. And this is the reason why I would recommend this management host or management server, but it would also be possible to install Windows Admin Center directly onto a client you use for management. So there you will have the situation, you have this small web application locally, and you will also run the browser for accessing this uh, locally. Um, you could install it on a managed node, but there you have several dependencies where it's not possible. It's for example, not supported on a domain controller. Uh, you will run into issues if there are other websites servers present there and so on. There is an high available option. My preferred option is the second one we see here, the dedicated gateway server, the dedicated uh, management server. And this is the way I use it in my live demo in a few minutes. The only um, thing where I have some yeah, um, optimizations for the demo here, I don't have one or more clients where I access the Windows Admin Center via the web browser, I use a web browser directly on the server. I wouldn't recommend this because uh, regarding uh, the security, um, we would be very, very clear in the discussion that it's not recommended to use the web browser directly on the server, but I think you agree it's easier for us in the live demo not always to switch between server, target server, and a client where I manage from. Um, and this is the reason why I use the web browser directly on this management server. I will use the Edge browser. Um, you you um, are free to only choose uh, to also choose the Google Chrome. The installation of Windows Admin Center is possible on the actual latest Windows Server operating system versions. We can run it on Windows Server 2022. This is my scenario. I have installation of Windows Admin Center on Windows Server 2022. We can also use 2019, 2016. The target servers are um, yeah, Windows Server 2012 and later, and for sure, Azure Stack HCI. In my scenario, I will not use Windows Admin Center to configure any um, Windows Server services, traditional services, roles, file services, and things like this. I want to show you how to configure storage spaces direct based on Azure Stack HCI with the Windows Admin Center. And what you should see is my demo environment here. I have a physical host where I run several virtual machines. To give you a short um, uh, impression about the demo environment we will use, we have this Windows Admin Center 01 machine. This is my Windows Admin Center host. I have a server 11. This is, for example, my domain controller for this environment. Um, I have several other servers we are actually not using. I have a traditional storage spaces direct cluster. We will not use this uh, in this live demo because we will focus on Azure Stack HCI. And in this um, environment, I have to choose here. I will use these two nodes here. Um, these are virtual machines. So for um, yeah, um, having some uh, easier uh, things in the live demo, I'm working on the virtual machines because in the physical hosts, we always have the physical hardware checks and it takes much more time. And here in the virtual machines, um, uh, I will be a little bit more effective in configuring the things. And I think it's absolutely um, fine for us to see what happens in this configuration of um, Azure Stack HCI and the technology storage spaces direct with Windows Admin Center. So um, to, to, to give you an impression, if you are new to Azure Stack HCI, when I connect to one of these nodes, for example, Azure Stack HCI node 02, then um, I think you already know that Azure Stack HCI is always a server core installation. So you don't have the full Windows graphical user interface we see on my host. My physical host here um, is a Windows Server 2022, and for sure it has a graphical user interface. Um, you can also install the Windows Server 2022 as a server core, but this is your choice. In Azure Stack HCI, 
you always have the server core installation. So for sure, I could do the configuration here via PowerShell um, directly at the host or via remote PowerShell, but um, the feedback of many partners and customers is we prefer a graphical user interface. And this is the reason why I want to show you how to use the Windows Admin Center. If you prefer PowerShell, so you feel free. You can do this. You can use your um, yeah, uh, well-known scripts and your already tested scripts. So you don't have to switch to Windows Admin Center. Today, I'm not sure what uh, what are the plans on the roadmap in the far future. We already had Microsoft technologies in the past where Microsoft said, please use the wizards we provide because if you don't use the wizards, maybe we are not able to manage it completely. This is not the message today. Today the message is you can use your well-known PowerShell stuff, you're fine, or you can use the ease of Windows Admin Center if you like this, and I will show you in the live demo now how it works, give you an impression how it works, because on Windows Admin Center, my experience is that I often hear, ah, yeah, Windows Admin Center, I tried this um, and I've seen there were some features missing. I uh, need for my configuration, for my scenario. And so I switched back to PowerShell or to my traditional tools. And as Carsten mentioned, Windows Admin Center um, is available in, uh, yeah, uh, in a, in a, as a service model. So we get updates once or twice a year. And actually, the latest version is version 2103.2. And this is the version my demos are running on. It should be the latest build here. And I already updated some extensions in the Windows Admin Center. If you already worked with Windows Admin Center, you know in the settings here, so um, we can um, choose the option of the extensions. And in this extension list, you can install extensions of yeah, software and hardware partners. So Carsten mentioned the sponsors of the show and all sponsors that will be here in these two days have extensions for the Windows Admin Center so that you can also manage some of their um, hardware stuff. Um, and if you have the, 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 the Microsoft components, something like, for example, for us relevant, the cluster management things, then you can see here if you uh, should install an update. Here actually we see the, the extensions that are available. And for example, for PowerShell, I can see here, oh, there's an update available and I could install this update here, but I don't need this actually, so we will not uh, spend any time on updating this. I already updated the relevant um, yeah, um, extensions we will need for this wizard here. So here we can see in Windows Admin Center the list of servers we can manage. And uh, I already told you we can uh, do a traditional server management. So for example, I could manage here my uh, file server 02. The D114 file server 02 is my file server in this environment. But this is not the target. We want to work on the Azure Stack HCI nodes. Um, in my scenario, they are already added to the list of servers, to the connection list, but this is not necessary to be able to configure an Azure Stack HCI cluster. So the first step is we click on add in this um, yeah, Windows Admin Center um, yeah, uh, page and in the server clusters here, we have um, the add if we already have a created cluster. So if our Azure Stack HCI cluster is already um, ready, uh, then we can add this cluster to um, our Windows Admin Center to manage it, to manage volumes and things like this. I will do later and we can create new and create new is the interesting thing because Create new is not brand new. We have this for several months already, but it's a new thing. We didn't have this in Windows Server 2016 when Storage Spaces Direct started, and we didn't have this in Windows Server 2019 when Storage Spaces Direct continued, and it was a new feature for Azure Stack HCI. And this is the important message here. When I go to create new, there's a choice 
between Windows Server deploy a failover cluster to run VMs or cluster roles and apps on Windows Server. And there's a second choice, Azure Stack HCI, deploy a hyper-converged cluster to run VMs on Azure Stack HCI. There is no choice, deploy an, an hyper-converged cluster based on Windows Server. And I think you are familiar with the Microsoft HCI um, yeah, configuration options you have. You can choose for storage spaces direct in Windows Server 2022 or um, 2019 or 2016. So it's storage spaces direct in Windows Server data center edition where you can enable the hyper-converged infrastructure features. The new opportunity since December 2020 is to use the Azure Stack HCI operating system. In Azure Stack HCI, we also have storage spaces direct with extended features, but with a different licensing model. Windows Server is a, per, is a, is a permanent license and Azure Stack HCI is a pay-per-use um, based on the number of cores you have in your physical hardware. The technology storage space is direct is in both of them, but Windows Admin Center says, okay, you can configure hyperconverged with Azure Stack HCI, or you can configure traditional with Windows Server. If you want to configure hyperconverged infrastructure with Windows Server data center, you have to do it the old style way, so you have to um, yeah, you have to use um, PowerShell and the traditional uh, tools and so on. Okay, so when we um, switch to Azure Stack HCI, this is what we have to do here. And it's very important because I had a support call a few days ago where um, a customer tried to configure um, storage spaces direct with this wizard on a traditional Windows server. And um, you will not be successful with, with this because this is not a scenario that is planned in this wizard. So I choose Azure Stack HCI and as Carsten mentioned, I can um, select all servers in one side. This is what I will do. I will build a small two node Azure Stack HCI cluster. And I think this matches perfectly to what uh, Helmut Otto will present tomorrow from SMB to data center. We can start very small and we can scale up to several clusters and nodes in a larger scale here. Carsten already mentioned he wouldn't uh, build a 60 node cluster. I absolutely agree. I would always build uh, some smaller clusters with, for example, four nodes. Um, but uh, in my scenario, all the servers are in one side. Um, what Carsten already presented in his session, um, in, in the previous session, was servers in two sides, so the stretch cluster scenario. So we will go to all servers in one side and we will go a bit in detail to what happens in this wizard because what you will see, the wizard is really cool designed, but it's a wizard if you have different ideas how you configure it and you are absolutely sure that this configuration you prefer is supported, but it's not provided by the wizard. Yeah, then you will not be happy with this one. Let's have a look what the steps are. All servers in one side I want to create based on Azure Stack HCI. So what we see here is deployment of Azure Stack HCI cluster in seven, um, sorry, in five uh, big major steps. And we have a lot of um, sub steps here. So for example, for the get started part, we have seven uh, individual steps that are yeah, configured, that are checked. So where I have seven individual steps I have to go through to finish this get started part. Um, I have a lot of information here. I have a lot of links to docs.microsoft.com and I'm often asked about uh, books about Microsoft technologies and so on. I would always recommend to first go to docs.microsoft.com and the important thing is um, in docs.microsoft.com you have two sections. You have one where you get the information about um, yeah, storage spaces direct and one for Azure Stack HCI. So in this situation where we are 
focused on Azure Stack HCI, you should really um, prefer the Azure Stack HCI documentation. Many of the topics are the same, the situation, how you create volumes and how you work with it, but some things are really different. So first step, I will go to next because I have to add servers. What is already here are my credentials. I need username and password of a user that um, is able to connect to the servers. I already have entered this in a previous session, so we don't need to do this. Here. First is I have to add my nodes and I will do this here. I have the D114, this is my demo environment and I have an, a, an Azure Stack HCI node 01. So this is my first server I want to add it here and the wizard says I found this server in the domain mhdemolab.de and I can add this server. I will do so. I will add this server to the list of the servers and I will add the second one d114 minus Azure Stack HCI node 02 and the great thing is there are a lot of things already checked here. So it checks the server names, the status. Is the server ready? Is the operating system fine? And uh, the model, is it uh, from yeah, one of our sponsors? Is it from Lenovo, from Dell Technologies, from Fujitsu? Or in my case, it's a Microsoft virtual machine. Um, the important thing about the model is for you, um, I think you know, and we have some presentations about this in the two days, is there are certified solutions for Azure Stack HCI and they are integrated systems. And you have when you have an integrated system, you have some advanced capabilities in this wizard. Um, you always should uh, use a uh, uh, validated node, so a certified node for Azure Stack HCI. And here you can see the model and you can see if it's really um, one of these systems I absolutely recommend it and also Microsoft recommends. The next step, join to a domain. I already prepared this because you know domain join needs a restart and restart. These are virtual machines, but also in the virtual machines we would have 30 seconds to one minute till they are back uh, in my configuration here. And so this is the reason why I already joined them. If they are not joined, I can see this here and the wizard will do the domain join for me. Next step, installation of features. If you are familiar with storage spaces direct in Windows Server and or Azure Stack HCI, you know that you have some requirements for the implementation of storage spaces direct. We need failover clustering. Carsten already explained this. Uh, we always have a cluster behind Storage Spaces Direct. So it's not a new, totally different thing. It is built on the foundation of Windows clustering. And so we need the failover cluster feature. Um, we need for the hyperconverged scenario, Hyper-V, we need it for the switches with switch embedded teaming and so on. Um, so um, we need the Hyper-V role. Um, to be able to configure everything we need here, the, um, the Active Directory stuff and the Hyper-V stuff, we need the PowerShell modules for both of them. Um, the uh, data data application is optional, but if it's not installed, you cannot use the data application on the volume. So this is the reason why it's always on the list. And here we have the data center uh, bridging and BitLocker drive encryption. We have several sessions about networking in these two days. I think they will, you will hear something about this also. The data center bridging um, is, for example, required if you use um, RDMA with a Rocky-based implementation um, to ensure that you have the prioritization of the traffic, the capability of prioritizing the traffic here. You see here, everything is installed. If not, this wizard will do the installation on the nodes and you can stay in this with a wizard here because you can see here's a refresh. If there would be something missing, I would have the button install the required features, then the features are installed, the nodes restart, and then I can refresh my list here and uh, continue here. The next step is installation of updates. 
And here the wizard uh, checks if there are new updates at Microsoft and I can install them. The recommendation is in a real life implementation to install these updates. I can exactly see what it is. So let's check what uh, is missing. I have a cumulative update here and I have a cumulative update for Azure Stack HCI 20H2. Important thing about this here, Azure Stack HCI 20H2 is the actual version, but the Azure Stack HCI 21H2 is already available as a preview. It's a public preview. If you want to test uh, Azure Stack HCI version 21H2, you always install first 20H2, and then you have similar to the insider configuration in Windows Client, the option to um, yeah, switch from the um, latest supported version to the insider version or the preview version of Azure Stack HCI, and then this is installed via an update. This works very, very well. Okay, I will not install the updates here because this will take some time and I can do this afterwards. We don't need, I don't need these updates to show you how the um, implementation, the configuration works. Then we have install hardware updates. And this is a great point here because we will see, oh, um, we recommend to check this again. Um, we can't find any um, hardware updates. I can retry here. And when I read this text completely, I can see here, um, that these hardware updates are available um, with uh, the integrated systems and the systems where this is provided. So, um, yeah, here is the text. This could be because your cluster isn't an integrated system. So there are several levels of um, yeah, certification for Azure Stack HCI solutions and systems. The validated node ensures that everything works. The integrated systems give you some advantages. And if I would have an integrated system here as a platform for the live demo, I would see here, for example, firmware updates, driver updates for my hardware. And this is a great advantage because if I don't have this, let's imagine my two virtual machines would be physical hosts, then I would have to ensure that these versions are on the level I need them. So I can do this manually for sure, but it's great to have this here. So next step, restart of the service. Here the um, wizard checks if I need um, to um, restart any of the nodes. I see here one question, is your Windows Admin Center server joined to the domain? Yes. In my environment, all the nodes I'm working on are joined to my virtual domain. The domain is um, based on Windows Server 2022 already, but it would also work with an, late, uh, with an earlier, with an older Active Directory domain level. Um, my Windows Admin Center is domain joined. My Azure Stack HCI nodes were domain joined. If they weren't domain joined, the wizard would have done this. Um, and um, yes. If I would access via a client, I also so would join this to the domain in the live demo. It would also be possible to work with a non-domain joint um, yeah, version. So next, networking. Networking is a very, very important uh, part of this configuration with it. And the first uh, question is, asked me, do you want to remove existing virtual switches? Yes, I want. I'm using these two nodes very often for live demos and I'm resetting them afterwards. And sometimes I forget to remove some switches and this um, wizard here um, supports me to clean up the environment. I'm what what I often hear about uh, the storage spaces direct and the Azure Stack HCI implementation that many customers, partners and technicians are a little bit afraid of this networking part. I'm not sure what the reason for it is, maybe because at the, the beginning of Storage Spaces Direct, not everything was documented very clear. And so maybe somebody or many of uh, us run in first issues there. Um, the great thing about the wizard is um, it um, eases this network part 
Uh, absolutely, because you can see here, first it checks network adapters. This is what happens actually um, here in my environment. Then I select the management adapters. For sure, I need some adapters, minimum one, maybe more for redundancy, to manage the host operating systems. Then step 2.3, the virtual switches are created. Then step 2.4, RDMA is configured. RDMA is absolutely supported. And I remember um, that I um, delivered several hands-on uh, workshops and training on the job uh, uh, things where we uh, configured storage spaces direct and where we had to use several tools to implement RDMA, PowerShell, and then to test if RDMA works. And this is now in this wizard. So if you say, OK, I have an understanding what are the requirements for RDMA are, but I don't have a list uh, of these uh, tools I have to use. It's all in here. The last step, 2.5, uh, define the networks. So here we decide which network is used for um, SMB and which one is for virtual machine traffic. So when we have a look here at one of the machines, I have configured several network adapters in these uh, virtual machines. I have here one adapter. There's already a name on it. It's management. This adapter, I will choose this one here, the first one for the management network uh, later. And then we have three network adapters, Ethernet 2, 3 and 4. I will use two of them for SMB, for the storage traffic, and one of them for the VM traffic. So, so the same configuration on the second host. You can see we can network adapters disable here. We can uh, include and exclude. We can enable, refresh, so you can um, work on your network configuration here. So select management adapters. Um, the wizard changes um, the um, selectable options based on your hardware configuration. Here, for example, I can see the second option is grayed out. I cannot configure um, a management network with two teamed network adapters. They would be teamed via switch embedded teaming because I only have one network adapter that is in my management network. So this is the only option I have here. If I were two adapters in the network, I could also choose the second option. It's clear this option would be recommended if you need uh, redundancy on the management network, what for a production environment would be recommended. Yes, I want to select the management network. I do this here in the list here. This is, I would say, a little bit uh, maybe not so directly clear. I have to read the full text to know that I can select these options here because the checkbox only appears if I'm um, yeah on this line with the network adapter. So the way how to do it, you move to the network adapter you want to select and then you can click it. Um, so if you have done this once, I think you will remember this. I select the two management network adapters. Now the great thing is it's not only apply here the button, it's apply and test. So the settings are applied and they are tested. And when I get this green sign here, changes are applied and they are successfully tested. I had once the situation uh, where this test was successful and I run in a problem later uh, based on the network. In all the other cases, and I had several demos and implementations, I um, always had the situation that this checks helped me a lot because now I can go to the next step, virtual switches. And here we have uh, three options. I could create one virtual switch for compute and storage together. I could create one virtual switch for compute only. We see the SMB traffic would go directly via the network adapters. And the third option would be create two virtual switches. Uh, Carsten, maybe I may ask you what's your preferred option here because I have one and I will use this preferred option here. <laughs> the Let's second see. one. 
Carson would use the second one. OK, so sorry, we are actually not on video because in the live demo, I think it's better if you have it on full screen. We will switch to the video later again. So Carson prefers the second one. I would also prefer the second one. Um, can you say what's the reason for you, Carson, that you prefer yeah, for, the for me, it's uh, in the second one. First to explain it, you, we have two adapters for our virtual switch for our VMs and maybe some virtual management uh, not here. And we have two separate adapters for our east west traffic or for our interconnect between the nodes and I use them directly. So why create a Hyper-V switch and then create virtual SMB adapters with RDMA? It's a lot of software involved. We yep. have a Hyper-V switch. We have the virtual RDMA adapter. You have to bind them to to the hardware adapters. Uh, and uh, a lot of software, there are maybe some problems in the software, so why not use them directly? Yeah. Yeah. For, do it simple, use them directly. Don't add a lot of uh, uh, layers uh, on top of the direct things. Yeah, this is also um, the, the way how I am thinking here. Um, because um, I, I often get the question uh, about storage spaces direct um, and the hyperconverged uh, thing itself is is it possible to have a fast storage here because we go over net, the network? And I always say we don't, uh, I usually don't see the limitations in the network when it's configured accordingly. We have network interface cards. I've seen a post uh, from Cosmos, I think so. He has some samples of network interface cards with 400 gigabit network speed. So I would say in the typical implementations I see in the field, it's 25 gigabits or maybe 100 gigabits uh, today, but this is usually not the bottleneck. The bottleneck is there if you don't plan your um, yeah your uh, workload you expect and this I, I see this maybe may happen um, here sometimes because you think okay I have the network interface cards I put them on one uh, virtual switch and I split off the traffic and it will go well here in the scenario Carsten mentioned he prefers and I will show you in the live demo you have always this dedicated connectivity um, with uh, two physical connections we use here the multi-channeling um, we don't need any teaming um, and so we can be sure these two ports are for my storage and so it's very easy to plan to calculate um, it's fine and as Carsten mentioned the third option also would give us these two dedicated ports or maybe more we can have up to up eight ports in this switch embedded teaming configuration but why should I add this software layer if I don't need it maybe you have some more flexibility so if you have a scenario where say i need this switch embedded teaming switch then you are fine then choose the third option but if you don't need this if you don't use any of this functionality my recommendation would also be to choose the second one here okay um maybe you have seen if i choose one of these scenarios something also changes on the bottom of this page and um, the text says me adapters you don't select can't be used by virtual machines but the host server can still use them for example storage spaces direct so what i choose here this means the text i'm choosing the network interfaces for the for the workload for the virtual machine traffic so what i choose here are the network interface card for the um for the first set team here so i'm choosing in this list below the adapters for this switch here and all the adapters i don't choose here are used for the storage traffic i can see here below and this is what the text means and in my configuration uh, in the virtual machines the situation is that i use one adapter for the vm traffic and two for the storage traffic what may be important for you, we have here a small um, yeah, button where we can click on advanced. Here you can um, change the name of the virtual switch that is created. The default is compute switch. You can um, decide which load balancing algorithm you want to use. Hyper-V port is recommended and you can 
um, yeah, use or configure the virtual machine queuing and the queue pairs here. It's a little bit hidden, but it's there. In the next step, you can decide to configure RDMA. In my virtual machines, I will not use the RDMA configuration. You know, in the physical implementation, you can have RDMA based on IVORP. This is what Microsoft actually recommends. And you can use RDMAs based on Rocky, based on RDMA over converged Ethernet. I would recommend, please use RDMA in a physical implementation. Um, in most scenarios, uh, it's not correct. I would say it, it doesn't matter if you have IVOP or Rocky. It, it, it does matter because there are differences. But the important thing is to have RDMA. Um, the discussion between IVOP and Rocky is sometimes uh, a little bit uh, tricky. Um, so please choose one of these two um, and ensure that you have RDMA on your storage traffic where it's possible. We have heard that there are some limitations in the stretch cluster scenario. In the defined networks, I um, have a yeah, great yeah, table, I would say, where I can configure all my networks with the names, with the IP addresses, with the subnet masks, with the VLAN IDs. I will not do this here because this would only cost time and it will not change anything here. I will use this default values I added for some, I added for demo purpose, but I think you can imagine you have your network interface cards and they need all to be configured. You want to have names on it, you want to have IP addresses, you have the requirement of uh, specifying the correct subnet mask. You need for a traffic prioritization in a Rocky based implementation and also for traffic prioritization prioritization in an IVOR based implementation, the VLAN ID, because the VLAN ID is used to, um, to transport the prioritization tag and you can do all this here. You have also a little bit hidden the advanced button because it's not blue, it's a little white here. You can click on the advanced to have um, some additional configuration options regarding the Chumbo packet size and the encapsulation overhead if you have here individual requirements in your environment. So also here, not only apply, it's always apply and test. And you can see here, there's a retry connectivity test and there's a download report. This will take a few minutes, I think, so till the test uh, f finishes here. And um, this uh, will be in the next steps, clustering and storage also. Um, in the relevant steps, I can always download a report for documentation and to find the issue if um, something goes wrong, if you have a warning or if you have an error there, then you can have a look in the report and the details and see what's going wrong with the configuration. So actually it's testing the connectivity, it's testing um, if the networks are reachable, if they are pingable and so on. Um, and uh, depending on the number of network interface cards you have, and depending on the number of virtual switches you created, this will be um, this will take a little bit longer or not so long here. And always, um, th this is live here, so no video, no cut out content here. Um, but if you do this on physical nodes, you will see it takes longer because it really checks the hardware. It really checks uh, the um, hardware configuration. So on. Um, let's have a look at the next steps that will be configured when this check has finished. The next step is clustering. I already mentioned this. When we prepared our nodes, we always configure a Windows Server cluster where we build storage spaces direct on top of it. So clustering is the next step. And everybody who is familiar with clustering will find here um, his known and relevant steps. In step four, we configure the storage. The storage space is direct. Here, the wizard checks if we have the required number of disks, the required type of disks. And the last step is software defined networking. This is optional. We will skip this step in the live demo. 
Software defined networking is very, very interesting, but it's a huge topic on its own. So we could fill several sessions with this um, software defined networking itself. So tests are passed. Everything is fine. I mentioned the report. I will not download the report here, um, but I think you can imagine you have a lot of detailed information. I will download it so we can have a look at it uh, later. Next step, clustering. You know, a Windows Server cluster has to be validated to be supported. We don't need any longer um, any cluster certified hardware. This changed uh, generations of Windows ago. So we have um, the situation we need to validate the cluster and we can do this here for sure. You can also do this in failover cluster manager. You can do this via PowerShell. But in the past, the situation was you um, also had to validate the cluster and you had maybe to switch the tool. Maybe you started to prepare your nodes in server manager and then you had to switch to failover cluster manager and then you had to continue in PowerShell. Now we do everything in this wizard here. The important thing is the cluster has to be um, yeah, supported uh, regarding this validation. So there everything should be green. If we have a warning, we can configure this cluster but maybe it's not supported. If we have an error, we cannot configure the cluster with this configuration. So then we have to work it. So we, if, when we have an error, you have to fix this. If you have a warning, the recommendation is to have a detailed look on it, what the warning is. What we often have, and I think I will have this, uh, is a warning about the software levels. Here you can see this. I have a warning in the system configuration and when I scroll down, I can see, oh, the system configuration, there's a, I have a warning in the software update levels, warning here. When I download the report, I can see, okay, in the report, let's see here, um, then I will see um, in the system configuration, I have some missing update on one node. Yeah? This is not perfect. But for us, it's fine. I can install this update later. And maybe you remember the first step where I said we don't install the updates um, regarding the limited time we have. OK, so next step, I want to create the cluster. And the cluster I'm creating here requires a name. It's registered in DNS. My cluster will have the name D. 114 minus Azure Stack HCI cluster 21. Um, or let's take a 2021. No, it's too long. 15 characters. Sorry. Let's let's leave the 21. Um, I'm using DHCP in my environment. Um, the easy thing is uh, for me, I only have to click on next or create. Uh, if I enter IP addresses, always uh, the risk is that I have a typo there um, for sure in a production environment. In all, in most scenarios, you will use static IP addresses here. Um, then um, I can decide or configure what happens to the storage here? Default is to add all um, all eligible storage to the cluster, and the default is to use all networks. This depends on your configuration if this is fine. I, for example, have a cluster here, a physical cluster, where I uh, wouldn't choose this option because I have dedicated network interface cards that should not be uh, used here. Create cluster the next step and if the wizard didn't lie in the previous steps everything should go well with the cluster creation and in a few minutes we should see our windows server cluster on azure stack hci where we don't have storage spaces direct enabled because this happens in the next step so when i go to next to the storage i have the first thing erase the drives on a brand new Azure Stack HCI certified system. It shouldn't be necessary to erase the drives because they are brand new from the OEM. Uh, in my scenario, I mentioned I'm using them uh, for several demos and to be absolutely sure you should erase them. Um, in this case, um, there's a script in the background that ensures that there's no old metadata on these drives, that they are empty and prepared for you, the usage with storage spaces direct. Okay, um, drives are erased. 
you see the next steps are now everything successfully erased. The next is checking the drives. Maybe you already talked to one of the hardware vendors of certified systems for storage spaces direct and Azure Stack HCI, and then you have realized that you have requirements for the disks. You need minimum four disks on the storage layer. If you have a cache, you need minimum two disks on the cache layer. You can have more disks if you have flash only. You can use this flash only configuration um, for storage without any cache and so on. We won't discuss these disk requirements uh, now, but the wizard checks this for us. It says, OK, I have on each of the servers uh, four drives um, and this is a configuration that is supported. And we will get a warning in the um, next steps of the wizard that says, I didn't found any cache drives. Yeah, but this is fine for me in my configuration. Working without cache drives is not supported if you have hard drives for storing data. So, you know, Storage Spaces Direct supports a combination of hard disk drives and flash disk drives. If you have this combination, you um, need to um, use uh, minimum one flash layer for the cache, but the wizard decides this automatically. Here it says, sorry, I didn't find any cache drives. I'm in the virtual machines, so it's fine to only work with this virtual hard disks. And here again, a detailed report. And for me important, everything was successful. And now the last big step. This was in the past always a PowerShell step, enable cluster S2D. And now this is a button here, but for sure, uh, in the background, this um, wizard triggers the enable cluster S2D on the nodes. So I mentioned software defined networking. I will skip this step. If the enable cluster S2D is successful, we have an Azure Stack HCA, HCI based storage spaces direct implementation where we have already one pool, Karsten mentioned, in a not stretch cluster, we always have one pool with all the disks, and I've already one volume. Maybe you remember since Windows Server 2019, we have an, a cluster performance history that's provided by a volume in the storage spaces direct pool, where we can see some historical data about my storage spaces direct configuration. My disks, my virtual disks, my volumes for the workload I want to store can be added now in the Windows Admin Center. I have to wait till this uh, step is finished, um, but then I can create volumes, I can configure volumes and so on. Everything works. And I can try to create virtual machines because the question is why do we do this all? We want to create a hyperconverged infrastructure and in the hyperconverged infrastructure we um, want to run virtual machines on these nodes that also provide the storage um, capacity and when i try to create a virtual machine here in exactly this configuration i will receive an error because this is azure stack hci and azure stack hci has to be connected to Azure to provide the full capability. You will not realize this when you create volumes. You will never have a downtime for any existing workload if you are not connected to Azure. You don't need to be connected to Azure 24 seven. So it's absolutely fine if you register the cluster to Azure and then you are disconnected for a few days. You have to be connected to Azure minimum once a month to keep the full functionality and important. You will never have a downtime for existing workload um, if Azure is not reachable or something like this. Um, but if you want to create new virtual machines, then you have to be registered in Azure. And this is provided in the Windows Admin Center. And now it takes a little bit longer than planned. And uh, one question for you, Carsten, we had this discussion about um, registering Azure Stack HCI with Windows Admin Center in Azure. And you mentioned you 
we are not successful. I, I have uh, often issues. This is the reason for my question. In most of the scenarios, my registration of Azure Stack HCI in Azure via Windows Admin Center does not work today. Yeah, so I'm usually using uh, PowerShell. Yeah, usually uh, my experience is uh, the last setups, it always works. <laughs> so uh -huh. uh, with uh, 2103.2, I didn't have issues. Okay. So you have to first register VAC in, in Azure and then you can register the Azure Stack HCI cluster. But there is also a PowerShell code snippet that you yeah. can use that works very well. Yeah, I, I think I will need to use this uh, PowerShell um, option to register it because I um, had or, or I have the same experience Carsten has or had um, that I um, he, in the last time I was successful to configure it via Windows Admin Center. But when I tested it yesterday for the demo for today, I got this old uh, error and yeah. let's see here. Yeah. Just a reminder, we, yeah. we are 53 minutes into the sessions. We have some questions, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will I will finish. I will skip the, the software defined networking part and I have seen the time. I thought I can take till 55. You can take yeah. 55. Okay, yeah. I try. So let's uh, have a look at the cluster we created. The Azure Stack HCI 21 cluster here. This is the cluster we created and for sure, if you already worked with uh, storage spaces direct with Windows Admin Center, you know you have the drives here, you have the volumes here. This is the management part. This is not the configuration part. What is still part of the management? Here we can see Azure connection. It's not yet registered, but my Windows Admin Center is already uh, connected with Azure. This is what Carsten managed because I have several hybrid services. When I go to the settings here in this Azure Stack HCI cluster, I can also see uh, Azure Stack HCI registration. It's actually not registered. So there are two ways how to register it. And um, when I click here on register, the Windows Admin Center uses my Azure um, yeah, um, connectivity I've prepared here and says, OK, I try to register this Azure Stack HCI with um, Microsoft Azure and I've seen here a message that it doesn't work. Um, I could try to fix this via the settings. If you run in this issue in a production environment, you can do the registration directly on the nodes. And I will uh, show you here um, how you can do this um, when you use the Azure Stack HCI node um, 01, for example. I can leave here to uh, the PowerShell and there's a docs article that describes how this works. When you go to docs.microsoft.com, you have three ways how to do it. You can do it via PowerShell, you can do it via Windows Admin Center, and you can, you can do it via JSON. What's your preferred way? And the first thing is you need to install the module name Azure Stack HCI here. Uh, you can take it from the uh, article here and uh, put it um, to, um, to this uh, machine here. Um, and um, yeah, um, can um, use this um, thing to import the module and then you can continue and register your, um, your um, cluster in Azure and you need your subscription ID and you can find this in the, um, in the Azure portal and you need to use one computer name out of the uh, list of your servers. Now, Carson is showing me the time and sorry for this. I think you got an impression how it works. Um, I am um, sure you will be successful in configuring your cluster and registering here. And maybe we should use the last five minutes or four minutes to take three a minutes. few minutes, three, three minutes. minutes to take a few questions from the uh, Q&A. So thank you for your time first. Uh, sorry for um, the yeah, using most of the time for the live demo. And now, uh, Carsten, which question yeah, should we so, take? Um, I hope Didier is, is ready. His first one was, where is the, op, uh, the position of uh, VAC and uh, uh, BMM, so System Center BMM 2019? Yeah. 
Does a system center VMM still make sense for Aerostack HCI infrastructure and where? Yeah, um, so Microsoft says we have uh, both tools available. So System Center Virtual Machine Manager is not replaced by Windows Admin Center. But the situation is um, when I when I'm allowed to be clear, uh, none of these tools can be used uh, for the 100% configuration. So I'm always using Windows Admin Center, Failover Cluster Manager, PowerShell, Hyper-V Manager in combination. Um, if a customer has System Center in the latest version, System Center Virtual Machine Manager, and I think there's a preview yeah. program for the next uh, update there, uh, then I'm also additionally using Virtual Machine Manager. It's not the situation that you say Virtual Machine Manager is the tool you have to pay for and then there's everything in there. If you have VMM, you will also need Windows Admin Center um, to have this great new stuff. Yeah. So uh, one uh, one guy wanted to see how you configure SDN uh, with Windows Admin Center. You skipped that and there was no time for that. Yeah. Sorry, uh, but I have done it. It's it's not too complex. Then can extensions be installed in offline air gap scenarios? So yes, extensions. Uh, there's an uh, there's an extension catalog uh, that is um, available online, but you can also provide this uh, offline. You can specify the file share path inside your network where you put these extension packages, mm -hmm. and then you can install them from but there. But to clarify, if you use Azure Stack HCI, yeah, you can't have an air gap scenario. Azure yes, Stack HCI yeah. has always to be, yeah. not always, but every 30 days you have to be connected to the cloud. So yeah. there yeah. is no air gap scenario for Azure Stack HCI. Yes. For VAC, maybe. For Windows Admin Center, yes. For Azure Stack HCI, no, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, can we connect with Azure and manage VMs from Azure portal? That's the last question and then we go to DD. Yeah, the recommendation is for Azure Stack HCI and it's done automatically for Azure Stack HCI 21H2 to configure Azure Arc as first step when we connected Azure Stack HCI to Azure. And then we have first capability to manage resources from Azure and I'm absolutely sure that in the future we will see more and more Azure portal features we can use to manage local resources. Yeah. Okay, thanks Manfred for the great demo rich presentation. I liked it a lot. I wanted to eat during your presentation, but I couldn't because it was very interesting. I have done this stuff, of course. So Didier, um, can you share your screen please? So let's see. Do you, can you hear me? That's that's question we number can one. Hear you. Yes, oh, we can hear you. Oh, that's great. Now I'll make sure you can see me. Something like that. Now we can see you, and the audience can also see you. But if you this don't is have fine. any background, so you we you see your lab. Okay, let's let's fix that. <laughs> Yay! There we go. Ah, great. Hi, Didier. So so my so my sound check check is just live, right? Basically, so share yes. my screen. There we go. Should I introduce you or do you do that yourself? You can always introduce me, then I don't need to do that. <laughs> okay, now we have Didier van Hoye live from Belgium uh, from his lab. Didier is a fellow MVP and we are actually very close friends. Didier is now a 10 year MVP as far as I know, Didier, right? That's correct, and yes. Didier is also one of those guys who is doing still a lot of Hyper V. Um, Hyper-V stuff on premises, but also does a bunch of Azure, right, Didier? Correct. It's, you a, it's, a, it's a hybrid links. world. It's a hybrid, yeah, world. hybrid world. So you, all your relevant links are there. Your great blog, your Twitter handle. I just lost Carson's sound. I hope you haven't lost me. <laughs> Go Didier. Okay, so welcome. So I'm going to talk about SMB over Quick, and that's a feature you can use in Windows Server 2022, the Azure edition. This is relevant to Azure Stack HCI because you can either run this in Azure or you can run it on Azure Stack HCI, but for, for as far as I know today, nowhere else. So let's dive in. So SMB over Quick. Uh, the first thing, of course, you need to do is Quick. We need to discuss what it is and why it's relevant to you. Well, let's dive in. 
Quick is an internet engineering task for standards now. It aims to replace TCP with uh, initially at least an internet oriented UDP uh, solution. And it's, its aim is to improve the performance and be better on bad networks and handle congestion better. So Google started out with this, but now it's really an IETF standard. And Quick wants to replace TCPIP, but it also, of course, wants to build on what TCPIP has, its reliability and the fact that it's used everywhere, right? It's broad applicability, as they say. Now, the nice thing about Quick, it is always encrypted uh, as it requires TLS 1.3. So that means uh, requires means it doesn't work without. So unlike HTTP, it is always encrypted. Uh, Microsoft actually created MS Quick, which is their open source implementation of the, uh, the standard, and they are building on that one and keep improving on that one. So now you know what it is. Uh, what, what does it aim to achieve? Well, Quick, as I say, it reduces the connection times over TLS. Well, basically, it's a bit of, it's a bit of a lie. It's TLS 1.3 that does that. So they took out the, the key exchange and the authentication out of the handshake. So it's a lot faster and they've really cleaned up all the, the possible ciphers you have to test or compare whether they are compatible. There's only five left and those are the ones that will be secure for the foreseeable future. Now TCP IP also has a lot of overhead uh, associated with lots of data transfer. So you, you will see with video streaming, gaming, that UDP is very popular and Quick can use UDP to achieve the same thing, avoid that overhead. Now, uh, better performance in case of uh, congested network, so in case of data packet loss, uh, even with HTTP2, uh, if you have a connection with multiple streams, if one of the streams has a package that get lost, you will still have to wait for that package to be resent and arrive. So uh, basically all the streams are blocked waiting for that one stream that dropped the packet. So it's not ideal. It's better than it used to be, but it's not ideal. But Quick can deal with that. Quick actually uh, doesn't mind if one stream loses a package. So that's a lot better. Also, with Quick, you can reuse connections. So the, the server actually sends a session ticket to the client and you can reuse that instead of creating a new connection. And also for connection migrations, let's say if you switch from your wired to your Wi-Fi network or from your Wi-Fi to your uh, mobile data network, uh, you get a new IP address often and well, you have uh, reconnection issues because with TCP IP, new IP address, new connection, you need to be established, you will get hiccups. Now, Quick uses unique identifiers, which means that you can actually send a packet and the connection will resume. So there's no need to actually create a new connection, not even when you switch to a new network and have another IP address. And last but not least, it should encourage adoption. Why? Because everything can be done in the user uh, at the user level, which means it's not dependent on the kernel. So you can build your application and have it support Quick. So it should make it very easy and more flexible for people to build applications that support Quick. One of the examples is web browsers. Web browsers do not have to have Quick in the, in the kernel to be able to, to use it. Uh, and that's another big benefit. Now, there were some critiques when Quick uh, was first uh, shown to the masses, let's say. Uh, there was a lot of fun and fear uh, going around. The firewalls were blind and you couldn't do TLS inspection anymore. It would, it would be very bad for your application visibility and, and the control of the data that goes in and out. It would break your DDoS protection or detection because it's UDP and not TCP. And then there was the, the, the people that were worried about the logging and the reporting, so you couldn't find out what people were actually searching for on your network or what YouTube's things they were uh, looking at. But basically all those are a lot of FUD and uh, let's say that the, the security and monitoring industry has caught up, has adapted their appliances and software and they should be able to handle it. And if they are not, well, they should get, uh, get a move on basically. But let's get that out of the way. It is not as bad as you think it is. There are some challenges, of course. So some people say, oh, Quick is faster, so they, they want their application to be three times faster. Well, that's not really the purpose of Quick to make your application three times faster. It has to do with what's happening on the network, on the backbone, also at the provider level. If you have better TLS, faster TLS handshakes, that's important to a provider, less important to one individual user. Uh, some people also say, well, I don't really need Quick. I, I don't have all these issues you mentioned. That's fine. That's the me versus we discussion we're talk, talking in general on, on 
congested, less optimal networks, you will most definitely have a benefit of using Quick. Then there are some people that say, yeah, but Quick doesn't do 25 gig or higher yet. Uh, well, basically, do you need it for the use cases you have today? Probably not. And the other thing, of course, uh, Microsoft's engineers are hard at work, and I've put a link there. Uh, it's over here. I'm going to use my laser pointer here. It's over here. Uh, have a look. They're working very hard and they're making it more performance, every, more performant every day, so to speak. We've already discussed the inertia and the FUD, uh, but one of the things is that some people might say, look, I don't need the benefits of Quick, so I won't build it. Uh, that's true. Uh, that's uh, a ch uh, somebody, everybody will have to decide that for themselves. Uh, another thing will be with inertia. If you look at all the endpoints in the world and IoT, uh, I hope they're all on TLS 1.2, but I have little hope they will be on TLS 1.3 uh, in the next six to 12 months. So that's another thing. The security appliance, FUD and SCARE, we've already covered that. Uh, Quick is not just for the internet. It is coming to SMB, what we will talk about today, but also to DNS, SIP, WebSockets, you name it. Other things are UDP, that not all internet routing and appliances are ready for this. If you look at NAT and EMCP, the four tuple TCP IP load balancing versus the connection ID from QUIC. So they will have to do some engineering to make all that work. Uh, then there's a discussion about, look, TCP IP is so mature, it has all these offloads and performance optimizations. Well, again, the same link to Microsoft, what they are doing today to give you up offloads, uh, receive site scaling with UDP, et cetera, et cetera. They are hard at work to close that gap. Now my laser pointer, yeah, yes. So that was quick in a in a very rapid manner because i have to make up for some time i think uh, that's uh, something i need to watch out here why smb over quick well there's two real reasons and this is the microsoft part of the presentation what drives as a, a, a microsoft to, to go for this well on the one hand there's the focus on the user needs right uh, first of all it's udp over 443 so it's not tcp 445 for smb uh, that's very important, and we'll talk about that later. You will have no head of line blocking, very interesting. Easy network changes, stable connections, we've talked about that. Uh, and last but not least, a transparent user experience. So people can just access a file share when they're working from home or when they're working on the road, as if they were in the corporate office. That's uh, no VPN required, kind of cool. It's the same experience everywhere. On the other hand, is the engineering needs, I would say, uh, reducing those TLS overheads, right? Cloud scale is there, it exists. Uh, all the data transfer overhead TCP has, uh, you could avoid that with UDP. Maybe not very important to the individual user, but most certainly to, uh, let's say, the cloud uh, hyper, uh, hyperscalers. Then there's the easy development and adoption. We said it's all in user space, it's not in the kernel. So that is very helpful. And of course, uh, that UDP 443 is not just uh, a client thingy or a user need. Uh, it's very firewall friendly. So most of the time, TCP 445 is blocked on firewalls or by ISPs for security reasons. And that gives some issues if you want to use that over the internet. So. That's the main reason there. So the use cases for those uh, end user needs, well, the telecommuters, your road warriors, your work from home, work from anywhere, uh, no VPN required and a lot less or no ISP and firewall issues. End users, your, 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 your customers, they like that. Now, the use cases from, from the corporate world are, 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 and corporate employees are maybe a bit different, but port four or five, often or most oftenly blocked. So you can't even map to your Azure file shares. So what if they give you SMB quick on Azure file share in the future? Well, here we go. That's uh, one uh, issue less to worry about. Uh, HTTPS 443 is normally used on the corporate allowed, I mean, on the corporate firewall. So if you add UDP 443, you're in business. The thing there is uh, a couple of years ago, there was this, thought on the internet and everyone was saying, oh, block UDP 443 on your firewalls because Quick is coming and you will use all, will lose all insight into the security of your data. Uh, so please don't do that. Get with the program, be modern, evolve, and just join the club. So SMB over Quick, I've made a little drawing. 
Uh, how does it work? You've got a user. He wants to open an Excel file. That Excel file, I'm going to use my pointer again. Hang on. Um, he wants to access the Excel file on the file share, and then he will find that file share on the name based on DNS. So what happens? His SMB client is going to look, hey, uh, what can I use? DCP or RDMA? And maybe lost in the track quick. So he starts with TCP and RDMA. And if that doesn't work, you can always try it quick. Now on the corporate network, unless you force it, it will go for TCP IP or RDMA or applicable. If you have RDMA to open Excel files, I uh, really applaud you. I commend you. I, I, I love it, but normally it will be TC, TCP IP in that case. Now, if you are not on the corporate uh, network, what will happen? Well, uh, normally, 445 will not be available on the firewall, but you have UDP 443 open, so TCP and RDMA will fail. Quick is also tried, lost, because it gives little head start to TCP, but then if you've configured it on your firewall, you will get to your file share. Now I've drawn a KDC proxy here, and we'll talk about that later, because we want to have the benefits of Kerberos wherever we are in the world, so that's not unimportant. Now, it's very nice and very important to remember that during all this, whether it's internal or external access to that file share, that everything is, de is encrypted by default. Because why Quick uses TLS 1.3 all of the time, so it's almost as if you are working in a VPN or in an IPsec tunnel, right? So there is complete security. By definition, Quick will protect you from man in the middle attacks. It will protect you from uh, sniffing and uh, all that sort of stuff. So that's kind of cool. Also, don't forget that end user, wherever he is in the corporate office, on the road, at home, he has the same experience. That's all very nice because training of users, as we all know, we would all like it to be very easy and that users always get every technology uh, in two seconds and they, they are good to go. Unfortunately, that's not true. And VPNs really do add to people their frustrations and the things they need to take care of. So let's get rid of my pointer here and go to the next slide. Basically, I think you will see that what I've mentioned is discussed here. Uh, oh yeah, what I should mention, uh, but I've said that in the in the picture, it will always try TCP and RDMA first and then quick because it gives it a little head start. So that's kind of cool. Now, if you've set it up and you want to use it, uh, well, you, you need to do a couple of things, of course, first. Uh, you need to get a certificate. And NetPile has made a video, it's on YouTube. The link is on the slide. If you watch that video, you are good to go. It is a perfect video as far as the explanation goes. But I uh, I uh, made a little uh, syn synthesis of it for you here. So I'm gonna show you what I did in my lab. I have my uh, certificate authority and I duplicated my computer template. I modernized the compatibility settings to the best I could. And then I gave it a nice name and I said I would publish it in Active Directory. Then the purpose in my request handling is signature and then in cryptography, I go for modern key storage provider, a modern algorithm, and of course, SHA-256 and nothing lower because you are going to be dealing with TLS 1.3. You do not want to use a certificate of the Stone Age, so to speak. Make sure that your application policies and extensions are set to server authentication. For enrollment with Active Directory, you want to authenticate it users to have read rights. And last but not least, we of course want to have uh, some say in what goes into the certificates. So we say that we want to supply extra information and this will be important for the subject alternate names we are going to use. When you've done that, you just publish that certificate uh, to be issued and then you can actually use it. So on your file share server, so now we're on the file share server, our Windows Server 2022 Azure Edition. We are going to request a new certificate, an Active Directory enrollment policy. We are going to find our SMB over Quick certificate, and we're going to fill out the name. I'm going to give it a common name, but I'm also going to add some subject alternate names. Now, I went a bit overboard here because I'm playing in the lab. Uh, you shouldn't have to add so many, but that's me going overboard, being an enthusiastic MVP as I am and being in love with new technologies. So once you've done that, your certificate has been created and is available on your file server. Basically, you are now good to go.
So now you want to configure SMB over Quick, and configuring SMB over Quick is actually, well, ridiculously easy. I was expecting a lot of hard work, and uh, then they said use WAC or PowerShell. But WAC is like, it's as easy as it gets. So on WAC, you, you know if you have WAC, and thanks to my two colleagues before me, you, they've talked about WAC before, so I don't need to do that. You've got some extensions there, and the file sharing extension, one, once you've installed it or you have it, make sure this is on the latest of the greatest. So just make sure the file sharing extension is updated. Then you go to settings on your file uh, server. So you connect to your file server, you go to settings, and you go to file shares. What you will see is that SMB one isn't installed by default. Keep it that way. That's how we like it. Uh, but down below here, there is this cute little thing, file sharing across the internet with SMB over Quick, and then you can click this to configure it. And what you will see is you will see the certificates on your server. Just grab the one that we just requested from our certificate authority. You could, you could of course, also use a third party certificate provider. Uh, you select the names, the subject alternate names you want to use. I've selected them all again because I'm going overboard in the lab. And uh, you have the option to enable SMB encryption, which is actually not necessary because everything, as we mentioned, thanks to TLS 1.3 and Quick is already encrypted. And you don't want to use name pipes because name pipes have some security uh, concerns related to it. But that's actually it. You click enable and pronto, as you can see below, that's it. You're done. You have configured SMB over Quick. And for some reason, I'm going to stick with you for a bit longer because I'm not yet going to end my session. No, because we have a lot more to talk about, of course. Uh, but that's how easy it is to set up. I've created some PowerShell in the lab to play with. Uh, it's on the slides just for your reference so you know how to do it with PowerShell and how to remove it with PowerShell. But WAC is your tool of choice probably, unless you want to do this for many, many servers and you need some automation. Now, now we've set it up, now we want to use it. So what you could do with NetUse or with PowerShell, if you go to a file share, uh, you can actually say that the transport has to be quick. So that's cool, then you then you force quick. Uh, that's quite easy, but you can also play with the client uh, configuration and the SMB server configuration. So on the client side, you can say skip the certificate check. Uh, it's actually nice to play in the lab to see if you have any issues, but in production, of course, this is not a good idea. But you can also say force SMB encryption over quick. I want it to be enforced. So that's an option you have to configure it to be used. On the server side, you've got a couple more. Uh, you can disable the SMB encryption on the secure connection. That's always set to true because otherwise you double encrypt. Maybe you have a policy that requires you to do so, but rest assured when you're using Quick, everything is encrypted. They also by default restrict the name pipe access. That's the same as you have seen in WAC. And of course you can uh, choose to disable SMB over Quick, but normally as enable SMB Quick is set to true. So these are the three defaults. So that's the amount of control you have there. But of course, last but not least, what you can also do is go to your Windows firewall and block TCP 445 and uh, nothing will happen anymore unless you have quick configured. And as you can see on the Windows firewall, you actually have this new uh, rule in 2022 file and printer sharing SMB quick in. You can enable that. I play around with a with a open sense firewall in the lab just to make sure I can emulate an internet client later. So this only has access to DNS and the file server over UDP 443 and also actually uh, a KDC proxy, which we will, we will discuss later. So this is also a way to manage uh, whether you have to go over quick or not. Now we're done. I said. Uh, you can use Quick now, but the problem is you will see this nice pop-up that wants you to authenticate. Why? Because you're actually falling back to NTLM v2. Remember, in an internet scenario, you do not have line of sight to domain controller. So NTLM v2 is a fallback scenario, as it is for so many other use cases. But this is 2021, and we try to convince people not to use NTLM, even if it is v2. We want Kerberos. But for Kerberos, we need line of sight to a domain controller. 
And putting your domain controller on the internet is a very, very, very bad idea. Just as bad as putting your file server on the internet. Hence, we have SMB over Quick, right? Uh, so we have a KDC proxy for that. And a KDC proxy is actually a pretty cool thing to have. But we will discuss that later. This is a little screenshot. This is me going over the internet, uh, accessing my file, and showing you a screenshot of uh, Wireshark, showing you that we are using QUIC uh, uh, as a protocol. Now, why is that KDC proxy so important? Well, let's go recap a little bit. The key distribution center in Kerberos, uh, basically it's a service that runs on every domain controller and it provides two services to your uh, clients, right? It provides authentication, the AS in the, in the figure and the ticket granting service. So what you can do is, well, once you've authenticated, you get a ticket granting ticket and yet that you can use to request a, a ticket and a session key to access a resource. And if you are authorized to access that resource, you can actually get to it. An app server or a file server, it doesn't really matter. And you authenticate mutually. So that's the nice thing about Kerberos. But again, you need line of sight to domain controllers to do that. But putting domain controllers on the internet is a big no-no. But what if we have a KDC proxy? We This is a domain member, so it can talk to the domain controller. You can firewall it as much as you want, but it does not expose your domain controllers to the internet, just a proxy. The proxy goes over HTTPS port 443, typically for the firewall HTTPS. And everything you do here as a road warrior telecommuter actually now has line of sight to domain controller over that proxy. For this to work, of course, you need to have your uh, certificates published uh, and uh, your uh, certificate revocation list available to be checked because otherwise at a given moment it will fail. Uh, usually you will find this on every server you install. Basically, it is supported for direct access and remote desktop services. Uh, Microsoft mentions this in their documentation about SMB over Quick, but there is no really no real wholesale support statement yet that it is supported, but I guess it is, but it would be nice to have a list of uh, services where this is supported and where if you use this, you won't get into trouble. At least when you need support. Now, setting this up is something they were going to put into WAC, but they've had some uh, delays, so it is not there yet at the last time I checked. But they, they keep telling me it's coming. So if you want to configure it, uh, I'm not going to read it all out, but basically you are, you are going to create a URL ACL for the endpoint or for your KDC proxy with the correct user in the network service. You do that via NAT, NATSH. Uh, then in the registry or via PowerShell, you are going to disable smart cards in Windows Hello because you're going to use a password and you will allow a password. So you will not be using certificates uh, for authentication. So these are that that's these two that you are doing. Once you've done that, oops, once you've done that, you are going to tie your uh, certificate that you have created for Quick to that endpoint. So what you want to do is uh, you grab the certificate, the, uh, the name, the port, and you, you grab the, the thumbprint of the certificate. You put that in a uh, NetSH command and you tie it to the port and the, the name. So in our case, this is by quick edge data wise tech dot com with port 443. Uh, you can also do it via PowerShell, but PowerShell doesn't allow you to, to query it. So PowerShell in this case seems incomplete to me. So for this purpose, I still like to use NetSH. Even if Microsoft keeps saying it, it's yeah, depreciated and you should stop using it. I keep finding scenarios where this is just the only tool you, you can really use to do whatever you want to do. So that's a bit of a of a feedback to Microsoft, please, uh, if you want us to stop using that tool, make the, uh, the replacements uh, feature complete. Uh, last but not least, we will add your uh, uh, some names as a computer relies with NetDOM. This is way better than DNS uh, C names because this is compatible with Kerberos, right? And remember, we are doing this to have Kerberos authentication over the internet. Uh, then the last thing you need to do is set the startup type of that service to automatic and start the service, and then you're done. On the server side, 
Now, for the clients, you need to tell that client that if it cannot find a domain controller, it can try a KDC proxy. So you have a group policy for that where you can configure the domain name of your internal domain and you can map that to the name of your uh, externally visible uh, KDC proxy. This is nice if you have group policy and people come into the corporate office, but we, you know, we, we've also had this uh, little pandemic where people didn't come into the office anymore. So you, you, you have other options, registry edits, uh, as long as you have some way of managing those devices, even if it's not group policies, you can push those registry keys and configure it here as well in the registry. So you can enable it and add the KDC proxies. I've, I've have only one in the lab, but you can have multiple for redundancy if you want to do that. Last but not least, uh, I've said if you want to use a KDC proxy, you have to have that uh, certificate revocation list available to be checked. Uh, you can disable this for troubleshooting and for testing in the lab. That's all fine. In production, never do this. Do mind, I've noticed that if you do not have it available, uh, your KDC proxy and your SMB quick uh, over uh, in the lab, it will fail. So it doesn't fail immediately because there's a lot of caching going on with uh, certificate revocation lists. But sooner or later, if you wait long enough, if you come back a day later, uh, once all the caching has worked out, uh, you will see that it fails. I know there's all kinds of tricks to purge the cache and to delete files and to try and uh, reproduce it. But in the end, I've noticed that just acting as if it's real world and giving it some time, you will notice that you really need that CRL to be available. Now, the also cool is once you have this working, how do you know the KDC proxy is being used? Other than thinking, look, I'm on the internet, this shouldn't work. Well, on the KDC proxy, there is this log that will tell you that it's being used. And on the clients, you can actually see that you are getting your uh, tickets via the KDC proxy instead of just the name of the domain controller. And last but not least, and this is a bonus, the bonus is once you've set up that KDC proxy, users can actually change their password because that's one of the services that the KDC proxy provides. You can change your password while you are on the internet of your domain account, which in, uh, let's say, uh, Corona and working from home times is very handy. Uh, you don't even have to have uh, AD Connect with synced users where password writeback is enabled or something. No, this just works with the KDC proxy. So that was me in a whirlwind talking about everything I could uh, throw at you uh, in regards to SMB over Quick. But that was a lot of talking and I'm pretty sure uh, you want to see something. So let's do that. Okay, so let me get this one out of the way. And let's go to our virtual machine where I have uh, WAC set up. So as I said, uh, you install the latest version of WAC. Normally that updates very nicely for you if you want let it. And then you go to extensions. And the, the thing that you need to do is you need to go to file sharing and make sure that you always install the latest of the greatest of that extension. Make sure that's there. What you do then is in WAC, you connect to your file server. And as I have file sharing, as you can see, you will see some file shares here. So these exist on the server. Actually, they are over here somewhere. Oh no, sorry, I need to go to file server, of course. So this is on the file server. But where we really want to go is to go to settings and you go to file shares. It's very nice, it's the, easy, the first one in the row, so that's easy. As I said, SMB1 not installed, you leave everything on the default normally, and you're going to configure SMB over quick. And it's really that easy. I mean, you select the certificate you need, you select the, the subject alternate names or all of them that you want to add. Uh, with advanced settings, you can choose to uh, enable or disable SMB encryption on top of quick encryption. You can allow name pipes if you want to, but just clicking enable here and that's it. It's all set up from this moment on internally. And if your firewall rules are set up correctly, you can actually use SMB quick over the internet, albeit it will fall back to NTLM v2. Okay, so it will prompt you for a password. So that's the, the, the WAC part of things. Now let's take a look at our server. 
So I've put the KDC proxy server on the same host as my file share in the lab. You don't need to do that. You can have also multiple of those KDC proxy servers. Uh, actually, if you go and look at services and let's do that. Uh, let's go. OK, these are our file shares on the server, but I wanted to show you the services. I invite you to take a random server in your lab and find the KDC proxy server, you will see that it is uh, stopped and it is uh, disabled. And then all the steps we went through on the power, on the, on the on PowerShell and with the net shell and with the registry keys to configure it, that's what you'll need to do to set it up. And it's a bit tedious. Actually, this is the most difficult part of the exercise. But again, Microsoft said they were going to put this into WAC, so they, sh they should make it as easy as possible for you to set this up as well. And then last but not least, of course, I said there was a place to see where the KDC proxy is being used. As you can see, this morning and on some other days, I logged in to this machine and it found the KDC. So by the KDC proxy, it found the KDC server, a domain controller. And that's what's going on here. And we'll 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 make a connection with our client, and we'll come back to this to show you. And I'll also start my network trace. So there we go. Let's capture some package. I fill. I'm filtering on quick traffic, so we don't get too much over uh, overhead from other traffic. And then we go to the client. So the client has to be uh, Windows Server 2022, uh, or it has to be. Uh, uh, Windows 10, uh, I don't know the exact build number where it is supported from, but also in Windows 11, it should be supported by default. So again, here we are going to start a network trace. Uh, I logged in this morning and I checked my uh, Kerberos tickets and what you will see is I have two, right? And as you can see, they come really from the KDC proxy. Because why? Because this machine is now on a subnet in my uh, lab where it has only access to a DNS server, to the internet, to the certificate revocation list, and over UDP 443 to my uh, Windows 2022 Azure Edition file server where I have SMB of a quick configured. And of course, on this client, I actually did configure either in the group policies, and we can go there. Let's go system. Kerberos. Here we go. Specify the KDC proxies. So as you can see, I have set up one. This is actually my KDC edge server that I map to the internal domain name I have. Now, the DNS thing is, of course, something that you will have to work out for yourself. Do you, do you have publicly routable DNS names internal or are you using a non-routable domain name internally? So it has the DNS names have to be available on the internet for this to work. So that's something you need to, to consider. And as that, you can also configure this in the registry. As you can see, here is the registry. So you enable your KDC proxy by, by creating this value, setting it to one, and then you fill out your proxy server as you actually did in the, in the, the group policy on your domain controllers if you wanted to. So those are the two ways to, to get your clients configured to use a KDC proxy. Now, the thing to remember is that the KDC proxy will be used when everything else fails. So normally it will try to find a domain controller that will take some time because it will say, look, I'm trying, I'm trying, it's not going anywhere. Let me see, hey, do I have a KDC proxy configured? Hey, yes, I do. Let's try that one. And that's when this kicks in. So without further ado, uh, we've got our network traces running. Let's go to our Explorer and let's go to uh, a file share. And if we already look here, Rick protocol is already in action both on the server and on the client. So this is the first time we are connecting, so it's going to have to try a bit to find a domain controller, come to the conclusion there is none. It finds the KDC proxy and I am opening my documents over the internet 
without line of sight to the main controller. But did you see a password prompt? No, you did because uh, I logged in to my client. That login went via the KDC proxy, so I don't have to use NTLM uh, v2 here to authenticate to the server, which will then authenticate me to uh, yeah, for, to the file shares. So that's basically all this neat stuff in action. And now, last but not least, let's run this one again. And look at here, we have next to the Kerberos tickets we got from logging into the system, we now also see that we've got our tickets to go to the SIFs, right? SIFs, I know I don't like the name SIFs, I want to use SMB everywhere, but this is that giveaway that you are using your KDC proxy. It says so actually over here, and these entries only became uh, visible when we went to the file share. So you can edit these documents, you can you can copy them, you can do whatever you want. Uh, whether it is internal or external, there's no VPN involved. It's very transparent for the user. Uh, and that's kind of cool to see in action. Now, uh, let's go back to our KDC proxy. And let's refresh this. And let's change this over. Now. We've got the newest one on top. And you can look at the clock. This is me using the KDC proxy when I was navigating to the file share. And basically, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody else, this is uh, SMB over quick in action in the lab. It's not RTM yet. Uh, I think that's forthcoming. I think it won't be too long before that goes uh, RTM or GA, but you need to ask Microsoft. I do not work for them, and they don't tell me all of their secrets for some reason. Uh, Secondly, is this available on Azure file shares yet? Not to the best of my knowledge. I'm pretty sure they're working on it, but again, ask somebody who's very nice at Microsoft and they will probably answer you, yes, it's coming. Uh, but as with many things, I can't give you an exact date and they probably can't either, but I'm pretty sure it won't be long because I've, I've talked about this with a couple of people uh, and they really want this. Uh, for use cases, I even hadn't uh, imagined yet, uh, but uh, it's more than just the end user who is a road warrior. There's a lot of people who need access to Azure file shares that have issues with TCP 445 not being able, uh, possible for them. And if they can use this to, to send data to a file share in Azure from machines, from software that can't handle any other method of uploading files, this would be a godsend for them. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. So I'm leaving lots of times for questions and answers. I went a bit fast because I, I, I was worried that uh, I wouldn't make it uh, because I lost some time. But again, I'm, uh, I'm a bit early, so let's let's discuss this. Let's let's open it up uh, to discussion. Yeah, first, uh, Didier, thank you so much for this deep technical session and uh, I know all your sessions are very deep so uh, we have a few questions um, and I <coughs> excuse me <coughs> I can add I can add a bit more uh, yes I'm unmuted <laughs> last time I was muted so uh, one question is any info about using SMB over quick from a Mac or Linux Zamba support well, I would say uh, that should be easy, right? Because the development is not dependent on the kernel. So anybody working on an SMB client, uh, I'm like, have a ball. Nobody is stopping them. However, uh, Apple doesn't talk to me and div divulges their secrets to me, uh, but I'm pretty sure that they are implementing quick for their browser. So why not? Uh, again, Samba, Samba and SMB3, they are pretty let's say, well on board with everything else that's happening with SMB, RDMA, et cetera, et cetera, SMB3. So I think this is something that is on the roadmap, roadmap as well. But again, unfortunately, I, I don't have dates. Okay. Um, then as far as I understand, uh, Quick is in the moment, nor available, uh, nor only available in uh, the how you call it? Uh, Windows Server 2022 Azure Edition. Data Azure. Center Azure Edition, right? Yes. 
the thing is, okay. you can run you, you can run this in Azure the lab, or you can run the right the lab on Azure Stack HCI. That is for the moment. I have I'm not privy to any plans of Microsoft opening this up to Windows Server. Uh, let's say Azure, sorry, Azure, uh, Windows Server 2022 without the Azure edition uh, in the name. I would love for them to do that. Uh, and again, on the client, of course, the support there uh, is there in Windows 10, uh, dev editions, or even the latest real release, I'm not really sure, and Windows 11. So, but I, I would love to see some of these features light, light, light being lit up in every version of Windows Server 2022. But for the moment, uh, I mean, this is Azure Stack HCI days, uh, right? So this is an Azure Stack HCI, uh, yes, server edition. <laughs> it matches yes, the description. Hey, that's true, but we also uh, also talk about storage spaces uh, direct a bit and uh, absolutely. It, I, I hear you. I hear you. I have. I, I'm. I'm one of the people asking for them to do that. Yeah, and but uh, again, DDA, for some for some reason, they don't always immediately say. Yes, DDA, when you ask it, we'll do that immediately as soon as possible. <laughs> I, I know that feeling, DDA, yeah. I know it. You know that feeling? Well. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, if if you want to play around with uh, with uh, that, uh, uh, with with this uh, quick over SMB thingy or MS quick, um, yeah. in the moment, um, there's only the chance to deploy an Azure. Yeah, uh, if you go to Azure. Azure VM, yeah. If, if if in Azure you can find the VM uh, with Azure not Azure edition and then you can you can install it, deploy it, and you can build your lab completely in Azure. You can also do what I did. You grab the 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 VM, you download it, and you put it on Azure Stack HCI if you have that running. Uh, yeah. So that's that's options you have. You can also you maybe use an another hypervisor. <laughs> But I'm not I'm not sure if that will work or if that's supported or legal. But you, uh, you I mean, try and play around and see where you can get. I'm right? pretty this, sure I'm pretty sure on Hyper V and Storage Spaces Direct Hyper V it will work. Legal is something else, but uh, um, maybe that's also um, a a reason why not too many people know about it because it's. Only exactly, available exactly, in Azure. exactly. That that's that's one of the drawbacks of 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 having of having it only available on Azure Stack HCI or in Azure. It mm. uh, it builds, for better or worse, it's a bit of a barrier to entry, right? Yeah. So true. if if you want if you want as many people as possible to start playing with it, uh, it isn't it isn't as accessible as if it would be in Windows Server 22 all editions. Mm -hmm. Because okay. let's face it, as, as a data center edition for a file server, well, normally we use standard for that. Very but, rarely. Uh, he, yeah. Coming back to this discussion about in uh, Windows Server 2022 uh, or not, uh, you mentioned yes, this is Azure Stack HCA days, and there we have we can use Azure yeah. Yeah. edition. But uh, I think uh, Azure edition is in preview actually, correct? So it's it is. Not it is this. So SMB over Quick is not uh, GA yet because it is not yeah. because Azure edition has not GA yet. Yes, that's true. So that's forthcoming. Okay. I mentioned that during the presentation, but. Uh, as I'm going to repeat myself again, I do not have a date, but I think it won't be it won't be very long before it goes GA. It shouldn't be too long, okay. I think. Okay. And regarding the question, uh, is it in Windows Server or will it in Windows Server? Well, I think the, 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 the thing is, if you go to Windows Server and you 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 open up WAC and you try to configure it there. Last time I tried, which was a while back, uh, I couldn't see it. Right, but if you go to PowerShell and you start, right, let me let me grab my, let me let me open up my, is it open already somewhere? Yeah, here. So if you go to PowerShell and you, you know, you've got this new SMB server certificate mapping, you will find this on Windows Server 2022, the normal versions, standards, data center, non non Azure edition, it's there. Uh, when I tried it first, it just didn't work. And then I kept mailing, mailing and nagging that pile. That when when will it be lit up? That when I can when I play with this. That I think this is, is I think this is awesome. That when can I play with it? And he probably went crazy. And uh, then one day Azure Edition became available for evaluation, and then I uh, actually jumped on it. And it it was very late at night, uh, all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. But I got it to work. Yeah. 
But but uh, regarding this uh, Windows Server thing, um, in Windows Server we have a, re a release cycle of two to three years. So this means if it will be there, then uh, maybe in the, some next version, but not well, in Windows. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know. Look, this is in there, right? Yeah. This is in there. This is it's all in there. So I'm like, maybe they just need to enable it if they want to. I don't know. But okay. again, I'm not Microsoft. I cannot talk for Microsoft. I can only say awesome job. Well done. Very useful. I like it. I'm a geek. I'm an FMV. I like playing with this stuff. I see use cases for this. I have other people asking me about this. I'm going to give a presentation for some uh, IT companies who have uh, customers that would benefit from this. I'll do it on some user groups, the presentation, and show them how to do it. Uh, but again, uh, I would hope so. I would like to see it happen, but I don't know. Okay, I think we have one uh, question in the chat we didn't uh, answer till now. Without media available, how can we deploy Windows Server 2022 Data Center Azure Edition on top of Azure Stack HCI? Did we take uh, this already? Well, I, I actually actually said it. Uh, you go to Azure, you deploy VM, oh. you shut it down, you download the VHD, and well, pronto, you have your VHDX to build your your lab from, right? Yeah. yeah. So basically, what you saw, my my file server and my client, they're actually both uh, Azure 2022 Azure edition that I grabbed from Azure to play mm -hmm. with. Yeah. So, but it's it's preview. So it's far, preview. So it is not. It is uh, not supported PM. yet in production. No okay. matter how much you would like to do it, and and what's also a bit funky is if you if you if you start googling for KDC proxy, you will find two use cases, right? Direct access and uh, remote desktop services. And then there is some blog post, even from a Microsoft employee, that says, "Hey, we've got this really cool feature that's installed on every server. It's a KDC proxy service." It's disabled by default, blah, 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 but it's awesome and you can use it for so many use cases. However, let me focus. Even Microsoft says it is only supported for, but then again, if you start Googling for uh, SMB over quick, the first thing they will tell you, you don't want to use NTLM v2, do you? Deploy a KDC proxy. So I'm like, okay, Microsoft, please post some documentation that this is a supported use case for use with SMB quick, please. Thank you. That would be nice because you know how it goes. I blog it, I use it, you blog it, you use it, it works, but it works is different from it is supported. And a blog post, even from Microsoft, is very different from a documentation that says this is a supported scenario. Yeah, true. As always, oh. very important. Okay, Didier, we have, we have still 10 minutes up to the next session. The next one is, um, um, let's let's just read read it because out of my memory it's hard. Uh, tuning hyper, hybrid cloud dreams into reality with Dell Technologies. So I'm really looking forward to that because there are also two MVPs presenting this session. So we can we can expect some also some uh, deep uh, insight into to these hybrid uh, hybrid solutions. But uh, to uh, I want to talk with you about something we did uh, with Storage Spaces Direct, and we were thinking uh, if there is space on on the agenda to put a session there. But uh, fortunately, we we had a, a lot of other sessions. Um, so, Didi, uh, I, I'm talking about using Storage Spaces Direct. I know that's not Azure Stack HCI, but it's very similar. And in Storage Spaces Direct, we have two scenarios. We have the hyper-converged scenario, like we have in Azure Stack HCI, and we have the converged scenario, so where you have a highly available scale-out file server. Uh, do you know what I'm uh, uh, what I'm mentioning? It must be about that high-performance, high-available uh, backup target, the one <laughs> we did. Can we mention the, the brand name of, of the service? Yeah, we can mention the brand name. I think uh, they are not sponsors, but we are both Veeam Vanguard. So I mentioned the name and I did the, <laughs> the unthinkable thing. Uh, yeah. But it it, it, uh, it uses technology from Microsoft like SMB3 and RDMA. Yeah. Um, the, so, um, yeah. Yeah, the cloning. So maybe you want to elaborate a bit about the findings of these. Uh, yeah. 
basically, these... basically, basically, a year ago, we got the opportunity to lend a bit of hardware from Lenovo. Uh, this which is was, a sponsor, by the way. Which is oh, okay, well, that, was, that was actually the name I was alluding to. So that's that's good. So we we lend some hardware, and I, and that was very generous of them because actually we had two all flash. Uh, S2D clusters as a as a backup source, and then we had another uh, S2D uh, target with uh, NVMe and HDDs as a backup target. And the aim was to build a highly performant backup target, but that was also highly available. So one of the things you will see in the backup world is that you can get a, a very good performance and you can get uh, a lot of capacity but one of the things that's often missing is the high availability. And depending on the environment, this can be important. So because Veeam uh, can back up to an SMB target uh, and uh, the scale out file server, or even a general purpose file server for that matter, but in this case, of course, it was a, a scale out file server because it was S2D, uh, can be used as a backup target. And it just leverages SMB, even with RDMA, if you configure it correctly. So you offload that backup traffic also from your CPUs. And the beautiful part of it is one, it is really high available. You can reboot a host, lose a host, blue screen a host. Your backups will maybe pause a little while for 30 seconds, but then they will continue. So that is very unique uh, to, my, to my knowledge in the backup world, especially because you can build it with commodity hardware. But secondly, the magic of uh, the NVMEs combined with the uh, HDDs, with uh, the mirror accelerated parity in S2D, you can build actually very high performing backup targets where the bulk of the storage comes from the HDDs. And that's mm -hmm. to, to lower the price a bit, right? So to make it a bit more affordable. Yeah, we were, we were even very surprised about the findings because we tested three-way mirror. Yeah. And we tested mirror accelerated parity. Yeah. Um, that's that's the volume where we have a part three-way mirror and a part uh, double parity. Yeah. And we tested double parity. Yeah. Of course, with three-way mirror, you have the lowest amount of usable space, but it should be the fastest, right? And it is. With double is. parity, yeah. they, you have the most available space um, from out the, the HDDs, but it should be the slowest. and the mirror accelerated parity, you call it map, uh, is something between. So it's a good, uh, let's say, a good, a good yeah, yeah. best of the, both worlds. Yeah. We have the, the better. Trick, the trick, the trick there, of course, is you need to 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 tweak it a bit uh, with uh, with the destaging from the data from the from the NVMe to the HDDs that it starts early enough. And you have to size them correctly. But if you if you size them correctly, and you you don't wait until the last percent of your NVMe is being still available, then you can get performance that is very very good, way better than you can get with let's say a standard map out of the box where you don't tweak it, or or let alone with parity. So we found that let's say price value map conf configured correctly for that purpose was the way to go because it, you didn't lose that much performance compared to three-way mirror, yeah. but it was so much better than parity or even let's say a non-optimized map. So that was really uh, very, it was a very nice and fun project to do. The, on, the yeah, only I thing have some, I, I, I have I'm, some numbers in uh, out of my head because it was so impressive that I still remember. I don't know if you mentioned it because I had to answer some questions in the speaker chat because okay. uh, because of the last uh, next session, but we we uh, back up 600 VMs, right? Yep. And um, we did a full backup in four. Uh, what was it? Four and a half hours. Yes, 50 was, terabytes. Was, around yeah, the, 50 the, terabytes. Yeah, of but data. the thing the thing to remember here is, and th this was before Gustav announced his beat the Gustav speed challenge. Yeah. We do not use compression, so we actually created the virtual machines that they had all unique data. So bar for the operating okay. system, there was 80 gigabytes in every virtual machine that was 100% unique per virtual machine and we disabled compression. So this was always the worst possible scenario uh, to test performance because you had no benefits from compression or whatsoever. Exactly. And, and still uh, the speeds were very good. And you also have to remember that normally uh, Veeam says uh, SMB targets make sure they are very high quality uh, hardware.
because you have a chance of corruption otherwise. This is a this is a risk, even whatever, how, no matter how good or bad your hardware is, it's a risk that it's taken away by the witness service of a high available, continuous available file share. That has an impact on performance. I once did that. If you can do a file share without continuous access, uh, you, you lose a lot of performance uh, due to the to the uh, the, the witness to the con to continuous access that 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 comes at a cost. But the nice thing is you've got this bunch of NVMEs and sitting in front of those HDDs, so you can eat that cost. It doesn't matter at that point. You can just you've 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 mitigated that drawback that you have if you if you use continuous access by using uh, storage spaces direct, and that's really mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, the only thing I, I remember found very sad is I had to give the hardware back. Yeah, yeah, we were very sad. Uh, so we very sad. it was, I think, four to five hours for 50, 50 terabyte of uh, backup, and it doesn't really matter if it, if we use a three-way mirror or an optimized. Uh, no, no, uh, it was the difference parity. wasn't too big. I'm, I'm seeing maybe if half I can... an hour or so, or, or thirty minutes, or, or five or ten minutes. I and if you want, uh, do you have a blog it. post about the white paper on your on your blog? I yeah, have. I think so. I'm looking at if I have the white paper here to look at the numbers, but I wasn't yeah. really prepared for this discussion. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, so uh, if if the audience is interested, uh, we published a white paper with uh, Veeam, and uh, it's on my blog. Uh, one of the, I think, the second last entry. It's. Uh, hyper-v-server.de and I hope Didier has also a link to the white paper online. Unfortunately, uh, Veeam wants to know who you are if you download the white paper, <laughs> uh, but it's it's a nearly 50 page white paper with a lot of insight how to configure this. And if someone needs a high available backup target, also yeah. for other backup vendors, I think it should be also possible. Yeah, um, and it's, it's chock so full it's, of tips for S2D to optimize yeah, it to make yeah. sure you don't, yeah. True, and uh, uh, one insight, we expected maybe a 10 to 15 uh, page white paper and were <laughs> very surprised about the 47 pages, but they didn't want to cut something out. <laughs> no, they didn't, they didn't cut it down. It was interesting enough for them to publish it in, uh, in total. That was fun. Okay, Didier, I'm, I just looked at my watch. We have one minute to the next session. Didier, okay, then thank I'll just you so much. stop sharing my screen and say goodbye. Uh, I you hope don't you enjoyed have to it. Stop. Uh, the others will, will just grab it. Uh, ah, okay. So um, thank you so much. And I know you are still in the chat and I'm looking forward to the round table tomorrow with you. Okay, I'll be there. I just accepted the invite before the session started. So <laughs> okay. that should be so good. Now, now we go to uh, one of our uh, valued sponsor, uh, Dell Technologies, and uh, I hope um, you are there. Um, I chatted with Lisa. Lisa is uh, uh, is there, I know. So um, we will now see the session uh, turning hybrid cloud dreams into reality with Dell Technology. So there is, there is the slides. Uh, uh, guys, uh, the stage is yours, and I'm very happy you are also two MVPs, right? Yes, yes that's sure are. Um, Dell seems to have a habit of uh, collecting and cultivating uh, Microsoft MVPs and former Microsoft employees, um, as uh, Jaromir Kasper, who is also presenting, um, has just joined, just joined me um, and Michael's team. Um, we're super happy to have him. Um, but yes, yes, we're both Microsoft MVPs. Uh, we were both actually became Microsoft MVPs just this year. Um, so yeah, that's been awesome. Cool. So uh, and also welcome to Michael, right? Um, um, I think I'm right. Michael Welt, is that yes. correct? Yes. Thanks, Karsten. <laughs> Thank you for having us. So uh, go on with your session. I'm, I'm very interested in uh, especially the hybrid dreams come true. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> that, that go on, that, please. That was me. I tend to get a little bit carried away when it comes to um, hybrid and Azure. Um, so yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, we're really glad to be here. Very, very glad to be here. Um, we will do some quick introductions. Um, Michael will share for you the agenda that we've got today. 
we'll spend about 30 to 35 minutes talking, um, maybe 40 minutes, we'll see. Um, and then we'll have time for Q&A. &A. So any questions, get them into the Q&A function and we'll have time at the end to chat through them. And really looking forward to doing that with everyone who, who is here today. So I will start by introducing myself. My name is Lisa Clark um, and I work at Dell Technologies. Um, I'm based in Dundee, Scotland. So hello everyone from Scotland. Um, I've been in the IT industry for over 10 years now, which is, seems a little bit crazy. Um, I'm responsible for driving the Dell Azure Stack business across EMEA. Um, our team is responsible for evangelizing the product um, enabling our sales and our pre-sales um, teams, supporting our partners when it comes to um, realizing their Azure hybrid dreams. Um, we're all we're the team to make your dreams, your Azure hybrid dreams come true. Um, I also kicked off a podcast called Lisa at the Edge in 2020 when we were all in lockdown. Um, so I thought it was a bit now or never. Um, and then I was also lucky enough to be awarded Microsoft Community Hero and Inclusive Leader badges. Um, I think that was the end of 2019, beginning of 2020. And uh, so yeah, super happy to be here and can't wait to, to talk more about the, the Dell offering when it comes to Azure Stack HCI. Um, I will hand over to my teammate and friend Michael to introduce himself. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, so, like Lisa, I'm part of the engineering technologist team uh, here at Dell Technologies, specifically covering uh, the Azure Stack portfolio of products, so Azure Stack Hub, Azure Stack HCI. Um, uh, this is what we do all day is, is, is uh, talk Azure Stack. So we, we are the, the deep technical resources within our organization, um, supporting our, our, our sales teams and, and our customers. Uh, I joined Dell back in 2015. Um, uh, this has been my first uh, venture into the vendor side. Before that, I was always on the customer side. Uh, so throughout my career, I started out doing uh, software support, moved into development, moved, became an application architect, and then shifted over to database administration. So um, always uh, the entire time being in the, the Microsoft space. Um, Love to be active in the community. Um, love supporting user groups. Uh, I've had the the privilege to speak at a number of different conferences, um, and so I I always love to take every opportunity to talk tech uh, uh, whenever possible. Um, I just love to share my love and passion for the technology with everybody that I can. Um, that included running a user group for a number of years, uh, but. Um, a few years back, we relocated uh, from Florida up uh, north. Uh, so uh, my wife and my uh, two-year-old daughter, uh, we are now in uh, upstate New York. So um, much different climate, uh, loving having seasons again. Um, and and um, as was mentioned, Lisa and I are both um, Microsoft Azure MVPs. And I would just like to point out that I was responsible for writing our names and our roles on the slides, and I have, I have not updated Michael's role. So Michael is actually uh, a senior uh, principal um, engineer at <laughs> and not actually, he's got my role. He's got my role. <laughs> I completely missed that. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what we're going to cover today, so we're going to talk about just laying the groundwork, um, the, the different options for uh, getting Azure Stack HCI from an OEM, the, the validated nodes versus integrated systems. Uh, we're going to go into detail on the Dell EMC solution for Azure Stack HCI. So um, what's different about our solution or what makes our solution uh, unique? We're going to dive into some really cool new announcements around the Dell hardware. Um, uh, and then follow that up with some uh, uh, just as cool announcements around our open manage integration and our management environment for that. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with, with some summary information. Mm -hmm. So I will hand it back to Lisa. This is an interesting session for us because um, it's not often that we get to fully focus in just on the, the Dell side of things. So quite often within our role, 
we go out there and we're actually pitching the Microsoft message and the Azure hybrid by design and Azure Stack and Azure Arc. And um, but today we just get to sort of drill down on the Dell stuff, which is which is nice. Um, so yeah, we thought we would just take a little bit of time to set the scene um, in terms of a validated node versus integrated system. Um, because these are the two hardware options um, available for deploying Azure Stack HCI. So OEMs who were looking to offer hardware solutions for Azure Stack HCI had the option of offering validated nodes and or integrated systems. Dell Technologies chose to go down the integrated system route based on our experience with VxRail, with vSAN ready nodes, our past experience with reference architectures and ready nodes for S2D and our other Microsoft solutions, we decided that the integrated system was the one for us, that the integrated system was the way to deliver on your hybrid, um, hybrid dreams. Um, and that's because at Dell, Dell is fully on board with the fact that this is an integrated Azure experience. And therefore it was extremely important to us to focus on the delivery of a fully productized offering which would allow customers to spend that time innovating with the, you know, this new ability to have Azure capability on prem. So what's the difference between the validated node and the integrated system? Well, of course, um, both options, ha the hardware is validated for the new operating system. Um, but then the story continues with the with the integrated system and you're getting a lot more. And I personally think that's really important when you're thinking about the fact that you are running a, an Azure service and then consuming more Azure services on top. Um, you want to ensure that this platform is configured and it's optimized for running your workloads and, and your additional Azure services. And you also want to be able to focus on the new Azure functionality and capability rather than thinking too much about the infrastructure that it's running on. So there's a few um, boxes that must be ticked for an integrated system um, and the level at which they are ticked um, can differ between different OEMs. Um, so the integrated system must include the pre-installation of the Azure Stack HCI operating sister, sy system either uh, via factory installation or as part of the deployment process. Um, Dell Technologies has recently announced the uh, factory installed OS across all of our AX nodes. Another requirement is that there must be tooling integration into Windows Admin Center to allow for lifecycle management. So Dell Technologies has developed the specific integrations between Open Manage and Windows Admin Center for full stack, fully automated lifecycle management. Um, OEMs and Microsoft must have collaborative support. Dell Technologies, we've been in this uh, game for a while with Microsoft. We've got our engineers co-located in Microsoft headquarters. We've got integrated end-to-end -end, uh, back-end support systems, um, which means that we can support the full solution, so both the hardware and the operating system, which is pretty cool. And we, of course, have joint testing agreements with Microsoft and invest a serious amount of engineering hours and manpower into validating and testing our solutions. And um, so that's just kind of setting the scene, validated nodes, integrated system. We chose the integrated system path and we have gone full steam ahead on that path. I just want to share this slide because I just like to highlight the strength of our partnership with Microsoft. Um, we're known for our partnership with VMware, but maybe maybe not as well known for our partnership with Microsoft, um, which is interesting because it's an extremely strong partnership. Um, not only are we number one in all the segments that matter when you're looking at hyperconverged infrastructure, we're also number one in the Microsoft solution segment. Um, and the reason for this is that we've been partners for over 30 years. We are the largest Microsoft partner um, and invest heavily in engineering power, like I've said, when it comes to developing these solutions. And I think that's important to keep in mind. It's uh, it's why people like myself uh, and my teammates, who are you know Microsoft MVPs or massive uh, advocates of Microsoft, choose to come and be part of this Dell team. Also, our team's pretty awesome, so that helps. <laughs> um, so when it came to developing our integrated system, we wanted to deliver immediate value and eliminate any friction between deploying, maintaining and updating the infrastructure and getting stuck into the Azure integration. We wanted just to remove any um, sort of friction between, between, those, uh, between those 
elements. We decided, like I said, to go all in on the integrated system. We took a fully productized approach, applying our hyper-converged expertise. Um, we are committed to investing and updating this offering for years to come. At the end of the day, Azure is hybrid by design. Hybrid is here to stay, and we want to be the partner who helps deliver on these Azure hybrid dreams and make them a reality. Um, because we understand that this is a truly integrated Azure experience, we see it much more than just validating hardware. We want to do it as much as possible um, to help ensure that the platform is the right one for our customer workloads. <laughs> um, and so by fully productizing um, this offering, we are able to support the entire solution, which includes the hardware and the operating system. So whether you have an issue with storage spaces or networking or the operating system, we, we can support it. Um, next slide, please, Michael. Um, so our AX nodes, much of this will be this sort of build up will be familiar to you all here, but our AX, AX nodes lay the foundation for our Azure Stack HCI integrated system. What are AX nodes? Um, they are our award winning Power Edge servers, which have been specifically architected and designed for our Microsoft hyperconverged infrastructure ecosystem. We offer multiple configuration options of hardware that have been validated and guaranteed to deliver the optimal balance of um, performance and capacity to address the, the broad set of Azure Stack HCI use cases and workloads. Um, it's now available on 15G configurations with the latest generations of both Intel and AMD CPUs, um, which deliver breakthrough performance um, and density for use cases, including Edge and Robo and data center um, consolidation. Um, so the AX nodes are really the beginning um, of realizing all of your Azure hybrid dreams. <laughs> um, like I said, Delta, we've uh, introduced factory installed um, Azure Stack HCI operating system across all of our AX nodes um, to remove the step from the deployment process. It reduces the complexity of installation and the reliance on professional services and the support team. So we reduce our customers cost and help them get up and running as fast as possible. We've invested heavily in our open managed integration for Azure Stack HCI, which really does differentiate us not only as an integrated system over the validated nodes, but really in the players who offer, it, offer the integrated systems as well. I'm not going to go into too much detail here. Michael's going to go into more detail um, in a moment. However, I would like to highlight some pretty impressive stats from the, the work of our awesome technical marketing team. So Mike Lamia, shout out to Mike Lamia, um, is part of our technical marketing team and he does not like to publish stats that he cannot stand behind. <laughs> and these stats were so good, we were nervous to put them out because they seem unbelievable, but they are entirely valid. Um, so what Mike did was uh, he took the time to get really, really good at manually deploying and updating. So he did it again and again and again and again and again until he was satisfied that he was he knew what he was doing. He was an expert. And and uh, and he was like at the top of his game when it came to manually deploying and updating the system. And then what he did is he tested that against the using our open manage integration. And the results were pretty crazy, right? So they were 97% less attended time required for the updates and an 82% reduction in manual steps. Um, this is super impressive and it absolutely delivers on the goals that we set out when developing our integrated system. Um, since Mike wrote that white paper and did that testing, we've continued to invest in and develop our integration with Windows Admin Center. So yeah, not all integrated systems are created equal. Uh, life cycle management from Dell means fully automated for both the hardware updates and the Microsoft updates, which I think is pretty spectacular. Um, so it's safe to say that when it comes to deployment and support, we've, we've got you covered. We've got our Azure Stack HCI customers covered. Um, 
the most important point here really is that by delivering this integrated system, we are able to provide um, one stop cluster level support for the hardware and the software. So like I said, whether you've got an issue with the operating system or storage spaces direct or um, the networking, our certified engineers are ready to assist. Um, so this gives you a high level view of um, our Azure Stack HCI offering and some of our differentiators. Um, Michael's going to take us through a little bit more in depth um, through our AX node portfolio and our open manage integration um, in a bit more depth. Um, so I'll hand over to Michael um, and let him let him take it away. I've potentially rushed through that a little bit. I get very excited. Get very excited about our Azure Stack uh, integrated system. But it just means more opportunity, potentially more opportunities for a chat at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I'll hand over to you, Michael. So um, now we're going to go deep into the, the hardware itself. Right? So what's new for um, the Dell AX nodes that, that Lisa um, uh, introduced you to? Well, the first thing, and this is um, brand new, hot off the presses, uh, we now have Intel-based uh, 15G configurations for Azure Stack HCI. These are two new uh, chassis configurations uh, built around the Intel Xeon third gen processors. Uh, these are the Ice Lake processors. Um, and then along with that, we've introduced additional uh, enhanced WAC integration um, to, to be able to, to um, uh, better manage those systems. So the first one we're going to look at is the AX650. Um, again, built around Intel Ice Lake. Uh, so this is a 1U two socket system. So available from 16 cores all the way up to 80 cores per node, uh, all the way up to four terabytes of memory um, uh, per node. Uh, this configuration will support 10 drives. Uh, so you can get up to uh, just under 77 terabytes uh, maximum raw storage. Uh, we have this available in all flash configurations, all SSD and all NVMe. Uh, we also have this available in hybrid configurations, so SSD plus spinning disk. Um, because these are the new uh, third gen Intel systems, uh, they are the new uh, PCIe Gen 4. Uh, we have an increased number of PCI slots, uh, which make these uh, GPU ready when those GPU configurations are available later on. All right. Uh, these uh, 15G systems also introduce our new BOSS 2 cards, uh, which are hot pluggable uh, M.2 drives for the operating system. That means if you were to have an issue with one of the disks, um, you could uh, pull that disk and pop in a new one. It will automatically start rebuilding that virtual disk uh, without interrupting the workloads running on that system, without having to reboot that node. And of course, this supports the uh, secured core uh, when that's released with the new uh, HCI OS. Next up is our AX750. This is a 2U two socket system. So uh, again, it's the same 16 to 80 core configurations uh, up to four terabytes of memory, but this time instead of 10 drives, uh, we can support uh, up to 24 drives. So that pushes this up to 184 terabytes max raw storage per node. Uh, uh, at initial launch, uh, it'll be available in an all flash configuration, all SSD, but we'll have all NVMe and hybrid configurations uh, following shortly behind. Um, uh, four PCIe Gen 4 slots, uh, and then uh, again, uh, GPU ready configurations. So uh, these will be uh, um, eligible for GPU upgrades when those are available. Add that to our uh, existing portfolio. We have the AX7525. This is uh, AMD based configuration. Uh, this is a 2U two socket system. Uh, again, uh, 24 drives. Um, this uh, is supporting both the uh, second gen and third gen uh, AMD Epic processors. So up to 128 cores per node. Uh, are available within these configurations. So if you're looking for compute density, um, this is uh, this is certainly a way to do it. We also have uh, for more of the edge use cases, the 6515. 
this is again based on the, the uh, AMD EPIC uh, second and third gen processors. Uh, so you can get up to 64 cores, but with it being a single socket, it's a um, shorter depth server, uh, but it's still capable of those high uh, core counts. So you can still get 64 cores within this. All right, uh, and then on top of that, our existing Cascade Lake based systems, our 14G systems. Uh, so these are available uh, with Cascade Lake and Cascade Lake refresh processors. Uh, the 740XD is our two socket 2U system. Uh, and then the AX640 is our 1U uh, two socket system. So all this comes together to, um, to form a, a pretty extensive portfolio as far as uh, form factors, capabilities, densities. Um, so the, a lot of available configurations uh, to meet the needs of your workloads. Uh, you'll see that um, with the 750, we'll have the additional configurations coming post RTS. Uh, what's available now is the all flash, all SSD version. Um, uh, you'll also notice with these, uh, we have called out specific configurations as being validated with stretch clustering. Um, so we've taken the extra step of validating those specific configurations um, with stretch clustering, right, to ensure that they're going to work properly. Um, that doesn't mean the other systems can't support stretch clustering, um, but because of um, the change data capture, the, the, um, the logging requirements, uh, to be able to, to track those changes as they occur. Um, you want fast storage to be able to apply those changes on the target side. So having that high performing storage makes a difference. So we've, we've um, made our focus those um, faster storage subsystems, um, but the other ones are, are gonna depend on the workload. Right. And then of course, all of the security of our PowerEdge system and with our new systems, the um, AMD Epic Gen 3 and the Intel Scalable Gen 3 processors are secured core server ready, right? So when that feature is available within the operating system, our hardware platform is already ready to take advantage of that. So that's with the hardware. Um, so now we'll dive into the open managed integration. So what good is great hardware if it's difficult to manage? So we've had our open managed integration with Windows Admin Center uh, for uh, a few years now, um, having the ability to do inventory monitoring um, update. Uh, it talks directly to the IDRAX within the nodes, so it's agentless. You don't have to install anything into the operating system. It doesn't require open manage enterprise running in the environment. I mean, if you're running it, great, but it doesn't have to be there. The uh, Windows Admin Center uh, extension is talking directly to the IDRAX within the nodes. So what can you do with it? Cluster monitoring and management, right? Real-time health status, overall cluster status, you can get status by the node, look at the health of individual components, um, hardware and firmware inventory, um, on those systems, right? All from within Windows Admin Center without having to leave that tool, right? It just shows up under the left-hand navigation. Under extensions, you see that Dell EMC Open Manage integration. All right, uh, our 2.0 release, uh, we introduced um, uh, additional automation for deployment as well as for uh, full stack cluster aware updates. So with the automated cluster creation, um, if you saw um, one of the sessions earlier this morning, you saw the, the process of creating uh, an Azure Stack HCI cluster using Windows Admin Center. Uh, what we've done is we've incorporated into that process through our extension, the hardware checks for that cluster creation. All right, so we're going to go through and check hardware compatibility. We're gonna check symmetry and make sure all the nodes match. Uh, we're going to make sure that all of the firmware and everything is at the same level across all the nodes. If it's not, um, you're able to remediate that and update those components right within the cluster creation wizard so that you don't have to stop what you're doing, go update something, and then go back to, to recreate the cluster. 
Why does this matter? Well, it prevents a lot of those issues that you could run into uh, if your nodes aren't matched or if the firmware levels are different between the nodes, if you have inconsistency problems, we eliminate that possibility by validating everything in advance uh, while you're trying to create that cluster. Full stack lifecycle management. So we introduced lifecycle management uh, through our cluster aware updating process in our 1.1 release. Uh, with our 2.0 release, we added support for updating the operating system for HCI OS. So now you have the ability within a single workflow to do OS updates, BIOS, firmware, and driver updates. Single automated workflow, one reboot per node. And because it's a cluster aware update, it's going to handle migrating the workloads. Um, so draining that node before it takes it out and applies the updates to it. So you're not taking any of your workloads offline during this process. All right. It is going to use uh, by default, it's going to use our online catalog. Um, but you do have the ability through the Dell EMC repository manager to create an offline catalog uh, if you'd like to. All right, and it's going to give you this nice compliance report uh, and be able to remediate um, anything that's out of compliance. All right, so let me jump out and do a quick demo here. Uh, for anybody who hasn't seen this, this is our interactive demo center. Uh, I'll have a link for this later in the, the deck, uh, but this allows you to demo functionality um, of, of our systems. Uh, we have a number of different capabilities in here, and this is open to everybody. So what I'm going to do is jump in and start the uh, one click full stack update. Right. So as you can see, we are in um, Windows Admin Center. So check for updates. It's found some operating system updates. Now we're going to do hardware updates. With this capability, you see the, the Dell Technologies extensions being um, called right from the Microsoft update piece. So we're going to say get updates. I'm going to pick the update source that I want to use. So it defaults to the online catalog, but again, I can use an offline catalog if I'd like to. Then it's going to generate the compliance report. So it's going to go through the inventory on those systems and it's going to tell me if anything is out of compliance with that update catalog. All right. So now I can see the summary. Here's the work that it's going to perform. I can go ahead and download those updates. So I'm going to pre-stage those updates. So pull everything down first. Um, the update catalog, I, I just kind of glossed over it, but it's it's important to understand the value of that update catalog. I'm not going out to dell.com slash support and pulling down random power edge drivers, right? We view this as an integrated system as a solution. So we maintain an update catalog specifically for Azure Stack HCI. Everything in that catalog has been validated to work together and to work with HCI OS. So you don't have any more questions as to what version of this driver do I need or what version of this firmware should I be or is this going to conflict with that? None of that, it, you don't have any of those questions because we've already tested and validated everything together. So when you're pulling from that repository, you're always pulling the latest validated configurations from us, All right? So now that I've downloaded those updates, I'm gonna go on to install, All right? I can see here it's gonna install the Windows update and then it's gonna install some solution updates and go. And here it's actually going through um, draining the node, um, applying the updates, rebooting the node, bringing it back in, moving to the next node in the cluster. All right, so we'll go ahead and jump back to the slide deck here. So that is the full stack um, lifecycle management. One of the things you didn't see, but you do have that capability is not just running the remediation immediately, but you have the option of scheduling that remediation to take place at a later time. And so 
maybe you've got a maintenance window over the weekend that you want to hit. You don't have to wait until the weekend to run the compliance check. You can run that compliance check well in advance and then schedule that update to take place later on. The newest updates to, to our uh, Windows Admin Center integration. Uh, so we just had our 2.1 release. It's now available. Um, so if you go out to Windows Admin Center and look at the extensions, you'll see 2.1. So we've introduced CPU core management and automation around cluster expansion. So let's talk about CPU core management. Um, why does this matter? Right. So Azure Stack HCI is consumed as an Azure service. That means you're paying per core monthly on your Azure bill for the size of that cluster. Right. Microsoft allows you to change the number of CPU cores within the BIOS to disable certain cores. The operating system doesn't see them. It doesn't report those back up to Microsoft, and therefore your spend, your OPEX spend is decreased. Why is this important? Well, it allows you to spend a little bit more on the hardware budget and get a higher core count CPU, but then disable some of those cores in the BIOS so that you're not immediately hit with the OPEX cost associated with that, but you can scale up over time as the workload requires it. So now you have the ability to scale up the nodes as your compute requirements increase without having to scale out to more nodes immediately, right? Or hitting that full spend right from day one. This is intended to allow you to grow that over time as your CPU demands increase, right? As your processing demands increase. This is not intended for gaming the system, right? So this is, um, it's not, um, do this core count today and that core count tomorrow or anything like that. The intent is this allows you to easily adjust your core count to the right size for your workload and then over time be able to scale that core count as you need to. So we'll just do a quick look at what that looks like. All right, um, I apologize, the call outs are in here. We are looking at a pre-release copy of this demo. Uh, this demo will be published out to the demo center uh, by the end of next week. Um, so uh, you'll have the same experience and, and everybody will be able to access it once it's published. Uh, but for now, we're looking at a pre-release version. So in the Dell EMC Open Manage integration, so you can see I'm on the server, um, or excuse me, I'm on the cluster here. I click the integration. Uh, I'm going to click configure. Uh, this particular system is a four node 6515 cluster um, with um, 24 core processors. So if I look at the node level details, you can see here are the nodes within the cluster, single CPU, 24 cores. I can look at the individual node and I can see the node details. I can see um, the, the um, CPU features that are available. But what I want to do is I want to update the CPU core count. Now, the first thing you're going to notice here is I have two sliders, uh, CCDs per processor and cores per CCD. I'm seeing this because this is an AMD EPIC system, right? The, the CCDs are core complexes, so you have a certain number of core complexes, and then each core complex has a number of cores. If this was an Intel-based system, I would see a single slider that is cores per processor. Right, but because this is an AMD system, I have the two sliders. So what I want to do is I want to reduce my core count. I'm going to cut it in half. So I'm going to change the number of CCDs per processor down to three. And I'm going to change the number of cores per CCD down to four. Right? I have the option to apply this now. It, is, it does require a reboot of the system. So we are going to leverage that cluster aware update capability to drain the roles off the node um, and, and, and update and reboot each node or I could apply this at the next reboot. So if I wanted to schedule the reboot to occur during uh, a maintenance window, I can, uh, I can set that to happen later. All right, but I'm gonna go ahead and say apply and reboot now. So if I click on the view details here, I can see the update in progress. You can see that it's running on node four at the moment. So we'll flip over to failover cluster manager. 
it's draining the roles from that node. So if I look at the roles, I can see that it's live migrating those VMs. All right, so I will flip back over to nodes. We'll see that that node is paused. It's now going down for the reboot. Flip back over. We can see that that node status is restarting. It succeeded, so now it's moved on to another node. All right, so everything. All right, so we're restarting that node. And it's going to continue to run through the remaining nodes within the cluster. All right, and that's it. I have now updated the core count within those nodes. So now if I come over here, I can see my current core count is 48. I have 48 available cores, maximum core is 96. If I look at the node level details, I can now see that each node has uh, 12 cores per CPU that are currently enabled. And again, if I look in here, I can see that 12 cores and so that's how the dynamic core management piece works. Streamline cluster node expansion. So similar to the way we incorporated our integration into the cluster creation, we have that capability now to uh, do that within cluster expansion. So if you're expanding an, ex expanding an existing cluster, adding additional nodes into it, we're going to be able to provide those same hardware validations uh, and ensure everything is running at the same level. All right, so you'd be able to see the, the configuration profile, any warnings uh, related to uh, node configurations, um, the hardware configurations within the nodes, drive configurations, things like that. You'll be able to see the update compliance. You can see that in this particular case, there's seven uh, components that are not at the correct update version, and you'll actually be able to remediate those as part of the cluster expansion. So again, you're not having to drop out of the cluster expansion process to then bring things up to date and then bring it back in. Uh, and again, this is to help prevent those issues uh, from things not being consistent within the cluster. So this all comes to uh, our uh, our solution as a whole and, and what the reason around why we believe the integrated system is the right way to deploy Azure Stack HCI, right? By having a fully productized solution, um, we can offer consistent outcomes with those configurations, right? We've validated all of the configurations. We maintain those. We've committed to maintaining those for years to come. We have a, a wide portfolio of offerings specialized for uh, multiple use cases, uh, different capacities, different performance points, um, and that portfolio is growing all the time. We have the um, extensive lifecycle management and integrated tooling uh, that we've built around this and that we continue to enhance over time to be able to increase the functionality that you can do directly from within Windows Admin Center and to make those outcomes more consistent, right? So to, to cut down on cluster creation failures, to cut down on cluster expansion failures, to ensure that things are being done right from the beginning so that you don't have to spend time keeping the lights on and you can focus on that innovation, right? The high performance architecture, um, we've pretty much standardized on 25 gig for everything, but we do also have 100 gig RDMA uh, available for those really high performance um, solutions. And all of this is backed by the global availability, support, deployment services, professional services um, uh, from Dell EMC. We've got some questions, Michael. So I think now is as good as time as any to um, go through them. So one uh, question that came through that I have answered and published was um, open manage is it included in the in integrated system cost or you know is it like an additional cost and um, the open managed integrations are included in the cost of our ax nodes so that's one answered and um, the other one another question is um 
in AX node switch list topology, can we upgrade from two, no two node cluster to three nodes cluster or uh, would we need to rebuild the cluster? Um, Michael, I think for expansion, you need to be starting with a three node. Well, so so the 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 challenge here is switchless, right? So um, the the way we identify these options, we have what we call switchless and what we call scalable, right? Um, switchless configurations are much harder to uh, to scale because it often involves the addition of new hardware into the system, right? So um, you may have to add additional NICs into the chassis to be able to support that expansion. Um, it changes the cabling, uh, the way you have to cable the nodes together. Um, so it's we we don't do expansion on switchless configurations. If you want to do expansion, if you if you think there's a chance that that cluster is going to grow over time, um, you really should look at at what we call a scalable configuration. And a scalable configuration can also start at two nodes, but can go all the way up to sixteen nodes. And that does use um, uh, storage uh, uh, storage switches, right? So RDMA switches uh, to provide those storage networks. Um, the other challenge with scaling of switchless configurations is we support switchless configurations in two node, three node, and four node um, uh, clusters. Uh, so if you've gone switchless, even if we gave you the ability to expand from two to three nodes or from three to four, you don't, you've got a physical limitation. You cannot expand beyond that point. Uh, so you, if if you think that there's a chance that you're going to need to scale that cluster over time, um, scalable is really the direction that you should be going. Um, you can, if you want, if you're trying to limit the cost associated with the networking piece, um, you can, we support both converged and non-converged networking. So um, in, in either of those cases, you can be using the same top of rack switches for both the storage network and the application network, um, or you can run fully converged in which you're using the same NICs um, uh, for both the storage network and, and the application and management network. So we do have those configurations available to help um, uh, adjust the cost or, or to account for the cost of the networking piece. Uh, but really those switchless configurations are intended for those robo use cases where you know your workload's not going to exceed a certain size, you know two nodes is going to account for that workload or three nodes is going to account for that workload. Um, but it's a remote site where you don't have IT staff in that site. You don't want the cost of storage switches. You don't want to have to maintain um, a the the firmware and the configuration on storage switches because it's not necessary. So if you think, um, uh, for instance, retail, right? So uh, you you want to have um, uh, hardware on site to be able to run the applications that the store needs to, to function, but you don't maintain an, an IT staff in the store. Uh, at best, you have regional resources that might be able to get out there uh, tomorrow or a couple days from now. So minimizing the infrastructure that you have to maintain at those sites really makes a difference. But you know that that site's not going to add more registers. You know that that site's not going to. Uh, it, there's already other limitations in place where that workload's not going to scale. That's where I would implement switchless. But if there's a chance of, of scaling that cluster over time, you're really better off doing a scalable cluster uh, with, with switches. So we've got a few more other questions. The problem is, is that whoever's an asking them is anonymous. So I'm going to guess that the most recent one is related back to the switch question that you've just answered. And um, from performance perspective, what is the recommended design, converged or non-converged? Um, so there's that's driven by the workload, right? So non-converged is going to give you the best performance because you are not competing with application traffic for the storage, right? So storage needs to, um, the, when we talk about storage operations, so we're talking about being able to retrieve those, um, the, the, the rebuild and rebalance operations. So being able to write blocks out uh, and being able to copy blocks or move blocks over. Um, that traffic is important, right? You need to have bandwidth. If you have a drive failure 
or uh, you have a node that goes down, those rebuild rebalance operations should take place as quickly as possible. So you will want to allow for that traffic. Um, if you're doing converged, uh, you can set hardware, or excuse me, you can set uh, quality of service, you can set bandwidth limitations uh, so that the, the application traffic can't go, can't pressure the, the storage traffic. Uh, but obviously, if, if you are very performance sensitive, having those isolated out onto separate uh, networks is going to give you the best performance. Now, the question is, what, how much performance is good enough for the workload you're trying to accomplish? So you need to balance that performance with the complexity and the management. Okay. Next question. Sorry, Michael, I'm firing them all at you. Um, hey, that's fine. Can I add three times 25 gig dual port NICs in the AX750 servers, three times Mellanox, for example, or what max amount of NICs with what max speed is possible? Um, I will have to take the maximum number of NICs question offline. Um, maximum speed we support today is 100 gig. Um, and that is the Mellanox Connect X6 cards uh, are capable of 100 gig. Uh, and with the 15G servers and PCI Gen 4, uh, that is true 100 gig, not um, not because you're no longer limited by the speed of the PCI Gen 3 bus. Um, so with the, the new 15G systems, PCI Gen 4 and the Mellanox Connect X6 cards, uh, we are 100 gig capable. Uh, and within the switching family, um, we have the 5236, I believe it's the 5236 um, switch is uh, fully 100 gig. So it's, it's 36 ports of 100 gig uh, performance. Uh, so we can certainly do those high performance situations. Um, but as far as the maximum number of NICs, so generally what we would do is we would have um, a single RDMA NIC that is two ports, uh, and then we would have uh, in a non or uh, yep yeah, in a non converged setting, we would then have a second uh, network card for the application and management traffic. Um, so the the RDMA card is going to handle your storage network, and the uh, rest of it is going to go through the application management NICs, uh, and that's generally another two port or four port NIC um, that can connect up to the same switch, different set of ports uh, with different VLANs, or it connect can connect up to a completely separate switch. So say for instance, if you already have an application. Uh, set of application switches within your environment that you want to connect into, you can use your application and management traffic against those. Um, I hope that answered the question. Thanks, Michael. Um, just looking through uh, some other questions. So in the presentation, we've mentioned AX nodes and S2D ready nodes. Um, are S2D ready nodes a different series? So we, sh I, we shouldn't really, S2D ready nodes should not appear in the presentation. Uh, the, there were a couple slides where S2D ready nodes were mentioned and that's for backwards compatibility. Okay. Uh, the S2D ready nodes were the predecessor to yes. our AX nodes. So yes. S2D ready nodes were a validated system. Uh, they were built around the uh, uh, WSSD program, the Windows Server Software Defined. Uh, so those, when we initially launched, those were um, based on Windows Server 2016. They eventually went to Windows Server 2019. Um, we we don't sell S2D ready nodes anymore, right? So if they're, if they're out there, um, we have the ability in, in some cases to, um, uh, to provide the uh, elevated licensing so that you can add matching AX nodes into the cluster and get the entire cluster up to the AX node capability level. Um, but as far as new servers, we don't offer the S2D ready nodes anymore. Everything's moved over to the AX nodes yep. um, over to that integrated system. Yep, yep. OK, um, there's no more questions um, currently in the chat. I know we've got um, some sessions upcoming that we want to give a shout out to. If you do have any more questions, pop them in the, the q and um, we've got a couple of minutes so we can take them. Um, if you do want to find out, if you want to find out more, 
um, about the Azure Stack HCI integrated system from Dell Technologies, then then the, then definitely um, take a trip to our, I would definitely go to the info hub page. That is where you'll find all of our white papers, our videos. Um, there's some really, really great content there. Um, I would definitely go there. You've got the demo center link there as well. Um, so you can go and walk through the demos for yourself. Um, but yeah, if you want to learn more, here is all of the information. Yeah, Lisa and Michael, actually, I have a question. Carsten speaking. Can you hear me? Yes, yes absolutely. Go right ahead, Carsten. Cool. So you showed this nice uh, Windows Admin Center integration. I, I know the uh, Open Manage add-in, but you showed some things that were very cool. So my question is, when it is when is it available public uh, publicly? You mentioned that it's available in the demo center end of next week, but how can customers get it? Because I have already done uh, installations with Dell hardware, and uh, that looks that looks very nice. So the, the Open Manage integration for Windows Admin Center uh, 2.1 is already available uh, in Windows Admin Center, so you can already update the extension to that 2.1 version. Uh, and as long as you're running AX nodes, um, that feature and capability is there. OK, cool. So I, I have a, a tip that, uh, that I ran into with, uh, with the customer deployment. So when you use the Windows Admin Center update of Azure Stack HCI, it will install a cow role on the servers and uh, put in a schedule for the third Tuesday of the month, 3 a.m. in the morning. So you have to be aware if you use this update part in Azure uh, from WAC, that's that's a preferred way from Microsoft, that it that there will be an automatically update every third, third Tuesday uh, every month at 3 o'clock in the morning. So some customers maybe don't want their cluster self update itself, and I assume it will also uh, is also true for the hardware components because it's an integral uh, part of uh, the win, uh, the um, cluster aware update, right? Well, so the, the cluster aware update uses a separate scheduling function that's okay. within our extension. So it's not going to use the WAC automation. So when WAC does that automatic update of Windows Admin Center, it's doing that on the Windows Admin Center host. Um, when we talk about the cluster aware updating and the ability to schedule that to occur, that's using a different scheduler. So what you're doing is you're running through doing the compliance check, identifying that there are components that need to be updated, and then you get to specify the date and time that you want that update to execute. And that's completely separate from the auto update within Windows Admin Center. Um, you also have the ability um, to, if you want to, you can do the, the um, install now where it will immediately go and, and apply those updates. Um, but the, that scheduling feature is, is something new that was added in, uh, in 2.0 um, to give you the ability to, to shift those updates to occur during a maintenance window. OK, that's really great to to uh, to hear because I think some customers are afraid doing something like firmware updates or driver updates automatically. They want to they want to have a look on it when it's done and so. So that, that's uh, that's really great. And I have another question. Um, you mentioned the differentiation between an integrated system and certified nodes. As far as I know, I don't know if it's true also for uh, for certified nodes, but with an integrated system, the vendor also um, agrees to update the firmware and the drivers of the components for five years, right? Because we had some issues in the past, not with Dell, with other vendors, where uh, there was no, no new firmware for some components, um, for example, for Windows Server 2019. So a customer, uh, bought an installation late in 20 or early in 2019 and then uh, wanted to update to to the 2019 operating system but his hardware was not certified for 2019 so i, I as far as i know for an integrated system that is a must that uh, that you uh, that you agree with uh, with the microsoft contract to do that for 5 years for the systems right or am i wrong 
No, that is absolutely correct. And that, that is a requirement of the integrated systems. It's part of what we call that joint support agreement. Um, yeah. that, that that we agree to support those systems for um, a, a given period of time. Um, so so yes, we have to 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 commit to providing those firmware BIOS and and driver updates for that period of time uh, for certifying the platform for the new versions of the operating system. That's not something that's required of a validated node. So that's okay. another important distinction. Yeah. Okay, cool. So okay. if there are no more questions, are there more questions? Um, I don't think so. Some are just comments um, in the Q&A. Um, I think we've answered all the main questions, um, but we just wanted to give a shout out to some of the up and coming sessions that we're particularly interested in. Um, the Azure Stack HCI roadmap session is straight after this one, so we'll be hanging around for that. Um, Michael, you're particularly looking forward to the secure core service. Yes. Session. Um, so as I had mentioned, our 15G platforms, if you're using the third gen AMD and the third gen Intel, um, are already ready for secure core when that feature is released in, in HCI OS. If you're um, interested in learning more about what secure core is, um, uh, I recommend uh, checking out the session. It's the last session of the day, um, secure core server for Azure Stack HCI. Uh, and then, of course, we, we have to mention uh, Yarmir's session uh, at the start of tomorrow uh, covering um, uh, his uh, new HCI uh, 21H2 features uh, with MS Lab. He's been putting a lot of work into updates for MS Lab to be able to support um, testing 21H2, uh, adding new capabilities, being able to, to use MS Lab to test on bare metal hardware and not just on virtual machines, um, uh, incorporating hardware updates into the process. He's doing more work related to the operating system. So absolutely check out his session tomorrow uh, for more information on, on what he's doing with MS Lab. Yeah, absolutely. And then because of the, the slight schedule update, really looking forward to the panel discussion tomorrow as well. So yes, yeah, super excited to be here. Thanks again, Carson, for having us. Um, I'm looking forward to the rest of the event. Yeah, thanks so much, guys. It was a great presentation, Lisa and Michael. Uh, really nice having you. And now we, we switch over to the... Uh, yeah, to the long-awaited roadmap from Cosmos Darwin. He just joined the team live event. So um, I'm really exciting to hear from Cosmos uh, what's coming in 21H2 and maybe beyond. Cosmos, take the stage, stage please. Thank you very much, Karsten. Can you uh, confirm that you're able to hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. And if you share your screen, we are golden. Uh, yes, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um... Let me know uh, if you are able to see my slides. Yes, we see your slides, Cosmos. Uh, do you want an introduction or do you introduce yourself? Oh, that's fine. I can I can introduce myself. Um, <laughs> okay, so go on, please. Thanks. So let me, I guess, say good evening to everyone who's tuning in from uh, Europe, which I imagine is sort of where the center of gravity of this is. Uh, you'll have to bear with uh, me and some of the subsequent presenters as it is a little bit early in the morning in the US. Um, but we're really delighted to be here, and I want to take a brief moment to thank Karsten and all the organizers for putting this event together. Uh, these are great. I was a participant in the um, Azure Stack HCI days last year. Uh, I'm delighted to be back this year, and we've got a whole crew of uh, presenters from Microsoft, uh, as you'll see over the course of today and tomorrow. So uh, yeah, thank you, Karsten. Thank you to everyone who's been involved with organizing this event. Uh, I'm very excited. What I'd like to do for the next um, 45 minutes or so is talk a little bit about the roadmap for Azure Stack HCI. And in particular, I'm, I want to try to just uh, zoom out a little bit and talk about you know, what it is that Azure Stack HCI uh, is all about. Why is Microsoft doing this? How does this fit into our strategy? Uh, what are some of the things that you can expect over the coming weeks and months from Azure Stack HCI? And maybe a few hints about things that are coming even further, uh, further away than that. So specifically, uh, I'll get into my agenda in a moment, but if anyone uh, has not uh, heard from me before or met me before, my name's Cosmos. Uh, I'm a principal PM manager on the Microsoft Azure team focused on Azure Edge and Platform. Uh, so I lead the PM organization for Azure Stack HCI. 
I have the privilege of working with many of the presenters that you'll hear from over the course of the next two days. Uh, and it, in most cases, if I say something and it doesn't have enough detail, uh, there will be more detail coming from one of those other presenters over the course of uh, the rest of Azure Stack HCI days. OK, so without any further ado, then let me uh, let me dive in. So here are the topics that I specifically want to touch on over the course of this session. First, just a brief look at sort of what is the Azure strategy and how is that evolving and how does Azure Stack HCI fit in? Uh, then I want to talk a little bit just about sort of the basics and we'll level, level set everybody on what is Azure Stack HCI. Uh, I want to talk about some of the key investment areas that we have, some of the focuses where based on customer feedback and based on uh, what we believe makes sense for the product, we have been making some significant investments in areas like management and uh, host and hypervisor level innovation. So I'll talk about that and give a few examples. I have just a couple demos, not too many, um, but as I said, there will be many more demos from the other presenters over the course of the event. Then I want to talk a little bit about updates and lifecycle because I think that's important uh, when considering, you know, how to think about 21H2 and how to think about subsequent releases of Azure Stack HCI as well. Uh, and then I'll just touch very briefly on what are some of the things to, that we can look ahead to. So that's the agenda. Those are the topics that I'd like to cover in this session. Uh, let's dive in then and start by talking about the Azure strategy. Now, in case you missed it, the Azure strategy has been evolving. And so if you look, you know, five years back at what, what was the message coming loud and clear from Redmond, right? Azure five years ago, the message was migrate to the public cloud. Uh, and uh, if you watched any keynote at Microsoft Ignite or an event like that, uh, all you would hear was Microsoft executives coming up on the stage saying, hey, we have more regions than any other vendor. But that's, by the way, that is still true. Uh, and you should definitely take your workload and move it into an Azure data center. Uh, the public cloud is the future. Uh, you know, that was it, right? That was the story. And that's changed considerably in the last few years. And if you were to listen to a, a keynote presentation from someone like uh, Scott Guthrie, who leads the Azure organization today, uh, you would hear a very, very different tone. The emphasis is uh, not on simply migrating workloads to the public cloud. Sometimes that is the right thing, of course. But really, Azure today is about helping you to innovate anywhere to innovate wherever it makes the most commercial sense for you and your business, whether that's in the cloud, oh, that's great if it's in the cloud, whether it's a hybrid environment, whether it's on-prem or in multi-cloud or at the edge, wherever it makes sense for a workload to be run for your organization, we want to meet you there. As the Azure team, we want to build tools and services that you can take advantage of wherever it makes the most sense for you. And that's a really significant change from the strategy from five years ago. And I think it's important to just start by acknowledging that because uh, sometimes I meet people who haven't been uh, paying super close attention to Azure for a few years because they think, oh, well, that's the cloud and you know, there's, there's a reason my business can't use the cloud. Maybe it's regulatory, maybe it's uh, some sort of other reason, uh, technical reason. And they say, okay, well, if it's Azure, then it's not for me. And I, I really encourage you, uh, if you feel that way, to take another look at some of the tools and some of the services that are coming from Azure, because it's it's frankly astonishing, especially if you think of Azure like the message five years ago. It's frankly astonishing some of the things that are being built. And in many cases, I'm willing to bet you can take advantage of them, uh, even if you sort of are the kind of person who thinks, well, I'm not really, I don't really use the public cloud very much. So I think that's an important place to start, is just with that changing strategy, at, even at the highest level in Microsoft Azure. Okay. Uh, just to emphasize, by the way, you know, you, you go to azure.com and like literally the word on premises is is what you see on the home page. Like there's this developer who's enjoying her $200 of credit and then there's where, where should you use Azure? And the first thing is on premises. So uh, I, I, this is a very serious strategic shift from Microsoft. How does Azure Stack HCI fit in? I think that's a, an important uh, thing to add on to this. You know, we've got the high level strategy. Uh, given, given that Azure is really focused on helping customers to innovate anywhere, uh, it makes sense that we're actually increasing our focus on our on-premises products. And in particular, we have a significant renewed focus on Hyper-V and on virtualization and on software-defined infrastructure and edge infrastructure. One of the ways you can see that is that we've been transforming Azure Stack HCI from being simply uh, a scenario, one of many scenarios or features in Windows Server, to actually its own product line. And there are a number of things this lets us do, which I'll talk about a little bit in you know, life cycle and so on. But 
But now Azure Stack HCI has grown up, basically. It's moving out from home. It's no longer just a feature within Windows Server. It's actually its own distinct product. It's a product focused on being the best virtualization host. This actually has the benefit that it allows us to focus Windows Server even more on what people really use it for, which is primarily guest workloads and traditional server workloads. And this new Azure Stack HCI product has a life cycle, which I'll cover toward the end here today, uh, which is actually, uh, I think, pretty exciting. It's much, much quicker. And so our ability to deliver innovation for Azure Stack HCI is no longer going to be every two or three years, but actually every one year. Uh, and the 21H2 feature update is a great example of that. And the reason that we're focusing more on Hyper-V and more on HCI today than we ever have in the past is because of this strategy from Azure to meet you where you are and to deliver tools and services that you can take advantage of in whatever way makes sense for you, whether it's hosted by us or whether it's hosted by you. Uh, again, this is a, a very profound shift strategically. And so you can see that in the original announcement for Azure Stack HCI when we made this transition from just being a feature of server to being our own product. Uh, the person who announced it was not me. <laughs> it wasn't my boss. It was actually Satya Nadella, the chief executive officer of Microsoft, uh, conveying the importance, if you sort of look specifically at what he said, of things like consistent management from the portal and regular feature updates. Uh, and Again, a, a very profound uh, strategy shift from, from Microsoft. Now, there are sort of two big pieces to the Azure Stack HCI strategy. So if we zoom in now onto hyperconverged infrastructure specifically, there's two things we're doing. The first is we're trying to bring as much Azure management innovation as we can so that you can take advantage of it with your on-premises clusters. And that looks a lot like ARC enabling our infrastructure by default, making it manageable from the Azure portal and building integrations with Azure management and Azure security services. So this is a huge focus for us. There's a few things that are already launched. There's a few more things that I'll touch on briefly today, and there's going to be a lot coming over the coming months and years. And so this is sort of a theme that you can look for, is us bringing Azure management innovation. People love the management tools in Azure and bringing that so that you can take advantage of it with your Azure Stack HCI. The other big focus for us is around Azure host innovation. So I've said this uh, before, but I think a lot of people probably don't know. We actually uh, are a single engineering team here at Microsoft that is responsible for two things. We're responsible for Azure Stack HCI, and we're also responsible for the rollout of the Azure host OS. So there are more than a million physical hosts in Microsoft data centers that our engineering team is directly responsible for providing the OS, rolling out that OS, keeping it patched. Uh, literally, our team is very, very busy uh, at the same time of the month that you are, because we have a million machines that we're responsible for. And what's cool is with Azure Stack HCI, we have an opportunity to take some of the hypervisor level and the host level innovation that our engineering team develops for the Azure fleet and deliver that in a way that you, our customers, can actually take advantage of it on your own fleet, on your own servers that run on your premises. And so that's a second big theme for us that you can uh, look out for and that you'll see us doing things not only this year, but over the coming months and years beyond that. These are two big pieces of our strategy with Azure Stack HCI specifically as part of that overall Azure strategy. So I hope that that uh, serves to kind of frame a little bit what our team is doing, how we're thinking about this product and uh, why it makes sense that actually within Microsoft and within Azure, this product is getting more and more focused from Microsoft. Uh, as part of that new strategy. OK, so let's let you know, let's talk concretely, you know, what is Azure Stack HCI? And we can get into uh, a little bit less strategy and a little bit more just uh, plain and direct facts. First and foremost, Azure Stack HCI is a new operating system specifically aimed at hyperconverged infrastructure scenarios. And so it's our latest bare metal hypervisor that has built in software defined storage and software defined networking. It has a composition that's been optimized and reduced so that it doesn't have all of the other things that you don't need. Uh, and you can see here that when you install it, uh, there is clearly some shared heritage with Windows Server, but there are also clearly some differences. Uh, and over time, those differences, I suspect, are going to become slightly more pronounced as we work on bringing as much innovation as we can from the Azure host and also continuing to streamline the actual composition of this image. And so one thing that you'll see is uh, between Azure Stack HCI version 20H2 and version 21H2, 
uh, a significant uh, reduction in the number of roles and features that are there that you might not need. What you'll see in the difference between 21 H2 and I guess this is a reveal, 22 H2 is you'll actually see the out-of-box experience change more significantly. So it looks a little bit less like Windows. And this will be a gradual story over the course of many, many releases. Um, but I think the first sort of concrete thing to know is yes, it is a distinct operating system uh, that is specifically tailored for this scenario. Uh, now, I want to be really clear just because sometimes uh, I, I've seen folks get confused. Azure Stack HCI runs on your servers on your premises, right? So this is, in spite of all of the talk about cloud, this is fundamentally a bare metal OS that runs on industry standard servers. Uh, you've heard from folks today uh, from some of our great partners like Dell, uh, and uh, you run this on your physical premises. But the key thing is that Microsoft is delivering Azure Stack HCI as a hybrid service. And so what I mean by that is, there are not software licenses that you need to go to buy for Azure Stack HCI. If you're an Azure subscriber, you simply bill it to your Azure subscription automatically. There's not a standalone legal agreement. There's no EULA for Azure Stack HCI. Uh, it's simply covered by the Azure service terms. There is no separate support uh, contract or support you know, price list or anything for Azure Stack HCI. It is simply covered as part of your Azure support contract if you are an Azure subscriber and you can request support from the Azure portal uh, just like you would for any other Azure service that you use. And there's not uh, versions that you need to go out and decide which one of these am I going to buy and then do I want to pay for an upgrade. Uh, it's an always up to date product where you get continuous feature updates included as part of the subscription fee. And so on the one hand, it's definitely on prem. Like, I think it's very clear, right? It runs on your servers that you control and your premises, you're the administrator, you can use the management tools you like. On the other hand, in many ways, it's uh, packaged as an Azure service. And I think that's a very interesting uh, and sometimes confusing for, for folks uh, dichotomy that I, I, I'm hoping that I can clarify here. There are uh, parts of the user experience. Uh, that previous slide is very businessy. There are, there are real user experience consequences for this. Um, so like you can see your Azure Stack HCI in the Azure portal. Uh, you can request support through the portal. You can see your billing in the portal. Um, and so these are some sort of user experience consequences from the same idea, which is that Azure Stack HCI really is delivered as an Azure service. Okay, now I talked about our strategy having two important areas. The first one is Azure management innovation. The second one is Azure host innovation. And so what I'd like to do now is specifically talk about each of these. Uh, and I'll give some examples and some demos and some sort of uh, indication of what's coming next uh, for each of these areas. So I'm going to start with Azure management innovation. And then a little later, we'll transition into talking about Azure host innovation. So let's start with management innovation. And the key thing to start with here is Azure Arc. Now, I'll forgive you if you find Azure Arc a little confusing. So Microsoft has been talking a lot about Azure Arc over the recent uh, years. We first talked about it at Microsoft Ignite 2019, which of course was our last in-person Ignite. Um, and in the two years since then, uh, there's been a ton of capability and a ton of new scenarios that have been brought to Azure Arc. So the first thing I want to do is just sort of unpack <laughs> what are all these different pieces of Azure Arc and how do they relate to Azure Stack HCI? The whole idea with Azure Arc is to enable you to manage a resource that is outside of the public cloud from the public cloud control plane. And so sitting in the Azure portal, using Azure tools like the Azure CLI or the Azure SDK, you can interface with and manage resources that are actually not in an Azure data center, even though they appear like an Azure resource. That's the common thread across all of these parts of Azure Arc. But what exactly is that resource? That's what's different. And that's where there's a lot of different pieces that are applicable to Azure Stack HCI. For example, you can manage the HCI infrastructure itself with Arc enabled hosts. And that's what I'll give a demo of in a minute. Uh, for a few of you who are part of this private pre preview program, you've probably already seen that you can also create and manage VMs on the Azure Stack HCI cluster using the ARC resource bridge. This is something that we've talked about a little bit publicly. Uh, I think most folks are aware that there's a private preview going on. Uh, this is something that we'll be transitioning to public preview pretty soon. You can also manage 
uh, the guest OS inside of those VMs by ARC enabling the virtual machines. If you deploy Kubernetes using uh, AKS on Azure Stack HCI, you can actually ARC enable your Kubernetes clusters and then manage those using the tools that you would use to manage AKS in Azure Cloud. So that includes things like GitOps, um, an Azure policy to configure the Kubernetes clusters. And there's a selection of services, including data services and app services, like web apps and Azure Functions, that you can run on Azure Stack HCI. They actually are packaged to run on top of AKS, on top of Azure Stack HCI. And by ARC enabling those services, uh, you can actually manage them from within the Azure portal as well. And so there's a lot here uh, under the umbrella of Azure Arc. And you can see that some of it is already in preview, some of it is already generally available. Uh, and really that last kind of piece of the puzzle, which is the ability to provision workloads on the fabric from the resource bridge, uh, we expect to have in public preview very shortly. So I hope that this sort of brings a little bit of like organization <laughs> to all of the different things that are possible through Azure Arc, uh, and all of which are uh, relevant and applicable to an Azure Stack HCI deployment. Now, the one that is sort of closest to my heart is managing the HCI infrastructure. And so I do want to uh, start by talking just a little bit about that one. And I'll give a, a demo of this because I think in many ways a demo is more valuable than slides. Let me give you uh, an example then of what I mean when I say that you can manage your infrastructure through Azure Arc. And specifically, I want to give a demo of something called Azure Monitor Insights for Azure Stack HCI. This is a scenario that's been in preview since a little bit earlier this year, since May, so hopefully a few of you have had a chance to see it already. Uh, but I think it's a great illustration of what the team is doing, extending the power of Azure Arc to Azure Stack HCI. Let me give you uh, an example of where this would matter. One of the problems that we hear about frequently from customers with Azure Stack HCI is that Windows Admin Center is, is great if you have a single cluster that you want to manage, but if you have multiple clusters at multiple locations, uh, it is not that easy to monitor all of them in a single pane of glass. You basically have to monitor them one by one using tools like Windows App Center. Increasingly, we see customers with many deployments. In fact, this is uh, astonishingly common. Hyperconverged infrastructure is great. One of the strongest uh, scenarios for it is branch office and edge deployments, right? Because of the small scale, because it brings its own storage and you don't need a SAN or NAS product. And so we see a huge number of customers deploying HCI at the edge and in branch offices. But of course, that means they have multiple locations. In fact, many customers already have um, like more than 10 different locations where they're running Azure Stack HCI. So how can they monitor those centrally? And this used to be a problem where we really didn't have a great solution. And Azure Monitor Insights is intended to address that problem by taking advantage of the power of Azure Arc. So let me give you a quick demo then, and uh, hopefully this will uh, be more valuable than any slides that I could show. So I'm going to start for this demo in the Azure portal, and I'm just in portal.azure.com. This is like on the public internet. There's nothing funny. Uh, and you can see that I have a collection of resources, including an Azure Stack HCI cluster resource. And so you can see it here. It's four nodes. Uh, they're from Dell, they're PowerEdge, they're great. Um, and each of these nodes is an ARC enabled server. And this happened automatically for me because I deployed version 21H2, which as you'll hear is coming a little later this year. Now, uh, that means I have all of the capabilities of Azure Arc for each of these servers. And I also have a set of capabilities like the one that I wanna show you, which is multi-cluster monitor. So I can connect this cluster with just one click in the portal here to a log analytics workspace in my subscription in Azure. Now notice that I don't have to leave the portal. I don't have to go uh, manually install some agent. I don't have to do something on every node. I just click that I want the logs capability right here conveniently from the Azure portal. And when that's set up, now I'm, I've done everything I need to do to monitor this cluster from Azure. Now, if I go to Azure Monitor in the portal, you'll see there's a set of resource types that Azure Monitor natively knows how to monitor. So there's like VMs and SQL, and one of those resource types is Azure Stack HCI. And so right here in Azure Monitor, again, this is not some weird version of Azure Monitor. I didn't have to go set something up that's complicated. I just went to Azure Monitor, and I can see all of the clusters that are registered with this subscription. And I can see things like the health of the clusters, the health of the nodes, 
the state of virtual machines that are deployed across all of these clusters, and even storage information for things like uh, data volumes and drives. So this is a lot of the same information that you'd get in Windows Admin Center. There's not new information here. But what's different is you can get to it conveniently from the Azure portal across all of your different deployments. And so if you have 10 or 100 or 1,000 Azure Stack HCI clusters deployed in your organization, you can see them all here. As you can see, there's a subscription picker at the top, so you can actually do multiple subscriptions if you want and see them all in one place. Uh, and then you can get a, an overview at a glance of if anything uh, requires your attention, right? If any of the clusters are unhealthy, if any of the nodes are down, if any of the VMs are stopped when they actually shouldn't be stopped, you can easily get that here. And then you can use tools like Windows Admin Center to drill in and actually take action uh, if you need to. So this is really easy to set up, which is a, a, an important criterion for us, um, and is I think a great example of how taking the power of Azure Arc and Azure Monitor in this case, we can actually address a scenario that previously we had struggled, I'll be honest, for, for many years to address, right? Uh, if you had multiple clusters of Azure Stack HCI, there was really no good way to see them all in one place. Uh, but here, with just a convenient click in the portal, you can easily do that. So this is something that we didn't have before. It's not us sort of trying to rebuild something from Admin Center here. Uh, it's really us taking that same information. It's actually the same APIs and everything underneath, um, but doing it at scale in a way where the information is pre-aggregated and cached up through Azure Monitor, through Log Analytics, and then you can see it all conveniently here in Azure Monitor. So how does that, um, how does that work, actually? Um, you might be wondering, you know, you clicked one button, okay, that's great, but that's always dangerous, right? When someone says, oh, it's just one button click, that means they're hiding something. So how does this work behind the scenes? Uh, the, the key intuition that you need to have here is that each of these host servers is actually an ARC enabled server. And so when you're in the Azure portal, like I just was in my demo, and I'm interacting with my Azure Stack HCI cluster resource, which as you saw is a native first class resource right there in the portal. When I click the button that says I want logs to be uploaded to a workspace and I, I you know, provide the information of the workspace, what actually happens behind the scenes is the HCI resource provider in Azure uh, is managing a collection of ARC enabled server resources for me. And those are each of my hosts. And with 21H2, when you register your HCI cluster, we automatically register each of the hosts as an ARC enabled server. So that means behind the scenes, each of these ARC enabled nodes has the Azure ARC infrastructure on the node, like there's an agent, the Azure ARC agent, the ARC connected machine agent specifically. And that agent will do things like install extensions if uh, Azure says, hey, this machine is supposed to have this extension. This works using the same mechanism as you might be familiar with already for Azure virtual machines. And so what this means is I can, you know, with just one click on the cluster, say, hey, I want this extension on my cluster. Behind the scenes, each of the nodes says, oh, okay, I need to go get this extension. And then it gets installed onto the node for me. And all of that is flowing over the connectivity established by Azure Arc. Um, which you can read about, but it's it's very nice. It's an outbound only model, so you actually don't even need an inbound firewall port for this. Um, the agent essentially pulls for the state in the cloud every couple of minutes and then installs agents if it needs to, um, which is what happened here for log analytics. And so just like that, without leaving the portal with a couple of clicks, I can connect all the nodes in my cluster to a log analytics workspace really easily. This is a huge improvement over how you would have had to do this before, which would have taken a lot of monkeying around, especially in a, a, a core based OS like Azure Stack HCI where you don't have the desktop to install things. Additional points I want to make with this solution architecture here is the way that we are setting ourselves up for management at scale. And so the demo that I did showed me enabling only a single cluster for monitoring. I already had three others in my subscription that were enabled, and so I was able to show you four of them on the screen. But I only showed you, you know, going to one cluster and then using the portal to actually click, like, install uh, this extension, please. An important insight here is that extension management, uh, and this is true of IaaS virtual machines if you use those, is already something that integrates well with the Azure CLI, with the Azure SDK, and with Azure Policy so that you can control it at scale. And this is a really important thing because it means if you have, say, uh, I mean, this slide shows three, but let's say you have 500 clusters and you actually have not set them up for monitoring. It would be really tedious to go one at a time 
and enable them for monitoring. And what you can do instead is just take an Azure policy, apply it to the resource group where all of your clusters are, and say, hey, every Azure Stack HCI cluster in this resource group or in this subscription, for example, should be uh, using Azure Monitor. And then Azure Arc will apply that policy for you. And uh, when you check back half an hour later, all of your clusters, and they're, what I really mean is all of your nodes, will be connected to the log analytics workspace that you specify. So this is really important because as we add more capabilities, uh, you don't want to have to go one cluster at a time and, and add them or remove them or edit them. And by the way, this works for editing the parameters as well. And so if you wanted to take 500 different clusters and point them all at a different log analytics workspace, that would be just a single Azure policy that you would have to apply, uh, same as rolling it out. Okay, now I, I don't have, uh, unfortunately, the ability to disclose much that is in the future, but I do want to give a pretty direct hint about something. Uh, there are over 100 extensions available for Azure Virtual Machines in Azure IaaS today. And if you, if you use Azure and if you use Virtual Machines in Azure, then you know what I'm talking about, right? There are just a ton of different extensions. Uh, the pattern that you can expect is that extensions will come to Azure IaaS first, and then we will bring them through Azure Arc onto Azure Stack HCI. And so uh, today, a number of extensions are generally available for ISVMs. That includes things like uh, the Azure Monitor agent for monitoring, uh, guest configuration for uh, specifically, I guess that's the DSC extension for uh, Azure Policy guest configuration. Uh, there are some extensions that I think many in this crowd will be aware of, like the Windows Admin Center in Portal extension, which is currently in public preview for IaaS virtual machines. Uh, you can install Site Recovery as an extension in Azure. Uh, and there's a public preview recently announced for uh, a second uh, significant update to the run command capability uh, where you can actually run uh, commands like such as PowerShell commands in virtual machines that you deploy in Azure. That's in public preview. So that's just a few examples of extensions that are already available to you in IaaS VMs. And what you've seen here today is the Azure Monitor extension is now in preview for HCI. And if, um, if you take my hint, you should stay tuned on uh, potentially other extensions uh, that will come to Azure Arc over time. Uh, now, there is, there is one that I think it's important to give a little sneak peek at because the team is uh, specifically working on something that many of you may already use through Windows Admin Center. And so we are working on packaging the Azure Site Recovery scenario as an extension so that you can enable it as conveniently as I just did for logs directly from the portal. So this is a render or a mock-up. This is not a real screenshot yet, um, but you can see similar to how there were logs and monitoring in the demo that I showed a moment ago. Um, we anticipate that very soon you will be able to actually enroll a cluster in Azure Site Recovery and configure that directly from the Azure portal. Now, with the intuition that I gave around extensions sort of gradually coming to Arc and coming to HCI, I don't think that this is surprising, <laughs> uh, but I do just want to sort of give you a sense for what you can expect as the team continues to move forward uh, for each of these scenarios where there's a hybrid management service and we need to integrate it with HCI. Um, having a really easy way to enroll either a single cluster through the portal or many clusters through the Azure CLI and the Azure SDK and through Azure Policy uh, is something that we're, we're very, very focused on in our team. So the demo that I showed used monitoring as an example, um, but there's a pattern here uh, and if you want to keep your eye out for what to expect over the coming months and years, uh, look out for this pattern of extensions coming from IaaS to Azure Stack HCI. Okay, so that's a little bit about Azure management innovation. Uh, one of the things that is all, you know, ready right now with 21H2, which is that multi-cluster monitoring, and a, a little look ahead at some of the things that the team is uh, able to hint that we're working on. Let's switch gears then and talk about host innovation coming to Azure Stack HCI, because I think that's pretty important as well. Uh, I've talked, I've mentioned the 21H2 feature update, also known as Azure Stack HCI version 21H2. There are some pretty significant infrastructure capabilities in that feature update that I'm really excited we are able to deliver to all of our subscribers later this year. Uh, you see a few examples of them here on the screen, and I'll touch on those. There's actually a lot more as well. 
Um, and so if, you've, if you're paying close attention, you may have noticed, for example, that uh, if you have a 21H2 preview channel cluster, uh, you can actually change the amount of bandwidth allocated for storage repair directly from the settings in WAC. Um, that's a, an example of something that's not on the slide, but there's a lot of little things like that that um, that you'll discover, I think, as you as you take the 21H2 feature update and as you as you explore it. A number of these uh, capabilities, and I think this is an important point, are actually things that the team is either developing for Azure right now or developed for Azure at some time in the past. And so, uh, for example, the dynamic CPU compatibility feature, uh, which is one of my favorites. This has been a long standing request from Hyper-V customers. Uh, this allows you to mix and match different generations of processor within the same cluster and not have to uh, reduce them all to a punitively uh, low sort of uh, min bar for compatibility. And so actually the cluster will intelligently figure out the maximum set of processor features that it can use that are common between the processors. Um, so this is a huge deal in terms of the performance uh, that you can get in a cluster that has mixed generations of hardware, which is awesome. That's an example of something that not only are we uh, developing and bringing to Azure Stack HCI this year, actually we're rolling it out to the Azure host as well this year. Um, so this is like something that's brand new that we're bringing to both audiences, our own data centers and your data centers at the same time, um, because just like we know on-prem customers uh, often have a good reason that they need to mix hardware generations, we're starting to mix hardware generations in our own data centers. And so we developed this capability and we're able to bring it to both Azure and Azure Stack HCI at the same time. Uh, some of the other capabilities that you see here, right, the ability to assign a GPU to a clustered VM and still have high availability with that VM. Uh, network ATC, which allows you to configure cl cluster networking centrally and have it not only propagate cluster wide, but also correct for drift if something drifts. Uh, thin provisioning, which really changes the interaction model with storage bases direct. You no longer have to worry about, did I get my volume sizes right? Uh, did I, oh, did I make that one too big? How do I balance my capacity across? You can actually be a lot more, uh, dare I say, carefree about storage provisioning um, because uh, the consequences are much lesser when you're using thin provisioning. Uh, these are all pretty significant capabilities that are coming in the 21H2 feature update. And uh, I, I, I don't think I have time to sort of demo all of them, so I'm gonna just pick one that I'll give you a quick look at. Um, and then you'll hear about the others uh, over the course of the event. Um, but let me just give you like a, a look at one of them. And it, it, one of the nice things, the reason I chose this is it's a pretty quick demo, which is sort of the point. Uh, Kernel Soft Reboot is a technology that enables uh, the Azure Stack HCI OS and hypervisor to perform a software only restart where it actually bypasses the entire power on self-test and preboot sequence. And so this uh, enables restarting a physical host for in a scenario like doing maintenance or applying an update, for example. You can actually restart a host uh, about 10 times faster than you would normally be able to performing a classic cold reboot. Uh, and that's if, that's if that sounds incredible, I mean, I agree with you, actually. Uh, we were really pleasantly surprised to discover just how effective this technique is. Um, and I can show it to you. So uh, in this very simple demonstration, you'll, you'll see it does not take long. Uh, I am performing a normal reboot and a kernel soft reboot on the same server, and we've sort of lined the videos up so that you can compare how long it takes. Uh, so this is a, a Dell uh, 740 integrated system. You can see uh, with kernel soft reboot, it takes just 19 seconds for the OS to come all the way back up. So I'm already here at this control alt delete unlock screen, right? The OS is ready to host virtual machines again after 19 seconds. The normal reboot, by comparison, because it has to do that entire, entire preboot sequence with the power on self-test and everything else, actually takes much closer to the time you would normally expect, which is like about four minutes to restart the server. And so that's that 10 times difference, right? You could actually restart uh, using KSR on the right 10 times, in fact, 12 times uh, before the first reboot you had attempted using a, a normal classic reboot had completed. So supporting kernel soft reboot is a requirement for all Azure Stack HCI integrated systems, starting with version 21H2 and going forward. Uh, and we're really excited for this to start rolling out to folks who've been working closely with our partners. You'll hear from Christina later, uh, some of the systems that we already have uh, gone through really thorough validation to make sure that they're able to perform a KSR and every driver and everything in the whole system is, is able to do that. Um, but I think when folks are able to get their hands on this, 
and start taking advantage of this capability is really going to change the experience of uh, applying software updates. Um, so pretty excited about KSR. Now I mentioned Christina, uh, and in fact, not only for KSR, but for any of these capabilities that I described in the 21H2 update, you can learn more over the course of the rest of this event uh, today and tomorrow, because we literally have sessions about all of them. And so whether it's network ETC, where Dan will be speaking, or thin provisioning for storage space direct, where Tina will be speaking, GPUs for HA with Alvin and Payment and Persid, secured core server and rebooting in seconds uh, with KSR. All of these topics, and this is, I think, a testament to the strength of this event, all of these topics actually have the program manager from Microsoft who is responsible for that feature giving a presentation over the course of the rest of today and tomorrow. So uh, if you're interested in these, which I hope you are, I definitely encourage you to stick around and watch these detailed breakout sessions. OK, now I, I keep talking about the 21H2 feature update, and I think it's a reasonable question to say, well, wait a minute, what is that and how do I get it and when do I get it? And, uh, you know, these features like GPUs with HA or KSR or thin provisioning or network ATC, these are great, but uh, like how, how am I actually going to how am I actually going to receive? Them? And so uh, with Azure Stack HCI, we've adopted a lifecycle of having regular yearly feature updates. And so we released version 20H2 late last year. We will be releasing version 21H2 later this year. And we are already very far into planning version 22H2 for next year. And we anticipate doing uh, yearly releases uh, every year thereafter, as you can see from this slide. Now, the, the key insight is that because Azure Stack HCI is delivered as a service and it is packaged as a subscription, uh, there's no notion here of needing to buy the new versions. So if you have an Azure Stack HCI, you are a subscriber, you are automatically entitled to any feature update that comes out uh, that is technically able to be installed on your system. And so uh, every customer who has 20H2 today will receive the 21H2 feature update this fall uh, and the 22H2 uh, feature update thereafter and so on. Uh, and this is, I think, one of the reasons that our team is just so excited about this new product is our ability to deliver innovation on a continuous basis is uh, significantly greater uh, than it used to be when we were just a feature of Windows Server. Now, there are a number of investments the team is making across the board to actually deliver on these feature updates. Uh, some of these, I think, will be pretty intuitive. You'll recognize them from other products. Uh, some of them are significant innovations in the server space. Uh, unlike anything we've done before, the 21H2 feature update for Azure Stack HCI will be available as an over-the-air update, meaning you will see a notification in the product and you'll be able to install it just like you would install a monthly patch. There's actually a lot of uh, cleverness that goes into the dynamic packaging of these updates. And so when you are offered the 21H2 feature update over the air, you're not just getting some kind of a stale image that's from months ago, you will automatically also get all of the latest quality updates prepackaged into that so that when you when you when you apply it, you have a single update to get all the way to latest one shot to latest is what the team calls that. And it, it's a pretty significant uh, benefit from a user experience perspective. There's also been a lot of work that the team has done to optimize how applying updates even even works. Uh, and so one of the big breakthroughs there has been uh, reaching a single reboot. So if you've done like a Windows Server in place upgrade before, you may remember like it can take a very long time and it restarts multiple times as part of applying. Uh, that is not the case with the 21H2 feature update for Azure Stack HCI. And so when you get notified that this over the air update is available, um, not only will it contain all of the latest changes, you'll be able to go straight to latest in one shot with a single reboot and you'll be able to leave your nodes in cluster membership the whole time. Um, and cluster aware updating will actually orchestrate rolling out this feature update for you, just as if it was a monthly patch. Uh, now, I think a screenshot sometimes is, is even more useful than words. So this is a, a quick look at how this will appear in Windows Admin Center. Uh, this, some of you may have seen this already if you've used the preview channel. This is rolling out to Windows Admin Center a little bit later this fall. Um, but you, if I can call your attention to sort of the middle of the screen, what you'll see is when there is a feature update and quality updates available, uh, the feature update is, of course, what Microsoft recommends because it includes all the quality updates also. So it's just kind of the best of everything. 
Um, but you will literally have this uh, radio button that allows you to select, like, do you want to apply the feature update or do you want to apply the quality update? And regardless of which one you choose, uh, it'll work the same way. So it's over the air with a notification from the Microsoft Update uh, CDN uh, in the same tool at Windows Admin Center. So hopefully that helps to clarify what the 21H2 feature update is. It really is unlike anything we've done before with servers. Uh, we've never published an over-the-air feature update like this. Uh, we've never been able to roll something like this out using cluster aware updating. Uh, almost everything that you're seeing here is, uh, is a significant step forward and it's uh, the work of a lot of engineers at Microsoft to bring this to reality. This is a, uh, an indication among other things of our commitment to Azure Stack HCI. I mentioned that some of the update technology here is actually being brought over from Windows Client. Uh, and I just, I find this chart really kind of stunning. So I wanted to share this with you. Uh, this visualization shows you the amount of time that it takes to apply a feature update for Windows 10 or Windows Client, uh, starting about three or four years ago, coming all the way to uh, actually a little bit into the future <laughs> with one of the, the, the updates that you'll, you'll get soon on Client. And so you can see the, the 50th percentile, which is the light blue line, that's the average time it takes to apply an update. It used to be about 80 minutes, meaning like an hour and a half almost. And very steadily over the last couple of years, that average time it takes to apply a feature update has come all the way down to just under five minutes is the average amount of time it takes to apply a Windows 10 feature update. The 95th percentile, meaning kind of the worst case that most people would ever experience, used to take 280 minutes, which like you have to do the math. That's almost that's almost five hours, it's more than four hours. And that worst case time has also been has also come down over the years to the point where it is now the same as the average time. Whether you have whether your system is average or worst case, it takes five minutes to apply feature updates on Windows client. Now it doesn't take five minutes. It's a little, a little longer still with Azure Stack HCI with this 21H2 update. But the team that is responsible for the update innovation and the technology that's gone into client here, uh, literally they are, they are now part of the Azure Stack HCI team and they are working on bringing all of the same experiential benefit to Azure Stack HCI. So this is what you can look forward to, uh, not just with 21H2, but also with our 22H2 feature update a year later and so on. Uh, this is our vision for an always up-to-date a hypervisor host for Azure Stack HCI. Now the 21H2 feature update I can say is less than two months away. We're getting really close. Uh, I'm looking forward to being able to talk even more about some of the things that are in this update. I'm looking forward to the day that it goes live and anyone who has a current cluster that's currently subscribed is able to get this update and it's coming very, very soon. So uh, definitely stay tuned for that. There are also going to be a handful of more surprises, and so I think it's important to acknowledge right what I've described here so far is information uh, that for the most part uh, is public. Most of it is things that are in public preview that are coming to Azure Stack HCI over the course of the rest of this year. Uh, but there are a few more things that we haven't talked about and then unfortunately I'm not at liberty to talk about today, um, but that you should stay tuned for as we move toward the 21H2 feature update and beyond. Now, I, some of you have probably put two and two together already here, but when I say that we're less than two months away, uh, you, you may have noticed like our biggest conference of the year is also less than two months away. And so I think you can probably guess at our schedule here. Um, Microsoft Ignite Virtual Conference, this was actually recently announced. Um, it, it's completely virtual. There's unfortunately no in-person component, um, but it's November 2nd to 4th of 2021. And so, uh, if you're eager to hear uh, all of what's new for Azure, including Azure services like Azure Stack HCI, I encourage you to register for Microsoft Ignite. You can do that at myignite.microsoft.com. And certainly information that's specific to Azure Stack HCI, uh, I and others on the team will be you know, tweeting about and writing blogs about as we get closer to Microsoft Ignite. This is a very significant milestone for us, and I think you can probably guess when the 21H2 feature update is going to be available. I do want to give one final, I guess, hint, for lack of a better word, at uh, some of the things that we're going to be talking about as we get to Ignite. Um, all throughout this presentation, I've been talking about really two big pillars of our strategy with Azure Stack HCI, bringing Azure management innovation to HCI and bringing Azure host and hypervisor innovation to HCI. 
And I gave you some examples, right? I talked about multi-cluster monitoring with log analytics, and I talked about kernel soft reboot, which we use to save like millions of minutes a year in Azure, and we're really excited to bring that savings to folks on-prem too. There's a third pillar of our strategy that we're going to be talking about for the first time at Ignite this year um, that we're calling Azure Workloads and Azure Benefits that are coming to Azure Stack HCI. And um, there's a bit of a hint on the slide as to one of the big announcements that will be part of that, but unfortunately I can't say more right now. So uh, you'll have to stick around, stay tuned, uh, and definitely tune into Microsoft Ignite in November. Okay, so that's what I wanted to cover in this roadmap session. Um, I hope that this was valuable information for you. Uh, just to recap briefly, right? We talked about the Azure strategy, uh, the role of Azure Stack HCI within Azure's strategy, how that has shifted from being all about migrating to cloud to now being a, a much broader strategy that includes uh, innovation at the edge and on-prem and in hybrid. Uh, we talked about sort of specifically how Azure Stack HCI fits into that. Some of the big themes for us, including management innovation and hypervisor host innovation that are coming to Azure Stack HCI. And then uh, the updates uh, in the 21H2 feature update and the lifecycle that you can expect, not only for 21H2, but also for feature updates thereafter, like 22H2. And uh, yeah, a quick look ahead at uh, reasons you should stay tuned uh, throughout the year. So like I said, there'll be more details on almost everything I've talked about over the course of the remainder of this event, uh, an incredible lineup of speakers, uh, and kudos and thank you to Karsten and the organizers again for both having me here and for having all of us here uh, to talk about Azure Stack HCI. Um, but with that, that's the content that I had wanted to cover. So thank you all very much. Yeah, yeah. thanks Karsten for, for, for the session. session. Now I have an echo. I think the echo is from, from Cosmo from side. Cosmo is this side? possible? Why should it? Yeah, so, so, so it's is muted, but I, th I think uh, Cosmos is still in the session. If we I, I hope so. Okay. So thank you, Cosmos, for the great session and the great teasers for things to come that you can't talk about. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to Ignite to learn more. Cosmos, have you still time for some uh, questions, uh, two or three questions maybe, or have you to go now? Yeah, absolutely. I, I have until the end of the hour. Cool. So one question was, Cost, a cost for Arc extension, mostly free, mostly costly, like an app store. I know this is asking you to be a fortune teller, but if you could speak to what that future might look like. Yeah, definitely. That's a great question, actually. Um, so the, and, and uh, luckily, <laughs> there's actually a really simple answer. So, uh, the cost for these extensions is going to be the same as in Azure. And so if something is free and included in Azure, it will be free and included on Azure Stack HCI um, in terms of these extensions, things like management tools and so on, right? Uh, and if a management tool or an extension is paid uh, in Azure, then that same cost, uh, usually that's because there's a real cost for us to deliver that service behind the scenes. So that same cost will apply on Azure Stack HCI. And so I can give like two examples. Um, Azure Site Recovery, if you uh, set that up for a virtual machine in Azure, there's a certain cost structure. Basically you pay for uh, the storage in a storage account. Uh, you don't pay for the VM, the, for the replica VM unless it's running. And I believe there is a flat rate fee, which I think is 25 US dollars a month, if I'm not mistaken, for Site Recovery itself. Um, that fee structure is the same if you set up site recovery for either an HCI host or for a virtual machine on HCI. Um, I'll give a different example, Azure Policy Guest Configuration. This is an interesting one because it's actually provided for free in Azure. It's a built-in part of having your workloads in Azure that you can apply guest configuration centrally. Um, it is normally something that's actually charged for. It's uh, six US dollars a month per node outside of Azure, but it is free on Azure Stack HCI. Um, and that is something that we'll be talking about as part of the sort of Azure benefits um, narrative is that our pricing for all of these extensions, it, the, the short answer is it's just the same as Azure. So if something's free in Azure, it's free here. If something's charged in Azure, it's charged here. Um, it's probably about 50-50 if you look at that slide of the ones I was hinting at, which ones are, are free. So like in Azure, run command is free. Uh, Windows Admin Center in the portal is free. 
uh, log analytics is paid, site recovery is paid, guest configuration is free. Yeah, it's about 50 50. Um, and that'll be the same on HCI. Mm -hmm. OK, thanks. So then I have a question from Martin. Martin is, of course, uh, I think a Microsoft service provider. So he asked if there is maybe a management white paper or guideline how an MS MSP can manage more customers with Azure Stack HCI. It's a great, I love that question. So the, the short answer is unfortunate, which is like right now the answer is no, we don't have a great white paper that explains this. Uh, but as we as we move in the direction of ARC enabling Azure Stack HCI more and more, and so you know today we talked about ARC enabling the host and some of the things you can do there. But as we add the ARC resource bridge, and especially as Kubernetes adoption increases and we have more and more folks with ARC enabled VMs and ARC enabled Kubernetes, um, it makes a ton of sense to uh, take advantage of Azure Lighthouse. Uh, which for folks who may not be aware, that's like a capability where a, an integrator or an MSP can actually see and, and potentially manage, depending on the customer's choices, resources on behalf of the customer from the portal. It makes a ton of sense to extend that Azure Lighthouse technology and those management capabilities to Azure Stack HCI. So we definitely have a, a person on my team working on this. Like it's a it's something we're very interested in. Um, but as of right now, we don't have a good white paper for it. But uh, there's also like we're not getting in the way of it. There's nothing preventing it. So if you are able to, I hate to say this, but if you are able to figure it out yourself for how Arc allows you to do this, then uh, it's certainly supported. You can do it. OK, uh, next question I have. Uh, that's maybe a difficult one. Uh, what happened to Azure Stack? I think the the questionnaire uh, means Azure Stack Hub. Is Azure Stack HCI the only option left to have compute on on Prem Azure wise, how is Azure Stack Hub different to Azure Stack HCI? Yeah, OK, good question. So uh, we have a family of products with Azure Stack today. We have Azure Stack Hub, we have Azure Stack Edge, and we have Azure Stack HCI. They are all quite different from each other, actually. And so Azure Stack Hub uh, is unique relative to the other ones in that it does not uh, actually connect to Azure in the way that I've described. Like you don't go to the public cloud Azure portal to manage your Azure Stack Hub. Instead, you actually get a fully self-contained autonomous little Azure region of your own, um, where you have a local instance of the Azure Resource Manager, a local instance of the portal. Um, and as a result, it has a somewhat larger footprint and a somewhat higher price tag uh, compared to some of the other members of the family. Uh, Azure Stack Edge is almost the, the extreme other end, right? So it's a Microsoft managed first party uh, hardware appliance that you can use to run containers uh, and going forward you'll probably be able to do a little bit more than that um, but it's really focused on kind of simplicity so it's a single node it's not highly available the networking is therefore very sim uh, very straightforward um, and it's completely managed from the portal so there's uh, almost no local management capability at all and then Azure Stack HCI of course I talked about here so they are quite different from each other uh, and we are very excited to have that uh, that much choice for customers in the portfolio to have the different members of the stack family. Uh, I do think that over time um, you will see changes in how we position the different products and how we emphasize different products. Uh, and probably the person you'll be hearing from about that is me. So maybe that's a hint. Um, but as of today, um, it's definitely the case that all of those products are a really important part of the portfolio. We see, I mean, let me be clear, every single month we see new deployments of all three of those products uh, and the customers are very happy in most cases. Uh, and they're, they're just, they cater to very different use cases, right? You, you can use Azure Stack Hub completely disconnected, completely autonomous with a full local ARM instance. That's an incredible capability that there really is no alternative for that in the market. Um, and the first party hardware subscription through Azure with Azure Stack Edge is also a pretty unique capability that uh, not many other folks are offering. So they all bring something a little bit different and we have a portfolio approach. Um, and if you just make sure you follow me on Twitter, then if anything changes, you'll definitely hear about it. OK, so <laughs> another guy asks, I, I think I got the question twice over the day. Uh, when will we get to deploy HCI across <laughs> three sites? So the question about a three site uh, stretch cluster, is, it, is there something in the works there or will you stay at two sites? Uh, great question. So uh, John Marlin, uh, whom if you're uh, someone who uses stretch clusters or storage replica, you've probably heard of John Marlin before. He's the he's a, a colleague of mine at Microsoft who's the PM responsible for these scenarios. 
uh, he's very interested in feedback and requirements and um, sort of scenario examples for uh, new features like three site capability with a stretched cluster. Uh, it's definitely something that we're open to. Like, a, it's not that we're not going to do it. It's not that for some reason we're dead. We're you know steadfast on staying at two sites. Um, I will say though, it isn't a capability in the 21H2 feature update, and so it's not something that's going to be here this fall. Um, we're still we're gathering feedback. We're gathering input. Uh, if if you haven't, I encourage you to uh, you know make your voice heard as you're doing now, and <laughs> make sure that Microsoft knows and that John knows that you want that capability. Uh, and it's it's for sure something that we can add in the future. This is one of the great things about Azure Stack HCI is when I say the future, I don't mean four years from now, right? We have an update every year. It's not in 21 H2, but the next update is just a year away in 22 H2. <laughs> okay. Um, then I had some questions about GP, uh, GPU support. Uh, I hinted the session this night at 10. 10 p.m. But maybe you want to give a little bit insight for the guys who are sleeping at that time already. And the sessions will be recorded, so they will be available afterwards, of course. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I can briefly summarize the state of play with respect to GPUs. So uh, in Not too 21, much, only tease it. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, it, it, simply put, in 21H2, uh, we've added the ability to attach uh, a GPU to a highly available virtual machine, a clustered virtual machine. What that means is uh, you can do discrete device assignment and take a whole GPU and assign it to a VM that is participating in a cluster. And uh, a bunch of scenarios that would have previously not worked at all work now. And so you can take that VM and uh, like if the node that it's hosted on fails, that VM will just start on another node and it will actually automatically assign itself to the GPU on that node if there's a GPU available. And there's a whole concept of GPU pools, which I'm sure Alvin and Prasid will talk about later today for how you manage that. Um, and that's a big new management investment for us. So we'll have to talk a lot about the concepts behind GPU pools and the UI for GPU pools and the PowerShell commands and everything like that. Um, so you can have an automatic failover between nodes of a workload that has a GPU attached. This is a big deal because a lot of folks who are deploying like machine learning workloads to like, for example, a grocery store to like, you know, scan um, video feeds, for example. Uh, it's pretty important. I mean, it's, it's just one workload. It's just one big VM that needs a GPU, but it does need to be highly available, right? The whole point is to have a two node cluster in the store. And so this is the, this is the scenario that this addresses really well. Uh, you can also do things like drain the node. And if you've configured the shutdown action or the, the drain action to be shut down for that VM, then the VM will gracefully shut down and you can successfully like pause and drain a clustered node for maintenance, which means you can do a cluster or updating run, even though you have workloads that had GPUs attached. Everything I've just described would have like not worked in the past. <laughs> so okay. that's some of the so that's some of the innovations there. Now we have a longer term roadmap around GPUs. Um, everyone is just waiting for me to say the word partitioning, so I'll say it. Um, but over the course <laughs> of H2 and 23H2 and beyond. Uh, we'll definitely be continuing to invest every single release in significant new capabilities for GPUs. But our focus in this in 21H2 is, and you'll hear this from Alvin and Persid and others later, our focus is really around um, a GPU that's DDA attached to a VM. That VM, even though it's clustered, it can it can still basically fully participate in the cluster, even though it has a GPU, which didn't used to work at all before, so now it works. Cool. So. Uh, the time is up now. Um, Dave is already ready to present. Uh, Cosmos, thanks so much uh, for taking the time. Uh, I know your schedule is quite busy these days, so uh, I much appreciated you having you at the second time at the Azure Stack HCI days and uh, for all your help with the other speakers. Thanks so much, Cosmos. Have a nice day. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, and enjoy the rest of the event. Thanks. So and now, and now we go directly to Dave. He is ready. I see him on video. So Dave, Dave uh, hello Dave, another MVP colleague of mine from Canada. And it's also very early uh, at your, you're at, you have 9 a.m. I assume, right? So take the stage and present Dave, please. Well, thank you so much for having me, Carson. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you are uh, good to hear and we see your slides. 
Perfect, perfect. Well, thank you so much for having me. I actually wore a very special T-shirt here today. I have my cloud and data center conference T-shirt. I had to wear that for some nostalgia for when, you know, we could speak in person. So, you know, I think the, the biggest question that I have, and you can wait to the end to the Q&A, but when is CDC coming back? Because I desperately want to come back and visit you guys in uh, Germany for that. So I hope I hope it's soon because, you know, virtual virtual conferences are cool, but I'd like to actually meet people as well. Dave, that's the same for me. Uh, unfortunately, I decided to do it in 2023, but you will be invited, of course. Well, fantastic, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for having me. The show's uh, been great so far. You know, I, I always learn a lot myself when I, I come to these these types of shows. And, you know, your presentation early in the morning, I was actually up, I caught the tail end of that. So I caught a little bit of DJs before I went back to bed at 6 a.m. And uh, and Lisa and the presentation on Dell and then Cosmos on the roadmap was pretty awesome. So um, I have to give a little bit of a precursor for for my session, um, Karsten. I've been told that I have to dial back my sessions a little bit when I talk about security and ransomware because apparently there can be scary. But, you know, they need to be scary because there's a reality in this world that we live in that there's a lot of bad guys that are out there that try to break the, the cool infrastructure that we set up. And so hopefully you take a few little uh, gold nuggets out of this. Uh, my last uh, project that I worked on for ransomware defense was unfortunately a friend of mine had an ISP, uh, MSP actually, that got impacted by that Kaseya attack and uh, took out a lot of their customers. So. I've got a few notes from the fields and I also want to talk in this session particularly about having some advanced persistent threat protection um, as well as taking and having endpoint detection and responses being a really critical part to your solution design. All right, you can follow me on Twitter at Dave Kawula. I'm always available if you have questions after the show. Um, I'm always available to uh, to help out. Let's see if I can advance my slide. I'm using the web version of this. All right, a little bit about myself. I'm a Microsoft MVP now going on 10 years. I just got my little blue puck that went at the top of my uh, of my little MVP statue that I have. And uh, that's, that's a pretty huge accomplishment because for all of those 10 years, it was, uh, it was about 10 years ago that I had a chance to meet you, Karsten, at our first MVP summit. And we were the we were the loners in the room. We were the Hyper V guys. We got to hang out with Ben and Sarah, and we got to learn about all the new cool things that were coming up. And man, has everything grown up over these last uh, ten years. So I've met an incredible network of friends that are all Hyper V experts from around the world, and we've branched out into different technologies. But we're all still core Hyper V MVPs at heart. <laughs> so. Um, Unfortunately, I guess I'm the old guy now or one of the old guys, 25 years industry experience. It seems like yesterday that I started to do this. This really kicked in for me because my oldest son graduated this year. He's 18 years old and um, and so he's he's off on his own. When I'm not doing IT, I'm a dad of seven and a full time driver and coach of many different sports. I run my own consulting company called Tricon Elite Consulting, co-chair conference called uh, Tech Mentor, which is coming up in November. That one's actually going to be in person. Uh, written lots of books, spoken all around the world, and my hobbies that I have are hockey, fishing, dirt biking, and old cars. So that's what I do. And I'm based out of Canada. So if you hear me have any Canadian slips for, for, for English, that's you'll be able to tell pretty quick because when I get excited, you'll hear me say A, you'll hear me say stuff like roof, and things like that, and I hope that that's okay for everyone. Um, you can understand what I'm saying. You can check out some of my resources on my blog at checkyourlogs.net. Um, on YouTube, I didn't have a chance to put the short form URL in there, so just search for me on YouTube at uh, Dave Kabula. All of my books are available on LeanPub in PDF downloadable format, and make sure that you join up to the Azure Stack HCI Slack channel. Great. Uh, resource for anybody that's interested in this tech. All right, so now let's get into the meat of the presentation. 
So number one, uh, when it comes to security, you need to stay informed. And you know, social media is still your friend. If you're not a fan of Twitter, you should still be a fan of Twitter for you know the this, the context of security because I find that that's still where we're finding out about most of uh, attacks that are coming out and things like that. So if you're not on social media, you need to be on social media and stay up to date um, from a security standpoint. Um, the second thing is, is that it's everyone's security is everyone's responsibility. It's no longer just the SecOps team that has to look after security. And, you know, I almost have my audiences make a pledge with me that we are all IT security professionals now. We all have a responsibility in protecting infrastructure. So it's not just this one individual that lives in a closet that nobody really knows where they are in the building anymore. Uh, we have teams that are dedicated for this now and you can take and you can get help uh, very easily. The big statement here is that you only know what you know. I find that security has been very interesting for me, especially being brought in via cybersecurity insurance vendors to help with ransomware recovery efforts. And every time I've done one of these, I've done 10 ransomware recoveries in the past two and a half years. Um, something new with every single one that I go through. So don't be scared to continue your education. You want to make sure that you're staying on top of this. And like I said, you only know what it is that you know, so you need help. You know, what, what, where, where can help come from? So <laughs> this, is, this is the not so nice part about hyper-converged infrastructure and S2D is that what happens when you have an active threat actor inside of your network and you have a potential ransomware attack that's impacting either your Azure Stack HCI infrastructure or your storage spaces direct S2D infrastructure. Well, the first question that I have for you is, um, was the attack an admin level attack? Did the threat actors gain access to a domain admin attack, uh, domain admin credentials? And with that, were they, were they able to easily spread and move laterally through the infrastructure and quickly deliver C2 payloads and uh, then in turn infect the infrastructure? And so that's always one of the first questions I ask. I get the phone call late at night saying, Dave, we've got a problem. And I, I just, I pray that they don't say that, you know, we got the note, we got the ransomware note, they got us, what do we do? First question I ask is, did they get admin? Because if they got admin, then it's typically very, very bad. We're looking at recoveries via uh, backups or replicas, if that's even viable. And we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like, uh, because in order to understand why you need advanced persistent threat protection and endpoint detection and response, first you have to understand why. So the second question I ask uh, is, do the, do the customers have a fabric? And what does that mean? Do they have a separate domain? Do they have a separate security boundary where they've installed their hyper-converged infrastructure? Kind of a protected zone, because if the primary domain was attacked, do we have a secondary domain that we can restore back into? And if we do, we've got options. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about this later on in the presentation. When the attackers got in, did they go after your cluster shared volumes? Did they go after your VHDXs? Did they go after um, did they go after the core operating system? And this is actually very interesting because a lot of the ransomware attacks, um, they're actually set up to not corrupt the the operating system of the servers that they attack. And that's actually something interesting to me because in almost every single attack that we've had and i've had a few that we've had to pay for the recovery key um the core operating system is trashed like it, it is not recoverable it, we put the key in we get our data back but the windows directory the core os install is not good so what that means for your your s2d hosts or your azure stack hci hosts is that potentially you're looking at an OS reinstall scenario. And if it got your VMs and you had no backups available and you were having to go put the key in to try to recover everything, yeah, great, I got your data back. I got your SQL servers back. I got your, your SQL server databases back, um, but no front ends. So you have to go rebuild your SQL servers. You've got to go rebuild your IS application servers because the OS is trash sitting on top of that. So it's so important that we take a proactive stance and to, to jump in front of this before the attack ever gets us. So July 2nd, I got a phone call 
The phone call came from a friend of mine that was, uh, he was the president of a managed service provider. And I hadn't even heard about the, the whole Kaseya uh, ransomware attack that was out. It was, it had just hit a few days prior. And the unfortunate reality was, is they, they did have that management server set up and it gave the threat actors system level access to over 80 tenants that they had. So over 80 clients had system level access agents deployed on servers, agents deployed on desktops, and within a matter of an hour, they had 80 customers, not systems, 80 customers impacted by this particular attack. It was like the fastest spreading ransomware attack I've ever seen. It got the Hyper-D hosts, it got the backup targets, it got everything where that agent was on there. It had system level access. There was really no stopping it. And so, Going through that, the, the cyber insurance uh, vendor and the, the cyber threat team that we were working with, um, they actually gave us access to a GitHub site where it had a, a Rebel ransomware configuration file. And so this is gonna, for the first time in a live presentation, I'm gonna go through a couple slides just to show you what the anatomy of a ransomware attack actually looks like. Because like I said, in order to protect against this, we have to have an understanding of what it is that we're protecting against. And so this was a real eye opener for me. I put the link on the site. I'll give the slides and make them available for Carson post show as well. And uh, at the end of, the, uh, of my presentation, I'll put it up in the chat if you do want a copy of that link, because it's this is kind of that little gold nugget. So the global ransomware attack of Kaseya. I saw numbers, I saw this on CNN, I saw the, the US, the, the president of the United States, Joe Biden, talking about this particular attack and saying, well, you know, it wasn't that bad. A couple thousand customers that were hit. And I'm like, okay, so my friend's company had 80 customers themselves. And there was reports that I had seen going on that were way higher than that. I think those numbers were like in the tens of thousands of customers that were hit by this. And this is probably the worst case scenario for, for any type of defense that you had available because those agents that were in there had system level access. And so it really was an unstoppable ransomware attack. Like once it executed, there was no going back from it. So let's take a look and see what that uh, Rebel configuration file looked like. So in that GitHub repo, there's a configuration file that walks you through what the, the ransomware attack actually looked like. And a couple of interesting pieces inside of here was, and I'm not gonna point out all of these, I'm just gonna pick a few items that were interesting to me. The first one was encryption type. Do you wanna encrypt the whole file or do you wanna just encrypt part of the file? Because if I'm a bad guy, I can use a hex editor on like a VHDX file, for example, and I can just modify one byte inside of that file. I can just take one, one byte of, of data and I can modify it. It's not gonna CRC and it's not gonna work properly. So if I'm lazy and I wanna encrypt your system faster, I can just encrypt like the headers of the files and they're, they're gonna be no good to you. You still have to decrypt them the same way. But it, we, what it means is I can actually spread through your system a lot faster, not having to wait for the encryption engine to actually kick in. And so there's actually variables inside of there. The next one was like wipe selected folders true. Okay, well, what exact folders were we hunting for inside of there? And so we go through and they said, oh, well, here's, here's a bunch of whitelisted folders that we're not gonna touch. So just as a heads up, um, the code that ran for this particular piece of ransomware didn't actually listen to any of this whitelist stuff because I had a whole bunch of data that was in program data and I had a whole bunch of data that was in the Windows directory that were encrypted as well because we could see the file structures inside of there. So it wasn't really listening to this all that well and that's why the core OS kind of got blown up. But there was a whitelist. There were some file extensions to skip. There were some file names to skip inside of there too. Seems like some logical way of taking and delivering a payload. Seems like a, a pretty interesting application. And anybody that's interested in tech, when you look at the delivery of a ransomware payload, it's just an executable that listens to this as basically an any file. And so the any file is just giving instruction sets. Oh, here's some good ones. How about processes to kill? Okay, if I find anything with SQL Server, if I find anything that's going to take and have the, the name backup in it, I'm going to wipe that. That's fantastic for your backup targets that you have all your backups stored in a folder called eDrive Backup because now I just wiped all the backups. And so <laughs> ironically enough, there's a lot of backup targets that are out there that are actually in a folder called Backup. And so um, it was it's kind of neat to me to see what 
the anatomy of what this thing was actually doing. And then services to stop. Oh, so a couple of other ones that were in here was like, oh, do you run Veeam? Oh, well, we're just going to stop that service. You use VSS. Do you have Sophos for antivirus? Well, let's go kill those processes. And then let's take and let's elevate because a couple of the other pieces that are in here, there's some elevation commands. And then the most interesting piece to that file and that link is they have a whole list of C2 servers, command and control servers. There's a giant list that's in there of all of these um, of all of these uh, FQDNs of all the C2 servers that these things would go communicate with. So if you want a list of things to blacklist on your firewall, that's probably a pretty good start for you. Now that stuff's obviously going to change faster than you can go through it. But at the end of the day, we we'll go back to my early point. You only know what you know. And so kind of breaking apart the guts of, of what this does makes it a little more interesting to understand as to why we need to uh, take and be more diligent and have more than just traditional antivirus on our systems. So <laughs> traditional antivirus isn't good enough. Um, is such a true statement. It's listening to a very good friend of mine, Jeremy Moskowitz. You probably know him as the godfather of group policy. You probably read some of his white papers, some of his books along the way as you're configuring something in group policy. He runs a great company called Policy Pack, and uh, he gave a presentation that I listened to about uh, six months ago. And it was actually uh, notes from the field for a threat actor that took home, I think, $4 million with ransomware. And this, and this was interesting because the threat actor actually gave tips to organizations for how they could protect against um, ransomware and against uh, attacks from coming in. And so the biggest point that I pulled out of there was traditional antivirus by itself is not enough. It's easy enough for us to stop those services, gain access and, and get into the systems um, and, and work around traditional antivirus. And so he's like, you need to have advanced persistent threat protection. You need to have endpoint detection and response. And what's coming baked into the operating system is just, it's not enough by itself. So with, with server 2016, I think was the first version of Defender that came on a server platform for Microsoft in 2019, 2022, and Azure Stack HCI, Defender is in there. Defender antivirus is in there. So you have some level of protection that's inside of there. And the way I equate this is almost like putting the free version of antivirus that you'd find on your home computers, and that's what you're running for your corporate enterprise. It's not enough. It's lacking all the enterprise controls, a console, and if something does happen and there's a virus that pops up in there, where do all of the alerts and logs go if they're not centralized somewhere? So the answer to this that Microsoft has had prior to uh, what I'll show you uh, towards the end of the presentation was Microsoft Defender Advanced Threat Protection. And so uh, Defender Advanced Threat Protection came with its own portal. Um, you could take and you could load this up on your server 2019 S2D farms. It's just, that's the place that I, I play in a lot. And uh, you could get that advanced threat protection, that endpoint detection response. You could protect yourself. You could run that on all of those workloads as well. So it, it's been available. Microsoft's had a good answer, but now I call that almost like a generation one. So we'll take a look at gen one first and then we'll see where gen two is going with this. So with, with the setup of this advanced threat protection, first place that you need to go is you need to go to securitycenter.microsoft.com if you're looking at the gen one version of this. And don't worry for my friends at Microsoft, I'll talk about the Gen 2 stuff in a minute here. This is just the Gen 1 piece. This is this is part of, uh, part of what we had to work with over the years. And inside of securitycenter.microsoft.com, this was your portal for uh, advanced threat protection. And most people thought about this for endpoints, just like Windows 10 endpoints, but there was also a SKU for servers as well. And so this worked incredibly well on my server 2019 builds that we would deploy S2D on. And it, it met the measures that were required for uh, cyber recovery from the cyber insurance vendors. Because one of the very first things that happens during a ransomware uh, recovery effort is the cyber insurance vendors and the, the cybersecurity organizations, one of the very first things they're asking us to do is put on some, of advanced, some type of advanced threat protection so we can see if the threat is still persisting. Because what's the point in taking and uh, what's the point in taking and recovering everything if the bad guys still have command and control servers inside of there? If the bad guys are still in there, 
then you know what what do we have to do um so that's what they asked for and this is this is accepted for them so typically i see something like a vmware carbon black is one of the ones that they'll lead with or a defender advanced star protection so for the last couple that we've done we've done defender atp and it's sufficed for us the agent actually directly connects up to the cloud we get a, a great little portal and we get real-time views of the vulnerabilities um, indicators of compromise things like that you know it's all structured around the mitre framework and it's the pieces that you're missing from the enterprise antivirus that you know you really need all right and so Anyways, um, this, this piece here and the alert that you see was actually uh, a Mimicat's alert that popped up. I was doing some testing in my lab, and so it actually detected that uh, Mimicat's was on one of my servers because you know it's not good enough to just deploy. You have to test as well. And so with the ATP pieces, um, I find that, that I put them on almost all of my production um, S2D deployments today. Um, I don't really advise customers, especially having having gone through the ransomware recovery efforts to not use this. And so this is what we had in the past. And you know, I also recommend that this is put on any of the server workloads that you have. And this is the same messaging that Microsoft has coming like moving forward. And so when we take a look at you know the the ability to protect our infrastructure and our investments, like I said, you only know what you know. And having the ability of having a security operations center and a, a cloud-based NOC that Microsoft would provide for us is incredibly valuable because most organizations don't have the manpower to look after this themselves. So that's why having a trusted partner is just so important for us. So a couple of the pieces that I really like about the, uh, the ATP engine is the automated investigation capabilities and threat hunting capabilities. So when something bad happens, it's not good enough to just pop up an alert message saying, hey, something happened on here and you know we detected this particular file and we quarantined it because that's the world that we've lived in from an antivirus perspective over the years is just get a file, quarantine it, deal with it, block it on the firewall, you know, that's that's where we go. Well with advanced threat protection with ATP capabilities, we can gather evidence. We can see the logs. I can see the number of systems that were impacted, how many devices were impacted by this particular threat. I can watch the threat moving laterally through my infrastructure. And most importantly, as I'm hunting for you know traces of this still being out there, I can now inline isolate those devices where we can take and I can actually turn them off from a network perspective and only leave a back communication channel up to the cloud, up to your ATP provider and up to your ATP portal. So, you know, now I can actually stop this thing from spreading, especially if this is the source of our uh, C2 instance where somebody's actually jumping through here to get inside of our infrastructure. And so we can start to lock this down. So this, this is a big piece that doesn't come with traditional antivirus. And this is one of the reasons why I need this. I speak to this primarily around the, the server landscape um, because you know I, I see organizations just you know rolling upgrades of, of servers and infrastructure. And this is also a really great reason if you're if you're not on the latest generation of operating system like server 2019 or server 2022, you need to get there because some of these pieces are not fully supported on the older operating systems. So you may still be in a support life cycle for that operating system, but that doesn't mean that you're going to be getting all of the, the threat protection features that your organization is going to need. So it's a pretty good motivator to get there. I know it's not that easy for organizations. I've been a professional consultant for going on 25 years now. I know that all of this is a process, but taking a posture and sitting back and burying your head in the sand, it's not, it's not good enough. So the next, uh, the next big piece is uh, along that initial statement at, that I made at the beginning of the presentation. And it was, uh, you only know what you know, and you, you don't know what's wrong with your infrastructure. And a lot of organizations will do a biannual IT audit or maybe even an, an annual audit. Maybe they don't even do an IT audit, I'm not sure. Um, but part of that is, is going through a security vulnerability assessment. And so what I found is that most organizations will do that a couple times a year. They get a tool or they get a third party consultant in to do it. 
And you know, that's that's not really good enough anymore. You need to do this real time. So the great part about the, the ATP agents that Microsoft provides is that they do provide real time vulnerability assessments. So we can actually see what, um, what holes we have inside of our infrastructure. And it drives down beyond just the core operating system level because a lot of the holes in the operating system come from the application stack that's installed. So for example, take a, take a, a workload that's running as an RDSH host and that RDSH host has a bunch of applications that are published through RD Web or something like that. Well, those apps need to be updated as well. And so my question for you as IT professionals, do you stay on top of every single application that you have deployed in your fleet and make sure that all of those holes are, are closed? Or are you just taking the posture of, well, I'm patching the operating system and that's good enough. Well, remember, there's things that ride on top of the operating system. And those things that ride on top of the operating system, especially the workloads that are driven by either S2D or Azure Stack HCI, need to be protected as well, because that could become a backdoor getting into your into your infrastructure. And like the landscape of, of critical exploits that are coming out via browsers, like for example, Chrome exploits, you've got you've got exploits coming out via via if you still have Java installed, all of these pieces because you've got old applications out there, you know, it, at least it helps you. And it gives you a scorecard as well. So it says, oh, well, you know what? I'm going to score you really bad for your organization if you're not getting your patches up to date. So we're going to give you a bad score for that. So then when you go to take that scorecard up to management saying, hey, listen, this is this is how good we're doing, it's going to reflect not very well for you. So vulnerability assessments are key, and it's a piece that just comes as part of the solution. The next piece of this is the remediation levels. What do you want to do if threats are discovered? And so there's various types of remediation levels that you can have in the uh, Defender ATP portal. Um, I found some issues um, just as a heads up if you're going to be loading this up on backup targets. So if you're backing up your S2D infrastructure with Veeam like many of us do, um, I found issues on some of those backup targets running the, um, the advanced threat protection agents from, uh, from Defender. Um, on those Veeam backup targets, they stopped communicating properly and that was in the full remediate mode. We had to dial that back a little bit on those backup targets to get it to work. And we had some tickets with Microsoft to work our way through that. Um, ensure you're testing this on your production servers. It's not gonna impact um, any issues that you have. And from what I've seen outside of those Veeam backup targets, the full remediation is normally um, fairly safe to, to roll with, but I'm a realist as well. So you need to make sure that you're always testing this from a production perspective. All right, so now generation two. So what does generation two look, for, look like for us? So Microsoft's key investments that they have um, and you know, kind of the, the statements that I, I heard coming back from the, the product teams, was that you know Defender ATP was never really the home for servers, and so you know that was that was there was a SKU that was built. It was more of like the endpoint solution that was available, um, but where's the new home? So the new home for this is inside of Microsoft Security Center. It's called Azure Defender. You can you can take and you can either have a free version or you can have a paid version of this. It's a pay by VM uh, type pricing model. And you can take and you can have support for this, um, not only inside of your Azure, uh, your full Azure workloads, so full cloud workloads, hybrid workloads, multi-cloud workloads, and, and the deployment of this is, is done and supported uh, via Azure Arc. And so that Azure Arc deployment can and take and happen through a PowerShell script that you generate uh, just a generic script, admin center, but you've got to deploy the agents out there so that you can take and that you can communicate and so that they'll then show up inside of the portal. Then once that happens, of course, you're going to get some additional features that are outside of Defender Advanced Threat Protection. And, you know, one of the big ones for me is just-in-time VM access. This is one of the big features that we get asked about all of the time. And so that's a big one, vulnerability assessment management that we talked about earlier. Um, and also there's a new tab inside of Security Center that provides regulatory compliance. So if your organization has to conform with ISO standards, NIST, HIPAA for healthcare, you know, this is not something that you just snap your fingers and, and have uh, a compliance infrastructure. 
you know, HIPAA compliance, for example, has regulations for like SQL Server databases with encryption. So those settings need to be configured. And so, so the regulatory compliance piece of this is actually incredibly valuable, especially if your organization is in the process of heading down that direction or has yearly audits that are uh, surrounding that. So that's a really nice add on. And I'm really good, really glad to see that Microsoft has put that in there. So as a quick view of the Azure Defender um, portal here. So you can see that, you know, very similar to what we saw inside of uh, Defender Advanced Threat Protection. Um, we can see that we've got a similar dashboard type view for security alerts. In this example, we can see that we're kind of following along the MITRE framework, which is great because this is going to line up to any type of, you know, security, uh, security operations framework that you're building for your organization. And so we can see that that's breaking into the different uh, the different domains that you have, like credential access, persistent, initial access. How are they trying to get in there? And then you can drill into the incidents and you can see uh, more information from there. And the beauty of this is, is this spans your Azure tenant um, beyond just your your cloud based resources with Azure Arc and integrating in that fashion. We can take and we can have our Azure Stack HCI VMs protected by default. Now, um, Azure Stack uh, HCI is Azure Arc integrated. So with Azure Arc integration, we've got capabilities of taking and supporting this. Almost as simple as what you saw uh, Cosmos in his demo with Azure Monitor, the kind of the one button click push downs or Azure policies. Uh, the same plays for Azure Defender on the security side as well. So the ability to take and seamlessly deploy this across multi-site workloads for uh, Azure Stack HCI, protecting the hosts themselves, as well as the workloads that are running on those are absolutely key because if you're not doing that, then you're leaving very big holes inside of your infrastructure. So this this level of you know mods or add-ons that are coming down via Azure Stack HCI to me are really, really cool because I've lived in the world of hyper-converged infrastructure with Microsoft since its inception in server 2016, had many customers running on 2016, had many customers running on, on 2019, and now seeing the evolution moving over to Azure Stack HCI, all of those pieces that we had where we had to manually button up or fill holes are kind of automatically being taken care of inside of the Azure Stack HCI portfolio. And Azure Defender is just one great example of what that's looking like for us. So for somebody who had to do this the manual way for the last five, six years, seeing the automation behind this is absolutely fantastic. And I, I'm super excited for this. And I, I'm really glad that Microsoft is taking security extremely serious because when an organization gets hit, it's not pretty. It, it's, it really is not pretty. And you're, you're for lack of better terms, being being wound down to you know the the beginning of time for that organization depending on how bad that is so having the ability with azure stack hci to not only protect with uh, azure defender having azure site recovery integration so now i can have you know i have the ability to now fail over to azure in the event that something happens these are all great moves in the right direction and and really building um, upon that seamless infrastructure that we're looking for like I said, this, this is an extension out of um, Azure Security Center. So out of Security Center inside of your portal, you can see the protection is available inside of there for not only your server workloads. If you've got AKS uh, instances in there, if you've got app services, if you've got storage accounts, uh, if you've got PaaS instances for SQL databases, um, all of that is gonna take and uh, be supported for you. And we'll, I hate to use the word that one single pane of glass, but this is really what we're heading towards from a security perspective, is that one place, one home for all of this, instead of having this kludgy multi-tool, uh, you know, run a script on this to get it working and run a script on that. No, we want one seamless experience and to have this be able to be turned on kind of out of box is, uh, is really cool. 
All right, so availability for this with the extensions that Cosmos was talking about in his presentation via Azure Arc integration. You can have Azure only, Azure and on-prem with, for example, Azure Stack HCI or other on-prem workloads. You could even extend this out to other clouds. Maybe your organization is using AWS or Google Cloud or other clouds that are out available. As long as those can communicate up with your, with your portal and you've opened up those firewall rules to allow those uh, FQDNs to be available, they're there, and in the and in the three the the three prong scenario where we've got uh, Azure cloud based resources, we've got other clouds and on prem Azure Stack HCI, for example, all are fully uh, supported scenarios. Now, outside of Azure itself, Azure itself is probably the easiest way to turn this on because it's almost like the extensions are are there and available for us. Um, the the deployment to anything outside of that, we're looking at Azure Arc based um, integration for that. Um, Azure Defender is kind of the on off version, and this is this is interesting. I always like, you know, I've worked in IT for 25 years, and and I I still I still love the way that we come up with um, some of our naming for some of the features and the way that we do things. So um, Azure Defender off is kind of like free mode and Azure Defender on is the paid mode. And inside of the paid mode down below when you click through your portal, so you're gonna go through, uh, I think it's inside of the settings tab for Azure Defender. Um, you can see the pricing sheet that's inside of there. So I was seeing today, I, I pulled the, the pricing. I never like to get into pricing discussions because I've never claimed to be a licensing or pricing expert. I just, I'm the mechanic that puts this all together and is, is told to, you know, make it turn faster or keep the wheels on. And so, you know, it appears right now for my subscription, it was about 15 bucks a month for a server from a protection standpoint. And, you know, that's pretty similar to the SKU for that I saw for uh, Defender ATP as well. So that was similar to the pricing that we saw uh, when we were doing this for our uh, old way Gen 1 of doing this. Got some cool auto provisioning capabilities inside of there. So uh, like Cosmos was talking about all the different extensions that are available. So this is the same type of idea to be able to turn on different um, extensions. So once the agent's in there, we can basically turn on and flip on different features. So this is pretty cool. Um, there'll be email, you know, you've got options in here to have all your email notifications and workflows and you can change the way that the wording looks like on the alert emails. And, you know, we really live by this and in some of the infrastructure that we've deployed this, I've been running uh, Defender ATP on server based infrastructures and desktop endpoint based infrastructure now for probably the better part of three plus years for a lot of customers that I support. And uh, in line, the question I always get asked is, does it work? And I say, well, if there's nothing perfect, nothing's that gonna stop potentially everything 100%, but I'd rather be in the 95th percentile than you know be in the fifth percentile and have nothing. I know what one particular customer we've stopped in line with, uh, with Defender ATP, probably about 15 um, direct ransomware attacks I've got an organization that seems to love to go plug in USB sticks that they get from who knows where, and it's pretty easy to get elevation when you've got those USB sticks like that. Since since then, we've done further lockdowns that I'll talk about towards the end of the presentation, but um, you wanna make sure that you're taking, you're protecting all of that infrastructure that you're looking after. All right, so a couple kind of closing thoughts that I have, probably have about another, um, eight to 10 minutes here, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. Um, I wanna talk about some of the current threats that are out there and what we've seen in the last 18 months with COVID-19. I don't know if in your organization, if you really paid attention to the uptick in ransomware attacks since COVID-19, but man, oh man, for the threat actors that were out there, there were uh, there was a lot of low hanging fruit because this was the phone call that we got in I think it was March of 2020 when COVID kind of first went mainstream. We started with all of the lockdowns. I remember the date because I had just gotten back. My daughter was in a cheer competition in Nashville, and as soon as we landed, that was when everything shut down. I remember that because that was last time I was on a plane. It was March of 2020. 
Um, <laughs> so, so anyways, um, what ended up happening is we got phone calls from the organization saying, listen, I've got, I've got 8,000 people here and, and I need to send them home. Everybody is working from home. And we have, we're like in IT, we're like, uh, we don't really have VPN set up for 8,000 people. No, you need to get VPN remote access set up right now. Well, it's gonna take some time to secure all of that. No, don't worry about the security. Just make sure that people can log in from home. Well, are you sure that's a good idea? Because that's gonna probably leave a lot of holes. No, we don't care, open it up, people need to work. Okay, you're the boss, you sign the check. Here, sign the waiver that says Dave's not responsible for turning this on. So <laughs> it left a lot of holes that were out there. And so we found that there was tons of open RDP connections because organizations were just opening up RDP and leaving open endpoints on the internet, not just enough access, like wide open on the internet. Those endpoints, those VPN endpoints weren't secured at all. So there was no ATP on them. So who knows what people were doing at home on um, those systems, those corporate systems that kids were probably doing homework and on whatever sites and probably not the best thing to be doing for corporate devices. So we found that, that those VPNs became a big entry point coming across because there was no port lockdowns. It was just like you were on a full extension of the infrastructure just because the IT teams couldn't keep up. So what type of mess are we left with? Well, the, the wave of you know ransomware attacks that are out there. The other thing we kind of change gears here a little bit is dev test environments actually really kind of tick me off. You know, I, I've, I've got a bit of a beef with dev test environments because we like to think that these dev test environments that live on, on in our infrastructure are, you know, they're just something that, you know, we don't have to pay attention to security on. And that's absolutely not the case because the first question I've got for you does that lab environment connect to a production network somewhere? Oh yeah, the VLAN's completely routable. We can take and get to the lab environment because all the developers need to push code up to those things all the time. Okay, is it in a separate domain? Well, you know, we've been thinking about that, but it's actually inside of the production domain. So it's not really a lab environment, it's really production, okay. Well, hopefully you do have a separate domain and you've got pre-prod, prod, dev test, you've got all of that stuff set up, but make sure you isolate those environments, please. And just because it's running on something like Azure Stack HCI, just because it's running inside of your Azure tenant, it still needs to be secured and locked down. Make sure you're controlling what those things have access to, because if you don't, and there, you could actually inadvertently provide yourself a jump box for a bad guy, a threat actor, who can reverse port his way back through your, your production infrastructure. So don't leave those unseen holes inside of the dev test environments. We're finding that there's a lot of problems there when we're going through security audits with customers right now. And also make sure that you're putting the same level of advanced threat protection in the lab environments. I don't care if it costs a little bit more money. If that's a server and it's on the network, it needs to be protected. If you're not gonna protect it, get it off my network because I don't want it on there. And so you, just, you need to kind of take that approach as you're looking at um, kind of modernizing your, your, security, uh, your security footprint. All right, uh, I think I got three slides left here and then we'll take some questions. So ransomware exists and a virtual show of hands, if you've had a customer that's been impacted by ransomware or you are that customer that's been impacted by ransomware. And at this point in time in a live presentation, sheepishly about 75 percent of the the attendees kind of slowly put up their hands and so the reality of it is is that this is not getting any any better it's only getting worse and just because you're in the cloud it does not mean that you're ransom proofing your your organization just because you've got azure arc integration doesn't mean that you're ransom proofed you still need to be diligent about your cyber defenses you need to be testing your cyber defenses if you're not familiar with concepts of like red teaming and blue teaming exercises, you need to do some research on this. And I also throw a new one in and Karsten, you're going to love this. I just made something up. I call it cloud teaming. So you need a third team. It's called cloud teaming to go with your red team and your blue team. And so you need to test those defenses. You need to test Azure Stack HCI defenses. You need to test 
Azure Arc defenses. If I tell you that these things can be turned on with Azure Defender, you need to test this. Don't just turn it on. You need to make sure that it actually works. I know it looks like one button that you're pressing to turn it on, but you still need to test it and validate it. So make sure that you build those pieces in when you're taking and you're, you're setting up your infrastructure. So remember, you got a new team, you got a cloud team now. All right, uh, I've got about five minutes left here, two slides, and so I want to walk you through uh, the Monday morning call that I got on July 2nd. So July 2nd, um, my phone rings, and it's it's from a weird number. I hadn't gotten a phone call from them before. It's from, uh, I live in Calgary, and I got a number from, it was a Toronto number that I got a call from, and I was like, well, that's weird, 9 a.m. to have a, a phone call from from this particular phone number. If for my European friends, this would be like uh, you're in Germany and you're getting a phone call from Sweden. It's like, well, I kind of maybe have some friends in Sweden. I'm not sure. Um, and so the conversation went something like this. Uh, we're in bad shape. Uh, we need help right now. OK, what can I do for you? Well, have you heard of Kaseya? No. What's going on with Kaseya? It was the weekend. I was out dirt biking in the mountains. There was no cell phone service. That's why I go there. I don't want cell phone service. <laughs> and so I come back Monday morning to find out that the biggest ransom attack in history had just been launched. And I said, well, okay, well, how bad is it? Well, I, I got a couple customers that are here. Okay, well, I've, I've heard this before. I'm like, a couple customers? What do you mean you got a couple customers? He's like, well, I actually got all of our customers. All of your customers? How many is all of your customers? Well, that's like 80. Oh. That's bad. Yeah, the whole team's all hands on deck and well, how bad was it? Did they get backups? Oh yeah, they got everything. They got backups, they got uh, they got all the replicas, they got all the production servers, they got Active Directory. Well, that's a question I asked earlier about the fabric. Did they have a fabric? Nope. How bad was the attack? Oh, it was a system-wide attack. Oh, goody, that's fun. And so, the then you start going through the calls with the insurance provider and the insurance provider is like okay don't worry we've got dedicated security instant response team that's going to look after this two days go by nothing happens well we're really busy with this kaseya incident and you know we'll get to you when we can three days go by nothing um and that's kind of where i jumped in was at like day three of this and they were down and so by the time we discovered that there was no path out, there was no backups, there was there was nothing for us to come back to. Now we've got to negotiate payment, and this is where it gets really interesting for all of our uh, U.S.-based customers, because I don't know if you paid attention to the news today. There's just been sanctions that are being put to prevent ransomware uh, payments to crypto wallets. So just because you think you can pay, you might not even be able to pay you might not be allowed to pay. So you want to pay big attention to this. So we, as Canadians, we didn't have those sanctions, so we paid. Um, if you're wondering what the going rate was, it was $55,000 US per server or 5 million for the organization. So if you want a number to throw at this, that was the number. Um, the recovery effort took probably about 10 weeks. We were all hands on deck for our organization for this one um, company. And uh, cyber insurance actually did cover the costs. Now, will they continue to cover the costs? I don't know, because that was a big hit on the industry. So you really want to pay attention to uh, your policies and make sure that you still got coverage. Um, they're putting riders in those cyber insurance policies now that you have to do things like put MFA, you have to pass a security audit, you've got to do a bunch of things. If you don't do that, void your policy, okay? And so the last thing is, what if you don't pay? Well, you have nothing. That's what you've got left with is nothing. Maybe you go to some type of recovery service, but it doesn't look good. So this is why I'm so serious about these discussions around ransom and advanced threat protection. Um, just some quick statistics for you is that 55% of small businesses typically pay. And this is from a very reputable organization. Know before you probably know this organization. Uh, 20 billion in, in damages caused by ransomware. If you're a US-based organization, you're more than uh, well aware of the, of the pipelines that were hit. Um, ransomware 2.0 is potentially actually a ransomware less attack where they don't actually ransom your data, they just steal everything and they threaten to release it. So instead of going through all the legwork of doing that, and uh, this is just continuing to get worse and worse and worse. So some interesting statistics. 
And so some takeaways for everyone, if you don't have advanced threat protection, you want to be looking at Azure Defender today, you want to make sure that you're getting ATP and EDR set up. Remember, antivirus alone is not enough. Um, it's also not enough to run everything in a single domain. This, this seems really weird to me, right? Because for years, you know, from an Active Directory perspective, we're like, oh, you have too many domains. You're, you're the old MT4 style of domains with PDCs here and a PDC for you. And every site has its own different domain and structure. And you need to consolidate that for a single management uh, surface. And so well, the only thing we did is we just made it easier with a single attack surface for the bad guys. And so when we were going through those discussions all those years ago for AD migrations, <laughs> we were thinking about you know ease of management, not security. And so from a security perspective, you should have two domains. Second domain, we call it Fabric. You put your, your key resources in there. That's where you're gonna put things like your Azure Stack HCI, your S2D clusters. Have a separate one if you want for your backup targets and make sure that you're taking and protecting because in the event that you do get attacked, you wanna make sure that it is at least recoverable. Um, implementing a zero trust configuration. I don't even know why we have this discussion anymore. Um, domain admins is still God. So domain admins by default is uh, is still the account that can log on to pretty much anything. A domain admin only needs to log into a domain controller. OK, so the, the principle of zero trust is breaking that apart. It's really simple, really simple. Domain admins only need to log into domain controllers. Server admins need to log into servers and desktop admins need to log into desktops. Desktop admins don't log into servers. Server admins don't log into desktops and domain admins only log into domain controllers. And there you have it. Zero trust in a nutshell for you. You need to do that. All right. Um, the next thing is multi-factor authentication is actually being required by a lot of insurance policies right now. So make sure that you're taking and you're looking into that if you're if you're not doing it right now. I'm actually a really big fan uh, for some of our infrastructure. I, I don't like to really name drop vendors and stuff, but Cisco Duo does a really good job. They've actually got a free account set up for up to 10 administrative accounts. So especially for a fabric where we have limited number of admin accounts, Cisco Duo is, is really good. We like it. Um, and enjoy the rest of the show. I really have to thank Karsten and the entire crew there for taking the time to put on this event for the community. I know there's a ton of effort that goes into it. And I just, I really thought you'd enjoy the icon that the AI picked up for enjoy the rest of the show. So you enjoy the rest of the show from your beds. And so with that, I think we'll take some, some Q and A and, and hopefully you enjoyed the session. Yes, I enjoyed it very much, Dave. Thank you so much. And with as with all security sessions, you are after that you are you are speechless. So <laughs> is there still hope to protect anything for at least a small company? Like I, I'm a I'm a three three person company. Uh, it seems like a lot of work, uh, multi-factor authentication. Um, um, uh, how you um, how you call it the admins different to all of this this is the a lot of lot of work that you have to do right well and i think if you're not going to uh go through the effort of zero trust with actually locking that down and there's some really great guides out there my good friend sammy laiho does some great talks on how to lock these things down uh same mike neistrom does some great talks on it as well but um at least have different accounts carson so don't be logging in as your daily driver account doing administrative work so your I daily drive that. your daily driver account is just for email have a separate laptop set up that you just do your email on and when you go to do admin stuff just work on your admin stuff on there and one of the things that i didn't mention in the session was the requirement to internet connect servers okay this is really important to me because uh servers typically don't need to connect to the internet because they're typically used for in internal things so I'll, I'll if i've got an azure arc extension on a server great i'll maybe open up those ports to the cloud but that's it those things don't need to generically talk to everything so start locking that down. If you don't need browsers on your servers, remove browsers from your servers. Make sure that they're not there. We can do other things that are very simple to try to protect ourselves inside of here. So, yeah. Another question I have, I, I know you and I, we are uh, in another community program uh, and uh, it's about backup. So uh, uh, would 
it would it had helped your customer if they had a a cloud backup maybe with uh, immu immu build it. I, I I don't get the word out. Immu you know what I mean, right? Immutability, um, yeah. Yeah, would that be helpful or did the attackers wait for maybe 90 days before they uh, showed up uh, with their demands? So for this particular instance, um, they had changed managed service providers, Karsten, and they were still deciding on whether it was a good idea to continue cloud protection. So the cloud-based backups that we had were, I think, four months old. So oh. their financial data was lost for four months. So I was able to bring back a domain controller from the cloud to at least getting people to log in and get back into Office 365 and AD Connect and stuff, but it was four months old. And so um, absolutely having a cloud tiering solution with immutability is really key. And, and I'm going to I'm going to just uh, take one step back even further. And this goes great for the smaller customers out there. USB drives, take a USB drive, back up all your stuff, put it in there once a week, put it in a lockbox. If anything happens, I don't care if it's slow to restore. At least I have your data from a week ago. That USB drive not connected to anything is immutable. If it's got no power going to it and nobody can touch it, it's immutable. And so that's the simplest form of going back to the days of tape or anything like that. Like we try to get away from this so much, but having those forms of offline backup are sometimes a real saving grace. So yeah, I see people going back to not tape, but like removable media. Mm -hmm. So would you say uh, this is are the Azure Stack HCI days? And on Azure Stack HCI, you, we have two things. You have have to have a connection to Azure at least, so mm -hmm. we can open maybe only the connection to Azure, but that is not easy because there are multiple IP networks that change. So put in the firewall, uh, only connect to these addresses is a bit a bit uh, hard to do. You can do a VPN, uh, but that's expensive if you have your VPN in, in Azure. Um, uh, that's maybe a bad thing for security. The other thing you have only a uh, a core installation, so no uh, no browser on on the desktop or, or on the login screen. So this is, I think, good. And the other thing is maybe bad. What what would you say? Or how would you well, handle all these Azure uh, different Azure networks? You don't know what to connect. Well, it's going to be a bit of a moving target for you. So you kind of have to watch your firewalls to see what's being blocked from those devices and to to screen that because. The unfortunate reality is if you're not getting all of those firewall rules open properly, your connectivity um, downstream to your Azure Stack HCI clusters is going to be impacted. So it, it's something that I don't think you can just set and forget. I think it, it adds management overhead for sure. Um, in regards to the, the conversation of a core OS, um, it's not when things are working for me. I don't get called in typically when things are working. I get called in when things are broken. And so yeah. when things are broken, it is just a fact of reality that it's harder to troubleshoot in a core installation. Um, I'm with you. And, 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 you know, I've had this discussion with Microsoft and Jeff Woolsey is going to beat me up the next time we have this conversation, but it's not when it's working. It's when it's not, that's the problem. And so, you know, it kind of is what it is. It's the platform that it is, but at the end of the day, it's harder to troubleshoot core than it is GUI. Okay, so uh, same with me. Uh, for me, uh, the core, um, Azure Stack HCI, the core uh, core con console, is much harder because we need some PowerShell uh, commands direct on the console. For example, with uh, storage uh, storage storage replica partnerships and so on, BitLocker, whatever you do, you have to do it on the console, and it's much harder without any good editor and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, absolutely. Oh, now we have a split screen. You can do that. Yeah. I just ended the presentation. <laughs> okay, we are both in the picture. Yeah, Dave, thanks so much. It's only a minute away to our next uh, to our next presentation. I will send you a mail. I have an idea, but uh, we will do that offline. Okay, Sounds Dave? good. Sounds good, my thanks friend. So thanks so much everyone. for being here and the support of of our Azure Stack HCI days and great presentation. But I think the audience is a little bit tired. This was the sixth hour already, and we have only five hours to go. <laughs> <laughs> sounds sounds good, everyone. Well, remember, it's all recorded. You can catch it afterwards. It is, and it was a great one. So uh, let's switch over to Dave um, uh, Dave Cuomo. 
I, I'm I'm a little bit tired too to, to Dave and and Trung, Dan sorry yes. Dan and Trung they will talk about um, um, network ATC and uh, Dave are you the uh, Dan are you then <laughs> there I am indeed uh, it is Dan uh, <laughs> I, I Dan is here Dave is not Dave's leaving um, Dave just but yeah. Here. Yeah, thanks for having us today. Um, do I go ahead and share my screen here? Is that how I do yeah, this? Yeah, that or? would be fantastic. You, We hear you Great. and you can right go on with the next session. OK. All right, can everyone see my screen? I'm just going to move that out of the way. Can everybody see my screen there? In a few seconds. Yes, we can uh, see it. No, yes. Excellent. OK, I will just make sure that I uh you know don't go too too fast here talk ahead of my slides uh so yeah thank you all for joining us today uh we're very excited to talk to you about network atc and and the roadmap that's coming along with this we've gotten some great feedback while network atc has been in preview um if you're not familiar with it this is uh you know a a, a brand new service that's coming to you with 21 h2 so it's right around the corner uh and we really hope that you'll give it a shot and you and you'll love it so uh, today we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to go through a recap of Network ATC. We're going to do a demo. We have a never before, before seen demo of uh, Windows Admin Center that Trung will take care of for us. Uh, we'll walk us through. And then we'll talk about some roadmap stuff. Uh, it's not actually just about Network ATC. So if you get bored with the first half, uh, and uh, despite Trung's demo being full of action, if you somehow uh, got bored of me talking and, and dropped off the call, Make sure you come back for the roadmap. We we actually have some uh, a, a brand new thing that we are have never talked about before publicly. We're going to show you at the end of the of the uh, at the end of this uh, session here. Um, so with that, who am I? I'm Dan Kumo. I'm a program manager on the Azure Edge and Platform core networking team at Microsoft. I own the server network data plane. So that means that anywhere your bits go, anywhere that the data is moving through the operating system or across the fabric. Uh, those are going through my components or, or things that I am responsible for. Um, so whether it's on Azure, Windows or HCI, it's kind of it, it, you're using many, many, many of my features, including Network ATC, and I hope that doesn't upset you. <laughs> so uh, with me today is Trung Tran. Uh, Trung is one of the program managers on the Windows Admin Center team. So Trung and I are both in the same organization. Uh, Trung focuses on Windows Admin Center accessibility uh, user engagements and feedback. Um, and Trung is going to be taking us through a, a brand new Network ATC demo in Windows Admin Center. So let's just quickly step back and make sure everybody's uh, heard of Network ATC and what we're trying to solve for, right? With any time that you're deploying a hyper-converged infrastructure, there's a whole lot of things you have to do, right? And because of all those things you have to do, it takes a lot of time, right? It takes several hours in fact, to actually deploy the system. And because there's so many things that you have to do, and it takes so much time, even if you script it out, um, it's complex, right? There's a lot of moving parts. And with that many moving parts, it becomes very error prone, right? There, there's a lot of differentiation between the nodes. It's very difficult to get every every node in the cluster to leave, uh, excuse me, every node in the cluster to look exactly the same as every other node in the cluster, right? And then Again, maybe you add multiple clusters, right? It gets it compounds the problem, right? So we have a deployment time issue, we have a complexity issue, and ultimately, you know, anytime you change configuration, it's there's a chance that it's going to be error prone, and that ultimately really uh, degrades the experience you're going to have on any hyperconverged infrastructure, let alone Azure Stack HCI. So what we've done is we've brought a new a new thing called Network ATC, and if you think about it. Network ATC is trying to tackle all these things on the checklist here. As I mentioned, the reason it's so long in deployment, the reason it's so complex, the reason it's so error prone is because we have all of these things we have to take care of just for host networking. And of course, that's just host one, right? Once you get host one done, you actually have to make sure that the other nodes in the cluster, in cluster one, uh, look exactly the same. Otherwise, the reliability of your solution may degrade. Otherwise, uh, you know, the experience, the, the performance of your cluster may degrade. Um, it's just not great, right? You, it's not the way it's supposed to be. You know, I'm sure if I asked you to take a look at some of our performance uh, blogs out there, you'd see 
you know, some really great numbers that we've demonstrated and shown, but then you try to repro that in your environment and, and you never quite get it right. Those are Microsoft numbers I've been told, right? That they don't represent real world scenarios, right? Well, in part that's because, well, you didn't configure it the same way that we did. And that's not necessarily your fault. We didn't make it overly easy for you to configure that. Well, now we are, right? So here, if you think about that, again, you go back to this network complexity. Uh, we've got four nodes here, right? It was hard enough just to get the one node uh, correct. Now we've got four nodes. That's very difficult to get exactly the same. Then if I go to the next slide, well, maybe I want to deploy more than one cluster, right? This just becomes a compounding issue. Um, now, many of you uh, will probably say, yeah, Dan, I don't need this. I have this all scripted. I've written my script years ago and it's it's been refined. It's perfect. It's great. No problems. Um, well, unfortunately, you know, I, I work with world class developers and they have bugs. I'm quite certain your script has a bug as well. I know my scripts have bugs, um, so that's not a slight on you. It's just that's the nature of the beast, right? Um, so instead, there's there's kind of a better way, and that's where network ATC comes in. Instead of deploying one node at a time, I deploy all nodes in the cluster, one time, one command, and I just give you, I just give you, uh, or, or you just tell us the intent of an adapter. So you can see on screen here, we have, uh, if I use my laser pointer here, I specify the NICs that I want to use for a specific intent, and I specify the cluster name that this intent is going to apply to. And then I provide one or more intents. Now, it, I don't want you to uh, over index on this and, and think that this is the only deployment model you can. If you go out to our documentation, we have a whole bunch of uh, example deployments that you can do, that you can look through. Um, but the key here is that you provide one or more intents and the intent names are management, compute, or storage. If you give us those, we translate uh, the appropriate configuration and implement it on all the cluster nodes. We do more than that, actually. Um, as I mentioned, network ATC is intent based, right? So you give us that intent, we translate it. We deploy the Microsoft validated best practices uh, on each of the nodes. So it's not again, it's not just that we do the deployment, but we de do the deployment the way that Microsoft would do it in our data center, the way that Microsoft is testing and validating it in our data center. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, we ensure uh, one of the best features, one of the coolest features about Network ATC is that we actually uh, make sure that it auto remediates, right? So if any one of the nodes uh, drifts or gets out of compliance with the, the specified intent, Network ATC will bring that node back into compliance. I'm sure if I took a quick poll uh, and asked any of you, uh, have you ever gone to one of your systems and say, oh, how did that get there? How did that happen? How did how did that configuration, how, why is that node different, right? Well, that's no longer a problem with network ATC. Sorry, my mouse is not clicking here. So uh, how do you actually get network ATC? Well, if you're on 21H2, if you're on an Azure Stack HCI solu uh, solution, which is right now 21H2 is in preview, uh, you can install Windows feature and just use network ATC um, this does work cluster-wide, and as Chung is about to show us, it also now works with Windows Admin Center. So we're going to be releasing an update uh, to deploy either through Windows Admin Center in the deployment wizard, or as always, you can use PowerShell. And again, just to be clear, you this was about to GA, right? So as soon as 21H2 goes live, uh, this will be available to all subscribers, all Azure Stack HCI subscribers, not just the preview channel. Right now it is in preview, so if you're on the preview channel, please try it out, give us some feedback. Um, but, you know, again, just to summarize here, you don't have to worry about turning every knob. You know, you don't have to worry about changing defaults between operating systems. You don't have to worry about the latest best practices or is my system supported? Did I deploy it in a supported manner? Do you, you don't have to worry about it changing over time. You have enough to worry about, right? You want to you want to move on to things like SDN or AKS on HCI. You have enough to worry about. Let us take care of this for you. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Trung. Uh, Trung's going to show us a, a pretty slick new demo, I think, of uh, Windows, uh, Windows Admin Center deployment. Trung, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Trung Tran, and I am a program manager on the Windows Admin Center team. Before I showcase the new deployment workflow with Network ATC, I wanted to refresh you all with our existing wizard flow so you can see the improvements for yourself. 
where users, um, then if you go to the next slide, where users were forced to have a management configuration. Now the deployment wizard can deploy any configuration that network ATC can deploy. Windows Admin Center did not allow for converged solutions and creating and assigning an IP address were really easy to mess up and misconfigure. Um, I know what you see on the screen right now, stage 2.5, where you have to define the networks were one of the um, stages that were most blocking for a lot of you. Um, a couple errors uh, would be like we couldn't configure and test network adapters, um, errors connecting to remote servers and things of that nature. Um, there would be times where like users would provide a static IP address in the same subnet for each adapter, but it would fail the ping test. And so um, based on our telemetry, we've seen that a lot of our users uh, sort of like abandon at this stage, and we hope to improve that somewhat. And so with that said, with the new ATC integration, we have simplified the user experience and made cluster deployment a lot easier. Right after stage one, you'll be prompted to either use the old flow or network ATC if your OS is 21H2. It's important to note that if you do not see this pop up, your hosts are not running 21H2, and so you need to upgrade beforehand. Um, and so in stage 2.1, uh, we automatically detect and verify your adapters and then auto populate them on screen if they are symmetrical adapters on all the nodes, which essentially means that each adapter has the same name, make, model, speed, and configuration. Uh, they should be named appropriately. And if an adapter is not symmetric with its counterparts on another host, or if there isn't an adapter named the same on another host, then it will not appear on this list of consolidated adapters. Uh, and if you notice that there is a missing adapter, you would click on that button there at, to display all the adapters available and then configure them as you see fit uh, in this context panel here. Um, the reason why we added this context panel instead of like displaying it outrightly for all of you to use is because it's very um, j jarring to look at at first. If this was like the first stage that you looked at, um, we did our best to simplify the experience for you all and to make it more user friendly. Um, that's why we've abstracted a lot of it away. Um, and uh, Dan, is there anything else you'd like to add here? Uh, no, I think you did a great job. I would just add, I just maybe I would add actually, just that the the list that you see here is the consolidated list. So again, as Trung, Trung stated, these are symmetric adapters that have the same name. Symmetric adapters defined in our documentation as the same make, model, speed, and configuration. The configuration part, network ATC is taken care of for you, right? So as long as they're the same make, model, and speed, and there's a corresponding adapter with the same name on every every node in the cluster. So you see there, there may be some here. We have Ethernet 2, NIC 1, NIC 1 on the left-hand side. Those are already selected. If you find that something is missing, you can either rename it here um, or uh, try to figure out and resolve why it's not there. But now uh, what you can see is now these four, these, uh, what is that, five adapters we can move forward with through the wizard because ATC is, has stated that these are uh, ready to be used. Okay. Amazing, thank you, Dan. Uh, and then once the adapters are ready, you'll continue on to stage 2.2 to define your network intent. Uh, in this design, we've automatically uh, ensured that you are only able to select adapters that can be paired together to guarantee that the supported solution is deployed with the highest level of reliability and support. So um, as uh, Dan clicks through uh, this demo, um, you'll see that a lot of options, uh, such as the one you see right now, um, are grayed out because um, it says the message here is like only identical adapters can be grouped together. And so if they do not match, we do not allow you to choose it um, because you'll encounter an error down the road anyway. So we just grayed out that option for you. Um, just so that and it's this, less prone. It, if uh, I may, Trung, I'm sorry. It, it also yes. helps to make sure that you remain in a supported configuration, right? So we know that you can't team 
uh, asymmetric adapters, right? In this case, we have Intel adapters and Mellanox adapters. Well, we can't team those together. So we, the wizard won't allow you to do that. In fact, it just, it kind of shows you that, hey, for these adapters that are, you're gonna use for the same purpose, they need to be the same, they need to be symmetric. And rather than you having to worry about that, the WAC wizard uh, worries about that for you and takes make sure that you can't uh, select the wrong options. Yes. Um, and then finally, um, if you do wish to make any changes to the configuration, there is an option to customize your network settings. Um, available here. Um, and so from there, uh, ATC already provides a set list of defaults um, for all of these settings. But if you wish to deviate from those defaults within like um, the given boundaries, um, such as like the virtual switch settings, data center bridging settings, or the adapter properties, um, you can. Uh, Dan, is there anything you'd like to add here? Nope. Oh. Okay. No, please continue. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, and then uh, once that uh, you confirm that uh, this is uh, how you want to define your network intents, um, you will move on to the next stage, uh, 2.3. Uh, in stage 2.3, uh, this is where you will define the subnets and VLANs uh, for the storage intent adapters. Uh, you'll find the network ATC defaults are pre-configured in these boxes already for you at the very top. Um, if these defaults work for you, amazing. Um, if not, feel free to modify them um, within the given boundaries of network ATC. Um, and then, yes, there we go. And then uh, down below, you will have to define the IP addresses for each PNIC. Um, after the demo, Dan will talk about uh, Network ATC roadmap, uh, including one of the cool new features um, that will make this page even easier for you all. Um, uh, Dan, is there anything else you'd like to add here before I give a, a brief overview of stage three? Yeah, I think the, the key here is that Network ATC does not change what you deploy, just how you deploy it, right? So it's not going to change uh, you know, if you're going to modify your MTU between nodes, it's not going to change what VLANs you have to use. It's not going to force you down a specific path. Um, it's just going to make sure that what you do select is a supported option. And, uh, you know, we're going to provide the built-in defaults, right? What Microsoft uses uh, in their labs. Yes. Um, and then uh, while <clears throat> I still have your attention, uh, in the cluster creation stage, um, we've seen that uh, there's been a lot of issues uh, due to like blocking errors uh, where people couldn't validate their clusters. So we reordered the steps to simplify the experience by allowing users to create the cluster in 3.1. And then with that, uh, they can deploy the networking information from stage two in 3.2. Uh, this allows us to implement and maintain the networking configuration across all the cluster nodes. Uh, and then finally, you'll be able to validate your clusters to ensure that all the nodes and intents defined uh, pass the validation successfully. And um, just uh, as a reminder, this feature will be available through an extension update at Ignite in November. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Trung. Yeah, so I think what you've seen here is we've taken a, even with the old workflow, um, you know, that workflow was still somewhat very complicated uh, because you still had to do a lot more work, right? You had to still provide all the same information, but you were just given a UI. And that UI certainly helped you work through that information, right? It kind of gave you a little bit more of a guided experience, but you still had to think about all the little details about the configuration. Now with this uh, update to the Windows Admin Center deployment UI, uh, we have a significantly better uh, streamlined experience where you have to worry about only the things that you really need to worry about. Um, you know, for example, what VLANs are used on the physical network. Um, so just to kind of close that out, we're, we'll talk about the roadmap for network ATC before we go on to our, our the uh, big new thing that we're going to talk about here. Um, 
you know, just a couple of updates. Trung alluded to um, some improvements in network ATC that will make this page even easier. So as, as simplified as this is, right, in the old page, we had to specify an IP address, a subnet mask, a VLAN for every single adapter that was being used in the storage network. Well, now uh, in, in the future, in a future update to network ATC, we're going to actually provide the auto configuration of IPs for any storage adapters, right? So anytime that you specify the storage intent, any physical adapter included in that storage intent will automatically find an IP address in the subnet and VLAN uh, or in a default subnet and VLAN that network ATC assumes. Now, again, you're not gonna be forced down that path. Uh, this UI will allow you to disable that behavior and you can specify your own IPs if that's your choice. Uh, however, you know, many of our customers don't actually care, right? They just want it configured. And so as long as the VLAN is available on the physical network, or sometimes they're using a switchless configuration, um, you know, network ATC can go off and actually find all, all these IP addresses and save these questions for you, right? Um, one additional thing is that uh, currently network ATC under the hood um, does not check uh, cluster-wide adapter symmetry, right? So it assumes that as long as the adapters uh, can be teamed, um, you know, that it would be uh, fine to do so. Um, in the future, we will provide additional support capabilities to identify on the local node if the adapters are teamable and across nodes, right? So we'll ensure that if you're using a 40 gig adapter on node one, that you have a 40 gig adapter on node two. And if it's 100 gig on node three, well, we'll flag that, right? Uh, so those are some uh, great new little additions to the solution. Again, all of this driving towards making your Azure Stack HCI solution uh, completely stable and reliable and making sure that you have the a best possible experience with your line of business apps that are sitting on top of our Azure Stack HCI solution. So with that, we're gonna talk about one more great new feature uh, that I'm really excited about. It's called Network HUD. Um, and this is really about finding uh, or identifying operational problems in your environment. So after Network ATC has deployed your environment, how do you know that it's actually working, right? Network ATC configures the host, but you might have a physical network that's sitting in between and actually stopping your connectivity between nodes. How do you know that? It becomes very challenging to tell. And it's all specific to your environment, right? So, and we started out with this picture again, deployment time, complexity, error prone. Uh, these are things that network ATC addresses here, right? Uh, but the operational analytics is something that network ATC doesn't address. Network HUD is going to address these things. And what that really means is that we're going to ingest, Network HUD is a, a, a service that will ingest uh, data from a variety of different sources. And if you look at you know, the physical switch and event logs and performance counters and functional tests, well, now we have another large problem, right? You have to be an expert at knowing how to ingest and define uh, uh, you know, the, the problems, right? When you see a problem or when you see a crash or a, a an error on your system, how do you draw the answer out from the vast amount of data that's being provided to you? Well, you know, we put our heads together here at Microsoft and we, we have our own lab that run into these very same problems. And so we take in that data and we perform a real-time analysis, right? The real-time analysis might be, in a simple example, if you can think about a NIC that might be flapping, right? It might be disconnecting and reconnecting, disconnecting, reconnecting. If that event occurs, X number of times within Y minutes, we can form a conclusion, right? We can perform a real-time analysis and perform a conclusion. Of course, in the future, that's why it says HUD update there, we'll also be able to establish trends for your environment, right? We'll be able to identify traffic that is, uh, you know, expected to occur and make sure that your VMs on your work, on your systems actually can achieve that traffic. Um, finally, we're going to give you contextual responses, right? Where possible, we'll auto remediate, and where, where possible really means where safe, right? So if we have enough adapters in that same flapping Nick example, um, we could remove an unstable adapter or quarantine it. Uh, but if it's not safe to do do so, we'll just auto alert, right? So we'll we'll uh, proactively provide uh, contextual responses if there's missing VLANs and things like that. We can tell you what VLANs are not being seen. So again, detect, assess, remediate. 
So here's some of the operational issues we'll, we'll tackle. So if you look at the fabric misconfiguration, maybe we're missing a VLAN on the fabric. Um, maybe we're missing a VLAN being advertised to one team member. Actually, I had an issue come into my inbox this morning with that very issue, right? One team member uh, had a VLAN available to it on the physical network and one team member did not. That was all on the same node, right? So when the a, a VM, let's say you have two VMs, they each use the same uh, different network adapters there, they might have different connectivity because the VLANs aren't available on the fabric. Um, VLANs advertisement across team members and the nodes, right? So if the nodes, if the nodes themselves don't have the same VLANs advertised. If the MTU uh, that you've specified in your network ATC configuration can't get across the fabric, we can tell you that. Um, if you have incorrect data center bridging, PFC or ETS, right? So if you have incorrect data center bridging configuration on the locally connected switch ports, we'll be able to tell you that. Um, of course, some operational states like TCP, UDP, RDMA, uh, we have many scenarios where uh, our customers are running their solution. Uh, they think it's using RDMA, but it's not, right? It's actually consuming the CPU cycles that your VMs need on your host, right? Maybe it's only actually doing that on one host. How do you know that? How do you see that? Network HUD will help you there. Uh, state changes, again, as we mentioned, disconnects or resets of the adapter, consistent uh, disconnections or resets. We can identify that, quarantine the adapter if needed. Um, PCIe bandwidth limitations. This is a really interesting one. Uh, now that we're getting into higher speed adapters. You know, 100 gig is becoming a, a norm in many of your environments. The PCIe bandwidth, uh, uh, the, the slot that it's plugged into, may not be fast enough to actually allow you to achieve that 100 gigabits, right? Uh, so we can identify those things. Again, topology uh, mapping, some of the, the physical and lo logical topology efficiencies, we can make recommendations there. Um, whether or not your cabling is helping you there actually achieve the, the line rate of the adapters. And of course, hotspot identification. We mentioned before with that HUD update, we'll be able to identify uh, latency and throughput hotspots uh, to help you resolve physical issues on your network. So again, just to summarize here, some of the goals of Network ATC is to identify operational networking issues, right? We're not gonna tackle host configuration issues. That's Network ATC's job. Um, environmental awareness, we wanna make sure uh, that we are understanding the data that's coming in in your environment. It's critical that we we operate this solution for your environment because your environment is going to be different than others. We love to auto remediate whenever possible, but we also don't want to put you into a, a, a worse uh, si uh, situation. So we'll only do that when it's safe. Uh, otherwise, we will always alert. So we will alert and if possible, automatically remediate. And then, of course, as a result of this, right, the platform stability just goes up. So storage basis direct, AKS, HCI, SDN, anything that sits on top of the platform just inherently gets better. Uh, this is integrated with Network ATC. So the only way that you that Network HUD will actually track the adapters is if you're using Network ATC and the adapter is included in one of one or more, one of the intents that you have specified with Network ATC. It does integrate with the existing health and monitoring solution. So there's nothing else you need to do there. If you're using Azure Monitor, using uh, any of the uh, health and monitoring capabilities already in the platform that will be that will naturally uh, integrate. And again, diagnostics as a service, we don't have to just wait for a brand new OS. If we find an emerging issue in the ecosystem, um, you know, based on our support information or telemetry, we can provide you a new service uh, a new solution, excuse me, and you can just update that automatically in your environment when you're ready. Now, how do I get it, right? Uh, the first thing is you do need to use an Azure Stack HCI compliant network switch. You may be uh, aware that we have some public documentation outlining some switches that have met all the requirements that we've asked them to do, to, to uh, implement. Uh, those switches are the ones that will be able to leverage this capability because they provide the information that we need uh, to us. If they're not on that list, I, there's no guarantee that we'll be able to actually provide any of these cool new details. Um, of course, stay tuned to the preview channel. This will first appear there uh, in, a in a future preview release. Uh, it is not coming. Network HUD is not coming in 21H2. It will be coming in a release after that, um, and it will be automatically available at that point. So there's no additional cost for this, uh, nothing like that. You know, it's it's going to be automatically available to all the HCI subscribers.
All right, so with that, um, oh, and also I'll just note if you're uh, looking for the link to our compliant network switches, um, that'll be in the slides that I think uh, Karsten and, um, and uh, Manfred will send out. So uh, please look for that. All right, on the questions. Or is everybody asleep? <laughs> I don't know. Not everybody is asleep. Uh, you you finished a little bit early, uh, so half an hour. Uh, so we have a lot of room for questions, and uh, you open open that can of worms, right? Oh, uh, no. no. <laughs> All right. <laughs> because you are responsible for everything network in uh, Azure Stack HCI and Windows Server. So. Uh, um, jokes no aside, um, <laughs> the HUD feature is, is coming in a feature release. I, I like that what I see. I have actually a question about um, about ATC. Um, yeah. What about uh, in a stretch cluster? We will have replication networks. Can you configure that also with ATC or uh, is, it, uh, is it only for the easy stuff? <laughs> Uh, no, it's not only for the easy stuff. I will say there are some uh, caveats with stretch clustering, which is that right now on the host storage network, so if you think about the underlying storage network, um, we need to make sure that the VLANs are actually the exact same on both sites. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, they can be, you know, like we showed in the demo, it could be 711, 712, 713. We need to use that same uh, set of VLAN. That doesn't mean you have to stretch a VLAN, just to be clear, right? For the uh, underlay networks here, that can be, uh, to, you know, the same VLANs, but in different data centers or different locations, so they don't have to be stretched, okay? Um, but you would just need to use the same VLANs on both sites. That's the only limitation right now. We do aim to solve that in the future, uh, but that is the only limitation that I'm aware of with stretch. Yeah. Um... To give you some input there, uh, I work with a lot of network guys, you know that, and if they have a different subnet, it's nearly always a different VLAN. So uh, if we have that in two date, in two sites, uh, I really can't convince them to use the same VLANs. But uh, we have a question from Dave. He want to ask that live, so he joined us now. And I have also Sorry, another no, question. Before we go on, can I, before we go on, let me just uh, go back to your last question, which or last statement, which you know, so again, it totally depends on your design with stretch cluster, right? If you're in yeah. the same data center, that subnet and VLAN can be exactly the same, right? If you're using stretch in the same data center, it can be the exact same subnet and VLAN. If it's going across a site, right, across a geographical distance of some sort, um, then yeah, that might be a little bit more difficult. I, I've still seen customers do that. Uh, however, I, I recognize that it is a little bit uh, more difficult. In the future release, we are looking to address that. Okay, cool. So Dave. Yeah, Dan, I've got a quick question for you just in regards to the switch vendor support. Um, I do a lot of work with uh, Mellanox and work with their SN2100 platform. Um, since being bought by NVIDIA, they've actually deprecated some of their um, 40 gig switches. And like you said, 100 gigs or uh, it's either 100 or 25 is really what, what your choices are now. Um, so in that platform and in your testing, um, are you guys using Mellanox and is it like CX5, CX6s? What's, what do you have? And then the last part of that question is with the, the, the HUD configuration, is there going to be switch side configuration changes and will you publish those changes somewhere for us to configure the switches properly so we can use it? Yeah, so let's let's take the first one first, which is what do we use in our lab? And uh, I'm not going to make an advertisement for any specific vendors. We do use physical switches. We also have switchless configurations in our environment to kind of test the gamut. Um, what I would say is that currently NVIDIA and Mellanox is not on our compliant list. We hope that they will join shortly. Um, regardless of the vendor that is, you know, whether they're on the list or not, we would wholeheartedly encourage you to reach out to them and say, you know, look, you're not on the list and my switch needs to be there. Why is it not there? Right. Ask them. Uh, you know, we all work on feedback from our customers. Right. So if you tell us that this is important to you, we will absolutely listen. And I'm I'm quite certain that Mellanox and NVIDIA would as well. Um, you know, re again, regard regardless, there are many switches that are not on that list today. So, again, that goes for all of you. Please, please reach out to all of your network suppliers and find out why they're not, right? We, I know that many of them are working on it, uh, but there are some requirements that we have added that uh, many of them could not quite yet uh, obtain. So again, they are working on it, but uh, 
you know, it's going to take a little while. So, do you, so the only way to speed up is if you keep asking. <laughs> Sorry, okay. do you have do you have a published list of uh, the switches that are compliant right now? Yes, and the the link is actually in our um, is actually in the slide deck, but it's also if okay. you look up the physical uh, physical network requirements, we have two main documentation pages uh, for quote unquote data plane, the server network data plane, if you will. Um, there's one that's called physical host network requirements and uh, sorry, physical network requirements and host network requirements. There are two different mm -hmm. pages. They talk about things like stretch clustering. They talk about um, you know the physical switches, RDMA, that type of stuff. So that list of switches is actually on there. We'll continue to add more. So as soon as they they come, uh, you know, we we have communicated with them and we've validated or verified that they have met all the requirements. We'll publish them right on the list there, um, along with any of the requirements, right? So I think we just had Juniper that joined our list, um, and there is a minimum firmware version that you have to have on the switch, right? Um, now again, these requirements aren't terribly complex, right? So it's not adding a significant uh, chunk of code uh, into your configuration here. Really, the only thing that you're already that you're not already doing is enabling the LODP uh, information that we'll use. LODP is called Link Layer Discovery Protocol. And it's just a protocol that uh, allows the uh, communication of configuration between neighbors. In this case, the neighbor being Azure Stack HCI hosts with the switch. Uh, so the switch can send us that information, and we can, uh, you know, just use it from there. Um, so, one more quick question for you, just in regards to where it's going from a roadmap perspective. Sorry, Karsten. Um, okay. Is is the overall goal of this to start looking at being able to auto provision the switches so that we can basically just have a plug and play type infrastructure so that we're not having two planes that we have to work down, be able to drive all of that from a single configuration UI? Uh, so it's a great question. Um, I, while I would love to get there, that is going to take time. So I have no immediate plans to do that right now. Um, but yeah, we'd love to hear more about that offline. Thanks, Dave. Now I jump in. Uh, I have two questions from the audience I want to ask. But before that, I want to clarify on LLDP because in, in a lot of scenarios, people like to have LLDP uh, enabled on the servers so they can see them in the switches. Uh, the, what is on the other end? Is it possible to configure LLDP on a Windows server and Azure Stack HCI? Because I didn't find the commands for that. Ah, uh, well, they're Maybe not I'm installed by such, default. Yeah, yeah, they're they're not installed by default actually. But yes, it is possible. Uh, if you install the RSAT tools for the data center bridging uh, configuration, the yeah. uh, LODP commandlets come along with that. Uh, so you'll okay. see like enable LODP agent and um, things like that. Uh, we are improving those as well. Uh, along with this update with Network HUD, we'll be improving those capabilities that come in box. Um, LODP is uh, one of those things that was built a long time ago uh, for voice over IP. It's a very interesting uh, backstory. We won't bore anybody with that that uh, <laughs> uh, background right now, but uh, they are in box. They are available today. Uh, we've even made some helpers. Uh, if you go, there's a blog on our uh, site called Troubleshooting Switch Misconfigurations. If you go to that, there's a, a PowerShell module, an additional PowerShell module that you can download from the PowerShell gallery. Um, it can you can use it to enable the LODP agent across uh, a list of NICs or all the NICs that are in a specific team. Um, you can then test and make sure that you know you've actually seen data come in from the switch, and then you can also get that information and see what that information is. It automatically kind of parses it for you. Um, so yeah, so it is available uh, both inbox capabilities, but then also a helper externally, and we hope to bring all that inbox in the future. OK, cool. And I understand it's also available in Windows Server because the data center bridging module module is also in Windows Server, right? It's not only yeah, so the HCI, oh? No, no, the, you're correct. The uh, data center bridging module, as well as the PowerShell module that I mentioned before, will work on either Windows Server or Azure Stack HCI. Uh, Network HUD is going to do all of this of automatically course. for you, and that will only be available on Azure Stack HCI. So there mm -hmm. is some value, uh, some certainly some benefits that are there. Um, you could do all this manually. You could, uh, I'm sure, write your own service to actually, uh, you know, rerun all these commands and do all the crazy things that we're doing under the hood for you. Um, we'd recommend you just let leave us to it and and uh, join us on Azure Stack HCI. 
OK, so uh, I will send you also a mail offline because I'm I'm keen to have another webinar with you about networking in all the stuff is if you are up to it, but we can discuss it uh, offline. So sure. I have two questions from the audience. One is from Great. Chris. Can you save the network ATC configuration from WAC as a PowerShell script just before you su submit it for applying changes to use in case you rebuild the cluster? Great question. Great question. So uh, I have. I have good news and I have great news, right? So, <laughs> so Network C <laughs> first uses the cluster database uh, as its database, right? So when you configure, when you say add net intent or set net intent, that goal state is actually stored in the cluster database itself, right? So from there, all you really need to do is back up the cluster database like you already probably are, right? Uh, the other thing is the the other aspect of what you're uh, kind of hit, uh, hinting at is what if I have another cluster, right? How do I get that one to look exactly like the first one? Well, we have an inbox command like called copy net intent. So once you create your net intent and maybe you add in a whole bunch of overrides and customizations, right? You really didn't like our defaults. That's fine. Um, instead of having to replay all of those on the next cluster, you can just take the first cluster, say copy net intent from cluster A to cluster B, and from cluster A to cluster C, et cetera, et cetera, right? So Network ATC makes that actually very easy. You kind of have inside the cluster database, just a recap, you have a full-on backup of that configuration. Everything that Network ATC is using as its information store is in the cluster database. You can actually look at it. I do not modify it that way. That's <laughs> not supported, uh, but you can certainly look at it uh, and back it up with your regular cluster backups. Cool. Very Great cool. question. Another, another question from the audience. Uh, will network ATC be coming in uh, system center virtual machine manager also? Uh, maybe that is. So that's unknown at this time. Um, I would love to see it. Uh, we still have a lot of things to figure out. There's a lot of uh, additional pieces that we need to work on uh, in order to make that possible. OK, thanks so much. So if other MVPs have questions for Dan, I know he, some are online. Uh, it's now your time. Uh, otherwise, um, do we have more questions? Yeah, we have one in the chat. Do you see it when you scroll down, Karsten? OK, maybe. Uh, let me scroll yeah. down. Will there, I think uh, Dan talked already about a Mellanox support, but uh, to clarify, will there be a Mellanox support with Mellanox slash Onyx OS instead of Cumulus OS switches? I think you said oh. there is no Mellanox support at all at, in the moment. So uh, just to make sure I understood the question, is the question about the Onyx OS versus the Cumulus OS? Yeah, the, uh, the, the it is asked if if there will be support for the Onyx OS and, uh, and okay. not the Cumulus. Yeah, so I, I think what I would recommend is that the if you are running a Mellanox switch, you reach out to Mellanox and find out their roadmap. Um, not sure that I have the all of the information on on their exist on their future roadmap and their guidelines there. Um, but I would recommend that you reach out to Nvidia. Uh, I, sorry that I'm using Nvidia and Mellanox interchangeably here. Uh, but yeah. I would recommend that you reach out to NVIDIA there um, and just get their sense, uh, get get the information directly from them. Yeah, I think the the question was about uh, the customer has maybe the Onyx OS like I have in my Mel in my NVIDIA switches, and now Mellanox is uh, uh, NVIDIA is all about uh, Cumulus Linux. So this is a, mm -hmm. a new way to go. So. Uh, I think the, the question was more about if you would ever support it. You said you don't know yet because NVIDIA has to yeah, tell you which one would yeah, be. Uh, yeah. yeah, sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off there, Carson. I, I was just going to say that uh, ultimately the OS is uh, owned by NVIDIA there, right? So the, the switches OS is actually owned by NVIDIA, which is why uh, you know we need compliant network switches, meaning you know we, we can't build the software for the switch. Um, so it's only for switches that actually support the capabilities that we've published. And again, you can go and look on this uh, online. You can go to our public documentation. We list all the requirements that we've sent to the switch vendors are actually public. You can look at them yourself and you can ask them, right? Like, you know, question one, question two, question three, which one of these don't you support and why? And when will you support it, right? And I will say that uh, most of them are working on it right now. Okay. 
So if we have no more questions for Dan and uh, Drang, uh, Dave has one more, I see, Dave. And I have one question. And Manfred. Yeah, oh, first Dave uh, and then Manfred. First Dave and then Manfred. Yeah, Dave. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> first Dave. Okay. Okay, so, no, so with, with lack of support for my Mellanox gear, um, how does this, how does HUD pan out in an iWarp configuration then? Is that an easier configuration for us? Because you really don't care so much about the switches at that point in time because you're driving everything inside of the OS, right? So is, is this a bigger push to go iWarp over Rocky V2? No, I wouldn't say that. I, I would say that these two things are unrelated. We'll work, you know, Network HUD will work just as well with iWarp or Rocky. And and again, I, I don't want to make this uh, about NVIDIA specifically or any other specific vendor. Um, you know, all the vendors are working on this that I'm aware of, right? We've talked to many different vendors, whether they're on the list or not currently. Um, you know, that's how Juniper got on the list, right? We, talk, we were talking with Juniper. Uh, they came up with uh, you know, the feature gaps that they had, they closed the feature gaps and they released that in an updated uh, uh, firmware release. So again, this isn't uh, specific to iWarp or Rocky, nothing like that. Um, you know, it, it's at least not to say that uh, that this makes it easier to do one or the other. In fact, we're trying to make all of uh, all deployments easier, right? So that's kind of the goal of Network Hud is to highlight what you you know, how you are configured and if it's operationally working, right? The two network ATC and network HUD work together. Okay, um, uh, okay. I have an absolutely not technical question um, then. <laughs> uh, we always use this acronyms ATC um, uh, and now <laughs> network HUD. Can you say what it stands for? What's the official full name for ATC? I researched in docs and in docs uh, it starts with uh, this is network ATC and there's no <laughs> full name for it. Uh, so network ATC is the full name for it. Uh, there's no acronym okay. there. We had an acronym uh, internally just as we were talking about a conceptual uh, name, but we have not gone forward with that, right? The, the proper name is network ATC. So where you see things on my slides that just say ATC, that was a mistake where I should have said network ATC, right? The proper name is network ATC. Network HUD, uh, the HUD does sp stand for heads up display, right? So the idea conceptually you can think of a heads up display, right? You get a, um, you know, if you if you want to think about a, a, a pilot in a plane, right? They get all this little uh, data coming into them on their screen and they have to somehow make sense of that, right? Um, and so network HUD stands for heads up display where we're taking that information, we're coalescing it down to just what you need and we're providing some actionable data for you uh, that you can, uh, that you can, make a determination as to whether or not your system is actually working right again instead instead of seeing all those performance counters instead of seeing all the event logs instead of seeing uh ldp information and you having a way to like oh it said this is trunked or subtype seven is not you know configured properly right and so do you have to worry about all that network hud will do that for you so it, again it's coalescing all the many endpoints of data uh into some actionable tangible information that you can use and so that that was the idea behind Network HUD, heads up display. Again, it is a proper name, so we won't refer to it as heads up display or anything like that. It'll be Network HUD. Um, okay. We have another question from the audience. Um, uh, is the Microsoft Zonic, Zonic Switch OS supported? I didn't even I didn't know that Microsoft has a Switch OS. Yes. So uh, Sonic Sonic is uh, not something that I work on directly. Uh, I am very much aware of it, right? So Microsoft has an OS, uh, a switch OS. If you're if you're really interested in the background and the research on this, you can look up switch abstraction interface, uh, SAI. Uh, this was uh, kind of a, I, I don't, I, I probably will do a disservice by my definition, but this was kind of its uh, first of its kind where we abstracted, Microsoft, not me, uh, abstracted the uh, firmware OS that is running on the switch from the underlying hardware that's there. And so Sonic has the ability to actually run uh, across any uh, switch. And you know, Dave mentioned before the NVIDIA switch, right, which could run Onyx or Cumulus, same concept that's based off of SAI, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, the, the same, same concept is there, right? You can kind of take the Sonic OS and put it on various different hardware. Uh, to the specific question of whether it's supported, so, uh, we do Microsoft does not support Sonic publicly. Uh, it is used for internal use, but just like our, you know, we have various different uh, open source components that we provide to the community. 
Uh, there are various vendors that have actually forked that code um, and are shipping uh, you know, publicly, public versions, right? I think Dell has one that actually ships a Sonic OS publicly. Uh, we have not had anyone uh, that is running that Sonic OS reach out uh, about compliance, so I can't state whether or not it actually is uh, one of the compliant OSs. Um, interestingly, that's actually brings up another issue, right? Because you might have compliant hardware, but not uh, software. Um, and so where possible, we will try to make, you know, put a, a combined uh, list together um, if it's not uh, if it's not immediately apparent, right? We'll try to note both the firmware OS and uh, and the switch line. Yeah, Dan, and I, I think I have bad news for you because in the moment you have three switch vendors on your list. Uh, I think it's <laughs> Dell, Lenovo and Juniper. Yep. Um, if I'm correct, and Udo is also in the chat from, from Lenovo, I think Lenovo doesn't have these switches anymore. So. That's right. So, well, so, but if I remove it from I the have list, those switches, they are great, but uh, they don't make them anymore. So, unfortunately. Yeah, so if I remove it from the list, though, I'll, everybody would uh, suddenly be super worried that it's not on the list and say, well, my switch isn't compliant, it won't work, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm kind of caught between a rock and a hard place there. But what I would say is that, yes, we are, we are aware. Lenovo told us right when we, when we were talking okay. with them that uh, these devices were end of life, uh, but we didn't want to exclude them, right? If you had already purchased that switch, um, you know, it makes sense to continue on um, and, and just continue using that switch. You're not going to have a degraded experience with Network HUD. Um, you know, it's, it is what it is, right? You can't buy it from Lenovo anyway, so it's it's not an informed uh, purchasing problem, right? So, yeah. uh, but that is one of the benefits of having a compliant list is that when you go to purchase a switch, you purchase it knowing whether or not it will be able to do these things that we have uh, been trying to do. And so, um, if it is on the list, great. It will you'll have no no problems whatsoever. We fully expect it to to. Uh, uh, to integrate just fine with with Network HUD and, and any future capabilities we provide. Um, I will say that it's going to be version specific too, right? So there's this kind of a two part uh, a two part relationship, right? So Microsoft is building new capabilities like Network HUD to leverage these capabilities that are built by the the uh, the vendor, uh, the switch vendor. And so with 21H2, right? There are certain requirements in a future OS we may increase those requirements, right? And your network switch vendor will need to add those new capabilities to be on that same list, right? Mm -hmm. If they're not, uh, then you'll just, again, the the experience will degrade a little bit, right? You'll probably be warned or see an error in your log that says, whoop, we didn't find this information we were looking for. Um, so we can't check for this. See, if I don't error uh, and tell you that, I'm, that I didn't get the information from the switch, you'll go along thinking, oh, HUD's happy. Right, and that I don't want you to think that either. Right, so HUD didn't find any errors. Well, it's because I didn't it didn't actually check anything. Right, so we will alert you if the information didn't come in uh, to Network HUD, and and so you can follow up to the vendor at that point. That's great. So I have two more questions for you. Uh, one is uh, from Jaromir. Jaromir unfortunately can't ask him uh, ask the questions himself because he's having dinner with his kids and that would be too loud. So he's asking, and I know where, where this is coming from, uh, if the network ATC database uh, will expand for other cluster settings, so I could just export configuration and load it in, uh, into one node and, and then it would deploy cluster, including all settings. You know, he is automating a lot with uh, MS Lab, mm -hmm. so I think this is, uh, this is why, why he asked this question. Yeah, so I'll take that as a two-part question, actually. Um, and it's, I'm just going to point out, Carson, it's a good thing I ended early because we've got a lot of questions here, right? So this is good. I had a feeling. Yeah, uh, yeah so the yeah. I'll take that as a two-part question. The first is, uh, I'll take it in reverse order, actually. Can I run this in a virtual machine? Network ATC will absolutely deploy in a virtual machine, but you will see a status of failed for any intent, for uh, some of the intents, at least uh, the storage intent. And the reason is, uh, not because it actually failed to do what it's doing, but it couldn't deploy things like data center bridging inside the virtual machine. Those capabilities don't exist. And so whereas you might just be able to use ATC to deploy inside of a virtual machine, um, if you're going off some logic to like check when it's completed, you might find that you're you're going to run into a problem there. Um, I don't know if there's any other deviations, um, so don't quote me on that, but uh, you know, for any of the other types of intents. Um, but what I would say to the first question of whether or not we will take on more uh, cluster network settings, uh, we can absolutely do that. Uh, the, you know, it kind of comes up to um, a question of what settings do you want to see? 
So I'd like to I'd like to actually follow up and tell us uh, what don't we do today that you would like to see us do, right? Things like the auto IP uh, that we're bringing in a future release uh, in the you know in the next release with uh, Azure Stack HCI, um, that was direct customer feedback, right? That was direct customer feedback where we said, well, there's no real way we can predict IP addresses, right? And then they said, yeah, but couldn't you try, right? We said, oh, all right, well, you know, we'll come up with an idea, right? And we came up with an idea and and a way to allow you to override that if you don't like our idea, right? Um, and that's kind of how that was born. So by all means, tell us your feedback, give us your feedback. Um, the worst thing we can say is not right now, right? We can't get to it right now, but we'll, we'd be happy to take that um, and put it through our planning process and see if we can get it in. Okay, I, I see Jaromir is typing. Uh, I fear he's typing <laughs> a long, so I do first my question and if Sorry, there is enough go. time left, <laughs> Jaromir, otherwise Jaromir has to send it offline. I'm pretty sure he knows your mail address. Um, so in uh, Azure Stack HCI uh, 21H2, um, there is an improvement for RDMA. It's called uh, that encryption, for example, or um, is it encryption? Yeah, encryption. There's a better support for encryption with RDMA. And nowadays we have the problem if you use encryption, it's going through the CPU and RDMA is going um, not through the CPU, the, the card is directly get, uh, patching the data from the RAM. So is uh, can you explain, is there an improvement or is it more marketing? And if there is improvement, <laughs> how you do it? <laughs> uh, so I will I will say that this is an area I'm unfamiliar with. I'm not I'm not uh, familiar with all the intricacies there. I, I would like to say that it's not marketing. So I'll point you to Cosmos and Jason Yee. Uh, Cosmos yeah. and Jason, you would be the most knowledgeable on that. Okay, so but uh, but I got that right. They they said uh, there is an improvement in RDMA for yeah, encryption. Yeah, huh? I also heard this. Yeah. And you are responsible for RDMA, so I'm shocked that you don't know about it. Not, so I'm not. I'm not responsible for. So so this is a layering problem, Carson. This is what we call a layering <laughs> pro problem, right? I'm I am responsible for RDMA and the physical NIC and the data plane. Uh, yeah. SMB is an application, and the encryption of right. SMB is also part of that application. And so I'm not responsible. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. But okay. Yeah. Was, there you go. That's how you. I see how I skirted what? out of that one. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So now uh, Jaromir uh, specified his question. Many things. Oh, that's great. Many things. SMB bandwidth limits, cluster network settings, RMA settings, encryption signing, cluster cache. So he wants all these things in. And there is more. All CPU mitigation. Well, so, OK, so yes. let's hang on. Let's uh, <laughs> let's let's take a quick. So network ATC is about networking, right? So uh, cluster cache is not necessarily networking. But again, all of that information is likely stored in the cluster database as well. Um, I would certainly recommend that you follow up with the non-networking uh, uh, PMs about some of these non-networking things. And, and if there's a way that you want to improve, uh, I would certainly recommend that. Now, to your specific networking, some of these are networking things, right? Cluster yeah. network settings, great point, right? So we could certainly take a look at those. Uh, the RDMA settings, I'm not, again, you know, we, we get into this layering conversation of SMB, right? SMB being a consumer of RDMA. Um, and I don't want to go too far into all that, right? But the long and the short of it is there are certain, you know, uh, there's a platform capability called RDMA, and then there are people that use RDMA. Um, in this case, SMB is one of those things that uses RDMA. So yes, we could certainly do more there um, and, and integrate further. Um, again, we just need keep pinging us PMs about uh, what we you'd like to see, um, preferably offline and like an email that, you know, I, I'm not going to find this uh, chat list again, but uh, please send to me an email, Jaromir. Uh, yes, and I'm pretty sure you will get an email from Jaromir. I'm, 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 I'm confident pretty... I will. <laughs> <laughs> so we have now one minute to the next session. I want to thank uh, you, Dan, and also Trung for the great presentation. And we have a lot of questions here. First, the audience was shy, but then more and more questions came in. <laughs> and networking is always a part of uh, clustering that is very, very important. And if it's not working, nothing is working. So that, thanks, Dan. And uh, we will switch over now to um, the next presentation. Um, it's from Huizu, and we will hear about, uh, hear about deep dive, build stretch clustering with PrimeFlex for Microsoft Azure Stack HCI. I hope, yeah, I see Fabian 
Fabian, uh, uh, the stage is yours. If you just wait uh, some seconds, so maybe we do a little bit. Bye, Dan. Yeah, bye, everybody. Thank, Thank you again. Sound test. Yeah, Fabian? can you hear me? Yeah, can you? Yes, we can hear you and we oh, yes, can okay. see your slides. OK, so you can go um, on. Do you see my camera as well? Yes, yes, we do. OK, great. So um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me, Carsten and uh, Manfred. And uh, yeah, good evening uh, and yeah, good morning or simply hello to um, whatever time zone you may be in. Um, so in Germany, it's actually um, 8 p.m. right now. So um, this is what we would call um, prime time here. Um, so yeah, I'm very too happy, very happy to have the spot. And um, I hope you are having a great event so far. So I enjoyed all the sessions so far that I've seen. And um, thanks for joining my session, especially on uh, stretch clustering with um, PrimeFlex for Microsoft Azure Stack HCI. Um, we've got a yeah fully packed session, so I'd say let's get started. Um, first of all, quick um, overview of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, firstly, I'm going to um, introduce myself a bit and Fujitsu, and then after that we dive right into the main part, which is about um, stretch clustering with Azure Stack HCI. And um, I brought along a couple of pre-recorded videos with me um, for my demos. Um, so we were going to be uh, watch them. And um, yeah, we look at the installation, uh, creation of volumes and VM failover, um, but also want to cover some theoretical basics and concepts first, um, at least a bit. I think Carsten did a great job in laying them out early on already. Um, if you have joined his session, if not, then I would uh, re definitely recommend to do so um, to or to watch this later on. Um, so I want to take a look at everything from both a Windows Admin Center perspective and also um, PowerShell uh, point of view, um, which we haven't seen earlier in custom sessions, I think. And everything was um, recorded on our demo uh, systems in Munich. Um, we, we have um, newly rebuilt our demo lab there, and uh, we are happy to um, yeah host customer demos there and also partner or demos for partners and uh, yeah also such events as here. Um, so if you would be interested in a in a demo on on our systems, then. Um, you are free to reach out uh, to us and then uh, we can see if we can facilitate one of um, those demos. And of course, there will be some room for questions in the end, but um, yeah, now let's let's get started with the quick introduction. So first of all, um, a bit about me because I'm not as famous as uh, most of my fellow speakers here who are mostly MVPs and uh, Microsoft PMs. So um, yeah, my name is Fabian Boske. I work uh, at Fujitsu and I'm 24 years old. Um, I've actually already been with Fujitsu for six years now. Um, so I joined in 2015, um, working with them as part of my studies. And um, yeah, now I'm working in the Technical Competence Center um, for our integrated systems um, all across Europe. Um, and basically our responsibility there is to um, look after the integrated systems from a pre and post sales point of view and help our um, mostly internal colleagues to, to do their job properly. Um, I'm responsible for the Microsoft based integrated systems, which is why I'm here today. And um, yeah, when I say systems, I mean uh, basically prime flex for storage spaces direct. So this is our um, let's say old offering based on Windows Server. And then we also have an offering based on uh, the Azure Stack HCI um, dedicated operating system, which is called PrimeFlex for Microsoft Azure Stack HCI. So with that, um, for those of you who do not know Fujitsu, I think Carsten has been wondering about uh, how to pronounce it earlier. Um, so whether you say Fujitsu or uh, Fujitsu, you can actually say both, I think. Um, just as a side note, um, the, the G in Fujitsu uh, comes from earlier days when this was a joint venture together with Siemens. So um, in Japanese, the, the uh, 
G uh, stands for LG Mensu, which uh, was for Siemens. So um, we are actually the um, eighth largest IT service provider in the world with customers all over the world and employ um, yeah, more than 125,000 people worldwide. And um, last year we actually celebrated our 85th birthday. So um, we are a company with a long tradition and um, also value long lasting and sustainable customer relationships and trying to build them. And um, yeah, being an IT service provider means uh, that we do not only sell products, but uh, we also support our customers um, with building their IT strategies and uh, in finding the, the right spot for them between on-premises infrastructure and uh, cloud offerings. So um, as an Azure system integrator, we are well suited to do so. And I think with Azure Stack HCI, we have the perfect offering here. So let's continue to talk about Azure Stack HCI in our uh, offering portfolio. Um, so as mentioned, we have two different PrimeFlex integrated systems offerings. So one based on Windows Server 2019 currently, and then in the future, um, Windows Server 2022, and uh, also one based on Azure Stack HCI, um, which we are going to talk about today. And we currently have three different um, server base units in the um, Azure Stack HCI catalog. So um, these are certified solutions. And I want to um, point your attention um, to the um, TX1330 M4 um, on the right hand side, which is well suited for yeah, remote office and branch office scenarios um, because it's yeah, pretty small and it's a tower configuration. Um, so in a branch office, you can uh, put it in a room and uh, hopefully forget about it. Um, and the um, admins from the central IT department can administer um, these servers then via Azure. Um, so from a central place. So Azure Stack HCI is a good use case here. And then the other one, um, our most popular machine, which we have certified in three different configurations. Um, the RX2540 M5 um, certified as um, hybrid solutions, so SSD and HDD, then uh, to um, all flash scenarios with um, NVMEs and SSDs and uh, SSD only. Okay, but I, I do not want to go into too much detail because um, yeah, the session should be about stretch clustering. So um, let's get started with the with the main part here. So I think Carsten did a pretty good job in uh, laying out earlier why uh, we need stretch clusters and why they are available. And I think also most of us working in IT know the motivation behind stretch clusters well. Um, it's basically business continuity. Um, so IT is not an end in itself. It, it is there to um, support the business, but um, obviously without IT, most businesses are likely to fail and some may not uh, even be able to, to continue their operation, their IT operation, um, since more and more processes are supported and backed by IT infrastructure. And in the, in the past weeks and months, we have seen uh, numerous examples of um, all kinds of um, disasters that's, that can, ha can be happening, um, such as um, yeah, wildfires in California, floods in Western Germany and Belgium. And um, if I remember correctly, there was also larger power outage in Texas. And then there are hurricanes like Ida and Katrina. And uh, yeah, the list continues and probably will grow uh, in the next years with um, climate change at our doorsteps. So basically, this is what we want protection from with stretch clustering by putting parts of our clusters in different locations. So Carsten has already shown this, I believe, um, with the possible architectures, what we can do with stretch clustering or how we can set it up. Mm, on the one hand, uh, the, the left hand side, we um, have an active active configuration where um, our virtual machines are running um, 
in both sides. And on the right hand side, we um, have a scenario where um, the machines run only in the, uh, in the left hand side. So side one here, and this one is the active side and the other one acts as kind of a fallback side. And in case the disaster strikes on the um, primary side, um, everything fails over to the passive side, um, which then takes over the, the operation. So this is an active passive configuration. As you can see, um, both sides um, have their own storage pool. Um, so we have a dedicated storage pool for site one and uh, one for site two. And um, that means that we um, basically have different fault domains here. Usually we defined in, in the past uh, the with, with single site clusters, the, the um, the fault domains on a, on a node level, um, but just as a, as a recap, we can also define them on a chassis level, rack level, and what we are doing here is to define them on a um, site level. So what are the requirements for stretch clustering? Again, I'm trying not to repeat everything that Carsten has said earlier, um, but we need a minimum number of uh, nodes of two per site. So we have at least four nodes in total and we need an equal number of nodes uh, per site, obviously. Um, and talking about network uh, requirements, we, we have different points to look at. So first of all, the bandwidth. Um, there is um, no specific bandwidth um, requirement that we need to take care of, but you should always consider when designing solutions uh, for, for stretch clusters that um, on the one hand you have um, lots of um, replication traffic uh, running between the sites, so um, you want to facilitate this traffic and on the other hand um, you need to think about um, yeah, what happens in the case of a failover. Um, so all your workloads, if, if, let's say site one fails, everything moves to site two. And um, in this event, site two needs to be able to run everything um, on, on its own. So um, if you have um, yeah, lots of payload traffic, you should also consider that and um, size your um, network interfaces large enough. And then on the latency side, we um, have for synchronous replication um, round trip time requirement of less than five milliseconds. And for asynchronous replication, there is no um, hard latency recommendation or requirement. So um, that's, that's not uh, too relevant here. And then Carsten also mentioned this uh, routing is, is a topic. So um, servers in the sa same site must be in the same rack and um, only work via or communicate via layer two. Um, while the, the hosts that um, or the, the sites um, must uh, have a layer three boundary in between. So um, they, they, there must be a routed network. Um, over which the um, storage replica traffic flows. And um, another thing to um, take note of is that um, RDMA um, is only used for the traffic within one site and not for the traffic between the sites. Carsten also highlighted the uh, um, need for witness. Um, so that one must be placed in a third site. Um, so either an Azure or a file share that is reachable independently from both sites. So um, like a neutral site. Um, so yeah, file share witness could also be used here next to the um, cloud witness. And then something I want to um, go a bit uh, deeper into is um, the um, considerations on the NIC uh, configuration. So um, with um, um, stretch clusters, you can actually use the same physical NICs for um, storage replica traffic and the internal uh, single site storage traffic. And um, the requirement here is um, only that you or your adapters are um, of course sufficiently equipped for this, but also um, teamed with switch embedded teaming. 
and um, you need to um, create um, single virtual NICs for um, each of the traffic types and they must be assigned dedicated subnets and uh, VLANs of course and uh, we are going to have a look at what that looks like um, that's taken um, from the Microsoft um, documentation actually. So here you can see um, stretch cluster um, over two sides and we're going to have a look um, at one node in particular, um, how we would configure um, this node or how we have configured them actually in our um, lab environment. So um, basically this, this would um, um, yeah, make sure that the requirements are um, all, all considered. So um, we have our VSMB, um, so two um, virtual NICs for our local SMB storage uh, traffic. And then we have two virtual interfaces for our um, yeah, storage replic replication traffic. So stretch one and stretch two. And as you can see, we have a um, single physical uh, NIC in here. So in our case, it's a Mellanox um, Connect X4. And um, yeah, this obviously has two ports. And what we are going to do then is to create um, two vir uh, four virtual interfaces and um, to um, yeah, to make sure that everything is um, configured correctly, we need to enable RDMA on our um, storage NICs on our local storage NICs, but need to disable them on the um, stretch NICs. And uh, we use, um, of course, not routed traffic on the um, local storage NICs, but routed traffic. So I've configured that on the um, NICs that are going to be used for storage replica traffic. And of course, in the end, what is also um, recommended is to do a, um, adapter teaming or team mapping. Um, so that means that we are going to map the adapters, the, the virtual adapters to the physical ones. So we have the VSMB1 and the stretch one being mapped to the PNIC1 and uh, the, the other ones to the PNIC2. Okay, enough of the talking. Um, so let's start with um, some demo content here. Mm, um, because Carsten has shown uh, some parts and Manfred as well, I'm uh, trying to um, cut this demo a bit short by jumping to the relevant uh, um, steps. So um, this shows Windows Admin Center creation with the um, yeah with the wizard of a stretch cluster. And um, what is important here is that when you create a, a new cluster, as we're going to do this here, um, you will choose Azure Stack HCI, obviously, and then have your servers in two sites. Um, so they are stretched across two sites. And then, of course, we are going to add our servers. And um, this has been sped up a bit, so uh, we do, do not need to sit and wait, but you will see, so this is um, obviously Azure Stack HCI on real hardware, so our Primer GX 2540. And uh, yeah, why right, we are going to add our nodes, uh, we are waiting. And um, these are all validated um, now and we can use them. So I've prepared um, also a bit of stuff here. And so here, what is important that um, we have the storage replica module installed, obviously, because we need that to um, replicate our volumes later on. So um, that's also a minor difference compared to single site cluster deployments. Okay, so from here, I would like to jump to the um, next step, which must be here. So here we have um, our network adapters and um, I also have prepared them in advance and I would recommend everyone um, to do so as well. If you have a um, yeah, more complex setup of network adapters, I think it's, it's easier to configure them in advance with PowerShell and then just uh, skip through the wizard here. Um, so here you can see what I've shown you earlier. So we have our two um, SMB NICs and then we have the um, storage replica NICs 
and uh, they are using our um, Melanox adapters. And uh, then I've, I've also configured um, adapters for our Hyper-V traffic and, and the management traffic, of course. Okay, so this was uh, another thing that I wanted to show you, and then I will jump right ahead to um, this point in time where, um, yeah, the, the biggest difference uh, is shown. So basically here we are going to create the sites, so the, the cluster fault domains, and we assign our nodes to the two sites. So that's done pretty easily and goes pretty fast. And after that, it's just the usual steps, but you will notice that, um, for example, um, S2D will take a bit longer, so the enable S2D part will take a bit longer than in uh, usual uh, single site deployments um, because um, there are simply more tasks um, to, to do, which uh, we are going to have a look at later on. So again, this is heavily sped up. So uh, we do not have the, the long waiting times, um, but in, if you would compare it in real time, you would see that um, this, this takes much longer than on a um, yeah, normal, normal S2D cluster, Azure Stack HCI cluster. Okay, with that, I'm going to jump over to the next slide, um, which is actually the next uh, demo video, which will just show what we have configured here or what um, we will have after we um, created our cluster. So we have our two pools, which I've shown you earlier. So site one, site two, and we have four volumes in there already. Um, although it's only one volume that we want to use or are using. Um, so this is our um, automatically created cluster performance history volume. And you can see that we have um, the source defined here, um, the, the source lock, destination and destination lock. So our um, direction goes from site two um, to, uh, from site one to site two. So this is the direction which we are replicating here which we you will see um, when we move to the storage uh, replica tab. So um, because I freshly deployed this cluster, what I have also done, I just checked if everything was fine with our um, Fujitsu integrations or the Windows Admin Center extension. So this is the server view health extension from which you can um, check a lot of things um, on a hardware level. So you have basically um, single um, point of yeah, a single pane of glass uh, where you where you can uh, have a look at your your server and see if everything is working correctly. So uh, here it shows only green ticks, which is good. So, uh, but but I I also had it that a, like a fan was failing or so, and then you would instantly um, see a warning here. Okay, and now, as promised, our storage uh, replica partnerships that were created by the Windows Admin Center. So, uh, as mentioned, this is the, the direction here from um, our site one to site two for our cluster performance history volume, which was all uh, created automatically. Nothing else that we had to do other than uh, clicking through the uh, cluster creation wizard. Okay, and now um, how would the installation be different if we would have used um, PowerShell instead of the Windows Admin Center? So um, basically after the cluster creation and before enabling storage spaces direct, you um, would have needed to run a um, couple of commands. Um, so first of all, um, you had to um, set or create a new cluster fault domain. Um, so site one in our case and the fault domain type is site. And then as the next step, um, you would have um, assigned the nodes, so the, the children to the parents, so the nodes to the site in this case. And um, then another optional thing to do is to set a preferred site. This is also quite interesting because um, with the preferred site, 
um, you um, have a couple of um, benefits or different behavior in case there's an um, yeah, outage or your witness um, can't be reached um, during a um, yeah, disaster or when a site goes down. Because on the one hand, uh, um, yeah, with the, with the dynamic quorum and the, the rating of the other side, so the not preferred side is being decreased. Um, this ensures that the uh, um, preferred side stays online um, if everything else is equal. And in a split brain scenario where your witness cannot be contacted from either side and the uh, sides cannot uh, contact each other. So let's say we have side one with two nodes, side two with two nodes. Um, it's always the case um, that the preferred side will win the vote even if both sides have two votes and we do not have a tiebreaker. Um, so the, the preferred side is automatically um, set to win the vote, um, which is um, kind of a benefit if you want to have this um, scenario, or if you want to make sure of that. And then what would we do after the installation? So what hasn't been done by the cluster creation so far? Um, we need to register our cluster with Azure, obviously. Um, then as the next step, um, we need to set a cloud or file share witness. Um, we are going to set a file share witness, but yeah, Azure cloud witness is also perfectly fine and valid option. And then, yeah, some things I, I call it housekeeping here. Um, so um, it's always good to rename your cluster networks because you have lots of cluster networks in a um, replicated scenario. And also, if not yet happened, um, assign VLANs and map the uh, virtual NICs to the physical NICs. And uh, yeah, optionally, you can set a preferred site, um, exclude any networks from live migration, and set live migration and storage replica um, options such as bandwidth limit. I think uh, Carsten also um, showed the command uh, for that earlier on. So let's go that. Uh, let, let's uh, have a look at that in uh, our on our live uh, demo system or on our demo system. So um, this is what I was talking about when I meant uh, the, the network adapter team mapping. So we are mapping the virtual NICs to the physical maps uh, live here or in, in action. Um, and then we are going to enable RDMA on our um, SMB NICs and disable them on the on the stretch NICs. Then as a next step, uh, just um, yeah, seeing that everything was configured correctly, getting our cluster configuration, um, get our S2D configuration here, and um, then have another look at the storage pool. And we will also see here that we have um, two storage pools created. Um, we will use them later on. So um, yeah, that's interesting to keep their, their name in mind. Um, and then we see that we have the cluster fault domains, which were also configured by the Windows Admin Center. So that's what I meant earlier, the children we have here, and then we have basically the parent here with the different sites, um, which are our fault domains. And the Windows Admin Center has not set a preferred site, and uh, also I haven't done that. Um, so yeah, just confirming the settings here. And then as a next step, um, setting the, the Chrome, so our file share witness. And then after that, what I have promised to you is um, setting the cluster network names. So you will see that right here that it can be really confusing if you have like nine networks and they are all named network uh, one to nine. And um, so we are going to name them based on their address. And we can also see that our metrics are fine here because um, we have the um, lowest metrics for our SMB networks, which means they are being used first. And then um, we have the um, storage replica um, networks next and the management networks. Network is basic, or it is um, actually the last one. Um, so um, that's that's all fine. 
Okay, I've talked about um, the volumes uh, earlier on, and I think also Carsten did. So um, I try to keep it short here. For each volume that we want to create, we need essentially um, four um, volumes. So in each side, we have a data volume and a log volume. Um, so multiplied by two, that makes four volumes. And we can have different um, configurations. So we can either have a synchronous scenario where um, every incoming write is um, yeah, coming in, then uh, written to the log of this server cluster, and then also at the same time announced to the other side, written in the log, and then it's acknowledged. And um, only then it's acknowledged back to the application. And uh, after that, it's written to the data volume. And the difference in an asynchronous scenario is that we um, yeah, write the data to the log volume on our um, local cluster first, and then um, yeah, have this already acknowledged to um, our application, um, and then um, announce it to the other side, where it's written into the log, acknowledged and then written to the data volume. So um, yeah, let's have a quick look at the cluster creation in the Windows Admin Center. Um, this is yeah, just a very simple use case. And then after that, I want to um, show that in, in the PowerShell with the um, commands, which is a bit more complex, as you can see. And I think uh, then you can appreciate what the Windows Admin Center actually does for you. Um, so that's that's pretty nice, I think. Um, so we can select a di direction. We can say synchronous or asynchronous, um, select the size and also the resiliency level. And then again, this is heavily sped up. But you will see um, our first volume being created. Then as the next one, the log volume on our um, primary side, which is side two in this case, and then uh, everything else is going to happen on the um, other side as well. So the um, side one in this case, obviously depending on the direction which we chose first. And we can see that the storage replica partnership was created for us as well without uh, having to do anything else. So here is the um, initial block copy happening. Um, so you can track the progress here. It's just a small volume just for demo purposes. And then before going into the, the PowerShell um, volume creation, um, I want to talk about briefly about um, the, the log volume because I haven't shown that in the in the demo video, so you can go to the advanced section where you can define the log volume size actually. And um, yeah, this, this can be adjusted by you, but there is no general rule for sizing these log volumes. Um, so the, the dependence there is basically um, the larger the, the volume is, the large or the longer you can tolerate outages. Um, because the data goes into your log volume and if the other side comes back, so if it has failed uh, previously and then comes back, um, you can replicate directly from one log volume to the other. But if um, the first log volume has uh, filled up already and needs to discard data, then um, you need to um, yeah, have a different replay mechanism to um, restore the log data, basically. Um, so um, that's the benefit you get from a, from a larger log volume. And we have seen um, in, in the real world that um, yeah, larger log volumes can, can really help you to um, speed up this uh, re synchronizing process in the end. So log volumes also benefit from large uh, from from faster storage. So Carsten also mentioned that um, you you want to have flash st storage there um, for for your log volumes, and the log volumes must not be used for any other things than uh, than the log. Um, so that's that's not supported. 
And if you want to have deeper um, or more recommendations, you can also run a test as a topo topology commandlet. Um, that one can give you a um, couple of um, recommendations. And uh, there's also a section in the fre frequently asked uh, question sections. Um, so in the, in the Microsoft Docs, if you are wondering about the log volume, you can also go there and uh, check the documentation out. OK, moving on now to the um, to the volume creation with PowerShell and you can see I have prepared a longer script here. So I'm going to start with our um, disk names and um, just to show you this is the disk name we are going to create. So our demo stretched volume one. And in order to start, we first um, move our available storage resource or cluster group to node one because um, that's the replication direction we want to achieve. So from site one uh, to site two. So we are moving the available storage group there and creating our volumes there. So two volumes, uh, we have seen that scheme before. Um, so the, the original volume and the log volume. And after that, we are going to stop um, the um, cluster group available storage and move it to the site two. Um, so it's node three here. Um, so in, in my naming, it would be a node one in site two. And then we do basically the same. So we create our two volumes there. So you can also see that we specify the pool name here. Um, so for our storage pool. So we have the pool for site one and we have the pool for site two. So we are going to put our volumes there. And after we have done that, we move back our um, available storage cluster group. And then we do um, a quick check whether everything has been created. So um, get cluster resources. Um, we can see that we have four volumes now, which are called demo stretched volume 01, then the log volume, replica, and replica log volume. For our volume 01, we are going to create a um, cluster shared volume or add a cluster shared, shared volume, which we are going to start after that. And also move it to um, node one because um, that's where I want the volume to reside. And then I also start the cluster resources for the um, disk, uh, for, for the log disk. That's where I um, deviate a bit from the um, original Microsoft documentation and I will soon explain why. Um, so you can see there would be the, um, the script for testing the uh, storage replica topology, which I haven't done here. Um, but I'm going to create a storage replica partnership now um, with our volumes. Um, so I have to specify the names for our, um, for our resource groups. And um, then I have to specify the, the path to our volumes. Um, in a Microsoft documentation, you will often find that they use the, um, that they use the drive letters. Um, I have found that um, the drive letters are sometimes discarded after moving the available storage group around. Um, so that's the reason why I use paths instead of um, the, the drive letters. And you will see my first try failing here, um, which I have, le uh, have left in there uh, intentionally because um, I've encountered that a couple of times and I've noticed that if I'm going to do it this way, then I also need to start um, the, the cluster resources or the cluster resource for um, both the other disks. So I'm going to do that. And then you will see that everything is working as expected and we can create a new storage replica partnership. So running this command again. And then you will see that uh, this, this will work. 
And then what we're going to do as the last step while this is uh, doing its job, um, we will create a, or set a storage replica network constraint where we specify um, for each site um, which interfaces we want to use. So you can see here um, that we use the name of our cluster networks that we have defined earlier. So uh, site one replica one, site two replica two, uh, site, site one replica two, and then for, for our destination, um, the, the site two replica networks. So we are going to set that. And in the next step, um, just confirming what we have created so far. So that's right after I have created um, everything. So let's view the groups. We have six groups here, which makes sense because we have the cluster performance history volume. Then we have one volume for our um, uh, one group for our volume that we created in um, two groups for our volumes that we created with Windows Admin Center and two groups for our um, volume that we have created with um, PowerShell. So next one is the Storage Replica Partnership. We now have three of those. So cluster performance history, um, the demo stretched volume, and the one created with the Windows Admin Center. And last but not least, the network constraint, which we just defined. And once again, you can see here, we have specified the network interfaces, which we want to use um, for um, this uh, storage replica group, basically. On the next slide, on the next demo video, you would see the result, but I think we can uh, skip that as I still have uh, more interesting content to come um, because the next part is about affinity rules and affinity rules um, basically define um, rules for our virtual machines. And we can define with the affinity rules whether we want to keep them together on um, one node one side or even if we want to um, have them in different sites or different nodes, whatever you want. So you can see here I have created a couple of virtual machines and I can configure the affinity rules with the Windows Admin Center. Just uh, go to the settings, affinity rules, then assign a name, the rule type. So four different rule types together or apart same site, same server, different site, different servers. And then choose the VMs which this rule should apply to. And then we create a rule and then we are good to go. And you can now or could now delete the rule or create a new one. And now the same for PowerShell because I promised I would show you how to do everything in PowerShell as well. A um, couple of more steps again. So we create our affinity rule, um, create or specify the type which we want to use, and then we add our virtual machines. And what we can do as well, which we can also do with the Windows Admin Center, is to add cluster shared volumes to this group as well, uh, to this rule as well. So um, I'm doing that right here, as you can see. And then one additional benefit that PowerShell has, you can enable and disable the rules and change the rule type. I haven't seen that in Windows Admin Center. So um, if we get the rule type now, we can see um, it's set to the same fault domain, so same site. And if we are going to set it now to same node, then it's being changed. Okay, that's um, I think pretty easy and simple. So um, as a as a last demo, which I have brought, um, there is very small failover scenario. Do, do not expect too much. Um, but yeah, this this is a demo scenario for our four node cluster, um, where you can see I have the watch cluster script running here, and our all of our virtual machines are running in side two. And I will make site to fail by um, shutting down both 
nodes in site two. So you can already see that happening right here. So node two in site two is lost. Node one also gets lost. And this is just a ping to, to one of the virtual machines that is running. So um, just to keep track on uh, when, when this comes back up again. So you can look at the time. So it's 9.38 right now in the, in the demo. So um, yeah, we can uh, count the time until the um, machine comes back up. So this is um, sped up a bit. And I think at 9.40 or 9.39 already, yeah, we can see um, starting the IOPS to increase on our um, site one. So everything has failed uh, to site one. We can, that also, uh, we can also see that here on the owner nodes and our virtual machine is coming up again. And then if I move a bit ahead, um, I think we can see that at some point our storage jobs start to kick in. So in the meantime, I have, yeah, that, that's where the storage jobs uh, start to come in. So um, in the meantime, I have actually restarted both of the nodes. So it's 9.46 here and uh, we can see that um, our rebuild or repair jobs have started. Um, so yeah, now the, the volumes are being repaired. Okay, so much for the demo cases and now um, yeah, a bit more um, view on our Fujitsu Prime Flex offering before I uh, finish off and close the session. Um, so first of all, you already have seen uh, our um, Windows Admin Center integration. So um, we had seen the um, extension for our server view health um, program or application or agent, I should say. And um, then we also um, have the um, server view rate manager. Um, so extension for that where you can see um, the, the RAID uh, disks and also the um, yeah, NVM, uh, PCI Express cards. And um, then for those of you who may use our Fujitsu software infrastructure manager because of a yeah, more complex data center, lots of different servers there, um, where it makes sense to um, use the ISM appliance um, there you um, also have the possibility to to use one of our extensions so um, the extension for ism and then also um, we have the the cluster where updating coming um, for for um, our server view agents um, so that's something to look forward to and here's some um, yeah already quick uh, mock-up how it can uh, look like so um, yeah, stay stay tuned for that. I do not know the timeline uh, from the top of my head, but um, I think that's uh, something to look forward to, um, definitely. So um, about our Fujitsu Prime Flex offering, um, what what are the highlights there? So I think uh, most importantly um, is the reduced um, deployment risk for our customers. Um, because on the one hand, as the other vendors, we um, certify um, our hardware with um, Azure Stack HCI separately. Um, so um, the, the customers can just pick a node or whole cluster from the Azure Stack HCI catalog. And to complement that, we have um, our Fujitsu Web Architect where you can configure um, our solutions uh, via web interface. Um, so um, that's that's also pretty easy to use. And then, of course, we um, offer um, yeah, uh, best practices guides and design and implementation guides um, for those installing the um, solutions um, via the, the so-called implementation packs, which we offer to customers. Um, in order to make sure that they um, have a best practice configuration installed. So um, yeah, that, that also reduces um, the risk at the customer side. And of course, uh, 
it it means that customers do not need to build up that much knowledge because um, we as Fujitsu could take over that part or offer that to the customers. Um, of course, we um, have a very holistic view on, on infrastructure, so we do not only sell our integrated systems, but have offerings that concern Azure, for example. We can build hybrid solutions with Azure Arc. And um, also nice thing um, regarding the implementation pack is that we um, enable our partners and customers with our own um, Fujitsu PrimeFlex trainings. We have one specifically for Storage Spaces Direct and we have um, uh, or are working on uh, building one for Azure Stack or creating one for Azure Stack HCI as well. So much for that and then also just as a, as a short head, heads up um, that our M6 generation is approaching fast. Um, so we are currently still um, working out the details of how we um, uh, how we are going to use them in our um, integrated systems. Um, but yeah, be assured there will be integrated systems based on the um, uh, prime flex systems based on um, our M6 generation, um, making use of all the new um, features and functionalities that we can offer with. The M6 generation, so um, that is being worked on right now, and hopefully um, we will see the we will uh, be seeing the results very soon. So with that, I'd like to wrap, wrap up the session. So what are the key takeaways from today's session, or at least I hope that these are the key takeaways for you. Um, so we have talked about stretch cluster requirements, have uh, repeated what um, Carsten said, and. Um, also made uh, another point uh, yeah, to, to look specifically at networking and the witness um, because we have seen in projects that this is really important. Um, then uh, I've shown you the stretch cluster setup and I think the key takeaway here is that Windows Admin Center does a nice job in taking off um, all the necessary tasks and responsibilities of you. Um, but if you want most flexibility, you want to have scripted tasks and so on, then of course PowerShell is the way to go. And um, as, as always, Microsoft documentation is your friend uh, when it comes to, to using PowerShell and building Azure Stack HCI clusters. So with that, I'm finished. Uh, almost on time so thanks everyone for joining again uh, thanks Carsten and Manfred uh, thanks for having us and me here um, so looking forward to to any questions that uh, may may have come in so Fabian very detailed and very great session you had much more in your presentations than I had um, great. Uh, of course, I know all this stuff, but I didn't want to go too deep, but you had the chance to add to the session that we already have. So I have a question here from the audience. Um, I just read it out. Are there any time horizon when proactive LCM support will be released for PrimeFlex S2D solutions? So they are especially asking for storage basis direct solutions, not for Azure Stack HCI. Yeah, I know that we have lots of uh, S2D solutions um, in, in the field, so uh, I can understand this ask, obviously. And so proactive, um, I, yeah, I, I cannot comment on that actually. Um, do, not, do not know of anything, uh, but yeah, hopefully the, um, the Clusterware updating integration um, takes off some of the pain that that will come soon. So um, I hope that that is a benefit. I, I do not know the timeline of this either, but um, it's definitely coming. Yeah. OK, I don't see more questions, but I, I, I want to uh, comment something. It's it's not uh, it's not about yet prime flex, but I, but I had a, a very lengthy discussion in the Q&A uh, with a uh, with attendee about storage spaces direct and stretch clusters and there is quite there are quite some misconceptions so if it's okay for you i would state some comments here because it's sure. just just uh, helping with the topic with azure stack hci uh, and stretch cluster so 
Uh, Azure Stack HCI, there's official support for the stretch cluster scenario. We have, uh, Fabian pointed out, we have two pools. So uh, on every side, we have all our data completely in that side. So it's not spread over the sides. We have our uh, re resiliency in the side. So if we have two nodes in each side, a four node cluster, we have uh, two way mirror. If we have three or four nodes in each side, you can have a three way mirror and we can have up to two a server uh, fading out per site with a three way mirror. With storage basis direct, there is no support from Microsoft for a stretch cluster. There, uh, we can misuse the storage concept with a two node cluster or a four node cluster to build a stretched cluster that is residing in two sites. But we have to be very careful about the network. In essence, you need four switches, two per site for the resiliency, and you can't extend an, a stretch storage basis direct cluster with four nodes to six nodes or eight nodes because the maximum of failure you can have in a storage basis direct cluster without changing the fault domains is two fault domains. So in, in, a, in essence, two nodes. So if you have a six node cluster, three on each side, and one side fails, so three nodes fail. You have failures of three fault domains and a three-way mirror will not survive that. So uh, it, it, the, it's even worse. Uh, you you don't own, not only have one volume with problems, all volumes have problems. So all volumes are offline. They are not complete anymore. There are a lot of 256 megabytes extend missing. So if you do a stretch cluster, and I, I confess we have done around 100 storage bases direct stretch clusters for customers. All of the customers knows, knows there is no Microsoft support for that. So you can't call Microsoft, my stretch cluster has a problem. My stretch S2D cluster has a problem. But if you are very careful with four nodes, you can misuse the um, the fault domain concept to do that, but you have to be very careful and uh, we need stretch clusters, at, especially in Germany. We are the, the country of stretch, stretching everything and there Azure Stack HCI is the supported solution. And there are also, uh, you saw it in Fabian's session, there are many requirements with networks. No, um, they have to have routed replica networks. We don't have to have other traffic on those routed networks. We have to, to use uh, storage replica network constraints. So we have to redirect our replication traffic over those networks. I'm implementing st uh, stretch clusters in the moment at some customers and there are many requirements. So stretching uh, independent of every any technology is not easy. It's not just set it up and it works. You have to to think of many things here. So I'm not going over time. So I, I wa just wanted to clarify that you can, you can, you are not allowed to from Microsoft support, but you can stretch a storage, st stretch a storage basis direct cluster, but only four nodes or two nodes, or you play around with the four domains. So if you have, for example, two, eight, two uh, 60 node cluster, you can put eight nodes in one uh, side and eight nodes in the other, and then, then you have to change the fault domain to site. So you have basically two fault domains, one inside one A, one inside B. But now if one disk fails in one of the eight nodes inside A and one disk fails in one of the eight nodes inside B, you are doomed. Yeah, and that's uh, I have, I've done, I think, a webinar about this. Many people assume if I just have 60 nodes um, and I put them in two sides, eight nodes can fail. That's not the truth. Even with a non-stretched 60 node S2D cluster, only two nodes can fail. Not three, not four, not five, nothing more than two nodes. And that's only true with a three-way mirror and um, a mirror accelerated parity or a double parity volume. With a two-way mirror, only one node can fail, and that's very important. No? So, sorry, Fabian, because I, I got this misconception many times. So, 
uh, Microsoft technology is like magic. It will help with anything. No, you have to really to know what to de do, especially with a stretch cluster. But Carsten, I think the misunderstanding starts already earlier, but we <laughs> don't have enough time to discuss this now. But maybe we have later some on the time. on the round table, maybe tomorrow yeah, on the round table, because um, it depends on what you need in a cluster. You can lose if you have 60 nodes, 15 and something says online your cluster service. But let's discuss this later. <laughs> Yeah, nice okay. joke. So <laughs> thank you, Fabian, so much. It was a very good uh, presentation. I liked it a lot, uh, and I hope uh, the people get a lot of out, out of it. And thank you, uh, Fujitsu, to being sponsor at this event. Uh, we know we really need those guys because this is a lot of work to, and only with you we can offer a free event. So thanks, and uh, I think we have some seconds uh, still to go to uh, nine o'clock in Germany. So yes. if our our next presenters, I see Tina and Andrew. Tina and Andrew, hi. You can unmute yourself if you want to and start your presentation. Hi, how's it going? Hello. Uh, fine, a little bit tired. You are the, we are now in the eighth hour, I think. <laughs> Two, three, four, <laughs> we'll try five. to keep it entertaining and short then. No, you are in the ninth hour now. So, uh, but I'm very, really looking forward to your session. Can so everyone we see, see we see your presentation and we hear you. You can start if you want to. OK, perfect. So uh, welcome everyone to the storage session. Should we wait a little bit before starting or just start right now? It's recorded. Uh, just start, uh, start the session. OK, perfect. So thank you all for joining. My name is Tina and I will be one of your presenters today. As you can see in the slide, um, I am a PM at Microsoft uh, on the storage and file systems team specifically. And my main area of focus is storage spaces, storage spaces direct, and also portions of REFS. And joining me today um, as my co-presenter is Andrew. Andrew, did you want to give a brief introduction? Yeah, thanks, Tina. So as Tina said, my name is Andrew Hansen. I am a senior PM lead at Microsoft on the storage and file systems team. And uh, I've helped uh, do lots of storage innovations in a variety of products. Uh, so anything from the Azure host down to like client and edge and IoT devices. Um, and some of the technologies that I've worked on most are storage spaces and REFS. Awesome, thank you for that intro. Um, so moving on to the session agenda, we do have quite a few topics to get through. So we'll be starting off by talking about cluster within provisioning and also some of the new volume features that is um, coming along in Windows Admin Center. And then we will move on to talking about adjustable repair speeds and Andrew will close off the session with REFS snapshots. So that's an overview of what the next hour will kind of look like. Feel free to leave any questions and we will try and get through those either in the session at the end or follow up afterwards. So without further ado, um, I'm going to start by talking about cluster thin provisioning. So this is a new and exclusive feature that is coming to Azure Stack HCI 21H2. And the main value behind this feature is that it will bring you a ton of management flexibility and also reduce the amount of time that you need to spend on your storage capacity planning. And I will talk more about why this is the case as we get through uh, the rest of the slides. But first, I'm going to tell you about what thin provisioning is. Um, so it's basically a new way for you to provision your volumes. Traditionally, all we've had in the past is fixed provisioning. So on the right hand side in the graphic, you can see that, for example, I'm creating two volumes, one at five terabytes and one at four terabytes. So if I only had 10 terabytes in my entire storage pool, this means that nine terabytes of space will be completely taken up, even though I don't have any files in the volume. So those volumes are empty, but a good portion of my storage pool is already taken up. And with fixed provisioning, as you add files to those volumes, uh, the amount of space used doesn't really change because that space is pre-allocated at the time of creation. So what's new uh, with thin provisioning is that we only take up that space as needed. 
So as you can see, the same scenario, I have a five terabyte volume, a four terabyte volume, but the amount of space that I'm taking up from the storage pool is very little because it's only the amount of space that REFS needs to pre-map some of the metadata. So with this feature, what you can do is over provision your volumes, which just means that either your single volume can be equal to or greater than the size of your entire storage pool, or you can create multiple volumes. So think you have a four node cluster. What you can do is create four volumes at 10 terabytes each so that you don't have to worry about one volume filling up faster than the other and then having to rebalance afterwards. And so within provisioning, only when you add data to those volumes will we actually take storage from the pool. And once you delete um, a set of data, we will actually give that space back to the storage pool so other volumes can leverage that storage space. And this should happen automatically um, 10 to 15 minutes after file deletion. But if you're really keen to see that space being given back right away, what you can do is run optimize volume, slap consolidate as the parameter, and see that space being given back and um, your volume optimized. So moving on um, is the actual demo in PowerShell for what um, was shown in the second part of that graphic. So as you can see, I will start off by creating a new volume that is thinly provisioned and uh, five terabytes in size and just with the default three-way mirror configuration. So this volume was successfully created, and then I will check the allocated size, the size, and the provisioning type. So the allocated size is the amount of space that I'm actually taking from the pool, while the size is the size that I define the volume to be. And what I'm doing next is just adding some files to that volume with fsutil, and then rechecking the allocated size. So as you can see, uh, this is where thin provisioning comes in. So the allocated size has increased because I've actually added files to that volume. And if I were to remove those files that I previously created, I should see that space being given back to the pool. So pausing here, you can see that the allocated size has indeed decreased. Um, and I will just note this is a fairly gradual process, so you'll see that value decreasing um, over time and then eventually getting you back to that um, almost empty volume state in, this, in the case of this demo. So yeah, I just wanted to reiterate, um, this feature really does bring a lot of management flexibility and also reduces the amount of time that you need to spend on capacity planning. And the great thing about this feature is that you can provision this at the pool level, at the volume level, or at the tier level in PowerShell. So for the pool, you can set this as the pool default. Um, if you're interested in using a mere accelerated parity volume, what you can do is set both of the tiers that you're using to thin and then use those tier templates um, along with the new volume uh, commandlet. And also you can do all of this in Windows Admin Center. The last thing about management is that you can set a alert threshold for thin provisioning. So um, in the case that your used pool capacity has reached over 70%, we will actually send you an alert in Windows Admin Center. And that is kind of a signal that you should be adding more capacity to your pool, um, perhaps scaling up a node or even deleting some of your existing data. Um, so this setting, so to set that actual threshold is only available in PowerShell for now, uh, we are looking into adding this into Windows Admin Center down the road. So in the previous slide, I did mention that you can do um, all of these provisioning in Windows Admin Center. For people who have actually tried this out, you may think, oh, you can only set this at the pool level. You can't actually do this at the volume level. And in fact, um, I have received multiple bugs saying that you can't over provision quite yet in Windows Admin Center. So that is where the new new volume experience comes in. It is something that we are actively working on and something that you should expect to see later this fall. 
the main primary thing that um, comes with this update is that you can enable thin provisioning at a volume level. So when you go and actually create the volume, you can select if you want your volume to be fixed or thinly provisioned. And if you select thin provisioning, then you can actually over provision. And we've added in some extra guidelines for what your volume size should be to better adhere to REFS's rules and logic. And then the last uh, more significant change that you'll see is that the footprint parameter um, has been changed to the maximum volume size parameter instead, because when you have some provisioning, then your footprint at the time of creation doesn't add a lot of value because you're not actually taking up that much space. And the next thing that is new to the new volume experience is we've made some adjustments to the optional features area. So one significant thing is the thin provisioning field that's been added there. And then also we've heard a lot of feedback about adding support for stretch clusters. So previously optional features were not available, but now it will be. And then as an added bonus, uh, we've also heard a lot of feedback about adding nested resiliency as an option for two node and four node stretch clusters. So that is also a part of the new update. And I know that I've just covered a lot in the previous slide. So to summarize everything, I thought a demo would be a great way to showcase the work that has been done. So just pausing here, um, this is cluster manager and then under the volumes tab, if you go to um, inventory and then click on create, you will see the um, create volume pane being brought up in the on the right hand side. And pausing here, you can see that the UI hasn't changed drastically. You still have the name, the resiliency and the size fields. But um, in this case, for resiliency, this just happened to be a two-node cluster. We've added nested two-way mirror and nested mirror accelerated parity in addition to the two-way mirror um, option that has already existed. So if I select nested two-way mirror and I go down to see at max volume size on SSD, I'll see that um, this is the max size that a volume can be made. And if I switch back to two-way mirror, you'll see that that value has changed dynamically. And um, we all know two-way mirror is just 50% more of nested. And if you have multiple media types, you can select the media type. Um, in this case, I'll just leave it at SSD. And then I am going to add a size for what I want the volume to be. So pausing here, I want my volume to be 10 terabytes in size, but obviously that is too large. And uh, in comparison, we know that the max volume size that we can make right now is 1.73 terabytes. But what we can do about that is to go under more options and then switch from fixed provisioning to thin. And now you'll see that the max volume size has drastically increased to 4.6 petabytes. And um, if we wanted to over provision with a 10 terabyte volume, that is now feasible. I will say um, this does not mean that we recommend creating a 4.6 petabyte volume. It's kind of just acting as the upper ceiling um, and as a guideline. So click and create, uh, just giving Mac a few seconds to create that volume, and then it should show up in your inventory list. And going to the volume settings page or the properties page, you'll see that the total size is 10 terabytes, but the footprint is only 240 um, gigs. And the provisioning type is set as thin and the resiliency setting is going to be a nested two-way mirror. And if we just scroll down to storage tiers, you'll see that um, tiers are used and this is a nested two-way mirror volume. So that actually concludes the part on thin provisioning and uh, also some of the changes that are coming to new volume. Now we are just going to move on to some of the other new features with storage in HCI 21 H2. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about here is adjustable storage repair speeds. The main benefit of this feature is that it will 
greatly improve your life cycle management experience and help you get back to full resiliency a lot faster after a patch and update. With this feature, what you can control is the data resync speeds by either allocating some of your resources or more of your resources to um, either repairing data copies so that you can get back to full resiliency or focus them on running active workloads for a better performance when you have those mission critical um, workloads that you need to run. There's five settings in total ranging from very low to very high and you can see that on the right hand side so for very low and low those correspond to a q depth of one and two and this means that most of your resources will go to active workloads and then if you um, want to set your setting to high or very high this means that you want most of your resources to go towards resync and repairs the recommended and default setting is going to be four, and this corresponds to a Q depth of four as well. Oh, sorry, uh, the default setting is medium, and this corresponds to a Q depth of four. And it really is just a balance of workloads and repairs. Um, and we do recommend that you set this back to medium after use. And um, as with the provisioning, uh, we do want this feature to also have a really great management experience, both in PowerShell and also in Windows Admin Center. So um, as you can see, the PowerShell commandlet for how you can change the repair speeds is shown on the screen. And then in Windows Admin Center, this is available as a cluster manager setting. So you just have to go to cluster manager, settings, storage spaces and pools, and then under the storage repair speeds field is where you'll see this drop down. And if any of the information that is shown in either uh, this presentation or um, earlier on, um, you want a refresher on that, we do have public documentation available. So all you have to do is just search this up and then um, you will see all of the different PowerShell commandlets, uh, screenshots and instructions there. So that concludes um, the portion of the session on adjustable storage repair speeds. Next, um, Andrew is going to talk about REFS snapshots. Yeah, thanks, Tina, and thanks for those awesome demos. It's exciting new stuff. So for REFS, let's talk about snapshots. Um, some of you are familiar with snapshots, some aren't. Uh, a snapshot is basically just a save state of some data, and that data can be either in a block form, a file form, or an entire volume. And you might be wondering, how is this different than block cloning? Like REFS has this awesome feature in metadata where they can block clone a file super fast. And the main difference, there's some difference under the hood, and, and we'll go into that. But the main difference is that snapshots are meant to be read only, whereas clones of the file can be read and written to. And snapshots also take a constant time, irrespective of file size to take. So you can have a super large VHD, take a snapshot, uh, shot, of that and it's really fast and then a very small like text file and it's going to take the same amount of time. Uh, so for those of you who have studied computer science, it's O of one. And uh, you can capture any size of file, so there's no uh, limit on that. And it's currently built into REFS util. So some of you have used REFS util for things like salvage and I'll be showing this in a demo later on. But that's where we built the capabilities into currently. Um, and what we have right now is the ability to create a snapshot, delete a snapshot, list the snapshots of the file, and then you can query for modifications to things like virtual cluster numbers or logical cluster numbers. And I'll show you that later in the demo as well. And go to the next slide. All right, so yeah, under the hood. So what, what we've done to implement this it was we've separated the data management from more of the metadata management. And this is through uh, what we call ordered diff chaining of shadow B trees. So if those of you who are familiar with uh, REFS, we use uh, B plus trees all over in REFS with Merkle checksumming, hierarchical checksumming to make sure all the data is correct at any given time. And uh, so what we do is when there's a snapshot of a file, we just create a new shadow B tree every time there's a snapshot created. And if a snapshot is deleted, we can merge those two together to make things all congruent once again. And so when you read the metadata and there's a miss, it'll just traverse the chain down until it finds the right place to read. All right, next slide. 
OK, so I'm going to try a live demo here. And. Let me get to I have a VM. All right, can somebody let me know if they can see this? This it was presenting all right. Yep, it's fine. Cool, yes, thanks. You can see it. perfect. All right, so I have this VM here that I created just for the sake of this demo. I have a small one gigabyte volume that I formatted with ReFS. I've called it R. And on that volume is just a simple text file called changelog. And that changelog looks like this. It's just some ASCII art of a dog. And what we're going to do is take some snapshots of that file and show you how this works. So as I said earlier, this is built into REFS util. And so if you go to REFS, REFS util, it's in a system 32 file, and you can do a dash help to look at all the commands. Uh, some of you are familiar with that salvage operation. So if like a volume's not mounting, you can salvage data out of it. But there's this new one called stream snapshot at the bottom there, and that's what we're going to be using. So we'll take a snapshot of this first file and you just do that with RFS. So you tell stream snapshot and it's this dash C, C for create. We'll call it first snap and then we're doing it on this changelog file in the R drive. And super fast. And then I'm going to make some changes to the file. So I'll just write something like this is a snapshot terrier. And then we'll take another snapshot and we'll call this one a uh, second snap with that dash C for create. And that's successfully. And then let's show some changes in this. So to show the changes, you use a slash Q, Q's for query, and then you can choose the snapshot. And you can see there's just some different clusters, one cluster in here that's different. If I hadn't made those changes, what you would see is that it would just give a message saying there's no delta between these two. And then to list all the snapshots in a file, you can do this dash L and star will list all of them. So you can list them by name if you want, but the star will list all of them. And so you can see how we have this first snap that we took and then this second snap also that we took. And their stream size is slightly different because of the changes that we made between them. Now you can also delete and that's with that slash D and we'll delete the first snap. And then I'm going to relist those just to show you that, yep, first snap's gone. It was up here when we listed them first, then we deleted. Now it's no longer there. And that is my demo of RFS snapshots. So we hope this use is a useful feature to you. Um, this can be used either just with RFS util or there's a developer API. So if you want to learn more about that, like if you want to integrate it into some of your software solutions, you can go for it. We'd love to hear feedback on how this can be more useful and um, how you're going to use it. And that concludes my demo. So thanks everyone for attending. Um, we want you guys to try these out. Uh, these are available in the latest Insider builds um, or with Windows Server 2022 with the GA release. And um, yeah, let us know. Give us feedback. We'd love to hear it. Also have some time now for some questions in the chat or questions over audio if you'd like. Uh, thanks. This was uh, this was uh, thank you so much. This was surprisingly interesting and short. So we have a lot of time for questions. Um, I have one in the chat. Uh, so what actually happens if SYN provisioning is unwatched and you actually use up the whole pool? Will S2D guard against taking up your physical disk reserve capacity? Um, Tina, can you can you do something with that question? Yeah, sorry. Let me just take a quick look at the question. Um, it will not eat into the reserve. So the reserve is off limits still. OK, yeah, but uh, if I understand it, you, you, there is no real reserve or uh, in, in today if you want the parallel rebuild happening, if that's a reserve, what what we are talking about, 
it's just uh, unused space, so it could it could be used or not, or do I misunderstand the concept? So within provisioning, um, one thing that we have kind of in place is the alert that I mentioned. So mm -hmm. um, if your actual physical use um, space is going above 70% of um, your actual pool capacity, then you will get that alert and it won't be cleared until uh, you dip below that threshold. So that is one thing that is guarding against, um, but it's not a like hard limit by any means. We won't stop mm -hmm. you from filling up your volume, um, but it's meant to be there to act as a guideline. And for the reserved space, I believe that is something that um, the provisioning will still respect. So um, the amount of free and usable space is without, like it already takes into consideration the amount that is in reserve. Okay, um, next thing I had in mind when I saw you uh, creating a, a nested mirror uh, volume, great that it's now implemented in uh, in Windows Admin Center and I assume you also create um, now the, the two tiers we need for a two node cluster or even for a four node stretched, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so all of the tiers are created um, by enable STD. Uh, so the tiers already exist, but if you need to set the like um, settings for them provisioning, WAC will take care of all of that. So you don't have to worry about that. Okay, very cool. Yeah, the tiers exist today in Windows Server 2022 with Storage Spaces Direct and Azure Stack HCI, but you don't have it visible in Windows yeah, Admin Center. True. This yeah. is what, uh, what changes here. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Tina, I have also a question about the thin provisioning stuff. I played already a little bit around with it um, in Azure Stack uh, 21 H2 preview, and it works fine, it's great. Um, but the interesting thing is, um, if I um, w if I work with this and I upgrade a cluster from Azure Stack HCI 20H2 to 21H2, the pool level first stays on Windows Server 2019. This is the name of the pool level. I have to change it to Windows Server 2022 to have the um, thin provisioning and enabled, and then it works in Azure Stack HCI. The interesting thing is the pool level of the Storage Spaces Direct pool is also Windows Server 2022 when I enable Storage Spaces Direct in Windows Server 2022. And um, if I use Windows Admin Center to configure volumes on this target uh, S2D cluster, uh, the thin provisioning is visible because it's the same pool level. But as soon as you configure a thin provisioned volume, you run into an error when the platform is not Azure Stack HCI operating system, but Windows Server 2022. Um, is this correct that it's an Azure Stack HCI only feature? This is the first part of my question. And the second one, is this an uh, error in Windows Admin Center? Will it be removed in the future or what's the situation about this? Right, so um, thank you for bringing that up. It is an exclusive feature to HCI 21H2, and um, we are aware of that bug, and the fix is actually just propagating throughout the, um, the stack. So um, it's not supposed to show up like that in Windows Admin Center, and as we get closer to the official release date, you should see that being resolved. Yeah, but changing the repair speed is also supported under 2022, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, cool. So now more questions about um, the thin provisioning from the audience or even the other speakers. Otherwise, we go to Rear RFS. Uh, we had this uh, situation in your live demo. There was no data deduplication in Windows Admin Center. Um, on the second slide, it was. Ah, it was. OK, yeah. sorry, we didn't get OK. It was yeah. so it was only a special situation in the live demo. OK, yeah. yeah. So I, I can talk about that a little bit, actually. So we have removed it um, from the volume creation step, but it is definitely available for the user to turn on if they visit the volume properties page. Um, so I think that is more so just for simplicity purposes and also um, revamping what the new volume experience will look like. I had a slide on some of the changes that are coming, but that is not a overview of everything that is being mm -hmm. changed. Um, do stay tuned for that. We have a blog post going out when um, a later release is going out for the 
for the volume creation part of Windows Admin Center. Yeah, then I, then I have an, another question, but I don't know if you guys are the the, the right um, the right audience to ask. But uh, in a Azure Stack HCI stretch cluster, we don't have the easy possibility to turn on BitLocker for the stretched volumes. Uh, it's possible to do it by PowerShell, but it's very complex. So two part question is, do you know if BitLocker is support in, uh, supported in a, in a stretched uh, volume? And if so, any plans to, to add it to Windows Admin Center so it's much easier? So the optional features um, field or like the more options field didn't exist for stretch clusters previously, but it is a part of the um, update this time around. So you will mm -hmm. be able to turn on integrity checksums, BitLocker for stretch clusters as well. OK, cool. Thanks. But not for um, not for thin provisioning just yet. So that's the you get to, but <laughs> you don't get thin provisioning for um, stretch clusters just yet. And I, I just have to add another question. So um, what I will be asked, I'm pretty sure. So with Azure Stack uh, 20 H2, we only have fixed provisioning. And if you update to 21 H2, um, would it be possible to turn on the thin provisioning on the pool or the storage subsystem and then maybe convert a volume to thin provision if it's one fixed provision? I, I don't think so, but I have to ask. Uh, that is a great question. Um, I can definitely take that to the product team and see what our plans are there. I think it's more of a like suggestion or um, some something to add down the roadmap. Yeah, OK, uh, would be cool. Thanks. So now we go over to ReFS. I think there are also some questions. Um, um, uh, Jaromir said it would be nice to integrate snapshots with Hyper-V replica. So uh, any plans to integrate the this interesting technology into other Microsoft technologies like uh, Hyper-V replica? Uh, I, I saw a question from uh, from the audience about VSS snapshots. Um, any plans there? Yeah, so it's something that we've been thinking about as well. So this is very new uh, to us, this RFS snapshots. Um, and I believe actually this is the only file system that can do file level snapshots that I know of. Um, so yes, we're looking at those scenarios. And so for us, it's more just a, a, a question of what are the highest priority scenarios for us to go tackle first um, now that we've built this out. So if you have feedback on what you'd like to have built first, um, we'd love to have that. So send me an email. Um, I'm Ann Hansen at Microsoft.com. Uh, let us know. We'd love to have those discussions with you. So I assume Helmut has unmuted his microphone. Helmut, you have a question? Oh, sorry, it was an error. <laughs> OK, so um, um, I was thinking when I saw this uh, this feature, is there maybe a possibility to build something around immu in no, I, I didn't get the word immobility. So with, with a snapshot that you can't change the snapshot anymore. So you said it's read only, so not not changeable. That's correct. So um, yeah, that's something we're also looking at immutability because I know that's a, a big feature request, um, and especially for backups to protect your backups from things like ransomware or encryptionware. Yeah. Um, so yes, that's what, that would be a, a logical next step. So it's not there net yet, uh, and I think there's some other ways that we have to go about making those protected with ACLs and, and the right user account permissions. Um, but yes, that is something that we're looking at. Cool. Cool. Um, so have we more questions from the audience? Because this is, a, I think, a very interesting topic. Just let me see. No, so far we don't have other questions from the speakers. Are there? No, I don't see uh, see them because it's very late in Germany already. We are nearly at 10, 10, uh, 10 p.m. and the audience is getting uh, thinner and quieter. <laughs> it's sleeping time. So if you have any questions for the uh, the two, um, um, 
would be great to have them now. And I'm looking for Didier, but Didier is very, very quiet. I, I know he would have had questions, but he's not here, I, I presume. <laughs> so something is going I'm on. I'm here, all right, but I let other people speak as well. You know? I, I especially called you out now. So if you have questions for Andrew, please feel free. Now, otherwise, this session is over and uh, we have to fill up the time. I, I will I will discuss some more issue things later, I think. There's a round okay. later, right? So right. he's questionless. That's the first. No, no, <laughs> not questionless, but I'll I'll reserve it for the round table. Let's put it that way. Okay. But so, so for the audience, we have some other topics from previous questions we have to discuss, but uh, as long as there are open questions on this storage topic, we should stay here before we move to uh, uh, to two other topics where we said we will talk about this when we have some time between other sessions. Yeah, and there is another one from the audience. It's any way to apply a snapshot to the is there any way to apply a snapshot to the original and overwrite it? Yeah, not today. So that's something where we're looking at yep, going future. So I understand uh, the snapshot technology is very new and uh, uh, you are thinking about a lot of things where how we can use it or how it can be used, right? Yeah, you're getting a, like a very early look at like, we, we just kind of created the basic like functionality first and then yeah, so like I said, it's a developer API, so people can build on top of this. Yeah. OK, um, again, last call. Otherwise, Tina and Andrew are finished with uh, their session. So this is the last chance for you. I, I, I just was away for a moment, so I was wondering, is the in-place upgrade bug in 2022 addressed or mentioned somewhere with RUS by someone? No, what in place uh, it's upgrade? Not specific, it's not specific to uh, to Azure Stack this API. Is, RUFS seems yeah. to have an in place upgrade bug with blue screens. If you if you in, do an in place upgrade, yeah. So this is this is an issue when users upgrade in place Windows Server 2019 to Windows Server 2022. Uh, the fix is going out, I believe, tomorrow. Public in a in. Yes, in a, in a public um, like Windows update package. So okay. I will I will keep you posted if it does not. But otherwise, yep, it'll come out tomorrow. That's cool. Okay, and, and is it pure RUFS or is it a combination of RUFS with storage bases, or albeit standalone or in SUD, or or is it any any form of RUFS that you, that you know of? Oh, this would this would affect any form. Yeah, yeah, okay. This would, this would fix all. Yep. Okay, hey, I actually. Speaking. Can I okay, have a question yeah. also? Go on. Uh, so, one question was like, I noticed some time ago that there was something with VHDs being able to create directly on the spaces for the additional disks. Will it be somehow or somewhere, you know, to make it like a thinner layer between the operating system that is running in the VM and the spaces itself. It would be really nice to have some thin layer, let's say a thin REFS without a CSV, just sitting in directly on the spaces. Is there anything like that in the in the, in the plan or you know, just for higher performance, even higher performance to get rid of all of these layers that what are now presented? Yeah, thinning out the stack is definitely something we're interested in, um, especially when that additional stack layers increase additional latency, right? So that's definitely something we're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, I have another one that I get often uh, with with the audience. Uh, uh, so in the moment there, there is uh, not the possibility to change the resiliency on a storage basis direct volume. So for example, if you have a two node cluster and you have a two way mirror and you add another node, people always ask me, is it possible to change the resiliency for a volume from two way to a three way uh, mirror? I don't know if you guys are the correct uh, audience to ask that, but uh, I don't know who is better. So uh, it would be great if we get such a feature in, in the future somehow. 
So at mm -hmm. this time, that is not a um, possible like upgrade or a capability, but it is definitely on the roadmap. Oh, that's cool. Thank you. Anybody asked about immutability already or not? About what IDDA? Immutability, the word you can pronounce. Yeah, right. yeah I can't. I can't uh, pronounce. I can uh, uh, ask the question again. But I ask about the new ReFS uh, snapshot feature. If if there is a possibility to to use that maybe in the future for immu ah, immutability. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Andrew uh, said they are looking into it. And just immutability in, on the file system with, a, with a, a bit you can clip. Is that something that's being looked at? I mean, it's it's very yeah. high. It's very high on the agenda, uh, of course, due to ransomware. But what we're also seeing is that the the, the industry seems to be moving moving to object based storage, uh, and it's a trend that you see more and more. Where you could say that in the future maybe all backup storage will be object based uh, and today that means honestly aws s3 compatible storage so there is nothing else out there when it comes to immutable object based storage uh, there's there's no comparing offer from from the microsoft stack uh, in regards to mutability of a file system you are Let's say that's it's XFS, that's a Linux based game at the moment. So you see this trend where almost pushed to immutability out of fear for ransomware, that you might be losing out on that part of the market. Yeah, totally agree. And, and we've heard this uh, feature request in a variety of forums. And so, yeah, it's definitely, we've heard it loud and clear. So we're taking this into consideration for all of our future developments. If you um, want, let's make it louder and more clear. So. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's always helpful. Um, we're never going to turn back or turn away feedback. So, um, but there, there was a question earlier, I think, Karsten, that you were asking about uh, for resiliency changes, like mm -hmm. as, as you go in, if there are certain resiliency changes that are more interesting in different scenarios, then like that we could prioritize over others, that would be good for, to, for us to know. So it may be more interesting to go from two to three-way mirror, like you said, when mm -hmm. you add a node. Um, you know, going from mirror to parity is a very different amount of work than going from like parity to mirror or map to something else. So no, no, no. the specific no. jumps, we'd love to know which ones are most interesting. That would help us. I can, I can answer that from, from, I have many discussions about that. So uh, there are people who do two-way mirror because they don't know what the, how the resiliency is and that you only can lose one fault domain and not have anything in two fault domains. So they maybe see that and if they would have enough space, they would change to three-way mirror or the two node cluster with two-way mirror is, is two three-way mirror is a, is a big one. And we have another problem. The nested resiliency is really great, but uh, you can't do it with three nodes. So if, if one, someone has a two node cluster and need more, need more space, the, the way is to go to the third node and then what is with nested resiliency? So uh, uh, one thing would be nested resiliency over three nodes. That's quite hard, I guess, at least if it's more than a four-way mirror um, or change it to something else. But I think the first thing would be two-way to three-way. And uh, that shouldn't be, in uh, in my opinion, but I'm not have to program it, of course, it shouldn't be uh, as complex as a nested resiliency to three-way or map to three-way or, or something else. Yeah, I, yep, that's helpful. Yeah, I absolutely agree, Carson, but I think the questions about uh, changing from nested, so two-node cluster with nested resiliency to a three-node configuration, for example, with three-way mirror, uh, the, the number of these questions will increase because we now have it's in Windows Admin in Center. in Windows Admin yeah. Center and they will use it more and more. Yeah, so I think this yeah. question will be important yeah. in the future. Yeah. Yeah. So far, you uh, nested uh, resiliency is quite hard for many people because you have to do it with PowerShell. Now with Windows Admin Center with a new plugin, it's great. It, it, it was missing for so long. So I think a lot of two node clusters are still two way mirror even today. But now with WAC having nested resiliency, the possibility, 
uh, we will have more and more installations with nested and then you have the problem if you want to extend such a cluster and even for stretch cluster um, with a four node cluster you can do a four node azure stack hci stretched you can do a nested resiliency with windows admin center but what if when you extend a third node to each side yeah so um, this is I, I I think also very important. I agree with Manfred. Yeah. yeah. So these are maybe the main things. Two to three and nested to three. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's super helpful. Thank you. Yeah. And also, can I have one also again? Of course. Uh, so I had the discussion some time ago with a customer, and he was, you know, having he was making decision between going to full fully S2D or some storage from. I think it was IBM, Lenovo, whatever. And with the cost of the NVMEs, they were able to do RAID 6, right? And the cost of the disk was significant, significantly lower. So why do we have, or our, why does Microsoft have so slow parity? Is it because of the parity calculation that is not offloaded to any hardware or what's the reason? Or is there any plan to maybe include some special hardware to do all these calculations? So was that Yarmir? Yeah, it's of me. Of course it was Yarmir. Yeah, yeah. You didn't <laughs> recognize him. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sometimes still talking like we are that. doing something <laughs> as a Microsoft, but <laughs> I'm now in the Dell, so it's funny. <laughs> yeah, so you're saying the customer had a, like eight NVMEs and they were doing RAID 6, and were they using RAID cards at all, or this was all I mean, Yeah, CPU? probably some special hardware uh, from the Lenovo, because it was like a Sun hardware, right? So they were calculating like 10 NVMEs with RAID 6. RAID 6, it will you know cost this amount of money. It will probably not do as many yep. IOPS, but it's significantly cheaper than going S2D with, you know, for the same, for the same capacity, they would have to have much more as uh, uh, NVMEs, and it would be actually on the same price. Yep, that's a question we get often. Of, you know, why why do I do hardware as opposed to software for parity? And so, yeah, the hardware, you know, you'd having a dedicated chip for that calculation, definitely hard to beat. Um, and also, there's the uh, dedicated DIM. I mean, like you got you got RAM on those cards most of the time for caching, and then it's battery backed. So parity performance is something that we're looking at making faster. Um, we are bound just simply by the hardware on the systems. And so we can we can continue to make it faster. And we've done some improvements actually lately in parity. Um, I think between, I have to go back, but we recently made it faster. Uh, we made that announcement, I think, on an Ignite stage. But um, continuing to make it faster is something that we're always looking at because like you said we need to, we need to be able to compete with like the hardware raid controllers out there where we really excel in performance is distributed you know three-way mirror highly virtualized environments with a bunch of vms and it's really really random um, that's where like refs and spaces really shines so i have another question for you from the audience uh um, is there a limit for the number of snapshots? I, I presume VFS snap, snapshots. No, no limit. It's probably some super high theoretical limit, but it's, uh, you, you won't hit it. <laughs> One million or so, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just to ensure that they have different names. That is one requirement, okay. is that each snapshot has a, a unique name. Okay. And we can mess it up ourselves, or are we protected against that? It's protected. It'll fail if it has the same name. <laughs> okay. Inside there. Yeah. Uh, what, what, there what more features actually you want to see the, the snapshots do with REFS? Are you looking at, at anything like transportability of snapshots or stuff like that, the fancy stuff? Or yeah, it's so early in the development process. Like we just barely got this out the door that all the scenarios are kind of on the table going forward. So we just kind of wanted to build a tool and a platform that others can use. And so now it's just what scenarios make the most sense for us to really smooth out and maybe build UIs on top of and go from there. So yeah, if you have any feedback, DD, I'd love to get an email on where you think that would be the most interesting. Yeah, we, 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 we should figure out a way to, to do some PGIs and, and discuss these things. 
They have yeah, I agree. Breaks, tend to be very lengthy if you start discussing it all. It leaves room for interpretation. You can't ask for too much uh, extra information to, to understand each other. We should really find a way in, in view of, of even at the virtual MVP summit, it's very hard to get a discussion with each other, right? We need to find a way to get this going. And yeah, to clarify for the audience, a PGI session is a product group interaction that we MVPs have sometimes with uh, with the product manager from Redmond. And I would I would 100% uh, agree with Didier. It would be great if we had a discussion about that because it's much easier than long, long, long mails. So have we more questions from the audience? Otherwise, um, I otherwise, I have one more. <laughs> you have one more. I, I, I think I opened the can of worm, right? Yes, worms, worms, right? Yes. I'll, I'll <laughs> open it again tomorrow. No, no worry. But no, no, no. You can ask them. But first, uh, the audience, can the snapshot technology be used with VAC? There's no current integration with Windows Admin Center for snapshots. It's all in what I've demoed in RFS Util. Yeah. yeah, maybe in the future it's a developer stage. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Right now it's just an underlying API. Yep. Okay. Um, now we have DDA. In regards to the snapshotting, I, I also think that the communication around it might be very critical because you you, you come from this. Uh, state where people were doing, let's say, if you look at snapshots, one of the use cases, of course, is backups. So there was this issue with you have a software based VSS provider in NTFS, you have the hardware based and, and, uh, as VSS providers. Uh, everybody was very happy to get rid of them, especially if you couldn't afford them or if you had lousy ones and that the entire Hyper-V backup story didn't need them anymore. And now, now, now all of a sudden, Microsoft reintroduces snapshots and is looking for use cases. Whilst the previous where years were almost about getting rid of snapshots for a lot of use cases. So it's a bit of a confusing message, I think, to some people. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. And, and maybe some color I can add to that is that um, our Azure Stack solution uses snapshots for REFS today. So that's something they've already implemented in their software stack. Um, but there's nothing to say that that would be exclusive right right now. So that's why we're looking for future scenarios and feedback. Uh, to clarify, Andrew, you said Azure Stack. Which Azure Stack do you mean? Yeah, Hub would be the one that we're okay, talking Hub. about. Yeah. Okay. Uh, cool. but you needed to to emulate the 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 Azure capabilities with snapshotting. Is that what it's used for? Can I interpret it that way? Yeah, they use it to uh, snapshot some of their blobs that they yeah, have so on their so Azure stack. Yep. So you have the same capability in Azure. You need to replicate it on, on the Azure, Azure stack hub. So you needed a, a snapshot technology to do that, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Another another question from the audience, and I think it's already answered, but I, I, ans I ask it anyway. Uh, can we uh, trust VFS snapshots as a way to back up the VMs? I, I would say in the future, I would add, can we in the future see RFS snapshots as a way to back up VMs? I think that's definitely a vision that's out there. So, um, you know, if any software I, I, ISV wants to take advantage of it and build some use case for it, I think that's totally doable. OK. So I think the questions Go down now. Didier has one more. I have seen in the chat. Really, Didier, you have one more? That was not, that was not me. No, no, that was that was me. Oh, Jeremy, sorry. After Jeremy, that's fine. Uh, yeah, the, the question would be: uh, I would love to use block cloning, but somehow somewhat easier, right? Because there is a function somewhere in the internet that can do block clone files. Would it be? possible to do simple like copy item minus block clone like at just simple one parameter to the copy item because for example i if i would like to you know provision some vdi or you know ms labs for example i don't have i i, I would not necessarily need to use uh parent disks and then uh, instead of it i would be able to copy the vhd but instead of copying it i would block clone it 
Yeah, and, and it mostly depends on your use case. If you have a read write use case, then block cloning is definitely there, which it, it sounds like yours is read write, where you're cloning a VHD and then you're going to write to the clone, right? So that's where block cloning is perfect. Well, like a massive, um, imagine you, care, you have a customer and he would like to create 100 VMs, right? Or 1000 VMs for something. So instead of, mm -hmm. you know, copying it over and over, you would just say, hey, block clone it like 1000 times and that's it, right? Copy item 1000 times. Yeah, well, another feature of REFS is you have this um, delayed allocation. So you can create large VHD files instantaneously. Like you don't have to zero out every sector. Oh, yeah, yeah. So if you, right, so if you're creating 100 VMs, you could do that instantly today. You wouldn't have to clone the VHD, but you could. Like you said, but, you could do your use yeah, case. But usually what I do is that you clone the VHD that is like a, let's say, um, uh, uh, the, the already OS, so the, the VG is not empty, right? There's already the OS. So the only thing you have to do is inject answer file, right? So it's sysprep VHD that you want to clone like thousand I times see. and then open it, I see. inject the answer file and just boot it up and you have domain joint machine. I see. Yeah, block cloning. Yep. So you ask, yeah, but the Yaromi asked for an extension, for example, for the copy item PowerShell command, right? To specify that it's not copying it using ReFS and block cloning. That would be nice. Yeah, as I far as so. I understand, oh, Yaromir, I right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just simply copy item and minus block clone, and instead of just copying it manually, we just block clone it. It's, uh, you know, with I all see. of the checks. Okay. Something to chew about. Yeah, I think. So we, more we, questions. Otherwise, we are we are um, five minutes away. Uh, from the GPU session. So final questions, one, Helmut? One more one more question is in the Q&A, I think. So I have to switch to the Q&A again. The question is how thin provisioning can improve the storage repair. I don't think those two really have a strong correlation at this point. Um, they're more so like separate features. Yeah. But yeah, use them both and then <laughs> they kind of help you. Yeah. But you are yeah, not I think creating as many extents, right? So potentially you are not expanding uh, to as many extents with the data, right? So potentially you have to have you have to synchronize less extents, right? Than with the thick provision volume. But these are zero zero uh, extents. You don't change them if if there's no data in it, so you don't have to repair them. Right, but if you copy the data, it will probably spend more extents just than you know two. If you, for okay. example, create a small volume, it will just dynamically expand. You will just allocate you know extents as you copy the data, right? While if you already have a thick provision volume, you probably copy one item and it will spend like thousands of extents. I'm not sure, right, how it's in behind, but it would be okay. my, uh, you know. Yeah. I, I have just just another short question. Um, maybe, uh, you, maybe you could think about um, implementing the four-way mirror uh, for uh, a Five nodes, four nodes, and so on, because it's already in the in the two node uh, uh, scenario. Um, would that something you could think about having a four way mirror in other scenarios? So if we ever did do a four way mirror, it likely wouldn't be like the entirety um, of your volume and maybe it would be a portion or something like that. Um, but that is great feedback and I can definitely take it back to the yeah. consideration. Yeah, there are some customers uh, that they assume that more than two nodes can fail in a storage basis direct or Azure Stack HCI setup. And uh, so with a four way mirror, we, of course, we we have more extends, more duplicated extends. It's more expensive, but we, ha we would have more resiliency. So. In some scenarios, it would maybe be uh, very interesting. Yeah? And of course, then in three years, I would ask for a five-way mirror and it's going on, of course. <laughs> okay. So thanks, thanks you two for the great session. And uh, you asked for many questions because you you were you were done with your presentation so early. So uh, we had to, we had to fill up the time, and there were many questions about storage bases direct. Um, 
and uh, RFS. I hope you you didn't mind. Not at all. Thank you okay. so much. <laughs> Not at all so much. <laughs> thank thank you for having having you here. And now we are two minutes away from the next session. I was already see at least one speaker online. Alvin is there. Payment is there. Prashit is there. And if I butcher your name, sorry for that. Uh, it's very late. So uh, uh, can one of you already unmute uh, their microphone? And we did a we do a small uh, test if we can hear you. Hello. Yes, Payman, you are clear and loud. And uh, if you if one of you share share your screen, we are then nearly ready to go to start. Damien, are you ready to present? Um, yes. So do I just share my screen with the PowerPoint? Just share your screen, yeah. And we yeah, will bring it online, yes. OK. So that we see your start slide. Yeah. So now. Prasad, can you do a mic check? real quick because I know where you're having yeah. uh, some difficulties there on your side. Yeah, we can yeah. hear you. Awesome, thanks. And if you want to go full screen, we are ready so we can see your slides, I but it's uh, to find the full screen here. One second, it says presenting. Yeah, normally it's down there, down, down, down. Uh, and then yeah, this is it. Yes, Perfect. fantastic. So uh, you can start the session and uh, there are many people looking forward to news about GPU support for, for VMs. So please uh, go on. We are mute now. And prepare for questions afterward. For sure. Prashid, do you want to start? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Hey folks, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone who's watching here. Uh, here, Alvin Payman and I are going to talk about GPUs for highly available virtual machines in Azure Stack ATI. Uh, here, you can move on, Payman. Uh, we have, I guess, four overarching topics. Uh, of course, I'll give a quick introduction of why people use GPUs when it comes to clustering in Azure Stack ATI. Um, our GPU virtualization technologies, um, the most exciting bit, of course, which is the GPU support that's coming into Azure Stack ATI 21H2. Uh, some nice fun uh, Windows Admin Center UI that's coming in to actually manage your GPUs and assign them to virtual machines. And then, of course, a little bit of talk about our future for GPU partitioning. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to Payment to talk about why GPUs. Yeah, so before we actually get into uh, the actual tool and how um, GPUs are going to be available uh, as part of the highly available VMs, I think it's important to understand why GPUs are important and what type of processes can benefit from GPUs uh, when it comes to you know, modern applications that, uh, that we talk about. Uh, in many cases, GPUs are faster when we talk about operations that can be divided into smaller, isolated sub-processes. Uh, and these processes then uh, be, can then be uh, uh, given it pretty much into smaller process uh, uh, process controls that GPUs can handle. And uh, after uh, doing this, uh, what happens is you can have higher throughput for your application instead of lower latency. And this is most prevalent in operations that relate to linear algebra. A lot of the modern applications that are being developed for many different use cases take advantage of linear algebra and one of the benefits of linear algebra is that operations that uh, happen in this case I, i'm showing an example of a multiplication of two matrices together uh, can be performed independent of uh, other rows so in this case i'm showing uh, multiplication i'm multiplying uh, this first matrix by the second matrix and as you can see uh, the operation of row multiplied by the column to produce ij in the final matrix can be done independent of other rows and columns in the two matrices that i'm showing and this is why in most cases gpus can can perform much better uh, than cpus uh, when it comes to you know actually doing the multiplication and do linear algebra operations now if we look at 
uh, the performance difference between CPUs and GPUs for such an operation. You know, matrix multiplication is one of the most used uh, operations in many use cases. Um, you could see that as the dimension of the matrix increases in size, the performance difference between CPUs and GPUs uh, you know, drastically change. It's kind of exponential in terms of how much performance you could get. One of the reasons that in lower dimension matrices, you don't have much of a difference in terms of performance is because of the way current uh, architecture of CPUs, memory, and GPU is architected. Uh, and the reason is uh, for your GPU to be able to actually do the operation, the matrices need to be copied from your RAM, your memory, to your GPU memory. And that operation is quite extensive and actually takes it quite quite a bit of a time. Um, so for smaller matrices, if, if your operation is pretty small, the actual operation of moving your matrices and your operations to GPU could take a decent amount of time. Thus, you're not going to get much of an improvement in, 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 in performance. But then as your matrix uh, dimension increases, uh, the initial moving of uh, your matrices and your operations to GPU from your memory to your GPU memory uh, is just a fraction of your actual operation. So then you could get quite a bit of improvement in performance uh, when you do that operation on the GPU. Now, I give an example of a matrix multiplication. Uh, there are many type of workloads that actually use in the algebra uh, in the, uh, as part of foundation of what you do. Uh, as part of the workloads. I have three examples here. Uh, one of the ones that most people are familiar with is, you know, AI and machine learning. Uh, in this case, you have training and inferencing uh, in many different use cases, computer vision, natural language processing, and uh, GPU acceleration can vastly reduce both training and inference time. And again, the reason for this is most of the operations that are happening for these workloads, uh, at the end of the day, it gets back to uh, linear algebra operations. Uh, you know, one example is multiplication, but many other operations that I didn't really go into. Same, same uh, goes with the high performance compute uh, and media processing. Uh, you'll be able to parallelly operate over many data points uh, that are independent. In this case, you know, for example, you could have oil and gas simulations uh, or video transcode, which can then again be translated into linear algebra operations and be performed much faster on a GPU than a CPU. And again, increased throughput. Uh, similar goes with 3D apps and desktop remoting. Uh, uh, the GPU intensive uh, applications here, uh, in, in this case, we have simulation, design, CAD, uh, all these operations uh, kind of require high throughput, be able to parallelly operate on many different uh, uh, amount of data at parallel with, without uh, kind of relation between data points when it's going through operations. Thus, GPUs can have uh, immense number of performance increase in this case as well. Uh, so since this is quite important for us, uh, as you could, you could see, many of the modern applications that uh, I actually went through um, uh, are getting a quite of a performance boost when they come to GPU. Uh, we have GPU uh, as one of the in important pillars uh, when we think about uh, applications and, and workloads that customers going to bring to our services. So it's it's one of the core uh, it's one of the core pieces when we think about customer workloads and how we can enable these type of workloads uh, everywhere in Azure, right? In Azure Cloud, Azure Stack Hub, HCI, uh, and be able to manage all of those in a layer, you know, that we have in here, Hyper V and, and and Windows, to be able to use different vendors as well. In this case, in most cases, uh, people think of Nvidia as one of the vendors that uh, that offers GPUs, but many different vendors have. Uh, GPUs that can also um, uh, do the same operations in, in a faster manner. Now, um, I think I talked a lot about how GPU and CPU performance could, you know, uh, affect your application. I think I'm going to go over a demo and how that uh, that this demo kind of showcases um, why it's important to, you know, use GPUs for certain use cases. So let me actually play this demo. I'm going to over it. So um, there's a solution called Vision on Edge that uh, our team at Microsoft has developed. It's an open source uh, solution that kind of simplifies the process of uh, customers creating uh, computer vision based solutions for the edge. 
Um, it takes care of acceleration, optimization, and all the pieces that are quite difficult when customers come into actually creating um, solutions for the edge. So I've developed, um, I have two different VMs here. Uh, one VM is with a CPU uh, for uh, vCores. Um, I've developed the actual application. I, I've deployed it into this VM. I, I'm showing you here that I've deployed all the modules here using IoT Edge. Uh, in this case, I've deployed the solution, uh, the CPU version of the solution. Um, and I'm going to actually show you the solution itself. We have a UI for it. So let me actually find the IP address of uh, my public IP address of my VM. Uh, I'm going to take this and go to port 8181, which we are using here to show this solution. I'm not going to go into details of what this solution entails. I can share resources on how this works, but the key important part of this is we have a part here that's, you know, it's a scenario of libraries that we've found important for customers. In many use cases, in this case, uh, for manufacturing, it's quite important to be able to count specific objects when it goes through production line. I'm gonna deploy this uh, scenario on, on a camera that um, I have in, let's say, a manufacturing plant, and this is run, running on a CPU right now. It's an AMD 64, um, and you could see uh, if, if I show in the top above, you would see the. Um, 100 millisecond, which is the time it takes to do inference on one frame uh, on the CPU, and thus that 100 millisecond is giving us around nine, nine and a half frames per second per camera to be able to do detection. And in this case, I'm detecting boxes going through a production line. Now, the same exact solution, I can actually deploy on a GPU. So right now, this was on a CPU. I have the same exact machine. Uh, but one additional step is I have a T4 GPU from NVIDIA uh, attached to this VM, and I will deploy the same solution, but we have a GPU version of the same solution that does inference on a GPU. So let me actually show uh, the same modules here. The only difference is right now the predict module, I'm using the GPU version, right? So it's going to be able to use the GPU uh, for the actual inference. So if I find the IP address again, if you give me some time, so this is the IP address. I can go again to port 8181. And I can actually deploy the same solution, um, same scenario that I actually went through. Um, into to see how my performance is right so i'm going to go over the same counting objects again in this case i'm using gpu for inferencing and i click deploy and you could see that i'm actually running this um, and the the amount of time kind of improved drastically right by 10 10 times it's 9.49 it used to be 100 110 i can do 90 fps 90 frames per camera uh, to be able to do this inference here and this allows me not to do even one camera right i can then go and deploy the same solution over multiple cameras right because i have the performance now to expand this and 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 perform the same operation that i was doing not over one but you know i'm adding two more cameras here so three cameras now uh, to this exact uh, machine learning model. And I can deploy this. And each of the cameras can have three, uh, 30 frames per second uh, performance at the same time. So I can parallelly not only run one, uh, but I can run three cameras uh, almost real time, right? It's real time, 30 frames per second. I showed a second camera here that I'm running the same exact model on the second camera. I'm using the you know, third, uh, camera here doing it live and uh, this kind of shows how much of a performance boost you could get same exact solution the only thing that kind of differed was the inference uh, was moved from CPU to GPU and I could get around 10 times performance performance boost uh, when it comes to uh, my machine learning operation at the edge. So now with this done I kind of pass it to Alvin to talk about our virtualization technologies. Alan, I Alan, think you're still, you muted. still muted. Thank you. Happens a lot. Uh, thank you, Payman. That was a that was a real cool demo. Um, 
my name is Alvin Morales. I'm a PM on the Hyper-V team. Um, I also look after some virtualization uh, technologies within the HCAI space, um, particularly GPU. And I want to talk a little bit about the virtualization technologies that we're focusing on um, for HCI. So th the first one is the discrete device assignment. So what we are trying here, uh, with our investments here are around assigning a whole GPU to a VM from a host and uh, be able to dedicate that GPU. There's no sharing involved um, because of the nature of discrete device assignment. Um, this has been in support in single in server 2016, um, but there, it was lacking some of the clustering uh, support. Um, you can you could in, in the past you could have multiples and assign into the VM, so that's what the graphic is showing here. Um, if, even if you can advance. So the next type that we want to talk about is the GPU partitioning, GPUP. So basically you're you're fractioning, you're, you want to increase your density on, on your host. So you basically want to break your GPU into smaller uh, parts and be able to uh, assign it to a VM and using SROV as the isolation mechanism. This is currently available in Azure and Azure Stack uh, Hub, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't available um, full into um, other technologies. And as you can see, you can have, depending on what you decide to assign to the VM, you, you assign a fraction or a more than um, a fraction to a, to a VM and multiple users can log in. If you can advance, there we go. So for HCI 21H2, um, so let's talk a little bit of what we had on 20H2, which is not a whole lot. Um, we we didn't have a whole lot of, um, uh, we heard the feedback about GPU. We didn't have anything there. Um, we had very limited target um, for the, the type of usage that we had. The way to do it was really uh, cumbersome, didn't have, um, really well uh, integration with WAC. It wasn't really uh, super friendly to configure. So in, on, on 21H2, we, did, we lifted the restrictions for, uh, if you want to go to the next slide, please. We lifted the restrictions to do um, clustering. So now we can, the cluster will recognize the GPU as a resource and you can assign a VM, you can assign a, a, a VM to a resource pool which contains a GPU that's that's on the host, and then be able to um, um, move the the VM around. For Azure Stack for 21H2, we're looking only to support DDA at this point. Um, we we are looking for the VNX to support GPUP. Um, we are we're we're currently working on that. Um, you can advance to the next slide. So an admin can assign a GPU to, to a VM, and basically what they need to do is, before they, they assign it, they need to really create a pool. Um, they need to change the configuration of the VM to say, hey, you need to, you need to report to this pool to be able to get your, um, your device, your, your GPU. And um, the cluster manages the placement and the GPU assignment. So the, the, if a machine goes down, it will move over the VM and, um, shut down the VM and try to uh, move it to a, another host that has a, re a same name resource pool and then be able to assign it and start it over. So that's what we are. We incorporated into 21H2. Um, there's no live migration uh, yet because we're using DDA, so it's hard to um, the nature of assigning a full device, you know, changing, migrating that over to another device that has nothing to do with the GPU or has no notion of what happened to that um, device is, is hard to do and uh, complicated, if not impossible. So um, so this is what we are offering. And um, I'll, I'll show you a little bit more in a graphical way what um, this should look like. And I, and I, I display, if you can jump to the next slide, please. Um, so this is very, what, you can do this on, on PowerShell. And we also incorporated um, some WAC support, which uh, Prasid will, will show. But first thing you have to do is on each node, create a, a GPU uh, host resource pool. And the importance here is that it's that an abstraction, right? So you now you can assign more, more than one GPU, one or more GPUs into the host resource pool to be able to uh, 
be the VMs to talk to and be able to gather a, a, the configuration of a, of a GPU. Prior to this, you had to um, set the PC, the, the PMP ID, I believe, and be, or the, and be able to assign that to the VM is very complicated. So we, we added this layer to be able to make it easier for future investments um, and, and assignment, make it easier. Um, then the, the next thing, and you can see the PowerShell commands, and, and this is all in this link that's at the bottom, but um, you then uh, install the security and mitigation driver if one is available. Um, then you disable or dismount that device from the host. You get the devices that are on the host and then be able to, um, with the PowerShell command, assign it to this host resource pool. So now the 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 GPU, the host resource pool knows that this GPU is on his um, realm and be able to um, get it from, be able to assign it to a VM when needed. Then um, because of uh, we're using, where you, we have DDA, we you have to set the force shutdown because during when you move the VM, you want to be able to to force shut down the machine over to another host to be able to um, uh, detach that the, the data that was on the on the GPU because otherwise it won't come up on the other side. Um, then the next step is to configure or update the configuration of the VM, which will be assigning the VM to a host resource pool, and then. Um, that will allow you when the machine starts, which is the next step. It will query the GPU host resource pool. The host resource pool will say, hey, I, uh, here's a return GPU. I have one available. Here it is, and it assigns it to the VM. Then if you decide to move this machine, the cluster will uh, power down that machine, move it over to the next uh, host. And here comes the importance of the having the same resource pool name. It will go back to the, uh, the the second node and look for the same host resource pool uh, once the machine is started and then if the machine has a, a a gpu available in that pool it will go ahead and assign it back to the to the vm so basically this is the 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 in in concept what we are offering in 21h2 uh, for specific uh, scenarios that you can use this for um, now that, that I showed you sort of the PowerShell way or the concept, conceptual way, I'm going to pass it on to, um, to proceed so he can walk you through the, the investments that we did in WAC to simplify this. Awesome. Hey, thanks, Alvin. Uh, hey, Payment, I just requested uh, approval to, uh, to get access to control the screen. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, Hey folks, uh, my name is Presidora. I am a program manager on the Windows Admin Center team. Um, I'm sure if you're on this call, you have used Windows Admin Center in the past to manage your Azure Stack API cluster. Um, so I'm going to show you how easy it is to actually manage your GPUs, your GPU pools, and of course, DDA assign your GPUs to virtual machines using Windows Admin Center. Um, so let's take a look. Uh, here I'll start off with just connecting to my Azure Stack API cluster. Um, it'll bring me to this dashboard that I'm sure all of us are very familiar with, where I can get information about my cluster, things like you know virtual machine status, uh, memory consumption, performance graphs, and so on. Um, a lot of us are, are probably really familiar with this dashboard, and, and uh, at, at this point, probably skip through this. Uh, in this case, I'm actually connected to a two-node Azure Stack ATI cluster. Uh, both of these nodes in the cluster are uh, running Lenovo's uh, LSC 315 machines, uh, both running the preview version of the Azure Stack HCI 21H2 build. Uh, in this particular case, uh, there are about 22 virtual machines that are running on this cluster. Uh, most of the virtual machines, as you'll see here, are just running on one node of the cluster. Um, and there's just one virtual machine running on the second node, this B1 node. Uh, and I'll actually highlight this one here since that's the workload we're interested in. That's the workload we're actually going to be running our GPUs with. Um, on the left here, you'll actually see two new tools. Uh, you'll see one is a new security tool that folks are probably not familiar with, and one is a new GPU tool. Oh no. That wasn't supposed to happen. All right. Uh, anyway, uh, on the left here, you'll see two new tools. One is a new security tool and one is a new GPU tool. Uh, if folks are attending the next session here uh, on security, you'll, you'll find out more about the security tool. But of course, here for now, I'll focus on this new GPU tool. 
The first page of the GPU tool, you'll actually see. Uh, uh, oh. All right, pausing is not my friend today. I shall not pause. All right. Um, so the first page of the GPU tool just gives you information about the GPUs that are present on each node of the cluster. Um, so in this case, each node has an NVIDIA Tesla T4 GPU uh, that can be used for DDA assignment. Uh, each node also has this generic Microsoft display adapter, which is why on the, on the right side, you'll actually see this column that tells you if a particular GPU can be used for DDA assignment or not. Um, and if a particular GPU is not assignable, it'll, it'll tell you why. Uh, and that page can also be used for things like enabling, disabling, and doing traditional GPU tasks for the host. As Alvin just explained, GPU DDA assignment for Azure Stack HCI follows this concept of GPU pools. Um, and so here, if I navigate to this GPU pools tab, uh, I'd be able to create this GPU pool on every single node of my cluster. Um, as Alvin mentioned, this uh, the importance of having a GPU pool of the same node on every node of your cluster actually is what ensures high availability. Um, so the Windows Admin Center UI actually encourages you to create this uh, GPU pool of the same name on every single node in the cluster. Uh, in this case, I just called my GPU pool test pool. Uh, and actually, just right here, I'm, I'm now ready to assign GPUs to actual virtual machines. Um, as I mentioned just now, I'm interested in this Peter test virtual machine, and that's what I'll be assigning my GPU pool to. Um, so I'll click this assign virtual machine to GPU pool button, select my GPU. Um, I'll have some advanced options like configuring my high or low memory space IO spaces. Uh, and of course, this last bit about setting the offline action. Uh, as Alvin mentioned, live migration is not supported for GPU DDA assignment. And so setting that option that I just selected there actually ensures that during a migration, the virtual machine actually turns off, then migrates, and then turns on onto the new node. Um, and so setting that last bit sets the offline action to be shut down, where uh, it means on and offline, it should shut down and then turn on a new node. Anyway, here we'll see that Peter test has been assigned to this pool running on B1. Uh, so let's actually test the high availability here. Um, I'll select this V1 node and I'll, I'll pause it. Uh, of course, pausing a workload or suspending a, a node here actually migrates all of the workloads that are running on that particular node to the other node in the cluster. Uh, so in this case, if I navigate back here to the, G, uh, to the virtual machine page, uh, I'll refresh my list here um, and we'll see that this workload Peter test has now been migrated to the other node in this cluster. Uh, there we go. Uh, so there's nothing running on LSE uh, 350B1 anymore, and they're all running on B2. If I navigate back to my GPU pool page uh, and I refresh the list here, we'll actually now see that uh, Peter test is now running and using the GPU pool on node 2 as opposed to the GPU pool on node 1 as it previously was. Of course, once I'm done here, I can just very simply unassign this VM from the GPU pool and, and uh, move around my business and, and once again assign this GPU pool to uh, another VM that I'm interested in. Um, so that's the UI for Windows Admin Center that's coming uh, to managing GPUs, GPU pools, and the whole assignment process for Azure Stack ATI. Uh, this is expected to be released here uh, next month uh, for folks to try out. Uh, and I'll actually pass it back over to Alvin to talk about uh, the, the future of GPUs with Azure Stack ATI. Sure. sure. Um, uh, go ahead, go ahead and advance the slides. Thank you. So um, I just wanted to reiterate the the next, what we're looking into next for, uh, for Azure Stack HCI is really the, the GPU partitioning. And uh, we're looking into uh, targeting the, the live migration capabilities. So this concept of, you know, trying to move this partition to another um, another node and be able to migrate the the the, the memory and the GPU uh, workload that it's using is what uh, the target it will be for the next um, version. We haven't landed yet um, uh, a, a specific version. That's why um, I didn't dis uh, disclose that. But um, but it's more more to come. So we're working on it, actively working on it. Um, I guess the call for action, which will be the next slide, is really to um, want to uh, start using the new GPU tool in Admin Center and uh, proceed as your it's going to be released in October. Yeah, it's going to be released out here uh, next in October. 
Um, so just next month, you folks should be able to see the new GPU tool in the public Windows Admin Center feed for everyone to go install and try out. And of course, try out the new functionality for GPU DDA assignment on Azure Stack HCI. Awesome. Uh, probably ended a bit early, but we're here for Q&A. Yeah, guys, uh, thanks so much for the presentation. And I know a lot of people are keen to have GPU support in uh, Azure Stack HCI. So um, the DDA in the cluster is the first step. Uh, uh, you are working, as I got from the presentation, uh, at live migration for some future release. So was, was that meant with uh, DDA or also with GPU partitioning? It's meant to be with GPU partitioning. So you target directly GPU partitioning and live migration in one of the next versions, correct? Correct, that's correct. Okay, another question I have, I, we have some questions in the audience too. Another question uh, would be um, GPU partitioning, as far as I know in Azure, is only supported with one, one vendor. So is it, safe to assume that you will maybe support the same vendor in uh, on-premises because you have the code already for Azure. I heard there are some security problems with different GPU cards. Is that correct? Um, we're working with different, uh, we're working to actually include uh, a roadmap of our partners, but we don't mm -hmm. have that information as of yet to, to be able to disclose. Um, so we we are trying to to work diligently with our with our partners and um, not only with our partners with our uh, GPU partners but also with our hardware partners to see what the integration they're in going to include. So it's a more extensive um, uh, yeah, offering because, than than just than just the, the the GPUs themselves. Yeah, yeah. Because if you now buy an Azure Stack HCI cluster and you get an update next year, for example, it would be cool if you already have the the right GPU. Uh, in them, yeah. So uh, because you don't change your cluster um, because of new hardware features, I, I assume. So that would be cool if you don't take too much time to give us a roadmap here. Correctly put, Manfred. Yeah. And to, you. <laughs> to add something, you mentioned uh, uh, call to action. Uh, everybody should test this. When I go to docs.microsoft.com, actually the information is that there's no list of supported GPUs, so it's a little bit hard to build a test environment. So uh, especially for me, it's clear for not in production, uh, I don't want to invest too much in these GPU cards, but for sure I want to test it. Are there any recommendations uh, for, for example, for 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 building labs? What's the minimum uh, or, or what's a, a graphic card that's uh, actually supported that's, that's recommended for testing? And NVIDIA T4, you saw it. But is this <laughs> the only one? This was one example, yeah. So NVIDIA has a, all their, all the NVIDIA models have support for, um, DDA. I believe the new, the new DDA. So that you should be able to use um, any of the DDA supported GPUs and be able to install the driver um, on the on the guest and be able to um, have that, be able to use or assign that. Okay, so, if, so Ivan, if DDA works so far with Windows Server 2019 or Azure Stack HCI 20H2, um, we can assume the card will also work in a test environment with 21H2, right? Yes. Is, did, okay, okay, okay that's helpful. Yeah. Okay, then uh, we come to some questions from the audience. Or DDA, do you have questions? No, You're just, unmuted. Just a remark, because that would be a major improvement. That's something that worked in 2019, works with 2022. Because in the end, all the deployments we did with DDA with Windows Server 2016 come Windows 2019, the cards were no longer supported by NVIDIA. So the lifetime yeah. of those cards was reasonably short, and that disappointed a lot of people, to be honest. So it's nice to hear that the longevity would be there a bit better than, than before. Yeah, we are, I mean, we offload it to the to the partners and to be able to provide that driver. So really, we are in that in that. You can look at it from that perspective that we're in. We we will depend on 
the vendor to be able to provide you with the, the proper uh, driver to support it in the guest. So, it, so basically, it's a it's a third party vendor choice. You're not in the driver's seat there, right? Right. Too bad because. <laughs> Okay, so I will ask the first question. Can we assign more GPUs to a single VM or is it one GPU? With DDA is just uh, the one. Um, you can have multiple GPUs in a, in a resource pool mm -hmm. to be able to have you know multiple. If something uh, you have two VMs, you can assign one and one. Um, but it will be one one assignable DDA at this time. Yeah, okay, thanks. Next question is, is is it supported on a stretch cluster? So if you do a I assume if you do a live migration from one side to the other side and uh, there's the same GPUs there, every node has the same GPUs, would that work? Um, I don't see why not. I mean, the, the stretch cluster is just a storage. So once you move the, the machine and you configure the pool and the, and the host, of course, given that the, the host has the same pool, the same configuration, the GPU, um, it will request the the access to the um, to the resource pool and be able to assign it if available. Mm -hmm. Another one. Um, any enhancements on DDA? I would I would add. I I I think. Uh, uh, and, um, I I missed the word. It's late. Uh, unless uh, of course the uh, the the pool support. Other enhancements there. Um, no, I don't think so. I think we just have the, we wanted to sort of give the, the, the first step into using DDA as a, as a vehicle, um, give you that opportunity to use it in a cluster. Um, but we will have more to come probably in, in the, in the GPUP space. Okay. Um, does DDA failover affect the virtual machine's VTPM RPC boot measurement? That's a complex one. <laughs> yeah, that that is is a that's a loaded one because um, that you are mixing uh, potentially some of the investments done on the security space. Um, so um, there, there are there are security. I mean, right now, if you don't have the, there's a dependency to do um, like HGS, and we don't have that um, capability in Azure Stack HCI. So there, there's different components here. Um, so the answer to your question is, if you have a VTPM today, the answer is no, you can't. Um, you cannot move it over. Yeah. So in, in the past, uh, Microsoft also was talking about GPU virtualization. Uh, now I got the impression it's uh, it's GPU partitioning. So is the virtualization uh, virtualization of GPUs uh, off the table or is it still somewhere on the roadmap and maybe in the far future? Um. I'll say that the 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 focus right now is the the next the the next focus is GPU uh, partitioning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe down um, down the down down the path we we will we will have um, ideas around the the virtualization, but for now is we're focused on GPU on um, partitioning. Mm -hmm. Another one um, is also addressed to you because you are also the Hyper-V guy. Uh, <laughs> do we need to disable the load balancing in the cluster since we cannot live migrate the VM? So it would be not fantastic if the VM is moved to another host and you sh we have to shut down it. And uh, so I, I would imagine what happens with the workload in it, right? Yeah, you have to be aware that you're gonna ha your workload is has to go down because of you're assigning a full device that it's that has ties into the 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 PCI channel of the of the host. So it's hard for you to migrate that same um, having that same ID specified on the other node, and um, that's where the complications of 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 DDA come in play because mm. it's hard to just match that um, configuration on the other host. Because their their dependencies on the OS layer. Sorry, have we lost the presentation and the picture? 
So the screen should, the video should be there. Yeah, but, but it's the not. Present, it's not? No. No. <laughs> but, but you don't have the, the attendee screen. Is anybody, can anybody of the attendees give feedback if? You maybe do the Q&A thing again. You have yeah, now we have to. Manfred, you are live and the thank you isn't live. That's the main problem. Now thank now, you is live. Now yeah, the yeah, screen yeah. is live again. And yeah, the blue screen yeah. is live again. We don't I, want I, to see blue screens, yeah. right? <laughs> I have more questions. Yeah. The audience has more questions. So don't mess with the screens here, Manfred. We have still one and one hour and 20 minutes to go. Okay. <laughs> So another question, and I didn't know that, so I don't know if it's correct. Uh, VM checkpoints were not compatible with DDA in 2016. Do this new version of the OS allow for VM checkpoints for DDA? Um, no, same rules apply. Um, so how do you back up uh, such a VM? Just don't put important stuff in it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was joking. So I did. I was not aware. I, I, I forgot that uh, DDA and uh, checkpointing was not working. Of course, it's you. You put a hardware device in it. So okay. Yeah, that those are um, likely more investments that we're that you're going to see in, in the future. We just didn't uh, provide it on this on this release. Okay, that's cool. So then I then I had a, a remark from. Um, I think a customer of the EAP program of Azure Stack HCI. Um, and uh, he said that uh, uh, DDA is important uh, even for Citrix environments. I don't find uh, it's uh, because it, it gives huge, huge improvements even for X, Excel and uh, browsers and so on. So uh, he, he's, he's very, he's liking what he's seeing in uh, Azure Stack HCI 21H2 with uh, DDA support. Just to want to uh, also give you feedback that's good one so he hopes that uh, uh, that now more customers can switch from vmware to uh, azure stack hci with with citrix uh, uh, servers rds R, how it's called rds servers remote yes, desktop remote desktop servers yeah. station hosts yes <laughs> I, it seems to be that i'm a little bit tired <laughs> okay does windows server 2022 hci cluster support GPU, yes, they do, right? You talked about that, even with GPU partitioning. So uh, the the questionnaire should specify the question more. What does yeah, I think that I think the what they're probably re referring to is um, yes, we do have a Windows server. On sorry, Windows I, server. Yeah, but we don't have the su the support that you just saw for a DDA is only for Azure Stack HCI 21H2. Yeah, but uh, DDA uh, without cluster, the cluster advantages are, is still supported in 2022 or is it removed? We never had support so, for 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 um we you can run a DDA um, GPU on a on a host, sure. but you yeah. can't do the um the, the cluster. Yeah. yeah, of course. So it's still DDA is still there, but it's it's more a single server scenario, or at least not a, uh, any enablement in the cluster. Okay, so this is a cluster, uh, an Azure Stack HCI feature alone. Uh, sorry, we lost video again. So what do you mean, Helmut? Do you mean the slides? Yeah, here, Actually, nothing the slides is here. The slides is uh, are gone, and you are live now, but without a video stream. So maybe uh, are you uh, locked in as an attendee, Helmut, or are you locked in as a as speaker? As an attendee and a speaker. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we see this. I mean, I see the same thing. I see the little uh, the circles for everyone, but I don't see the the, the live video. Okay, yeah, because live. regarding the teams, it says the video is live. So the preview in Teams says uh, the video yeah. is shared live. So yeah. now Teams is the. So if we now have problems with teach capacity <laughs> yes. after 10, 10 hours, hours. 23 <laughs> minutes. So Microsoft <laughs> says it's 12 hours or up to 12 hours. So we are, but, uh, we are nearing the 12 hour yeah, mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we are, t we are 10 hours and uh, 23 minutes live now. Okay. Um, more questions from the audience or um, 
Are there more questions from the audience or even from other speakers? Helmut, do you have any questions? No, thanks. Uh, so Carl is saying that it's I see okay. I see live on video on the Teams. So okay. from one of the attendees, we have the feedback that the video is visible. Yeah, so okay. okay. Yeah, but only one, I don't see it either. Maybe can we have some Hyper-V related questions? And there is I don't know if Al Alvin, uh, will you take Hyper-V related questions or uh, or not? Depends on what they are. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so yeah, they're, 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 they're more easy. like uh, ask they're for the be features, easy. Right? <laughs> it's more like ask for the features, right? But that would be pretty awesome to be able to, for example, schedule the, the, the VM version update. So for the next reboot, you know, let's say I would like to update the VM version, but you have to turn off the VM, right? So you would be able to say, hey, I want to update this VM on the next reboot. So just make, make cold boot for the VM and update the versioning. So you don't have to schedule it complicated ways. So these kind of things like scheduling also the, the adjustments to the machines, right? The customer will ask you, hey, can I have in this machine instead of four vCPUs, I would like to have six vCPUs or 10 vCPUs. So you would just configure it and let it configure on the next reboot or something like that. It would be pretty awesome. I hear you. Yeah, um, I've, I've, hear, I've heard this, this feedback before. Um, I would appreciate um, Carson, do we have a mechanism to to get this feedback through? I did, we didn't, unfortunately, we didn't um, enable like a, a survey or something that we can add this to. I would love to to get a note of of this of this information and be able to. Yeah, if if you uh, if you set up a survey, I will get them to the attendees. If you okay. like this way, yeah. Well, we can use Slack channel, right? We can reach out to <laughs> thousands of people. So. Like, I, uh, what, I'm not what? in the Slack channel. I'm not active there. So, but ah. you can, of course, use the Slack channel. Too much noise. Don't worry. I'm, yeah, I'm taking notes right now. But yeah, yeah. Great feedback. Yep. So, other other things we want to have in Hyper-V and so, so you, HDI. <laughs> sorry, let me just go back to that. So, you mentioned two things there. You mentioned vCPU um, I mean, scheduling and configuration that you have to, that you have to do cold boot for, right? Or shut down the VM, right? So anything like uh, upgrading VM version okay. from nine to ten, for example, or you know adjusting the the CPU or making the, the the memory static to dynamic or dynamic to static, anything like that that requires turning off the VM, that would be awesome. Got it. Okay. Yeah, if if I can add to that, uh, for me, uh, it's more a Windows Admin Center thing. So, uh, Alvin, you are maybe not the right guy, but I can't live migrate in a cluster in Windows Admin Center and Azure Stack HCI uh, VMs. So I can't say, or at least I don't know how, I can't say move this VM to this host or this node. Um, for example, in a stretched Azure Stack HCI cluster scenario, I want to move the VMs to the other side and then switch the partnership because I have a planned downtime in one side of the cluster. That would be one example. Yeah. So if you if you pause a node, that is possible, of course. It moves the VM in the same side, but you can't get them over to the other. So I have to fall back to failover cluster manager or PowerShell to do that. And it would be nice to have that in the in the Hyper-V module in, 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 Azure, uh, in Windows Admin Center. So this is currently supported in Windows Admin Center. So I'm actually curious uh, if you're getting into a specific era or uh, if the UI is just not intuitive enough to kind of yeah, uh, so uh, Rashid, I I didn't I didn't find it, so I'm looking for it for for ages now. To, so you you say move this VM that is running on maybe node one to node three. That is possible. Yes, that is absolutely possible. Yeah, and uh, unfortunately, I I have lost so power while I'm sitting, but I'm going to try and share my screen to see if we can maybe see this together. That would be perfect. So uh, I, I would love that because I'm missing this forever and uh, maybe I'm just blind or always look at the wrong place. May I already so, publish your screen? Is this fine for you? Uh, 
you so I, I've had you sitting somewhere. I I lost power and internet where I'm sitting, so I'm uh, using my phone to hotspot. Um, okay. Do any of okay. you have a whack instance? We can just I can quickly walk you through it. Uh, so we can see your Windows Admin Center already. So I yeah. can. Uh, I can put this on the live stream. I, I have, of course, machines with Windows Admin Center that I can I can yeah. share my screen. Give, give me a minute. Please but do. if there are yeah. other Hyper-V related questions from the audience, that would be great. And we set this up. This is very important for me. <laughs> <laughs> so other questions. Can you can you look in the chat while I prepare? We're doing this? great with WAC related questions. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> We we have some in the chat. Um, does that, does so, any Hyper V question go? If you are if you are kind, Didier, yes. Okay, just take the the, the questions in the in the chat first, and then I'll. <laughs> you don't some. want to be kind or what? <laughs> I I'll, I'll be kind, but I'm also polite, so let the people who are still here get their questions answered, please. So, so we have one in the chat. Can I live migrate Windows Server 2022 VM to Windows Server 2019 host? And I think vice versa is the question here. We have the marketing and the technical answer to that. <laughs> and the licensing, maybe? I think it's... If, it's if, a, you, create a, a, if you create a the version label. 10 VM on 2022, you can live migrate it. If you create a version 11 VM, you can't. Yes. Yeah. And sorry, the, Ivan, to, to, to take this to take this answer. That's fine. Yeah. So, so <laughs> I've, got, I've got many the, jabs today, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, then we have one question. Is there any free Hyper-V version in Windows Server 2022? I believe that was removed that. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was removed from the, the from the SKU. The official answer is it's Azure Stack HCI. So use Azure Stack HCI for this scenarios to um, to to test your to run your test workloads. So the um, the free version of uh, Hyper-V server. There's no version Windows Server 2022, um, which is a bit of a pity, of course. Um, then we have a question. How can we migrate VM from Azure to Azure Stack HCI? Um, that will be a question for Kareem who um, in the Windows in the ACI team, but I believe there's um, you can do export import um, there. I think there's a mechanism to export it. Uh, you also can use the Azure. Um, um, ASR as your set recovery. I think that was that was uh, one of the items that um, um, mechanisms that were supported to to migrate. Um, but I'll definitely have to get back with with Kareem and and, and be able to get a, um, a better answer. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Uh, then we have a question. Do we need to disable the dynamic load balancing uh, in uh, Hyper-V cluster since we cannot live migrate the VM when we use the GPU um, DDA feature? Oh, we, we had that already. We had this already, sorry. Yeah. OK, it was still in the, it wasn't, so I can dismiss this one. OK, sorry, we had this. So, um, now maybe I can see, I, I see the power. Something doesn't work with your sharing, Carson. Now I can see it. Yeah, now it's fine. Yeah, but it's not sh it's ah, shared sorry, it's anymore. Ah, sorry, not your one. It's uh, the screen from Parish. Can we, is this your yeah. Windows App Center? Yeah, OK, so we will yeah. switch this to live, yeah. Feel free to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, uh, Prashid, I know, I know the, uh, I, I think we have a misunderstanding, but uh, okay. please, uh, please show me. So um, your question is live migrating a virtual machine within the cluster, correct? Exactly, yeah. OK, so I have a, a running virtual machine here. I'm able to click move. Uh, I select the same cluster I'm currently on, SME LSC 350F, SME LSC 350F. This is currently running, I'll go back. This is currently running on B2, so I'll live migrate it to B1. Yeah. Uh, and if I click this little move button in a second, uh, so this confirms that you are indeed migrating within your cluster and you don't have to do anything. 
and then you hit move and it will then migrate. Ah, okay, I, I know where my misunderstanding is because it stated VM and storage. So I was thinking it's a shared nothing live migration, but in, in the cluster, so, you, you the, the VM, the data stays at the same CSV, but you move the VM around. Right, and so I am updating the text in our next release of WAC okay. to make sure that it's clear. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing Hyper-V forever, so VM and storage is for me a, sto a shared nothing life migration. So I, this was my misunderstanding. Uh, Manfred, of course, know that it was possible, yes? And, and, and I, I know what you mean, because for me also VM and storage You had the same misunderstanding that means, I. Uh, okay. It's a shared nothing life migration. <laughs> okay, yeah. okay, that's okay. Um, now I'm, no, I don't have to go to failover cluster to move VMs around anymore. <laughs> Great, Feed great for me. We will update the text for sure uh, in our next Okay, week. thanks so much. Okay, more questions. We have still seven, uh, six minutes to go if the audience uh, want that. So if there are more questions, I, I will have a look in the chat. Is there any plan to improve performance of the Windows Admin Center? <laughs> Always. Oh, just just Always. wait, just wait for our next release. Is all I'm going to say. Awesome. It Thank will you. be ten times faster, like a GPU and CPU. <laughs> yeah, I would love to see some central database like uh, SCVMM, like because there are many people that love SCVMM, right? Mm. So uh, to have, for example, SCVMM Lite, where you would have like a Windows Admin Center Enterprise with some agent based whatever that would you know ship information to the central database so you can query information about multiple clusters that would be awesome yeah you know i'm actually really interested in such a feedback because uh, for a while now we are actually going towards the idea that WAC itself should be some sort of a, a stateless view where no matter what instance of WAC is running on a ton of different like you and i could be running the same instance of WAC or different instances of WAC, but as long as we are both connected to the same cluster or the same node, the two of us will always see the same information. And a lot of the work that we build in Windows Admin Center, you know, relying on PowerShell, relying on uh, basically as little possible statefulness as possible, really works towards that goal um, of being able to uh, have WAC basically essentially be stateless. So what I would love to see, and I'm not the only one, I have many customers, like to grab the SCVMM, grab the, 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 the main, from it, right? Like, uh, you know, tear it to the bones and just grab the bones and build a new product on top of it. That, let's say Windows Admin Center Enterprise. I know it's stateless because, but you, what you have to do, you always have to query the PowerShell or WMI or uh, SDDC something, right? And this will give you a bad performance, especially if you are querying multiple clusters. That's something that SCVMM team already did like 10 years ago. Uh, ah, yeah. But this is already invented wheel, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Maybe you can just you know ask around for another PM who was working for a CVMM team back then, because they already had all of these discussions before, I think. Yeah, it's interesting feedback and, and uh, kind of is different from a philosophy that we've been working with. I appreciate it. I'll, I'll definitely have. Yeah, time. I know where it comes from, right? Because I I I, I know I, I've experienced the, the shift from the CVMM and. A, Many, I, I understood it, right? Because the SCVMM is a big product and it's not suitable for the smaller customers, right? But it has some really great ideas inside. And while this uh, Windows Admin Center is a really great product for a customer who has one or two failover clusters, right? But there is nothing for, let's say, a customer who, like, who has like 10 clusters, maybe. Yeah, in the future, probably uh, Arc. Yeah, I mean, there's today. Azure for that. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so Prashid, um, there is a question in the in the Q and A. Uh, I would like you to answer that because it's it's a bit more complex. Uh, it's about G GPU extension from Wac, uh, the Wack Insider feed. Uh, it's from Carl. So if you can look through the uh, uh, new uh, Q and A and maybe answer that, that would be great. Another I, another another sorry, one is I don't asking Q and A. Yeah. I don't have access to the Q&A, I'm sorry. Uh, don't you have uh, it in your Teams client? I do not, uh, no. Oh, you have this, the phone situation, sorry. Ah, so okay, I, will, yeah. I will read it. Yeah. Um, I Prashid, I have installed the GPU extension from the WAC Insider feed. I have disabled the hardware on the host and hoped to be able to configure the GPUs. 
yet the GPUs in any state does not appear on the VAC tool panels of the machine. Could it happen that GPU extension only works is designed for Azure Stack HCI cluster and not for Windows Server 2019, 2022 clusters? That is accurate. The Windows Admin Center extension for GPUs is only available for Azure Stack HCI. Okay, we answered that. Uh, so then is another question, as uh, I think it's more for us, other than managing multi hypervisors, what is the limitation of WOC uh, versus uh, System Center Virtual Machine Manager? I think uh, Jaromir pointed out some things that we have a stateless uh, uh, um, admin center is not saving the data, it's, it's always querying them. Other limitations, I think there are much advantages over a Virtual Machine Manager. You have much more possibilities with Windows Admin Center than with Virtual Machine Manager, in my opinion. But people say I'm not a system center friend. It's maybe true. Um, so if there are other things you maybe Manfred, you can find. I'll also probably take that if that's okay. Um, yeah, take I, that, please. Yeah. I would say that Windows Admin Center and System Center are actually designed to work together. Uh, where Windows Admin Center is, you can think of it as these like reimagined re inbox platform tools, um, you know, the replacement of MMC without, you know, the need for RDP or need for going to PowerShell yourself. Um, it's like, for example, included with your Windows Server license, there's no additional cost to it. And it gives you really that deep single server and single cluster drill down for troubleshooting, configuration, maintenance. Uh, it's really optimized for that like two to four node or two to four like cluster management. Uh, deeply integrated with Hyper-V, Storage Spaces Direct, SDN, and whatnot. Uh, while something like uh, SCVMM is really designed to be that, that comprehensive suite of tools that is supposed to bring ad additional value across your environments and platforms. You know, it's to monitor and, and manage your heterogeneous systems at scale. Um, and yes, it does include, you know, Hyper-V, uh, but it also does things like VMware and Linux. Um, mm. And so I think the core difference is that there's no difference. It's that both of these are actually meant to be together, while one is supposed to be that very deep cluster management tool, and the other one is this uh, sort of at scale management tool. Okay, proceed. Thank you for the answer. I know that uh, Jaromir would love to answer it, but uh, unfortunately, we have already uh, 11 uh, p.m., and we will now start with our next session. Pra Prashit, you are also in that session, or did I? Yes, One of you guys is also in that session. So I see Roy. Roy, uh, you can share your screen or wh whoever is doing it because you are four guys. <laughs> yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll be doing your that. Session. <laughs> Sorry that we took uh, away a little bit of your time because there were some questions about GPU and generally Hyper-V and VMM and so on. That's a big topic, so no worries. It is. So if you want to start, please start. <laughs> I um, actually want to make sure that Saqib is here. Um, he will be talking about the first part of our uh, session. Yeah. Um, I see Ashwin here, so Saqib should be uh, joining in a moment. Yeah, okay. So, if, so I will look then for more questions. So you want, you want more questions? I see more questions from the audience. Uh, someone is uh, state, Carl is stating it would be nice to have DDA for GPUs for non Azure Stack HCI uh, installations. I could maybe say uh, that will uh, maybe not happen uh, because Azure Stack HCI is the way to go for new features. Um, other things, Didier, you have one more before well, I have or... a couple more. One, if uh, some feedback in regards to WAC, it would be nice to see some support for standalone storage spaces in there, which seems to be missing completely to manage that because people are using that. Often people who are using it for backup targets aren't always too sh savvy to do it all in PowerShell, so it might be nice to have it in there. And secondly, and there I go again, uh, VHD set backups, reliability, stability. We will not open that can of worms <laughs> tomorrow in the roundtable, maybe. So, Nasmus, uh, are we waiting for Nasmus or? Uh, Sakeep just joined, yes. Okay, so then I you think, uh, go, we can please. get started. Uh, DDA tomorrow in the roundtable. That would be the nice, a uh, nice place for that. Yeah. Cool. Okay. 
to... Awesome. So, are we ready to go? From our side, you are. Okay. So, Sakib, it's all yours. Uh, you can get started then. Awesome. Yeah. So, so thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm Nazma Sakib. Uh, I'm a PM lead in our Azure Edge and Platform uh, organization, specifically in the enterprise and security team. Um, really, really excited to, to be with uh, uh, all of you today um, and uh, get the opportunity to to kind of share uh, what we've been uh, uh, spending uh, the last um, uh, uh, I don't know how long, 18, 24 months kind of working with uh, our uh, Silicon and, and OEM partners on uh, and joined by by Roy, I think, uh, who was uh, speaking before me and proceed. I'm really uh, excited to, to, to talk to you about Secured Core. Um, so uh, I, I think, you know, um, uh, it, this slide gets out of date uh, so quickly because there's so many security threats, right? But um, uh, I think, you know, uh, it should come to as no surprise to, to probably anyone on the call that uh, security threats are uh, unfortunately uh, a, 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 uh, a constant uh, issue for uh, uh, everyone in the industry, whether you're uh, uh, a, a customer uh, a, uh, 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 that's using a technology, uh, if you're someone that's helping to maintain infrastructure on behalf of a customer, uh, and certainly for us as uh, the, 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 the builders of the, the technology that uh, 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 customers use, it's a, it's a huge pain point. Um, there are so many different examples uh, of uh, of attacks um, and uh, there's you know unfortunately always a new one every day, but you know these these risks uh, these security threats are are real and they're costly, and so um, you know given how uh, the 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 landscape is is expanding for the use of um, technologies in the cloud and the edge around uh, compute there's so many interesting things going on. Uh, across uh, AI, ML, uh, and other workloads, you know the 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 value of security is is increasing uh, for for everyone in in the the ecosystem. So um, you know, as we uh, uh, kind of dive a little bit deeper and we think about um, uh, the 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 where are those threats kind of coming from. Um, you know, our team did a little exercise, and uh, you know, we we tried to 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 uh, see if we could identify the uh, the top top five. So a little bit of a simplification, but I think it'll help um, highlight uh, how we and our team are sort of trying to to think holistically about the problem and what we're doing to solve uh, for for security. So we'll talk about the the, the top five. So. Um, the 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 threat that is the the most common um, that we see in the the server the sort of compute space is is web shells. So basically, having a way for uh, someone to uh, for an attacker to access a web shell, typically um, you know it takes advantage of some kind of misconfiguration or uh, a vulnerability in in some kind of application that leaves. Uh, a web shell uh, exposed. Um, uh, uh, as you can sort of see, 140,000 is the average number of web shell attacks per month. Um, so it's uh, uh, from uh, uh, in a six month period. Um, and that's actually an increase uh, from, from 70,000, so nearly doubling. So um, across the Microsoft stack, we are uh, investing in protections against web shells. We have Microsoft Defender uh, AV uh, that blocks web shell creation and execution. So that's, you know, signature driven, kind of a lot like what you expect from a antivirus. We have tools like Security Center and Azure Sentinel um, that will help provide um, uh, post compromise visibility into these sorts of attacks and alerting so that if you're managing a large infrastructure, you get to know what may be happening on um, a small subset of your nodes. And then um, on secured core systems, and you know, we'll get into a little bit more detail around the secured core solution we've built. We're trying to see if we can be a bit more proactive 
in enabling uh, mitigations all up. And so one of the key uh, capabilities that we enable for secured core is uh, virtualization based security and hypervisor based code integrity. They basically help enhance the security of the operating system kernel uh, and make it harder for certain exploits um, to, uh, to, to take over the system essentially. And so that's a way to mitigate the impact uh, of, uh, of uh, someone having access to, to a system via web shell. It basically says they can't do as much damage. So um, we have protections kind of across the stack to try and sort of help uh, customers mitigate the impact from web shells. Uh, so number two, um, threat number two in the, the that we saw was um, RDP brute forcing. Um, so you know, as you can see, general trend, right, which is attackers are trying to get into um, into these systems. Um, and you know, when you think about the the large amounts of customer data um, that uh, are being handled by modern applications, it makes a lot of sense, right? If uh, if you are an attacker, if you're a ransomware gang. You want to get access into into these sorts of servers, and RDP is one other way where uh, you can you can uh, 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 have remote access to to a server. And uh, RDP brute forcing is another attack that we saw. If you look at the trends last year, 768 percent increase in the number of uh, RDP brute force attacks. And so similarly, you know we have a, a, a multi pronged approach. Um, so you'll see another trend there, like, you know, I think at Microsoft, we have very much a, a defense in depth sort of perspective on on security issues. And so um, we are investing in in uh, strengthening uh, just the the basic infrastructure of uh, our uh, remote desktop services and, and allowing for uh, MFA. Uh, as you RDP, um, Azure Defender uh, uh, allows you to to, to help uh, uh, have visibility into to, to all your logons and help surface the suspicious ones. Uh, and uh, Sentinel is uh, is another great way to to keep track of your infrastructure at scale and uh, monitor and alert on um, uh, suspicious activity as well. Right, so let's see what's uh, what's number three um, uh, exploits on on public servers. So that's really sort of basic saying it's like, hey, if you have um, an exposed application, uh, something like a web app that's running, um, you know, there are uh, 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 attacks uh, on them. Like uh, 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 we have seen that 22% uh, of uh, uh, of the breaches that uh, uh, that were observed uh, in uh, in the last year, I think, involved some sort of a, a, a breach around uh, a web app. And so, being able to apply like the the basic best practices of uh, uh, improving, um, you know, isolation, investing in attack surface reduction. Um, that's kind of the theme uh, that informs how we mitigate this particular threat. And so uh, uh, we obviously have hypervisor backed containers to provide stronger isolation so that, you know, an, a, an attack uh, or a compromise of a specific application does not um, uh, uh, allow more access to the attacker to to, to things that uh, 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 to other entities on the server or uh, other things remotely on the network. Um, we have technologies like Exploit Guard um, that you can enable in the operating system that uh, help uh, turn off potentially uh, unnecessary but uh, uh, sort of powerful uh, capabilities just so that they aren't available to an attacker. Uh, and then um, Azure Arc provides update and vulnerability management. So, you know, one of the big source of uh, a lot of exploits on applications is really using um, vulnerable uh, components. So, you know, something that, you know, uh, has a just hasn't been patched yet. And so being able to invest in the fundamentals around making sure that software you're using is patched, Azure Arc helps provide that capability. And then um, uh, Microsoft Defender uh, AV uh, helps uh, inspect malicious traffic uh, and malicious behavior on a particular node, uh, just so that uh, you can detect uh, any uh, particular attack on, on an application that's running on one of your servers. 
And uh, similar to, I think, what we discussed for threat one, um, for secured core, for uh, uh, secured core uh, Windows Server, secured core Azure Stack HCI systems, uh, enabling a, a basic threat mitigation like BBS and HVCI, uh, once again, ensures that even if an attacker can compromise um, you know, an application, get some code running on, on your server, uh, it helps limit the amount of damage that they can do on um, uh, on any particular uh, on any particular node, it helps with things like privilege escalation uh, and persistence. Number four, um, uh, you know, uh, credential theft. Uh, you know, I think we've all heard of phishing, right? Uh, you shouldn't be clicking on an email uh, when you're using a, a desktop or a laptop. But you know, it is also an issue in uh, 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 the, the the compute uh, landscape uh, for for servers. Um, Sixty one percent of all data breaches involved some form of credential theft in in twenty twenty. So uh, the the majority of cases. And so uh, you know uh, the the basic best practices of having protection around credentials around identities um, uh, are really really important. Um, we have um, Windows Defender Credential Guard that helps protect uh, credentials uh, that are being used on any particular machine um, in hardware. Um, so that protects against things like Mimikatz, which is uh, used in a lot of uh, exploit kits uh, to harvest credentials from LSA. So uh, an important capability to be able to enable just so that any uh, credentials that are being used on any particular node for any kind of authentication, it isn't as easy for malware to attack it. Uh, and then Microsoft Defender has uh, uh, support against attacks or identity based attacks. They can detect credential dumping tools like Mimikatz um, when they execute on a system and uh, they have a lot of behavioral detections as well to, to, to monitor the uh, any risky behavior from unknown applications as well. Uh, and uh, uh, we think these are uh, critical capabilities uh, at, uh, at sort of mitigating uh, credential theft attacks. So what's number five? What's the last top threat, Roy? Um, ransomware. Um, and so uh, I, I, I think um, especially over the last few months, um, uh, uh, there have been so many uh, uh, examples of, uh, of ransomware in the news. Um, the, you know, there was a, uh, an estimate and who knows if it's still accurate that, uh, that you know, uh, uh, the, the economic damage from ransomware attacks was expected to total to 20 billion um and you know some of the the stats that you know the the frequency of ransomware attacks that uh, uh there's one happening every 11 seconds it's uh it's uh, pretty pretty alarming and so um you know we have a, 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 a several capabilities across the, the the microsoft stack to help with ransomware attacks, um, application control with uh, Windows Defend application uh, control um, uh, helps uh, 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 allow uh, anyone that's managing infrastructure to create policies that only allow the applications that should be running um, on the, the, the platform. Um, so it can be such a powerful capability because basically at that point, you know, only uh, known applications that you've authorized um, are allowed to execute. And so, uh, it, you know, if an attacker, uh, uh, you know, finds a web shell or finds uh, an RDP endpoint they can log into, they can be very limited in what they're able to do because they can't run new code um, uh, because of what the uh, uh, application control policy um, enforces. Uh, Azure Security Center uh, helps um, uh, provide visibility into what, what's happening on any particular uh, node and can help with post compromise um, actions. And then, you know, this is a running theme, right? Uh, uh, HVCI and VBS, um, they provide uh, just a critical uh, uh, reduction in, in attack surface for the operating system kernel. You know, to use uh, uh, a kind of a well-known uh, example, you know, I think a lot of folks may remember WannaCry from a few years ago, very uh, well-known example of, of ransomware. Um, it 
took advantage of, uh, of a vulnerability in the SMB stack. Um, and uh, one of the observations that we learned from it is that, you know, if we, any systems that had HVCI enabled would not have been impacted even with the bug was there just because the, uh, the risky behavior that the uh, exploit took advantage of just isn't allowed on a system with HVCI enabled. So it's a great way to kind of improve the, the, the threat resistance of the platform that you're running is to have VBS and HVCI enabled. And then obviously uh, vulnerability management, uh, a lot of ransomware uh, uh, attacks kind of take advantage of unpatched software. And so being able to, 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 to do the uh, unglamorous but uh, very, very necessary work of managing vulnerabilities, uh, making sure software is up to date, um, Azure Arc helps uh, to do that. So um, you've you've heard me uh, uh, talk to uh, some of these capabilities as we are going through through the threats. Um, Secure Core Servers is an investment that we're making uh, in partnership with uh, our OEM partners. And so one of the things that we are uh, 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 looking to do is to make things just a little bit easier. You know, this is not a silver bullet. It's not a panacea. Uh, it will not solve every problem. Um, as you know, we discussed, you know, dealing with uh, all the various threats that we have today uh, that are that are quite sophisticated and always advancing requires uh, a multi pronged approach, a defense in depth approach. But uh, we think that one way that uh, uh, we can help is to enable um, some critical security capabilities uh, uh, from the start, from the get go. Uh, and so what we are looking to do with Secured Core Servers is to work closely with our uh, Silicon and OEM partners to help build systems that enable a few critical operating system capabilities around security by default um, from the start. Uh, and uh, uh, just so that, uh, you know, when you get a, a system that's a secured core one, uh, you know that uh, the hardware, the firmware, uh, the operating system in specific cases like an Azure Stack HCI integrated nodes, they have uh, a critical set of uh, uh, technologies that we enable, enabled uh, by, by default. And so there are three principles that we've uh, uh, used to, to inform, you know, uh, the the, the kind of customer promise that you get with Secure Core Servers. We want to provide advanced protection. Um, we uh, 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 are enabling Windows Defender System Guard that uh, helps ensure that uh, uh, our hypervisor, the hypervisor that's used for our virtualization based uh, security offerings in the operating system, that they are resistant, uh, resistant against uh, firmware attacks. Um, uh, we think that that is an important capability since a lot of our research shows that there's a lot of interest in the security research uh, landscape in, uh, in firmware exploits. And so we wanna ensure that customers stay ahead of that. And then, um, you know, one of the, the the critical things that we enable, and you may have you know seen this in our discussion of the top threats, we're looking to try and get uh, make it just a bit easier to take a preventative uh, defense posture to try and uh, protect against some attack vectors proactively, and so VBS features like HVCI. Uh, which are enabled by default uh, allows uh, the the platform, the operating system, and the hardware underneath it to protect against entire classes of vulnerabilities uh, from the get go. Uh, there are a lot of different VBS capabilities. Credential Guard is one of them. Um, a system Guard runtime attestation is another. And so, while VBS and HVCI are the only ones that are enabled by default on Secure Core servers that uh, ship with uh, an operating system that's configured by an OEM. Um, you know, the getting a secure core server means that you know that you have uh, good compatibility with VBS and you can optionally turn on a lot of the other capabilities that come with uh, with the system. Uh, TPM 2.0 uh, comes on all secure core servers. It's now a standard requirement for new Windows servers. We think that the capabilities that TPM provides around uh, being able to securely uh, remotely attest to the, 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 the health of a platform, how it booted, 
uh, is an important capability, uh, and especially to have in hardware, just so that uh, in the long run, we can start creating really robust uh, zero trust uh, workflows for security that are grounded in being able to, 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 to provide conditional access uh, based on the uh, the health of your uh, of your platform, and all of this is uh, is done with uh, a perspective to try and, as as I mentioned, simplify things a little bit. Um, uh, uh, we, we're trying to get OEMs to enable these capabilities uh, by default. Obviously, there's a lot of other uh, security configuration that that uh, ultimately can can only really be done by. Uh, the people running the infrastructure, um, but uh, you know, for some of the things that are that we feel are are binary capabilities that don't you know vary a lot between enterprise to enterprise or customer to customer, we're trying to see if we can enable some of them uh, from the get go. And um, you know, one of the things that uh, we know is is important is just uh, easy ways to understand um the the state of of uh of any particular node or cluster and uh, that's where uh, we've been investing in the windows admin center uh to provide visibility into the secured core server features so there's you know four or five features that uh, uh that are part of the definition of secured core server and uh, we uh, Windows Admin Center provides great visibility into what those capabilities are and uh, how you can enable them and proceed. We'll be uh, showing a bit more of that in, in detail later. Um, so I, I touched on this uh, uh, before. I think, you know, you know, if you think about like the, the uh, a sort of a simplified view of what secure core servers are, um, sort of physically, um, it it kind of is is built on um, you know three things. We we have been working with OEMs to ensure that they have a hardware root of trust with a TPM. Um, we've been uh, enabling uh, uh, protections against firmware level attacks. Uh, that's been a close collaboration with Intel and AMD, uh, so that their uh, uh, upcoming platforms on Intel Ice Lake and AMD Milan uh, have uh, the necessary support to allow the operating system to enable uh, uh, System Guard, which protects the hypervisor and virtualization-based security against uh, firmware-level attacks. And all of that goes into, into providing that promise that I mentioned around raising the bar for uh, uh, attacks against the kernel and other critical system components in Windows. Uh, we enable VBS and hypervisor-based code integrity by default on secure core servers using those underlying capabilities. Um, and so uh, uh, our hardware root of trust, um, you know, uh, we use the TPM to measure how the system boots, um, uh, both uh, for, you know, what we do with uh, the secure boot that a lot of you may be familiar with, um, and also for system guard, which uses a, a, uh, 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 a, a new uh, way to, to initialize uh, how we boot the hypervisor using a method known as uh, DRTM. Uh, measurements for secure boot and also the DRTM initialization process are made into the TPM. And that allows uh, anyone that uh, wants to use the TPM logs uh, to, to know securely uh, how any particular node uh, booted. So uh, kind of the core capability that we have. And then um, the uh, uh, firmware level attacks, um, as I mentioned, they're rooted in um, our uh, uh, partnership with our silicon partners. Um, they're actually specific uh, 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 x64 instructions um, that support uh, this capability that I mentioned, which is DRTM, the dynamic root of trust or measurement. Uh, it's a way to initialize uh, the hypervisor um, after a lot of the, the regular boot process executes. Um, the Windows loader uh, in, you know, uses those special instructions uh, to help uh, ensure that uh, uh, it is the hypervisor uh, that we expect, Hyper-V, uh, that gets loaded, uh, even if uh, potentially other unsafe uh, software may have run uh, uh, in, the firmware, uh, in the firmware layer. 
And then finally, uh, you know, the, uh, 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 the, 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 the value of all of these things, they work uh, in concert with each other. Every, everything is a building block uh, for, for the next thing. And um, hypervisor-based code integrity uh, provides uh, strong mitigations against attacks like WannaCry. And uh, the hypervisor uh, uses obviously the, the virtualization extensions that uh, are supported in hardware uh, to have um, isolation between the regular kernel uh, and the uh, uh, things running in what we call the secure kernel, which is where you know, we store credentials that are protected by credential guard as an example, and also help enforce uh, protections on the, the normal kernel, like uh, the ability for the hypervisor to prevent um, even kernel level malware from uh, uh, overwriting uh, pages and things like that that allow for uh, privileged code execution. So, you know, as a whole, uh, you know, uh, we believe that it uh, that the the secured core stack uh, helps uh, raise the bar uh, against uh, a lot of the, the the common threats that we see, both in terms of being able to prevent uh, a lot of things from uh, uh, from executing in the first place from a malware perspective. Or uh, uh, or limiting the damage um, from uh, from any kind of foothold that an attacker might get. So I think uh, we're going to turn it over to proceed now, right, Roy? Yes, yes. So so proceed. Are you ready to talk? Um, I know you're yeah. under a severe weather. Not sure <laughs> if you still have a uh, access. I'll all good. Yeah, I could definitely still talk. Um, right. Hey, folks, this is. Oh, go ahead, Roy. No, no, go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, hey, folks, this is Prasad again from the Windows Admin Center team. Um, of course, with that, with a heavy focus on security with uh, Azure Stack HCI and Windows Server, um, there's going to be a new tool coming to Azure Stack HCI uh, for security. I'm um, here, Roy. You can you can hit play here. Um, so here, uh, once again, I'll connect to my Azure Stack ATI cluster. And, and for folks that attended the GPU session, uh, you saw there was this new security tool that was coming to Windows Admin Center. Um, and so I'll, I'll connect to the security tool in Windows Admin Center. Uh, this is just a, a V1 version of our security tool uh, that brings some of the, the basic capabilities for manning the security of your cluster. Um, and we're absolutely looking for feedback here. If you want some new cluster security features to be lit up in Windows Admin Center, you know, please feel free to reach, reach out and give us some feedback. But you'll see two cards on the dashboard here, one for secured core and one for gen general cluster security settings. Um, of course, we're talking about secured core here, so I'll open our secured core tab and, and you'll see that the six features that encompass the secured core feature um, are visible across every node of my cluster. Um, I'm able to see which ones are, are on, which ones are not configured. Um, I'm able to enable or disable them. I'm able to see which ones are just simply not supported by the hardware. Um, in this case, neither of my nodes are, are actually supported by secured core. Um, and I can also click on here, cluster security settings and get some, some additional settings to manage my cluster. Um, and of course, if I, if I was seeing a fully secured core server, um, I'd see you know, green check marks all across the board. Um, so for each of the six features, once again, that encompass secured core um, that uh, uh, that um, Saqib just talked about, um, I'm able to see that all of these are on and, and this specific hardware, for example, does support all of the six features for secured core across every single node in my cluster. Um, and I, I do see a good green check mark here. Um, and of course, I can still manage uh, you know, cluster security settings, things like cluster traffic encryption uh, from within the security tool of Windows Admin Center. Uh, short and sweet demo. Uh, once again, just like the GPU tool, this will be released uh, next month for everyone to be able to try out uh, and, and, of course, give us some feedback. I think I pass it over to you, Roy. Awesome. Thanks, uh, Proceed. Um, let me try to switch the slide. All right. No, that, okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Roy Sasabe. I'm a program manager at Agile CPU team based in Redmond, and I run security programs. So I'm going to use the next few minutes to talk about the secure core servers from ecosystem program perspective. And now uh, Sakib and Proceed have talked about all those exciting innov innovations went into the operating system and Windows Admin Center. Um, hopefully, you know, um, now you have a better understanding of what makes secure core servers so secure and easy to manage. And we're super excited to learn uh, launch secure core server 
with Agile Stack HCI 21H2. Again, the operating system has all the security advancements built in, uh, but the you know, secure core features won't work on operating system alone. It requires capable hardware, properly designed firmware, and operating system work all together. Um, that's why Microsoft has partnered with leading server manufacturers and silicon vendors over the past years to bring the secure core technology into the server space. So um, here are the industry leaders that we work together to enable secure core on server platform. We couldn't have launched secure core server without close engagement with these partners. And we really appreciate their partnership and excited about our mutual achievement with the uh, secured core server on Agile Stack HCI. Now, um, here's a summary of what you can expect out of secured core server certified HCI solutions. Um, first, you have the hardware that's based on the latest silicon platforms that are capable of supporting secured core server. Specifically, um, they are the um, third generation Intel Xeon scalable processors and the third generation AMD Epic server processors or newer. And next, um, all the secure core servers support TPM 2.0, secure boot, DBS, HPCI, boot DMA protection, and system guard. And you can rest assured that all of these features are validated by OEMs to their highest production quality standards that you know you can trust. And you are also provided with an OEM customized enabling guide, which walks you through the steps to configure your secured core capable servers to a fully protected state. And better yet, if you have a, uh, if you choose to, you know, purchase the solutions in the integrated systems product here, they will ship with the secured core features enabled out of box, so you don't have to configure it yourself. And last but not least, you can easily find the secured core server solutions on the Agile Stack HCI catalog when they become available to the market later this year or early next year. The secured core server certifications, uh, I mean certified solutions, will have a dedicated badge, and you can use the filter in the catalog to only show secured core servers you want. With that, we have covered now uh, how the hardware and firmware layer are fortified with the operating system on secured core servers, and we have seen the breadth of industry leading partners and boarded to support this technology. So this is just the tip of the iceberg for exciting security features in Agile Stack HCI, and we're so excited to be able to create a platform that is secure by default because your workload and data are only as, as secure as the foundation they are built upon. So again, thank you very much everyone for your time, and I'd like to open up the floor to any questions. Yes, you have to unmute okay. the So thanks so much for the presentation so far. So uh, nice features coming. I actually have one question before we start with the uh, attendee questions. Um, I saw the um, uh, the uh, protected Hyper-V protected containers, and I was thinking, um, <laughs> uh, I was thinking, I know it's available for Windows containers, but uh, I thought, is that also available for Linux containers? So the Hyper-V protected uh, containers for Linux. So you got one question. Or Ashwin, for that matter. I think Ashwin is not here anymore. Or? Um, I see Ashwin here, but not Sakib. Yeah, I think Sakib maybe had to drop. Could you maybe just repeat the question once again? Yeah, um, uh, you have the Hyper-V uh, protected containers for Windows containers. So the Hyper-V containers. Uh, question was, is, is there also a kind of Hyper-V containers for Linux? Because I, I assume most of the containers are deployed uh, with Linux in it and not with Windows. Right. I mean, I'm I'm not very sure about this, to be frank. I, I'll, I'll maybe have to get back to you on this. Yeah. Yeah. 
Not a problem. Just was a question uh, because I, I don't have use cases for Windows containers. I uh, barely find uh, use cases for Linux containers, so would would be nice to know. OK, coming to the to the questions from the audience, and I'm sure some of our MVPs have also questions. So uh, is TPM 2.0 a hard limitation? So uh, do we have to have it for a secure core? Yes, you do. Uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> that was really clear to two presenters answered with a, a clear yes. Yes, so, so actually uh, it's not only a requirement for the secured core server, um, it's actually a base requirement for the servers based on 2021 Silicon or newer when they sub, uh, submit for certification for tw uh, Windows Server 2022 or Azure Stack HCI. So um, you can expect that if you purchase like a Windows Server 2022 or like a, you know, Azure Stack HCI solutions based on the, you know, Intel Ice Lake or AMD Milan platform, um, those have a TPM 2.0. Okay, so another question uh, that is uh, in my mind now, um, will there be a requirement for secure support in, in any future release of Azure Stack HCI? Because um, we have now, if you if you nowadays buy hardware, there's still not, not secure core hardware there. And if, if you update it through the versions, so maybe to 22H2, 23H2, so if there would be a requirement for a secure core in the hardware, you can't update anymore. That would be against the five years support for the versions, if you know what I mean. Right. So will there always so, be a version that doesn't require secure core in Azure Stack HCI? Correct. So um, the secured core and even Windows Server. It's also in Windows Server, right? Yeah. So some of the features within, uh, you know, um, secured core server require uh, is ha um, hardware dependent. So yeah. uh, you would need to have a, plat a silicon platform that supports that capability, and specifically that's Ice Lake and uh, Milan for that matter. And mm -hmm. then um, for those, um, you know. Um, products based on the previous generation chipsets or CPUs, they don't have a capability to support uh, the full, you know, so secured core functionality. Therefore, we're not going to, you know, mandate secured core across the board, uh, including those uh, migrating or update upgrading to the latest, you know, um, version yeah. of this uh, Azure Stack HCI. So those, um, you know, um, um, solutions based on incapable hardware stays uh, without a secured core, but it is our direction to, you know, promote secured core or, you know, have secured core uh, adopted as much as possible for the newer, um, you know, solutions, uh, both for Azure Stack HCI and uh, Windows Server. Okay, thank you. So we answered that. Uh, is TPM 2.0 mandatory to upgrade Windows Server 2019 to 2022? No, uh, again, so um, when uh, TPM 2.0 is a new requirement for certification for Windows Server 2022 uh, for the latest uh, Silicon platform. So um, those, uh, you know, Existing solutions or the products in the market with Windows Server uh, certified for Windows 20, uh, Windows Server 2019, we don't require um, TPM 2.0 in order for them to be certified for Windows Server 2022. That said, um, it is strongly uh, recommended to have the TPM 2.0 uh, installed and enabled for um, you know for for any servers out there um, uh, going forward. Okay. So uh, another question is, is sh uh, shielded VM supported in Azure Stack HCI? So there was a, there was a big move about shielded VMs. <laughs> um, so Ashwin, do you want to take that? Now, uh, so shielded VMs may not, will not be supported right now, but there are plans to introduce a shielded VM equivalent uh, sometime in the near future. Okay, thanks. No, but... Um, okay, I will I will type that later. So more questions. Wait, there are more. 
Um, someone asked about Windows Admin Center. Do we need to add the security extension or is it enabled by default in Windows Admin Center? Uh, starting our next release of Windows Admin Center, the security extension will be enabled by default. So uh, another question, um, what about VTPM? Will that be linked to a CA for live migration or how will that work? Um, I, I don't think we have expertise in that area to answer that question. Okay, um, I played around with VTPM uh, and it was quite hard. You have to export some uh, certificates. If you don't use uh, Shielded VM, Shielded VMs are not available in Azure Stack HCI. I learned uh, some minutes ago. So if, uh, the question is, is, all, is VTPM even supported in Azure Stack HCI? So you, you have a virtual TPM chip in your VM. Is Alvin uh, still here? Or do you, or do, do you can answer this question, some of you? Well, we work more on the host side, so we don't have the expertise on the VM uh, side. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so something for Alvin maybe, because... Yep, uh, Alvin uh, is definitely the right person. Alvin or Ram Jairaman, these would be the area. Owner. So I can I can check in with them and uh, report on these. It would be great because if v VTPM support is not there, that would be a step back in security wise. So we can't do BitLocker in, VM any, in VMs anymore in Azure Stack HCI. Uh, I, I don't hope that it's hard to implement, but uh, at least you can do it in Windows Server 20. If I remember correctly, you can do it, but the problem is the live migration of the machine because the data are somehow stick to the host or something like that. Yeah, I can I can give you information about that, Jaromir offline. I yeah. I I did a webinar about it. It's possible oh. when you export the the certificates. Right, right. But the thing is, you it's not protected uh, protected against the administrator, right? So why you are you know bit lockering it if the administrator can grab the the private key from the you know configuration of the VM itself from the file, right? So you can do, of course, bit locker, but uh, admin of the Azure Stack HCI host can, you know, uh, un decrypt uh, the operating system from the guest. So that's yeah, why the complete open. protection against the administrator is no only shielded VMs, exactly. but it is at least some protection. Some is better than nothing. Not not everyone has admin rights on the hosts. There might be operators, right? Right. So it's not you. You don't have to be a, a local administrator to manage Hyper-V. So there is a certain amount of security to it. It's not full proof, but it does help in certain cases. Okay. Okay, there is another question. Not sure, not sure how that will work, but certified slash signed drivers, etc. Will that require all drivers firmware to come from Microsoft? Um, I believe this question is about the secure boot. Um, the sign driver, yes, the signature uh, has to come from Microsoft. So it's part of the device certification pro, uh, you know, process. Uh, we have those uh, sign drivers, um, and then um, yeah, that that rest happens automatically. That as long as you have a properly signed driver, um, you know, the 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 system boots up happily. Yeah, but the I, as far as I understand, the driver is from the vendor, but they get a certificate from Microsoft to sign it, something like that, or? Yes. So not only Microsoft drivers are signed, uh, but a vendor oh, no, driver no, no. <laughs> that does it right, has a, has a signed right. driver. Exactly. Yeah? So the third one, uh, party vendor uh, drivers are also signed by my, uh, using Microsoft signature. So another one, and I don't understand it, but still I ask it, is FTPM support uh, is FTPM support secure core or we need uh, don't don't get the question to the publisher side or DTPM? I yeah, think. so <laughs> FTPM I is was firmer. just reading, reading it, Helmut. <laughs> yeah, no worries. So the firmware TPM versus the uh, discrete TPM. So um, mm -hmm. currently, um, you know, we don't uh, we're not aware of any uh, firmware-based TPM for server platforms. 
So that's why we have, uh, you know, WHCP spec that mentions, you know, TPM 2.0 is only uh, certified. Uh, I mean, we require DTPM uh, for servers. However, um, this doesn't really mean, I mean, Windows is capable of uh, taking um, either FTPM or DTPM. It's just that there is no uh, FTPM in server space right now. So if uh, either Intel or you know, AMD or whoever else come with a uh, uh, you know, compatible solution, then um, you know, there's nothing limits in the, uh, from operating system view that, um, uh, that um, you know, makes the FTPM not functional. So then another, this is a remark from Carl. VM, VTPM should be part of the feature set. Otherwise, you might not be able to install Windows 11. Yet Windows 2022 does not yet enforce TPM 2.0 for installation. So I think Carl says Windows 11 requires a TPM, TPM chip and yes. then you can't install Windows 11 VMs on uh, Azure Stack HCI. Would if you don't stop it for VDI scenario. Yeah, if yeah. we don't have VTPM support. Yes. And Manfred agrees, so it must be a problem. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Windows 11 should be a problem here. So Your VDI server. <laughs> should be a problem, yeah. No, only Windows, Windows 11 also. Uh, Windows 11 also. Yeah, in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, we're no back to installing, on, uh, <laughs> so we're back to installing server for VDI. You can you can run Windows 11 in the VM without the TPM. I'm just running it now, right? But I, I guess that there will be probably some feature that will be depending on uh, probably some kind of remote attestation that depends on the uh, TPM 2.0 or something like that. So yeah, maybe the preview and yeah, not the no. GA product. But the latest you, version uh, has a blocker that only is, allows. I tested this. Um, and when I configure it in Windows Server 2022 with a VTPM, it's installable, and without, it says, uh, "No, sorry, your hardware is not supported." Okay, weird. I'm okay. I'm not installing it with installers, right? Yeah, well, we test these and it, it, it was possible in the previous preview versions, but in the latest one, um, it's it's uh, required. Maybe you found a workaround, but I didn't find this. I, yeah, yeah, we I can, thought it was a registry right, right? hack for that. Right. I don't have any registry hack. I have a, like a I converted the image from Windows 11, and now I just <laughs> the latest update. Sorry, I have to love a registry hack for that. Of course, you can turn off security by very easy uh, registry hack. I mean, uh, just saying. For that, I saying. have a for that I have a question here. So, if you buy a server from dot 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 or another China company, can you really trust the TPM2 chip and? Uh, derived drivers. So there are se some security concerns about companies from China. Sponsors of the Azure Stack HCI, though, they are, of course, excluded. Any statement here from Microsoft? I don't think so. Huh? <laughs> we didn't name any names, so. But we said China. OK, we would also be another country. <laughs> No, <laughs> so you don't have to command co uh, command on that. That's OK. Uh, I think you're questions? yeah, there is really nice uh, session on uh, black black hat or blue hat conference, but there is yeah. like a deep dive into the um, how to hack the hardware, right? So how to compromise the suppliers chains. Uh, it's probably really complicated, but you could probably compromise any supply chain without the the tests i think what one company does in us they just create you know or manufacture all the de uh, all the machines all the servers in the us and they have the supply chain control so you can ship it to the american defense of uh, department of defense right that's what i saw on the blue hat conference yeah but and you by by any chance you have, it doesn't have to do anything with that company right no i it's okay. It doesn't have to do anything with the company, but the only thing you have to do is to have a kind of some kind of special certification for the supply chain. So you need to regu regularly control check all the chips if there is not any extra layer in the chip itself, right? Because, but so, Jaromir, take a look we on need the in, Jaromir, we need in Azure Stack in the Azure Stack HCI catalog, we need something like a filter uh, certified by the Defense Department of the US. Uh, it would be probably special hardware, not the certification of, of the Azure Stack okay. HCI, right? Okay. 
<laughs> another question. Uh, if I run Windows Server on top of another hypervisor, for example, ESXi, can I gain the benefits of secure server? Or secure core in, in server? I don't think so, but we have the security guys here. No, um, so uh, secure core server is a host requirement and then it's tied with Windows feature. So if you use a uh, um, different host operating system other than Windows, then um, the secure core server are, uh, features are not enabled in the way that we do. So, um, I mean, XSI or, you know, uh, other solutions may have their own solutions. I mean, security solutions, but those are not uh, the same as secured core server. So the, the next question, and we are nearing the, the, uh, the midnight mark here in Europe, so uh, only seven minutes to go. Uh, so I will read it out. I, 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 I don't think I understand it. A defender for identity is surfacing remote code execution attempts when managing a remote server through a VAC gateway. When using an admin account that is a member of the protected user group, Kerberos out only, no NTLM v2. What is happening on the back end? Uh, is it in VOC command? Is VAC starting a PS uh, session with Kerberos authentication? What is the PS session authentication? Use so I think some concerns about WAC using uh, going to the machines. Yeah, Windows Admin Center does open a PowerShell session from the gateway where Windows Admin Center is installed to the managed node that you want to manage. So, for example, if you have Windows Admin Center installed on your local Windows 10 machine and you're managing a Windows server, it is opening a PowerShell session from that Windows 10 machine to your Windows server instance. Uh, what authentication is it using? Uh, it actually depends what you have set up. Um, if you have set up Kerberos authentication between your gateway and your managed node, uh, then it will use Kerberos. Um, uh, if not, it is just using the traditional, uh, anything you would use for enter PS session and you would enter those credentials. It's actually just using the traditional authentication that your gateway would uh, you'd use for uh, any remote PowerShell connection outside of Windows Admin Center. OK, so these are the questions I could ask. Um, are, are there questions from uh, the speakers? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> from other speakers than Jaromir, because first we want to give someone else a chance. <laughs> Nobody else? OK, Jaromir, go. So uh, are there any up to date uh, Spectre meltdown mitigations recommendations like should we enable it or not or keep it the default? Because there, there is like a whole you know, set of the Spectre meltdown mitigations recommendations right in general, but is there anything special for the just like HCI? Should we keep it as it is or you know, should we go and configure it or you know? I think our uh, guidance will remain the same. Ashwin, if you know anything else but or specific to like um, the recent, you know, uh, release of operating system, I think uh, the guidance will be exactly the same between uh, just like HCI and uh, Windows Server 2022. So just configure it, right? Uh, every yeah. time or just based on the workload. If you are a hoster, you probably should. If you trust the, the VMs, then you don't have to, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, there's nothing. Uh, uh, to, to my knowledge, there's nothing that's fundamentally different for Azure Stack HCI that's been offered. So, yeah. Okay. Um, then another question is again uh, around uh, all of these secured core features. It's kernel DMA, kernel DMA protection, right? VBS, uh, user mode, oh, kernel mode code integrity, and all of these features I think were already available in Windows Server 2019. So. So the difference is now that there is a certification process for the OEM, so the hardware really supports it, or what's the difference on the software? So, side? yeah, so that's a, gr a great question, um, actually. So uh, the feature uh, from operating system uh, perspective is there because Windows Server 2019 shares the code base with RS5. And, um, you know, secured core PC is, um, you know, available 
uh, with RS5. So, um, but um, yeah, that's that's right. So we haven't had a certificate official certification program to make secured core work on servers. And then there are some, um, you know, uh, additional uh, code, uh, piece of code that went into the, um, you know, Azure Stack HCI and one, uh, Windows Server 2022 to make it work for the uh, server platform. So um, you can't really, uh, I mean, secured core on, you know, uh, Windows Server 2019 is not a supported or tested uh, scenario. So, okay. um, yeah. That's awesome. So I have a and question. Last... Uh, wait, Jeremy, I have, I have another question from the audience. Um, and then you can go again. Since VAC can also manage Windows 10, thankfully, will will be able to check and help to en enforce secure core also for Windows client OS. It would make sense on Windows 10, Windows 11, as some of the basic features are part of the feature set. What do you think about it? The security extension for Windows Admin Center does support Windows 10 client at the moment. Yes. Oh, that's. I think Carl is happy about that answer. Thank you. And uh, now, Jaromir, <laughs> if you want, if you have one more. Okay. Yeah. There was a. You mentioned in the slide that there is a, a possible TPM attestation, and I know that there was a nice white paper around releasing Windows 8, so it's really old, and it was mentioning TPM attestation service that can be developed by any third party service so is there any plan to you know enable tpm attestation service in azure you know using a defender atp or something like that or are we using it already um i think the short answer is no but i don't have any visibility into our future plans right. um uh ashwin do you have anything uh, you want to share or uh for uh, Azure Stack HCI, I'm guessing for hybrid cloud scenarios, uh, there, uh, yeah, again, I'll have to follow up. Short answer is even same, same as Roy, that I don't have visibility into that, but I do believe that there might be some attestation service that uh, that, that could be spun up uh, sometime soon. But I, again, this is something I'll have to check with the feature teams and get back to you on. Yeah, because I think this is already somehow available for Windows 10. Because I saw some developer tweeting it, um, yeah, that he was working on this feature, uh, and it was recently released. I don't know, you know, a few months ago or something like that for the Windows client operating systems. So I was just under the impression that something similar will be also for the Azure Stack HCI. So I think even Yaromir is satisfied, right? We have yeah, my, the. I'm, uh, <laughs> we have the midnight mark here in Europe, so <laughs> it's pretty late. Uh, I think we have now had nearly 12 hours of uh, Azure Stack HCI uh, day, day one. Um, I, I would like to thank the, the speakers about Secure Core. It was a very informative and uh, uh, great session. I didn't understand any, uh, not anything, but not everything, uh, because I'm not a security guy, but it sounds great. So thank you a lot. And uh, I would conclude the first day of the Azure Stack HCI days. We had so far uh, 104 uh, questions in the Q&A that were published and some we had to dismiss because they were not around, around the topic. But uh, so far, I think a, a great day and I hope I see many of the attendees tomorrow. We will start at 1 p.m. in the afternoon, so 1 p.m. Uh, European uh, Central Time. That should be, it's, it's much too early for the US. I think it's, uh, I don't know, 4 in 4 a.m. or so. So uh, maybe we have mostly an European uh, audience. So have a good night and uh, we hope we see you tomorrow. And one question was asked multiple times. When will the recording be available? Uh, we try to get them out next week. And you will be informed if you allowed us to inform you and if you are on the newsletter. OK, so thanks so much and have a nice night. And see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks for the opportunity. And thanks bye -bye. for all the help uh, to the speakers. Bye bye. Bye.
Good night, everyone. <laughs> Good night. Good night. <laughs> Good night, Bob. <laughs> I, I, I woke up at uh, five thirty or so. <laughs> so you can still sleep for five hours and a half. Go, go grab some uh, sleep. <laughs>